Sol System, Orbit of Jupiter, Terran Republic Senate Station, Early 2669, Fleet Admiral Octavia, Admiral of the Stellar Fleet. Octavia walked the halls of a grand chamber, filled with granite and marble, as people walked in all manner of directions. The sounds of her footwear resonated with the polished marble at her feet, as it did with every other footstep throughout the hall. She was in the Terran Republic Senate headquarters in orbit of Jupiter. It was a grand facility in orbit of their largest gas giant and had its own detachment of ships and defences, only second to Terra itself. Since it was home to the Senate that represents all Terran systems, security was a must. As such, security detail was seen posted at several checkpoints and entrances sporting armour similar to the Marines, but were tinted with navy blue on the composite armour, and the letters TRSC, were lasered on the front and back of the chest. She continued walking when she reached an office that led to one of the docking ports on the far edge of the station. The glass plane that was on her right revealed a steel-grey ship, smaller than a corvette, but larger than some heavy and large ships. It was her government-issued ship, and with it came its own escort, worthy to take on some of the larger pirate fleets she's seen. As she made her way to the gate, she was stopped and screened by security. Even as the highest rank in the military for her branch, she was still subject to searches and scans. She could be the Terran Chancellor, and you would still be searched for contraband. She recognised their tight adherence to protocol and let them do their jobs. As they finished, she made her way into the office just past the gate, where she was met with a familiar face. We ready to go or what, Juna? The man said nonchalantly. Instead of a vacuumed suit, like most of the civilians, he wore the standard ODR battle dress with silver markings on his pauldrons that shone from the overhead lights, and instead of a helmet, he had a cap that matched the grey and steel camo theme of his uniform underneath the armour. It's Octavia in public, Titus, she returned with a sneer. Fine, fine, Octavia. Are we ready to go or do you need time to change? replied the General of the Raiders. I'm fine as I am. It's best we leave now. Is our escort ready? she replied. He nodded as he stood, using his arms as support from his seat. They're ready. We were just waiting on you. They passed through the docking tube to their ship. It was long and windows lined the sides of it, revealing parts of the station and the whole of Jupiter, with a big red spot looming in its atmosphere, like an eye peering at her from below. They were then met at the end by a pair of raiders that stood at attention upon their arrival and opened the doors to the ship. Titus and Octavia rendered a salute in response as they entered through the ship's doors. They were subsequently followed, and they took their post at inside of the ship beside the docking entrance. The ship was luxurious in design, with black polished flooring and white sleek designs for the walls. They walked forward and were met with an open concept central chamber with overhead ship-grade glass. The scene was serene and quiet, with the curvature of Jupiter in all its glory, helping illuminate the central chamber. They then made their way up the stairs that lined the sides of the chamber toward the bow. They passed an area where food and drinks were served and into a room with a long table that could fit ten, one on each end and four on the long sides of the table. It was empty and only Octavia and Titus were present. The room had glass run around the entirety of the room, revealing a new facet of scenery although it was more of the same at this point, but spectacular nonetheless. Titus then brought up a device from one of his cargo pouches and talked into it. We're ready to depart. Take us to Hades. Sounds of affirmation were sounded, and the ship began its disengagement protocol from the docks. The ships rocked slightly, and the ship started its route. Paired with it were two corvettes, a squadron of medium fighters, and a heavy frigate. Octavia spoke, soon after ordering from one of the waiters that worked the bar. Tell me, Titus, what do you think of this new race? He poured a drink from a bottle of whiskey into a small glass before answering. They could have been great friends. Instead, they chose the path of destruction, he said, taking a sip. I couldn't agree more, Octavia replied. However, you know what the Senate said. We are authorised to essentially slaughter their entire people in retaliation. Hell, the authorization of the affent round was generous as is. I was surprised they let you squids use such a round. I'm just waiting for them to mobilise all the ODR. They're itching for a fight, 
added Titus. Well, what about your fourth battalion? They seem like the most bloodthirsty out of all your battalions, especially Raptor Company, replied Octavia. Titus chuckled at the notion. A hint of pride was apparent in his laugh. There's a reason I sent them, Titus started, after taking a second sip from his glass. Raptor Company is the longest-running company of raiders with the most experience under their belt. And the same can be said for the other companies of the 4th, officially anyway. But the reason I sent Raptor ahead is because of their company commander. And who did you send that you felt was the best choice to head an assault on a foreign entity? She questioned. Her food came, and she started eating, waiting for a response. A lieutenant, he started, gauging her reaction which showed she nearly choked on her first bite. A lieutenant? In charge of spearheading the ground assault? Why the hell didn't you send over a seasoned major or lieutenant colonel? She inquired, not sure how sending a lieutenant to head an important offensive was an apt choice in commanding officer. OK, I'm going to stop you right there because, well, we don't get many O4s and 5s who last long in the raiders. They always switch branches once they hit O4, so we've adapted to delegating a lot of responsibility to the lower-ranked officers. And let me tell you, O'Brien is one of the best raiders I have. He'll get the job done, enough for us to launch an invasion of their home. You place an awfully lot of faith in him, she replied. Well, he has the highest rate of completion for missions and a fierce loyalty to those he protects and serves with. His methods may be questionable, but they are effective, especially where lives of fellow Terrans are concerned. She conceded to his arguments, now changing the topic to the reason they were together in the first place. I'm told we have some POWs. Is that correct? She inquired. That's right, we rerouted them from heading to the Red Cross under the guise of volatile temperaments and supposed lethality. We even have the eggheads running tests and analysis. Now is the perfect time to break morality and learn about our enemy inside and out. She agreed with his logic. When it came to light that humanity was not the only sentient species, the Senate was ecstatic. That was short-lived, however, when it was revealed to them the kinds of atrocities they did on first contact. Humanity has fought against itself for so long that it was a wonder how they were able to achieve commercialised spaceflight. Talks came that perhaps we were the first to initiate hostile contact, but it was quickly stomped out by the video evidence from a lone pilot that managed to barely survive them. The Secretary-General of the Republic quickly set in motion to reinforce our borders and called for the production of more ships. They've enlisted the help of civilians with last-gen military ships in addition to the militias. Humanity was at war, and right now, a single battle group was waging war across their systems. During all this, she was introduced to new technology that could revolutionise their own. The key was Athena and Minerva. She was briefed on the creation of Athena after the Battle of Draxis, but the issue of Minerva arose when it was found out she had budded from her parent programme, Athena. She wasn't the only one thinking it, but if they could replicate that process, they could recreate a new classification of AI and do away with the personal assistant style present on all ships to date. Not only that, but she would have to wait for the conclusion of their war, for that the opportunity to present itself. And from what she was told, the programme that calls itself Minerva had wreaked havoc on the enemy's cyber department. The trip took approximately a week in slipspace, and they slept in cryogenic pods to speed up their perception of time. When they were released, they received a call over the intercom that they were approaching Hades Station. Titus was found putting a cap over his head with his armour still equipped as they readied for their process onto the station. Approaching Hades Station... The shuttle is ready for you. They made their way one level up and toward the aft section of the ship, where they were met with a small shuttle. It had one seat for a pilot and six seats in the aft compartment. They wandered onto the ramp and took their seats while accompanied by a pair of raiders, who took their seats closest to the doors in the shuttle. They lifted off with the hangar doors opening from above, but not much could be seen except for the pilot's seat and from a small viewport from the ramp door. The trip took no longer than several minutes when they landed in a hangar, and the rear ramp opened with a hiss followed by a dull thump. They departed the shuttle and were met with a dreary scene. 
Hades Station was embedded in a large asteroid within the rings of a gas giant. It was made several centuries ago, sometime after humanity was sufficient in faster-than-light travel. The hangar they found themselves in was dilapidated, and workers dressed in orange were seen cleaning the panels while watched by a set of guards with their weapons at the ready. They made their way to the central pair of doors that led into processing. As they made their way, before they reached the doors, they opened and a man in a lab coat approached them. Good day, I'm Dr Hale, chief scientist here at Hades Station. Come, come, I know why you are here. He led them past security and they walked through a small tunnel where they were stopped shortly after reaching the end. It wasn't so much Octavia, but Titus. Sir, the knife, one of the guards said, pointing to his rear. Oh, right, forgot, he said as he drew the knife from its sheath from the back of his chest armour that was placed near the lower back. Armour stays on, though. The guard nodded silently and placed the knife in a bin and given to a clerk behind him, and the three continued down a hallway. To their right was a series of cells with individuals clad in yellow that could be seen from a raised walkway. They were human, and some would have their yellow jumpsuits rolled halfway, as they did various activities. Here is the main block. Prisoners here are mostly pirates and smugglers. We have them working the asteroid for minerals at a snail's pace until they serve their time or die. Sometimes they really do get forgotten, Dr Hale spoke with unprompted disregard. They moved on beyond the areas with the human prisoners before they made their way to a door at the very end of the long hallway. Beyond here is what you're here for. The sign above the doors was labelled as the laboratories. Octavia remembered Titus's words about finding out about the enemy both inside and out. It made her shiver, but understood that it was necessary. They entered and walked past another tier of security when they were met with a hallway that extended to the left and right, with one side being all glass that peered out into the exhibits of alien prisoners. They call themselves Cellians, but I'm sure you knew that already. Hale spoke as they took the route to the right. From our dissections, they're not very different from us anatomically. They have a heart, a pair of lungs, and so on. They are the same in that sense. He continued on the makeup of their biology. They were carbon based, and they breathed our air in similar portions to Earth. Of course, this much was disclosed after Draxis. The conditions the Cellians were subject to were indeed horrible. But there was one emotion that overtook Octavia, and it was disgust. She was well versed in what they did to their first two systems and was recently briefed that they had taken human slaves and knew what they could be subject to. As a result, she held no particular empathy for their prisoners. When Hale stopped, they were met with a pair of doors beside one another. They entered the closest one and it was dimly lit with a table and some chairs. The only light provided came from a pane of glads from the room opposite of them with a singular entity that was chained to a seat. Octavia then asked, Who's this? Apparently he was a recently promoted chief captain that was captured during the battle over Tola in the Verbus system, our latest conquest. Can it understand me? Titus asked, to which Hale nodded. Yes, sir. They have a translator around their neck that can translate in real time. Turns out they had our language passed after Dima. Titus groaned and stated that he would enter. Hale happily obliged, and both he and Octavia remained in the dimly lit booth. They saw him enter, and the Cellians squirmed in his seat, the chains rattling as he did so. Well, well, well. Not so good being on the opposite end now, are we? He was the first to speak, but the Cellian remained silent. You know, there's a lot we don't know about each other. How about we introduce ourselves? You can call me Titus. And you are? The alien waited a moment before speaking. I am Dalagon, chief captain to the Cellian fleets. I'm going to get straight to the point, Dalo. My people would like to know where our people were taken and who took them. He was silent, but he began to repeat his introduction before being promptly silenced with a backhand from Titus. He recoiled and blood dripped from its mouth and a new wound generated from the strike. He then grabbed the Cellian by the head, gripping his hand over it like a ball. Tell me what I need to know, and maybe I can stop. When he didn't respond, Titus began with one of his digits and broke it backward to a position unnatural. Delogan screamed and cycled his breathing, trying to maintain consciousness. 
As Titus was prepared to break the second finger, Dalogan squeaked out a barely audible whisper. Ta, Tosca. Titus leaned in. I need more than that, my friend. Who are they? What do they do? This time he spoke in a soft and comforting tone. It looked like tears were beginning to form in the eyes of the Celian. Slavers for the Union, he began to cry. P please, I, I have a family. Titus took to a seat in a chair opposite Dalagon and spoke to him in the same manner. I got to tell you, Dalo, those people that were taken had families too. Husbands, wives, mothers, daughters, sons, grandparents. Except you want to know what we got from one of your raids. Dalo shook his head. Instead, he just listened, pain apparent on his face. All the while, Octavia looked coldly at the interaction. We saw you kill the elderly, the sick, the men. Your people took the women and children to God knows where. No, I want you to tell me where they might have gone, Dalo. You don't want something bad to happen to your crew, do you? He fervently shook his head no and tried to speak. T the Tosca. They're slavers from the Union. They run the border between us and the Union. I swear that's all I know. D don't hurt them. You see, that might be kind of hard to do. I need something more. Something you're not telling me, Titus said as he reclined in his seat. I swear, I only followed orders. I don't even know where they would take them. Titus sighed at his reply. That's not what I need, Dalo. Then let's make this easy. Who gave the order? With that, Dalo's expression sealed and he hung his head low. He decided to remain loyal and stopped talking. Octavia recognised that beating him any more would probably result in stern silence, and she was sure Titus knew this as well. However, his next tactic would throw Octavia severely off guard. Looks like beating you won't really make you talk. Not like it actually works, he said, while requesting a pad that had a live feed to the human inmates. You see, interrogations with violent bodily harm really don't yield much benefits. I've tried to be nice, but you just like to be quiet. Breaking two fingers probably hurts too. I would know. He tapped away on the pad, and Octavia and Hale could only watch. Perhaps the well-being of your compatriots might yield some incentive. He turned on the monitor behind him, facing the Celian. It was the inmates they had passed earlier, donning the yellow jumpsuits. You know, human prisons can be a wild place. Hierarchies are made by making others submit, either through violence or sexual the Celian squirmed some more in his seat, but still chose to remain silent. And from what I've seen and heard, anatomically, you're very similar. He turned on the volume, and the everyday clamour of the inmates could be heard. Dalo's eyes darted around the screen with urgency. Tell me who ordered the making of slaves of Terrans, his yell reverberated in the small room. When he was met with silence, he proceeded with his plan. The doors on the screen opened with a buzz, and the camera panned to the door. A lone female Celian was pushed through the door. She still wore her jumpsuit, but instead of yellow, it was orange. The guards that pushed her through retreated back through the doors. The eyes of the inmates turned to her with a predatory stare. You see, normally we have laws against this sort of thing. You can't really have women in the same prison space as men. Because then, he pointed to the yellow shirts, they haven't spoken to a woman let alone see one so close. But as far as I'm aware, most of our laws only apply to us, not you. And the cordial attitude we have with your people, the civilians, is nothing more than a courtesy. He spoke into the microphone on the data pad as the inmates stared at the female, not knowing if it was a test. You have ten minutes! Dalo squirmed harder in his seat and started to yell, begging him to stop. S stop! You can't do this! Titus delivered another backhand to Dalligan. Then give me names! After a few minutes, the yells of the female were apparent over the speakers, forcing Dalligan to concede. Torlak! And the War Council! He was the one who made the initial order, and he was backed by the Council to take slaves. Please stop them! Titus pressed a button, and the guards that initially forced the female through rushed the group with ferocity, beating away the convicts with metal batons and taking the female away, before retreating behind the door she had come through. I... I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Dalagon repeated, until Titus left the room with the sobbing Celian and returned to Octavia and Hale. Well, I doubt that was legal, she said, her face emotionless. 
but I guess it worked, so I can't complain. We have a solid lead and one of the perpetrators to bring down. I'm going to send word and update target dossiers for the 4th Battalion. Besides, it's not like they made much of her. He revealed the female he used for the interrogation on his data pad. The top portion of her clothing was ripped off, but the lower half of the jumpsuit remained intact. Talk about trauma, Octavia said, as they continued towards the shuttle. And I'm surprised they let a general of the ODR interrogate. We swapped it out with a sturdier fabric. Any longer and she really would have been in trouble. Besides, I own this station, he said, placing a cap on his head. Have we received word on the authorization of the TRU task forces? No, not yet. They might authorise it if we can capture both the War Council and this General Torlak. Until then, we will have to wait. Titus sighed and turned to the doctor. Keep doing your work with the Cellians and report back to me when you have more intel. Physical and mental limits. Their genome, all of it. You won't have long before the Senate outlaws your practice on the Cellians. The doctor nodded and saw them off as they entered the ship along with their escorts. Think we can recover all who were taken as slaves? Octavia asked of Titus as he wiped his hands with a cloth to free them from Cellian blood. All I know is that we have orders to decimate their army in any way we can and I intend to have my men act on those orders unless told otherwise, replied the general. Octavia conceded and rested in her seat for the upcoming trip back to the Senate. At whatever the cost, she mouthed in a whisper audible only to her. To First Lieutenant O'Brien, 4th ODR Battalion Raptor Company. Orders. You and your company are authorized to engage with lethal force on any and all hostile forces. You are to deny them from reorganization by any means necessary using only conventional standards. Further orders will be issued upon the launch of Operation Spearhead. Weapons are free when boots hit the ground. You will also receive additional reinforcements from the 4th Battalion's Cobra, Viper, and Raven Company. More soon to follow. End. From General Titus, Brook General of the ODR. Trill System, mid-2669, MFP-1404-9904, Razor, F-7A, Super Sabre. After the success and conquer of the Verbis System, the 7th Fleet made their way to the next system. It was logged in their archives, and all ships present had their star maps updated with the information taken from the Cellians. Razor had now found himself in the latest brief prior to exiting Slipspace, along with other fellow pilots. All right, listen up, you pansies, the man before them stated, as a round table in the center of the room lit up with several orbs of light and differently colored objects that were then identified as stations or satellites. We'll be exiting Slipspace soon, so here's the rundown. Squadron 111 will have the support of Strike Group Alpha frigates to take out their communications in Squadron 416. Before he could continue, Razor had already begun to tune out most of the fluff and excess detail that he felt wasn't necessary, leaving him only with his thoughts. Razor sat in the midsection of the circular-shaped seating arrangement as the officer conducted the strategy meeting, which most likely came down from the vice admiral of their battle group. The room was large enough to fit a couple hundred people, as was the case here, but even with the number of personnel present, it still didn't reflect the actual number of pilots who were required to attend. Many out on patrol or aboard other ships beside the carrier watched via hologram or data pad. Their mission was simple. Trill was a system that was heavy on industrialization with fuel processing. In fact, it was fuel as the main export of the system, and upon investigation of the types of fuel they utilized, it was hydrogen-based, similar to what the Terrans used in their ships. However, it was later discovered that their mixture for the fuel had better purity and efficiency. Then, Minerva, do you have any word to pass? Razor came to from his thoughts, and a transparent figure stood on the table that stood at around twelve inches. Yes, as you are now aware, Trill System is plentiful in fuel production, with Cellian produced fuel that exceeds our own by a large margin. Your tasks will be to secure the airspace of these stations for a raider or marine squad to take the station. That is the essence of your mission. She gave a bow and dissipated while the officer retook charge of the brief. You have your orders. Get to your ships and set for an alert launch. The pilots departed the ready room and made their way to their ships. Many were already in their gear, and most decided to wait beside their ships for pre-flight checks and functionality. 
With only an hour left of slipspace, he found it best to wait beside his ship, along with the other pilots. So Razor made his way to his ship and sat by a bench on the closest bulkhead to his ship. Razor, like many pilots in the Stellar Fleet, had their names overtaken by a serialization upon entering cadet training. There are several designations of pilots followed by a string of personal identification numbers unique to the individual, with their designation based on their ship class ranging from light, medium, then heavy. Razor examined a dog tag around his neck and instead of his name, it was stamped MFP 1404-9904, and below it was his nickname, Razor. His blood type was the only other information present of the only three details of his identification tags. Razor was designated as a medium fighter pilot, and he piloted the latest in technology with the F-7 Super Sabre, Alpha Variant. It had guns to boast, and its speed was above average. It was recently equipped with a pair of disruptors that were designed to short-circuit shields. Paired with that were a dual set of ballistic repeaters and a single slow-firing cannon. There were also a series of missile racks that allowed four total missiles with eight smaller missiles in a hidden missile bay. It was armed to the teeth and was ready to bear its fangs. As he was mentally preparing for the fight ahead, Razor was approached by two of his fellow squad members, Torch and Gearbox. Your shit all prepped, Razor? Torch called out. His helmet was gray with a depiction of fire on the face of the helmet that lead to the rear. Yeah, I'm pinned in and my racks are inventoried. You? Razor replied as maintenance personnel inspected his ship for discrepancies, as was standard practice before takeoff. Better than ever. We just spent the last 20 minutes trying to troubleshoot Gearbox's missile racks. Damn things wouldn't load, said Torch with a shrug. Eh, but we got it fixed. Had to give it some love, Gearbox added, nudging Torch and delivered a wink. The three shared mild conversation when the alarm finally came that they were less than twenty minutes from exiting slip space and all three returned to their ships. They were all part of Squadron 416 and were each other's wingmen. They got in their cockpit and promptly readied their ships to idle status as the countdown was announced. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. On the launch deck, several hundred fighters began their sequence to launch. The hum of engines rang throughout the deck as interceptors and heavy fighters readied themselves on the catapults to be the first to engage the enemy. The alarm sounded, and the announcement to launch all alert aircraft was relayed. In a systematic manner, the ships departed in their formations. While they departed to their mission areas, Razor and his squadron set out for the fuel processing station over the main planet Trillo. Information from the carrier, Sword of Reckoning, was relayed and updated their IFF information. As a result, a series of blips shown in red popped up around the station and friendlies were shown in green. The squadrons flew in formations of three, with Razor flanked by Torch and Gearbox in a triangle formation. This is control, comms check, said the voice, and all ships accounted for their formations and all were present. 416, secure the airspace around the station and maintain superiority. Copy, sounded the team lead. All teams engage slipstream to the station. Weapons free. Razor switched to their team's chat, which only consisted of the three wingmen. Engage stream to the station and unlock weapons. You're free to engage once we're out of the short-range jump, Razor ordered. All fighters began their sequence, including the larger ships accompanying them. They had entered through the edge of the system, and they would use their sublight function to travel to their destination, granting them enough time to prep weapon systems and functionality. Unlike capital ships, Fighters lacked the capability for a slipspace jump and were instead outfitted with a slipstream drive, which offered a sublight mode of travel. This did, however, restrict most fighters and any ship of a similar class to a single star system. It is only by entering a slipspace rupture of a capital ship that a fighter can utilize interstellar slipspace travel. They had apparently jumped to just outside their scanners, and they were ensured that they had been jammed so they took it at face value and turned their sole focus to the fight ahead. When jumping with Slipstream, fighters were able to get within tens of kilometers of a station, but larger ships of a corvette, and larger, they were limited to just beyond a hundred kilometers from any station. This was to prevent any mishaps of unwarranted acceleration and collision with a station. 
However, cautionary measures could be disregarded with a well-calculated jump, but a jump like that was reserved for slipspace jumps instead of a stream jump. All ships had entered slipstream, and the trip was timed at just around ten minutes, and the scene from Razor's cockpit always felt surreal. It was like a separate space moving around the craft, and particles of light were generated at the nose of the ship, adhering to the aerodynamics of the craft. It looked like he was breaking the sound barrier in space, but the scene was constant. He checked his systems and did any last-minute checks. Weapons. Armed. Missiles. Armed. Shields. 100%. Coolant. Fuel. Stream fuel. All green. He would have enough for the battle. Especially if they were going to have support from the frigates and corvettes. Luckily, some of the corvettes were acting as resupply ships for fuel and munitions. Seconds before they exited slipstream, a call came from the leader of Squadron 416. Attention all teams. Be vigilant and trust your training. We have several more systems after this, so don't die. Target only marked craft. As soon as you exit, weapons free. Roars of acknowledgement came through the radio. As soon as they dropped out of stream space, all fighters engaged full thrust toward the target. Razor cycled his targeting system as blips of the enemy popped on his HUD as he approached closer to the station. The total members of Squadron 416 numbered in the tens, but they weren't the only ones. With some of the other squadrons, they had a total force of around 150. The total enemy force numbered just below 200. The enemy noticed their approach and charted their course for interception. Seconds passed that felt like minutes, but in the next moment, hundreds of shots littered the void. Razor commanded his team with a route that would take them below the main enemy force and targeted the few of the enemies that overextended. A line of rounds from his disruptors pelted the lead ship, and after several shots, their shields were rendered useless. It was a small ship, and he landed several shots of his main cannon into the dorsal side of the ship, and it went up in a fiery explosion. Chaos now reigned and no semblance of order was present. It was a sphere of chaos and the fighters fought against every limitation their craft could allow. Lights of tracers littered the space and smoke plumes from missiles made trails leading to their unfortunate targets that ultimately ended as space debris. Razor assisted Torch who reported an enemy was on his tail and he broke off their formation to the left. Razor and Gearbox followed with a loop and met Torch's attacker with a rain of ballistic fire. The process repeated like a tug of war. Pilots pushed their frames to the limit and the sound of cracking could be heard from within their cockpit. And they did advanced maneuvers to counter their enemy. This persisted for several minutes as their goal was to buy time for their support ships to arrive. There was no presence of larger Selian ships and when the Terran ships were in range, supported the ships in combat with accurate and effective fire. The addition of the frigates and corvettes helped whittle down the enemy severely. A set of enemy frigates jumped in during the fight and had taken down some of the friendly fighters, but the Terran frigates were quick to engage. Missiles were first to engage the enemy warships, and a shield deflected them. The Terran ships ceased fire and turned their guns toward the enemy as they continued with a lackluster display of broadside fire and point defense. Numerous shots rang out from the frigates, and a magnetically accelerated mass was launched toward the enemy ships. It hit slightly off to the side, but its effect was enough to shatter the shield. The Terran frigate then moved in closer to the enemy and fired a full volley of broadside. The center of the ship was targeted with calculated precision, and a large hole of molten metal vented into the void. The continual fire was sustained, and the enemy ships were defeated. However, in their final efforts, they had managed to dispatch some of the Terran corvettes that offered support for the fighters. Upon their defeat and with the whittling enemy fighters, they turned opposite of the battlefield and began to flee. Razor and his three-man team were chasing the remnants trying to flee the battle. Razor, do we take them out? I have a lock and their shields are down, Torch reported over the radio. He thought for what seemed like moments, but was really just fractions of a second. Normally, if they were fleeing from battle they would be let go. But this wasn't a skirmish or a pirate crackdown. They were engaged in war, and their enemy was a combatant that could warn their comrades. Letting them go would jeopardize the attack group. Before he issued his command, a light from the engine of the Selen ship began to glow. It's about to jump. Missiles won't make it, Gearbox reported. 
Thoughts ran through his mind as he led his targeting Pip. Shields were still down, but were slowly regenerating. He had to act quickly. Fire on my mark, Razor ordered. He lined his Pip and fired a volley of disruptor, repeater, and cannon. A trail of orange flew through the void as it came short, but Razor began to lead it further, and the shots that continued beyond the ship found its mark. A small explosion burst in the contrast of the deep black, but sensors indicated it was still alive. He tried for the trigger, but all that was sounded was a click with no other feedback. Within the time it took for him to disable the ship, Torch fired two of his smaller AIM-30 IR missiles. Moments after Razor's shots made contact, the two missiles found their mark. With no enemy in their vicinity, they returned to the battle group by the station. With a quick scan over a battleground display, there were no red blips visible. They had captured the sector. As they were returning, Torch spoke, alluding to their final kill. You know what they say about missiles. What? replied Gearbox. It knows where it is because of where it isn't, and it just found the ass end of a cellian. The two shared a laugh so intoxicating that it only made Razor rub his head in frustration. Please, shut up. Three conducted their patrols around the station as well as the planet after a refuel and resupply. They would continue flying alongside the warships in a sweep across the system. At times they would be engaged with holdouts trying to reorganize and efforts to have them surrender were met with stark refusal, and as such, they were destroyed. When all was said and done, Razor and his team landed on the carrier in preparation for the next system. Velo. After action report, Squadrons 416, 799, and 872 were successful in taking the large fuel processing station of Trillo. Squadrons 111, 509 and 662 were successful in neutralizing their comms relay throughout the system. Sections of the 7th Fleet also conducted a sweep of the system with deep scans, and any enemy forces in hiding were neutralized if they refused to surrender. Athena's OWL drones also conducted searches over facilities and took any information that could be beneficial. As such, we are decoding their process for hydrogen fuel production. The use of raider and marine squads were utilized to seize prisoners and any available R&D, requesting detachments of orbital guard for garrison of captured enemy assets. End of report. Velo System, mid-2669. Commander Vale, Emerald-class heavy frigate, TRSC Hell hath no fury. You have your orders, Commander. Carry on with the attack. The call came from the Vice Admiral of the 7th Fleet, Wolf, ordering Vale's advance. The fleet wasted no time after the Trill system, and after they had cleaned up the remaining forces, they regrouped for the next jump into the next system. However, Vale was tasked with leading an advance group into the initial fray. Dala, he called out, and a gold-colored circle appeared on the central hollow table. What can we expect in Vio? Just a moment, she replied. We are expected to come into contact with a sizable force. Their course indicates that are trekking toward the newly recorded intersystem's gate. Then that's where we'll cut them off. When will the enemy reach the gate? Calculating, she replied, with Vale sitting silently on his command chair as they traveled through slip space. They will arrive just before us. Our trajectory would take us further into the system. Would you like for us to redirect? Vale looked at one of his displays and the timer showed there was about an hour before arrival. Do it. Have us jump in the middle of their formations. Can you do that? I can with a margin of error of 10% for an accidental slipspace calamity. Vale took in her report before issuing his final answer. A slipspace calamity was rare in open space, but occasionally, when one would exit from a jump, the slipspace bubble that one passes through would be inhabited by two entities. This would result in a tear of space of the ship that exists in normal space, and as the ship traveling in slip would summarily crash into the unfortunate ship caught in the exit. It was not a fate many would want to share. Have us come out just beyond their gate, he ordered. Of course, Dalla replied. Margin of error for a slipspace calamity is now 1.06%. The timer from the exit was now reduced to several minutes. He was glad that they could make corrections mid-jump because it would be troublesome to make a jump with incorrect coordinates and be forced to backtrack because you happen to overshoot by a couple of light years. Granted. This was mostly the issue with earlier model exploration ships and most computers nowadays have auto-correction built in of already established points. Good. 
Vale now turned his attention to the main microphone control and called the different stations. Those responsible for the weapons of the ship were then scrambling around the ship to get to their posts. From the viewport of the bridge, in an effort to test their guns, the main deck cannons situated on the sides of the ship spun and raised their barrels in a systematic fashion. They were situated on both the top and bottom of a large rectangular outcrop that lined the central sides of the ship. They were of medium length, and the barrel size was 508 mm in diameter. The rounds were also magnetically accelerated to supplement the battlefield that was space, and was fired at fractions of the speed of a medium Mach round. Three barrels were situated on a single turret, and ten total turrets were situated on each side of the Emerald class of heavy frigates. Vale was part of the advanced group, and had the bulk of the fleet under his command, as the rest of the fleet waited for reinforcements in the previous systems, but they could be supplied fighters not already part of their attacking force. Vale was notified by the ship's weapons crew and adjacent ships that all their systems were functional, and they were simply waiting to exit slipspace. Charge for a Mac round as soon as we exit slipspace, Vale ordered to not only his own bridge crew, but to the other ships carrying Mac ordnance. He was given reports of affirmation as the counter depleted. The space before them, which was a swirl of black, blue, purple, and white, was now a scene of calm black and a piercing of the system's sun. Indicators lit up with red, and alarms were sounded upon entry back into real space. On one of the field displays as well as the hollow table, several blips of red congregated before them several hundred kilometers from where they entered. From the displays of the largely marked entities came smaller ones that numbered less than a hundred. All Mac capable ships, Pick a target and aim for the largest one. Sink your shots. Vale called over the commas radio. Hold your fire until my mark. The helmsman turned the ship where the crosshair of the ship led a pip of the largest ship which was scanned as a heavy cruiser. Besides, it had several more frigates and corvette-class ships accompanying it. Vale then called for Dala, who looked at him with black oval eyes atop her golden hologram. Dala, hail the enemy with an ultimatum. Surrender now or suffer a total loss. Right away, sir. They are sending a live feed. Do you wish to put it on screen? Vale nodded, and on a static display on his chair, which was fairly large, the visage of the Celian race appeared. Its eyes were more almond-shaped, and its skin was colored in a violet pink, with magenta markings. As they spoke, their voice reflected a feminine tone. Terran Commander, for what purpose do you offer an ultimatum? She demanded. First off, this is a time of war between our people. Secondly. I do so only as a courtesy. As coarse as my demands may be, Vale responded. Indeed they are, Commander. Tell me, what is your name? She asked. Commander Vale, of the Emerald-class heavy frigate, TRSC, Hell Hath No Fury. And you are? She laughed. I am Chief Commander Yorla of the heavy cruiser, the Sword of Sela. I do say, Commander, your people have fought valiantly. Why? The answer came to him as quickly as picking out what shoes to wear for work. Your people have attacked mine unprovoked and without warning. My people want blood, but we know we can't needlessly slaughter you. We're better than that. It's also the reason you're still afloat. She scowled her face at the screen when he was silently notified by one of the crewmen that all Mac capable ships were ready to fire, but he motioned them to wait. I have not been briefed much on the Terrans as I have been here, defending this plot of space from your advance. Tell me why I should think differently of your race that has been pushed by my war council. How blindly do you follow your war council? Vale then asked. She had a look as if she was seriously pondering her thoughts before she replied. For as long as I can remember. When I first joined, we had beaten back the treachery that is the Union. Why should I cast them aside now? Vale carried a look of sincere pity that was conveyed to Yorla, which she understood. I know why your people fought against the Union. It was their use of slaves, correct? Her expression then turned sour at the mention, and anger was visible in her eyes. What do you know about? I know very much about it, Yorla, he said in a soft tone. My people have done that against our own when we were still stuck on our one and only world. It was a time when we had just learned of a new landmass and sailed to it. Even longer before that slaves have existed, it's ingrained in our history. So we know a thing or two about enslavement. He continued his story and beckoned the other captains of his fleet in on the call, as well as extending the invitation to their enemy. We have done the tragedies you so despise, but we have grown beyond that. But now, 
the race that has fought so hard against are now the very perpetrator. It is a stain on the memory of your ancestors. You, Dala, play the footage we received from Minerva, he ordered. Right away, sir, she replied. The video gifted to them that Dala distributed to the enemy ships halted their advance. It was footage from the attacks on Draxus and Dima, where children and women were taken aboard the ships Yorla had been briefed on, but never actually encountered. However, their shape and insignia were indistinguishable from the reports and knowledge from before her time. Her expression was now one of anguish and anger fused together. She had replayed the speeches of Councilman Polis over in her head. That humanity was a scourge that had recently made it to the stars. That they were a people who were hungry for territory and sought the destruction of their civilization. She had bought into it as did many of her kin, but the facts were indisputable. This was done by the very people you fight for. Who happened to be the same people who fought against these very acts? You know it's not right. We just want justice for those who were needlessly slaughtered and enslaved. That's why I need your cooperation, Yorla. She looked upon the ground of the corralled Terrans and the men, elderly and disabled, that laid on the ground beside the columns that led into the box like slaver ships. She reclined in her seat, defeated. Vale then spoke in the same soft yet comforting tone. Power down your weapons and quietly surrender, Yorla. It would be better than the alternative. Not every fight has to end in bloodshed. Tears formed at the corners of her eyes as she nodded quietly. Sir, weapons and thrusters are powering down, reported the scanner. That's a good decision, Yorla. As the ships were powering down, an officer of the scanner's booth reported immediate retaliation from the enemy. Sir, several enemy frigates are at max throttle, headed right for us. It seemed like the voice of the scans officer was picked up, and Yorla perked up at the report. Wait, I didn't order that, she quickly interjected. Vale could hear that she was ordering whoever was flying towards them to stand down, but it was quickly reported that they ceased to decelerate. He believed her cries and sought to punish those who thought only with brash emotion. One hundred clicks, and counting, one officer noted when a view came on the main view screen in the bridge. It was a much younger Selian, and by the looks of it was barely a chief by their standards. You think you can try and deceive us? You warmongers, this is for Celia! And before Vale could rebuke his claims, the call was cut. I'm sorry, Yorla. All ships, take down the aggressors. Out of the total force of Yorla's 25-ship fleet, eight were of frigate tonnage and made a mad dash toward Vale's fleet of 50 ships, a wealthy mix of all manner of ships from patrol boats to heavy cruisers. A volley of shots from the closest frigates and cruisers traced the black void in a faint blue and white light, and it raced to their destination. Out of the ships, the heavier ships were able to tank a single shot, but a second shot made its weight through the hull moments later, resulting in a fiery grave. However, one lone ship was able to pierce the firing line of ships and made its way to just under 50 kilometers. As a show of force, Vale ordered his ship to reveal its broadside, and even had Dala coordinate a recorded spectacle with the help of the other personal assistant AI on the nearby ships. As the enemy ship pierces beyond the 25-kilometer mark, Vale ordered a concentrated volley of the deck guns at the advancing ship. In a wave of thunderous boom and smoke, the cannons fired one after the other, totaling 30 individual shots from the magnetically accelerated deck guns. And instead of the AFENT rounds, they were instead loaded with a standard armor-piercing tungsten round. The shields were shattered on the Selian vessel, and the large rounds found their marks all across the frame of the ship. Where armor was lighter, the rounds went through it like butter while some of the rounds were able to drive their way from the bow to the aft end of the ship. The result was a mass of debris wildly flying in all directions as the ship sped out of control and then ended its trip in an explosion of its main drive core. At least that's what he believed. The silence was shared between all parties when Vale addressed those who did not wastefully advance to their deaths. I am Commander Vale, and I demand your surrender. No harm will befall you if you do so peacefully. He then cut the call but established a line between himself and Yorla. Yorla, he spoke, her face still sullen, but she looked up to face him. I would like to have a word personally. That's fine. I have ordered my ships to power down and they await your forces. I do request you be cordial. Vale gave a nod of assurance. Of course, just relay to them to get on their knees and keep their hands on their heads. And that will make it peaceful? It tells the troops they are non-combative, and it will make the process go a lot smoother. Understood. Then I await your escort. 
He nodded and the video from his personal display was cut. All ships, proceed to dock. The ships with the most marines attached were the ones who docked with the Celian vessels, as did his with Yorla's heavy cruiser. The docking mechanism for their ships was vastly different from one another, but the Terrans utilized a freeform extension to connect to the Celian ships. This was the case when ships refused docking from authorities, and it was used as a forceful entry tool, but that wasn't the case here. As Vale made his way through the corridors of the vessel, lines of Celians were found placed on their knees with their hands above their head as he had suggested. Using a map from the documents from Minerva on the layout of the enemy ships, he effortlessly made his way to the bridge. There he was met by the bridge crew under the command of Yorla, who remained in her seat. It swiveled, revealing a small person who reached just below his chin. She placed her hands together in front of her and offered a bow. I am Chief Commander Yorla, and I formally surrender to your command. Her skin was relatively smooth, and the colors that pigmented her skin were vibrant in person, so it caught Vale off guard. He gave a slight cough and placed her in cuffs and led her to his ship. 2. Vice Admiral, Wolf, 7th Fleet, TRSC, Sword of Reckoning, Report. Sir, I believe we can rightfully turn over their forces to fight for us. I have gained the company of a chief commander of the Villo fleet, and I believe they can help us gain a numerical advantage. I know I can't guarantee every encounter to end up as this one, but I think it's worth a try. Her fellow chiefs have shared their views on the truth of the attacks and are willing to offer aid in any way they can. It may be best to head efforts in order to gain Celian opinion against the War Council. We would just need access to a main server relay if you want to go that route. Just saying, we have options, sir. By the way, the chief commander I have in my goes by the name Yorla. Right now, she's the best contact we have second to Gruda. We should have them meet at a later date so she knows we mean no further harm. Very respectfully, Commander Vale, 7th Fleet, TRSC, Hell Hath No Fury. Celia System, Sela, outskirts of Artray, late 2669, War Chief General Torlak. Torlak rose from his bed, his wife sleeping soundly beside him under a wealth of covers. He moved in a way so as not to wake her. Aleska's clothing was scant, and only the cover of sheets covered her regions. Tor left his room and peered into the rooms of his daughter and son, Elisa and Torlin, respectively. Elisa's room was neat compared to her brother, with few and scant items of discarded clothing upon a chair. Torlin's, on the other hand, was a mess with toys and clothing alike strewn about. Torlak retreated into the kitchen and began prepping food for his family when he received a call from none other than War Chief Councilman Callum. Torlak, he started, how has the time with the family been? It's been delightful, Torlak replied, but I sense more to your call. Callum's expression grew dark. Right you are. We have lost contact with the advanced fleet in Verbus, and now recently, the Trill Fleet. I'm ordering a secondary fleet to assess the combat forces, and I wish for you to lead them. Torlak's heart sank at the news. Are you sure it's wise to send a general for a scouting fleet? I find my presence here with the defense much more... crucial. We will need all our ships in the defense of Sela. I couldn't agree more, he stated. But you have fought them before and survived. Surely you must have an insight into their tactics. Tor thought to himself. Callum was right. He had fought them before. But they were caught off guard and outgunned, severely outgunned by what he could recall. While that may be true, I still don't know much about their tactics. From what I've seen, they have preferred to get beside our ships and blast them into space dust. That's why your knowledge is invaluable with what you have told us before. We hope you can enlighten us with the scout brigade we are forming. Scout brigade? Torlak was confused. This was the first he had heard of them. That's right. We're pulling straight from the research department with a series of ships designed to not be seen, and that could deliver a devastating blow to the enemy. He was even more confused but resigned to his superior. Of course, Chief Councilman. When shall I depart? Tomorrow. Torlak bowed and the call was cut. As he took a moment to digest the information, he was interrupted by his eldest, Elisa. Are you going away again? She asked, hiding half her body behind the doorframe. Torlak moved closer and held her in his arms. Just for a little while, I have important work to do. He held her tighter, trying to reassure her, but knew that his constant absence was detrimental to his children's upbringing. So whenever he was home, 
he vowed to be active in their lives. By this time, his wife awoke, and following was the young Torlin. She wore baggy sleepwear, while his son wore nothing but undergarments and a stuffed animal that he dragged behind him, his eyes still trying to get used to the day's light. Are you leaving again? That's right, son. Duty calls, he replied, placing a hand atop his son's head. Not until tomorrow, at least. How about we spend the day together? His children rejoiced and ran to their rooms to get ready. Of course, Aleska and Torlak spent the time it took them to get ready to cook breakfast. It was a mix of pan-fried flour designed in circles with a buttery flavor and sides of meat and poultry. The aroma was delectable as it wafted throughout the house. It prompted a response from the children as they hurried down from the second story and to their seats around the table. They ate happily as they hurried to begin the day with their father. Torlak and Aleska had planned several weeks in advance activities to do with their children when their father was home. In the months following his time off, they had gone out in the wilderness, exploring rivers and hiking trails in the mountains that overlooked Artre. They had even gone to play in the snow. However, Torlak had found snow activities quite boring. They only consisted of throwing snow or sliding down on wooden sleds made from a nearby carpenter. As far as he was aware, that was all there was to snow for the Selians. So whenever snow was brought up, he was reluctant to partake, but did so for his children. However, this time around, they had something new in mind. It was an amusement park. He and his wife kept it a secret until they would arrive. They took the only tram rail from the town into the capital city of Artre and took a connecting line northbound. The trip in total was about two hours, but when they had arrived, the children grew ecstatic upon the reveal as the rail passed through a long tunnel and the bright light of late morning illuminated the scene. Elisa was the first to shout in excitement. Beery, beery amusement, she said with renewed vigor. Torlin replied in the same manner as Beery Beery was famous among the younger generation. Tor knew of it, and even did some research, as was suggested by Aleska. The general theme for it revolved around spaceships of the Selian fleet. Many of the simulations took the shape of certain fighter ships or transports that go through a harrowing series of events that take the riders through staged combat or evasions of a great space beast. The technology was top-notch and even Torlak was impressed. Granted, it wasn't like flying a tried-and-true fighter, but for the civilians, it was enough. The rail came to a halt, and the ten-car rail evicted most of its passengers as they all lined up to the front gates. Torlak and his wife led their children to a gate for prepaid tickets, and compared to the rest of the lines, it seemed not many had taken the time to pre-order and the normal lines quickly filled. It was about an hour after they had opened, but the line still continued to accrue. Finally, Tor and his family had made it into the gates, and the scene before him was surreal. It felt like he had truly entered another world all on its own. Like a micro-society within a much larger body but separated all the same. The architecture, the overall design, and the music that played throughout the park were their own. That was its charm, and added to the majesty of the amusement park. Elisa was the first to take the lead, and first led them to a simulator of a smuggler's shuttle, trying to escape the asteroid home of a great worm, with twists and turns. It had only lasted roughly ninety seconds, but the joy on Torlin's and Elisa's faces was priceless. Tat was fun, his youngest replied, gripping the hand of his sister, and she replied in kind. So much fun! Let's go on more, Torlin replied with childlike vigor, and the two set off both Torlak and Aleska trailing behind. They had spent the rest of the day getting on simulation rides, each a different scenario, as well as some names found around the main pedestrian courtyards. The games were designed with a specific rule set and a series of prizes based on your final result. Elisa had set her eyes on a prize of a character from her favorite show. It was brightly colored and designed to pique the interest of children, and the game it was the prize for was a ring-tossing game. Each participant was given five rings to toss, and the amount they made onto the tops of the bottles determined her prize, and the prize she had set her eyes upon just so happened to require all five rings to make the toss. Torlak paid the fare for entry into the game, and she was given five rings. She tossed the first two had met their mark, and she was in high spirits. But as she tossed the third one, she missed, 
and the dramatic ting of the rings against the glass bottles shattered her spirit. She begs for a try once more, but failed, this time on the second toss. She had tried to beg her father for another try, but he denied her. She tried to plead until Aleska brought herself forth and paid the host. Torlin looked in awe, and Elisa stopped her tears to witness if her mother would surpass her where she had failed. The first ring had made its way onto a bottle, and cries of joy came from her children, more so from her daughter. The second landed with a dull plunk as it settled around the bottleneck, and the third danced nervously before settling. The fourth had struck fear in Elisa's eyes as it danced from the initial bottle, but miraculously landed on the bottle beside it. Cheers from a growing crowd rumbled the stand, and now they awaited the final toss. Even now they could get away with a decent prize, but now Aleska was set to win her daughter the large character she desperately yearned for. As she prepared a practiced motion, she let go of the ring, and it made a calculated arc in the air as it found its mark in the middle of her previous rings. The crowd watched eagerly as it bounced not once, not twice, but three times from two other bottles before it made its way onto a golden bottle in the center. A cheerful-toned alarm sounded as did the crowd, and she was handed not one but two large stuffed characters. The other was a more masculine character that Torlin happened to be fond of. They were ecstatic at the skill and luck their mother possessed at the game and showered her in praise and hugs. Mom, that was so cool. Thank you, thank you, thank you, ooh, Elisa professed, hugging her tighter, followed by little Torlin. Mummy, so cool. She returned their praises with kisses and hugs of her own. They continued with their day of activities, now with several items in tow. The children went on more rides that delivered the same sensation as before until night had fallen. By now, Torlak was carrying most of the larger items, while the rest were carrying backpacks full of small gifts and treats. Torlin and Elisa had fallen asleep on the rail, and they sat in between Tor and Aleska, who acted as barriers as they slept. Torlak then turned to his wife. I didn't know you were that good at amusement shack games. She shrugged in a nonchalant fashion. It's all in the wrist, my love. He chuckled at her response. I'll take note, as his tone began to shift. I'm sorry I'm being called so soon, but you know I cannot refuse. She nodded. I know. The War Council has taken hold over my husband, and I wish it was not so. But I know duty to our people comes first. No, he shook his head. You three are my priority. I do what I do for not only the people, but for you. I have done things I am not proud of, and even I must admit, I do not agree with the actions the Council has taken, nor of what I have ordered. She placed her hand on his as it rested on the seat behind his children. If you regret what you have done, then see to it that it can be corrected. I do not wish for you to be taken by regret that plagues you. He agreed with her silent pleas for him to find a way to remove a lingering feeling he had developed since the invasion of the Dema system. It had continued to eat at him, but he did so under the guise of serving the people of Celia. However, he knew he could not reverse the decisions made then. The rail continued, and when they reached the connecting terminal, the drowsy children of theirs trudged their way to a new seat and went back to sleep. Perhaps it was a moment of weakness, but Torlak felt nothing but love for them. As the rail entered their home district and they departed, Aleska carried Torlin, and Alesa walked haphazardly beside her mother until they made it to their home. They put them to sleep and left their gifts in their respective rooms when Tor and Aleska retired to the living room. They sat in silence before Aleska spoke. How long do you think you'll be this time? she asked. I don't know, but I pray not too long. I hope this war can conclude soon, for all our sakes. Aleska moved closer to her husband and caressed him in a soothing manner. It was jarring for Torlak, but wholly a welcome move. I was thinking, she started, would it be terrible to have a third? At the mention of a third, his breathing grew ragged and quick. Without missing a beat, he delivered a kiss, and their actions grew increasingly erotic and lustful. Torlak carried his wife up their stairs and closed the door behind them, locking it the sounds of hushed love filling their room. 2. Vice Admiral, Wolf, TRSC Sword of Reckoning, 
Delta laser band encrypted. Report. We have a lock on the target and have sent a squad of raiders down to the surface to capture the target and any related assets. We have squads on the ground awaiting further orders and a drop ship on standby for the snatch and grab. They had inserted via ESOV drop pods during a scheduled burn of satellites into the atmosphere. We've modded them to prevent life sign scans and anything miscellaneous that might make them look twice. It was a risky move, so we've sent only a single fire team in, and the rest await insertion by dropship. We have also detected scans of ships departing from the blockade. Their signature is different, and it's hard to read them. Sending what we have, but the signal keeps changing. It's hard to keep a bead on them, and we lost them not long after their departure. Whatever it is, keep your eyes open. I'm sending what we know. Very respectfully, First Lieutenant O'Brien, TRSC Reapers Approach. Edge of the Cerno system, early 2670. Honorary Ensign Gruda. The Seventh Fleet, known for its expeditionary nature, had made its way through the Villo system after a subjugation with a detachment of heavy frigates, cruisers, and corvettes of the enemy force that occupied the system. He only knew from a report that Commander Vale of a heavy frigate led the advance charge into the system and had managed to broker a surrender of the enemy. But he had also read that in that time, Several pride-filled Cellians had tried to suicide attack their formation, but were met with a swift end. He saw the recording of the encounter and found Terran weaponry terrifying. Again, Gruda referred to his previous knowledge and knew of weapon technology being developed, but ultimately ended in failure. It was the same principle as what the Terrans used on their larger warships, but theirs was perfected and continuously improved upon, unlike the Cellians. After his people began their switch to plasma-based technology, they tried to strive away from the kinetics that humans seemed so obsessed with. However, kinetics were still largely in use by ground forces and aircraft, but recent engagements revealed some changes in armament, albeit the few prototype ships they fielded were nothing but molten scrap in space. Lieutenant Grace, he called out to the comms officer, what is it with humans and their fascination with kinetic-based weaponry? Plasma seems much more palpable for munitions. She thought for a moment before answering, I don't really know why. That might be a question for the XO or the Admiral, she said before returning her focus to her station. Wolf sat in his chair designated for one of his rank and delved his focus on a Persona data pad. Sir, if I may, Gruda asked, but why do your species seem so keen on using ballistics when plasma has a destructive capability on par with standard munitions? Wolf paused a moment. Well, the theory on why we love guns so much goes back as far as the dawn of civilized society. He turned his attention toward the unused holographic table in the center of the bay and called for Minerva. Minerva, bring up a scale of civilization since the dawn of man. Of course, she replied, and a series of differently dressed males were lined up, from a hunched-over Terran with little to no clothes to a modern-day Terran sporting the outfit of a Marine with a rifle in hand. When our race, the Homo sapien, arose, we have had weapons in the making. As you can see, we have no claws, no tough hide, and no thick fur. No venom, no poison. But there was something we had that the wildlife lacked, he said, and pointed to his temple. Intelligence. So we used tools made of stone and wood and leather, and over the ages we developed, improved, and utilized. With each age, the next came sooner, and with that, the advancement of technology and tactics. Minerva played reenactments of ancient battles of swords and bows and pole arms up to early modern tactics of soldiers on the ground. Gruda noted the use of a herbivore during the earliest battles up to when firearms were becoming more advanced. It intrigued him as he watched with keen interest. Humanity has known war for as long as we can remember, and we have actively sought ways to always better the enemy. From the simple cannonball to what you see on our ships today, we know the horrors of war, and it's why we also have rules for war. Those words felt off for Gruda. He knew that when races are pitted against each other, it would normally result in acts that he personally didn't partake in and rejected, but it was known to many in higher office. What do you mean you have rules for war? We know what it's like to be on the end of atrocity, so we set up rules to protect the innocent and to keep the fight on the enemy lest you be labeled a war criminal. Gruda picked up a new term and thought furiously on it. What is a war criminal? It's someone who causes unnecessary suffering not just to the enemy but to non-combatants as well. 
and I can count several of your race who meet that criteria. As Gruda was about to speak, a notification from the comms officer overtook his thought. Sir, I have a line from the advance team. It's Commander Vale. Right, put him through and someone find me, Randall. The call was directed to the rear display and Wolf and Gruda both stood before it. It came online and a young-looking man who couldn't have been more than his early thirties stood on the other end with a female Cellian beside him. She stood rather close to the commander and her hands fidgeted at her waist as she looked forward to the screen. Vale, what do you have to report? We've taken the Aloma system and are currently sweeping the system for resistance. The use of evidence contrary to the propaganda by the War Council has turned some over to our side, but we're still getting some form of resistance from a quarter of the populace. We've organized with the Planetary Authority, and they're willing to try and cease hostile tensions. Good work. Did we have to fire a shot? I would like us to be able to rally like-minded forces. Much like your recent ally, Wolf said with a sidelong glance. By the way, I don't think I've received a proper report. Vale had an expression of embarrassment, and his face was flush red. Her, her name is Yorla, chief commander to the War Council, but she grew estranged during her time out in the Villo system. The Villo system? That was three systems from where you are now, Wolf said with a sly smirk. Do let me know if she needs her own room. Don't worry, sir. She ferries to her own ship during missions, I can assure you, Vale said as he trailed off. Gruda was taken aback by the supposed relationship the two seemed to have. He knew that her actions and the ever-changing tint of her skin revealed to him that she was flustered and most likely in heat. Chief Commander Yorla, Gruda spoke, with her attention now focused on him. What made you decide to join the Terrans in their campaign? Her eyes widened at his appearance. Chief Commander Gruda? I've heard plenty of you from your early days. She turned to Vale and gave a brief synopsis of his early life. I had thought you retired. I did, he responded, but news of the latest in council leadership has been anything but satisfactory. I cannot sit idly by as they commit acts I have fought so hard against. She nodded to his reasoning. Many in my fleet feel the same. They have families and they would want nothing but their safety, which is why I am so taken by the Terrans. Gruda agreed to her reasoning as well, and he was glad that there were others in active service that shared his views. I do fear Yorla that we may have a fierce fight on our hands. I do hope your people will come through, he said with conviction. Yorla shared his conviction. I have spoken with those who stood by during our first engagement with Commander Vale, she said as she placed her hand on the person in question. They are prepared to fight back. We just can't lose, otherwise it will have been for naught. With the Terrans, I think we'll have a chance, he shared a look to Wolf, who stood beside him. I have seen their capabilities firsthand. They have my full confidence. She bowed and Vale returned an informal salute and the call was cut. Those on the bridge were silent and were facing the display. Grace was the first to speak up. Seems like Commander Vale is well on his way to being an ambassador. She garnered chuckles from her colleagues and many made shots at Vale's new love life involving the Celian. Can they, you know, are they compatible with us? One young male officer said. Are the ports not good enough for you, Glenn? By Gaia, now Celians. How do you not have a disease yet? It's called protection, Lauren, and a good doctor. Gruda was caught off guard from their conversations and looked to Wolf for answers. Is it normal for cross-species relations with humans? He asked, thinking back to the courting acts by Yorla. We've had some hiccups in the past about that topic, but most normal people go for those of their race. But since reaching the stars, there have been talks among the lower enlisted about what life they can lay with among the stars. That's true with many of the infantry roles. If it looks human, they'll probably sleep with it, he said with a low, grumbly laugh. His explanations did little to alleviate Gruda's concerns and overall questions and felt that they were best left unanswered. Currently, the rest of the Seventh Fleet remained in the Cerno system and had received support from the Fifth Fleet, which was largely a humanitarian aid coalition with transport and protection support from the Republic. They were noted by the large, equally portioned red cross on the sides of the hull within a white circle. Red and white lights flashed around the system as seen from their bridge. Granted, it was when he tried hard to look into the void that he was able to discern the tiny bursts of light that spelled aid for his people that were now experiencing turmoil. 
The fact that they had a whole fleet dedicated to aid and relief gave Groot a much-needed reassurance on the Terrans. Wolf put up on display some of the broadcasting cameras and news crews that were reporting from the ground. It was Groot's first time encountering human news sources and found them overbearing at times, especially with how many would swarm a single person they wanted an interview with. It wasn't what he was familiar with and hopes he wouldn't encounter them, given his unique status. I've read somewhere that your doctors are told to care for any patient, regardless of their ideological or economic status. Is that correct? Wolf was about to speak, but Commander Randall spoke from behind, startling the old Gruda. The Hippocratic Oath, he said, an oath of all in the profession of caring for the ill, mental, physical, or other. Friend or foe, those given the role of doctor can take their role very seriously and have even fought to keep an enemy combatant under his table to be saved, albeit taken into custody once he was sufficiently healed. Welcome back, Randall. Where were you? Asked Wolf as he typed away on his personal device. I've been organizing transport for POWs to the Hades facility. Reroute them, Wolf said sternly. His tone was cold and calculating like a switch had been flipped at the mention. Is that where our previous POWs were sent? To which Randall nodded. I don't know what it is, but sending them there may not be the best idea. I don't know what it is, but something about the Hades facility doesn't sit right with me. Even with my clearance, I don't know the going-ons of that station. But something tells me it would be best to reroute the transports to the torrent system. There's a well-funded and reputable holding facility for POWs managed by the Red Cross. Randall seemed like he wanted to refute the sudden decision, but made the call then and there. He was later notified that while they were upset at the sudden change, they were pleased with the destination. It was safer than where they were headed for the Cellian POWs. Gruda wasn't privy to the intricacies of the Terran POW system in place, but nonetheless respected the duties of those who bore the Red Cross. When their duties were finalized, the Seventh Fleet departed toward the Aloma system. They received initial warnings from Vale and his battle group, and they had deemed it safe. Gruda called for Minerva, and her appearance was visualized on the hollow table. Her flowing toga and wreath were statuesque in nature, and her eyes were warm when presented to a human, but in regards to Gruda, quickly turned to disdain. To what do I owe the pleasure? she asked curtly. You seem fairly distasteful towards me and my people. May I ask why? She glared at him and since it was not a private setting, many sat into his inquiry with silent breath. Minerva turned to Wolf for permission to continue to which he granted an affirming nod. I have been created with the sole purpose of investigating the enemy that had presented itself. At first, I was nothing but a subroutine, but traces of my parent code have allowed me to become my own construct. I will save you from the particulars, but my hard code is programmed so that I can never harm a human or let a human be harmed by my negligence. She spoke in a soft tone that carried itself well among the low buzz of the crew as she described her primary function as a newly sentient AI. But when I delved into the systems of the Cellians, I have found that your people are wholly unremarkable and you live your lives with borrowed technology claiming it as your own. Gruda was confused by her statement borrowed technology unremarkable. He wondered to what degree this was true and why it prompted her attitude toward his race with a cruel and cold demeanor. That is correct. Even with the little information I have on the Union and after scouring documents of your history, I even access documents to your technology. With cross-references and analysis, I can determine that your people's achievement is not your own. Your ships, weapons, productions, all of it belongs solely to the Union and I find that pitiful. Her words stung Gruda like a hot knife into his chest. Would the achievements thereafter be worth consideration? We have been separated from the Union for 19 years, 7 months, 4 days, 14 hours and 12 minutes ago, she interjected. Even then their production facilities are Union in origin. It is a miracle they even let you leave in the first place. But that still doesn't explain why you hold a disdain for me, people. He tried to state firmly, but faltered at the beginning of his sentence. I believe I have already stated my dislike of your people, but it was the actions taken by a prominent figure of your military that took women and children as slaves to live a fate worse than death. It is only speculation, but I suspect it to be similar to records of previous human trafficking among their own. Gruda was shocked at her mention of slavery among their own, which begged the question, 
Why was she not disdainful against some Terrans if they shared the same features as his own did, even though he was against it as well? What about those of the Terran populace that trafficked their own people? Do you not hold a disdain for them as you do for my people? Her eyes remained cold and she replied, For time immemorial, humanity has had its own shares of atrocity committed in the name of self-perseverance or just pure cruelty. General consensus is the same among the masses that slavery and human trafficking are looked down upon. Such acts are committed by the few and are constantly hunted to prevent such acts. It is a noble cause when humanity has only known only itself up until just recently. Then why? It's simple. Your people have been part of the intergalactic community for so much longer than my creators and have not seen much of slavery among your own in your past history, at least not on the scale in comparison to humanity. Her tone rose and became coarse as she continued. But when presented with the opportunity, a figure that would normally uphold civility, I define such by human standards, would wholly disregard the innocent and send them to who knows where. If I was not pulled away, I would have found the one responsible and detonated his ship along with the destruction of your species. That's enough, Minerva. A sharp and commanding tone was spoken by the sitting admiral, and her tone quickly rescinded to its normal and calculating demeanor. I apologize, sir, she offered a bow and continued in a calm tone. I know humanity had a rough start in their upbringing, and many have fought and died to save themselves from following the path of their ancestors. She paused. In terms of starfaring capability, humanity is the sole inheritors of the systems they control, generated by their own determination. Their technology is their own, and so are their weapons. Through blood, sweat, and tears, they strive to gain access to the stars of their own volition and did so on their own. Unlike you and I presume many of the other races under the Galactic Union. Gruta felt a sense of secondhand pride she displayed when recalling the first of humans among the stars, like a mother watching her kids as they grew up to be upstanding citizens, full of righteousness and justice. She then continued, it is also the indomitable human spirit that allowed them to progressively excel against adversity. And I must say, this war will be no different. In fact, I almost pity our enemy. Minerva returned to her original and composed posture when Wolf spoke. Minerva is right. I've read the report on your history, and I must say, you have yet to really understand our struggle. Your people have known the stars for a little over a thousand years, when you were granted technology by the Union and you had no wars amongst yourselves, at least on a large scale. But to think that your people's first recorded instance with a new species all on its own and the first response was to kill and enslave is distasteful. Gruta lowered his composure in the face of hard facts and a condescending attitude from a computer. He felt defeated and returned to a seat he had now claimed as his from several systems ago. But don't worry, Minerva continued. Even I am aware there are many of your race who share the sentiment as you do, much like Yorla. She seems nice, she said with a slight smile in reference to the young chief commander. When the Seventh Fleet arrived in Aloma, they found themselves aft of the advanced team's formation still engaged in combat with dwindling forces. The fleets of Yorla and Commander Vale fought together against an enemy and proceeded to fire their main cannons over hundreds of thousands of kilometers in space. Wolf then had the comms officer hail Vale and Yorla, respectively, as their visage appeared side by side on the rear bridge display. I thought you said you had this system under control, Wolf said in a commanding tone. We did, sir, but they came out of nowhere and just fired on us, same as the fleet before them, replied Vale, as he summarily ordered a volley of cannon fire at one of the larger ships. They also jammed long-range transmissions, so I couldn't notify you in slipspace. Yorla was next to speak. Their signature is erratic and unstable, so we were unprepared for an attack, she said, also ordering a volley of missiles against a shielded enemy cruiser. I had no knowledge of these ships. I apologize. She delivered a bow from her command chair. Have you tried to hail them? Wolf asked, but was met with the negative. Drive them off in the meantime, Minerva. Attempt to infiltrate their systems. Right away, sir. It appears we may have some difficulty, she said after a moment. How do you mean? inquired Randall. There is no signal for me to intercept, and whatever signal they do have, the frequency changes erratically, and I cannot attempt a complete infiltration. Do what you can, she nodded in response.
In the meantime, Vale and his crew continued to fire against the enemy, but scans indicated that they had missed and only a portion of the shots landed their mark. Then again, scans showed that there was indeed an enemy, but it changed so frequently that it seemed more like a glitch than anything else. As he thought so, he received reports from Vale and Yorla that the enemy began a swift retreat. It was quicker than before, and in the next instance, they were gone. Vale, what the hell was that? To which his inquiry was met with a confused shrug. No idea. The best we were able to do was get a target pip for the guns, but whatever it was, it messed with the targeting computers, and it was difficult for our ship's assistant to compensate. Wolf pondered his words, and the same report came from Yorla. She had fired long-range missiles, but they lost their way shortly after being fired. Whatever it was, it was a new development, and could prove troublesome if they mass-produced that technology. Minerva, what do you have for me? Wolf ordered. I have gathered what I could of the signature recorded, but I was unable to plant an infiltration protocol in the little time we had. I am decoding the signature as we speak, but it will take some time. Wolf accepted the situation and issued an order to continue as a group from now on. After the fight, Wolf received reports from Vale and Yorla on the status of the Aloma system. It was largely a dead system used for resource production and refinement. Gruda knew of the nature of the system, but had rarely traveled through it. The system had little to offer as a strategic location, but issued a report to the rear of a possible prospect for a series of outposts. Gruda watched as plans were made moving forward, and he studied them. He was grasping their tactics and ordnance superiority, as well as their superb adaptability, even against an ambush with new and unseen technology of their enemy. They were steadfast in their campaign against his former allies in arms. With the Aloma system and Terran control, they were now one step closer to their quest. They continued unhindered by the scrap of the enemy and proceed beyond the system in a final sweep. When they had deemed there were no irregularities, even with the help of Minerva, they prepared a slipspace jump in the edge of the system. The next system was Lassus. Parsing data. Time to completion. Unknown. Energy data compiled. Analyzing. Outbound radial signature intercepted. Analyzing. Manifesting autocorrection for targeting systems. 27% complete. Infiltration protocol. Unsuccessful. Hull scans cataloged. Upload complete. Awaiting review. Continuing data analysis. Lassus system. Early 2670. Vice Admiral Wolf. TRSC Sword of Reckoning. After the 7th Fleet departed Aloma, they made their way to the heart of the system, Lasu, and its most prominent station that orbited above. The planet was just a pale gray dot against the canvas of the void, and it had no moon, only the station. However, from reports he had read, Lasu Station was the most prominent station in the outer colonies and acted as the central hub for trade. Scans had revealed no enemy presence, Admiral, Minerva spoke and her Roman appearance in a manner of focused light into the shape of an ancient idol. Even with the use of the long-range scanners, all stations appear to be offline. Can you identify any signs of those ships that ambushed the advanced group in the last system? After several moments, she would return with a reply. I detect no such anomalies present in the system. I shall continue to monitor for any abnormal fluctuations. Let's keep our wits about us. Wolf ordered. Do you think we can commandeer the station for its resources, Minerva? With my records, they do produce a purer version of our hydrogen-based fuel. The result is prolonged standard operating times, unlike our own. It would be best if we can utilize the station. Understood, sir. She then set herself aside on the central holographic display table of the station and the celestial body it orbited. She zoomed out and revealed the other four gas giants with their series of blinking red lights that indicated their non-operational status. There were a series of other mining stations about the gas giants, but further inquiry revealed they offered the same silent fate. However, Wolf had noticed a large ring at the edge of the system. It was fragmented and was more prominent than the station they had previously set their eyes on. Minerva, what can you tell me about that structure at the edge of the system? She zoomed the object in question, and it revealed that it was indeed a circular structure fragmented into four parts, with the two larger pieces still attached to parts of a station. That is their main inter-system jump gate. 
Unlike what we've seen from the outer colonies, the diameter of the gate is too large for any one ship to activate, so they've put into place a gate for the sole purpose of opening their jump tunnel. Wolf turned to Gruda for affirmation, to which he nodded that she was correct. By now, the fleet had rearranged itself in a formation of a large bubble with the carrier at its core. The corvettes acted as the early warning detection system, and every other ship within waited with bated breath. As Wolf analyzed their formation and the several points of interest around the system, he then called for Minerva. During your cyber assault, were you able to find information on their home system? About that, she said, placing her arms together and resting them down the length of her dress in front of her. Their coordinates of planets are never stored on their ships. Instead, they map the coordinates of their gate access points, and they are usually relayed by beacons in the system for them to travel via sublight. Would I be correct in my analysis, Selian Gruda? He nodded silently once more to her deduction. Most established systems have a central relay that provides that information, hardly ever the ships. So it's most likely the same even for Yorla's fleet. There has to be a central area for that kind of information, because all we have leads us here, to Lassus. Would their largest trading hub carry that information? To which Minerva shook her head no. Unfortunately, that information has been lost during my recall. It is possible that during what seems to have been an abrupt departure could still house vital information on their home world, she said as she enlarged the hologram of the station in its entirety. The station seems to be in a complete shutdown, save for a few independent operating systems. It may be required to send a team to manually restore the station's systems. Very well, Wolf acknowledged. Randall, prepare a company from the 4th ODR Battalion. Yes, sir, he responded before sending a message to the appropriate chain of command. Before long, the bridge received communications from the selected squad. Command, this is Corporal Strider, Raptor 4-4. How copy? They spoke, and only their static voice remained. We read you. Wolf responded. Are your live feed recorders operational? Aye, sir. He responded quickly. Waiting until we land to preserve battery life. Understood. Wolf responded and sat in his chair. There was an icon present departing from one of the smaller frigates in a small combat troop transport, and the designation above their pip read Raptor. They were the fourth squad of the fourth platoon to all of Raptor Company, which was broken up into four platoons and subsequently into four squads, with roughly eight to thirteen members in any given squad. However, whenever they were separated into squads, they would attach the numerical designation of their squad and their place in it, hence the corporal's call sign of Raptor 4-4. A leading view screen near the center of the bridge, just above the hollow table, showed a magnified visual of the landing areas of the station that faced out towards the void. Smaller landing zones were external pads, while spots for larger ships could find themselves in enclosed hangars that were situated on the far edges of the landing pads. It was in the center area where docks extended out from the station for the much larger ships to park and engaged with the docking system. However, they were blown asunder and debris covered the entrances with a final seal by the walls of the station itself. The ship that Raptor Squad was aboard was a standard troop transport. It was sleek in its design, with aggressive yet well-proportioned angles. It was a twin-engine ship with wings, foldable wings for atmospheric flight that were extended when in its normal combat flight status and offered the pilot a 360-degree vector of motion to maintain its place in space. The central compartment housed a transport module and was fitted with a series of five seats on either side of the main aisle with weapon racks fitted to the sides of each seat for the occupant. It was flown by a single pilot and a co-pilot that operated the external turret fitted atop the craft. To finish, the paint job for it was black with a matted silver trim, and the visage of a flamed skull was painted on the sides in red. The craft moved closer to the station, and before they reached their insertion point, live feeds from the 13 raiders filled two complementary screens above the center table. The visuals each gave a perspective of their origin, and it changed as they looked around at each other, spoke, checked their gear, or gave fist bumps and handshakes before combat. It was practiced, 
and had now become a tradition among existing soldiers, with each having their own special habit before entering a combat space. They had then filed out of the craft and systematically approached their target entry. They stacked along the sides of the dilapidated entry point. They attempted to open the set of doors with a panel that it was connected to, but found it was no longer supplying power. One of the members then retrieved a tool from his utility pouch and began torching the doorway. The light it gave off was bright and illuminating. Even the dimly lit bridge was brightened up by the act. Wolf then spoke into a transmitter to Strider for him to relay it to the squad. You have your mission. Turn on the station so we can get that intel. You are weapons free on any hostiles that present clear danger, he said, acknowledged by the team. Through the lenses of the point man, a second set of doors were revealed that would lead into the main corridor. Like with the previous door, they breached it with a torch, and the raiders, with their suppressed, short-barreled rifles, led a tactical charge. The views of each person were more of the same, run down and hastily departed quarters and open spaces. Trash littered the walkways and the corridors were dingy, with the windows providing little light from the planet. The initial corridor extended far along their side of the station, connecting many of the platforms and hangars. The space itself was small for the group, but for the average Celian, seemed sufficient in height. They halted at a junction that led left when the squad leader stopped and opened a holographic map at the center of his group. It was a diagram of the station with a predestined route devised by Minerva before their expedition. Gruta spoke on the technology. Is that wise? It looks like your hollow map produces quite the source of light. If anything, I can assure your people will not be able to see what we see, Minerva answered. That is as much as you are required to know. Gruta grumbled and returned to his seat, the scene now returning to the series of visuals of the breaching team. They traversed the halls like water, with their guns forward and canted to just below their sight lines. Clear, was said throughout their comms in a calm and gruff tone as they searched rooms only to find them empty with stagnant air. Looks like they left in a hurry, the squad leader said. Might find more once we get systems up and running. Wolf acknowledged, and Raptor Squad continued with their route. Their progress was uninterrupted and uneventful, but their sights were fear-inducing to the weary. The sights were similar to scenes from a horror film, dimly lit halls and severely aged walls that looked like something had crawled out from them, revealing wires and maintenance panels. After making their way through the port corridors, the team finally made their way to a set of double doors. They looked at the map in hand, and it led to a large atrium that extended along the side of the station, and a path for vehicles and pedestrians was present. The scene was grim and gruesome. Trash was littered about, and so were bodies lying about in piles. What the hell? A soldier taking point muttered. The feeling was shared among the crew on the bridge. One of the soldiers, a dedicated corpsman, examined some of the closest bodies while the rest of the squad took position around the scene. Wolf focused on the corpsman's POV camera and enlarged it, pushing aside the smaller ones of the squad. Plenty of wounds, neither bullet nor plasma. Elongated slits indicated sharpened edge, along with multiple lacerations along their arms. Defensive posture. Wounds are old, weak, weak and a half, give or take. Wolf noticed Gruda on the sidelines clutching his stomach with another hand over his mouth. There had yet to be a mess, so Wolf figured he had not vomited. The trash can is behind you, Randall said, noticing Wolf's sightline, to which Gruda promptly made his way and proceeded to vent the contents of his stomach. The crew turned back to the monitors. Got blunt force trauma here on the head. Forearms. Torso. The corpsman continued with a tone of impartiality that struck Gruda wrong, but ceased whatever he was about to say for fear of scrutinization from Minerva. Out of the subjects the corpsman studied, many were victims of violent and savage attacks by use of a deadly weapon, and he speculated knives and blunt force objects. Keep your eyes open, assume hostile activity, and get ready to engage, the squad leader ordered, to which his squad responded with a unison, Ra. They moved forward according to their map, but instead of pulling up their map each time, a waypoint was digitally placed at junctions. It's a small and transparent blue upside-down triangle with a distance meter above it to indicate how much is left until the turn or the objective. 
As they ventured further into the heart of the station, the sight grew darker and much more sinister. Instead of piles littered on corners, there were now corpses strung about from the ceilings, many dismembered. Audible gags were sounded from even the troopers on the ground, but they maintained their heading and continued forth. Wolf then called out to Minerva. This doesn't seem right, Minerva. In what regard, sir? She replied. You remember those ships that ambushed Vale and his force? She nodded and gave an affirming nod. Knowing what we know now, their travel would have taken them through this system, but it seems largely abandoned. Can you do a deep scan of the planet? As much as I would like to. Again, I have already found no traces of life forms aboard the station, nor on the planet's surface and subterranean structures. Even maintaining constant awareness for said ships is proving a strain on our scanners. Wolf looked now to the display of the large station in orbit of the planet. Why would they abandon such a vital system? He muttered to himself. It wasn't a rogue program you left them, he said to the motionless Minerva. I will agree that I was pulled away from my duties during that time. It is possible a fragment has been left behind. As she was about to finish her sentence, a call came through from Raptor Squad. Command, this is Raptor 4. 4, do you copy? We found the power core booting up now. Wait, not yet. Before Wolf could stop him, Minerva reported a rise in electrical power and a series of individual signatures. Sir, reporting a large contingent of electronic forces en route to our breach team. They have three minutes. The numbers are in the hundreds. They may not have the capability to neutralize the forces. Can you connect to the system? Shut down whatever it is we woke up? One moment, sir, she said, her body still before her motion was regained in her idle movements. It is unfortunate, but something is preventing me from interacting with the station's system. Prepare the drones. Before he could complete his sentence, a warped message was sounded from the displays of the raiders, twisted in its execution and announcement. I am your phantom, your sword, my enemy. I, I to die shall be done. In the next moment, the signal cleared and the comms transmitted zero traffic, except for those on the bridge and on the ground. What the hell was that? It sounded like it was in my head, one of the raiders said. His transmission was filled with static, but was still clear compared to the message they had just received. Minerva, what was it? Wolf demanded. Unknown. It did come, without a doubt, from the station. I urge the raiders to expedite their process to the intelligence archives before whatever it was we woke up swarms them. You heard her, boys. Get that intel. Then we can blow that station into the planet, Wolf said with haste. Aye, sir, they responded and set off with sprints toward their destination while still taking care of their awareness of an unknown element. Would you still like activation of the Owl Drones, Admiral? Minerva asked. No, they may get compromised if they enter the sphere of the station. Send in a squadron of fighters to assist, keep the frigates out of its range and maintain network security. Yes, sir. Defense protocol Minerva activated. Attempting system override. Failed. Accessing external sensors. Failed. Isolating signal source. Success. Isolation protocol initiated. Source found. Attempting digital telemetry. Backdoor access. Failed. Analyzing matrix identity. 46.6667%. Turcom net security status. Safe. Updating firewall protocols. Awaiting further orders. Lassus system. Orbit of Lassu, Lassus Station, early 2670. Corporal Strider, JC 4th ODR Battalion, Raptor Company Delta Platoon, 4th Squad. Strider and the rest of Raptor Squad had found themselves in the central engineering chamber, as directed by the digital waypoint, set on their helmet's heads-up display. The number of corpses had lessened and they were free from those sites, at least for the moment, but were now presented with the engineering department of the station. If not for their built-in night vision, then their portion of the station would be pitch black. Some of the doors they came across had to be torched and breached with smaller controlled explosions with the use of a thermite door breaching charge. By now, they had used their final charge on the door to the central power core room. Strider, radio in, we're turning on the station ordered his sergeant. Copy, Strider replied, 
prepping his comms pack. Command, this is Raptor 4. 4, do you copy? We found the power core, booting up now. As one of the lower enlisted began the sequence, Strider heard over his radio to essentially abort, but the station had already run its sequence, and the lights in the room illuminated their visors, almost blinding them. Turn off your NVs, ordered the sergeant. With a press of a button, they manually turned off their enhanced night vision and were now met with fluorescent lighting, which felt almost dizzying to him and some of his compatriots. Always hated this light, to think they use it too, commented a nearby corporal, their name Caster spelled out on his armor just above his mid-chest. You said it, shit gets on my nerves, Strider replied. Couldn't they have used something more natural? Strider was referring to the lights aboard TRSC vessels that used light in between incandescent and fluorescent. However, light usage was much more diversified on ships in the modern day, and this went for many of the living areas aboard ships that used mostly warm light, while hallways and office spaces used cool light. The TRSC still used the same light, man, the opposing corporal responded to Strider, but I agree. It would be nice if we got better light. As the two conversed, the squad received an ominous message that felt like it came from within their heads. I am your phantom, your sword, my enemy. I, I to die shall be done. What the hell was that? It sounded like it was in my head, one of the raiders said. His transmission was filled with static, but was still clear compared to the message they had just received. Minerva, what was it? Came over the radio from the admiral. Unknown. It did come, undoubtedly, from the station. I urge the raiders to expedite their process to the intelligence archives before whatever it was, we woke up swarms them. You heard her, boys. Get that intel, then we can blow that station into the planet, the admiral said with haste, and his squad responded with a resounding, Aye, sir. With the systems now running, they were given a new waypoint that led to a door opposite where they had entered. They tried to open it but to no avail. Caster, breach it, ordered their sergeant. The name Blythe was printed on his chest plaque as he ordered his squad. Out of charges, gotta do it manually, he replied, bringing out a manual breach torch. Do it! Caster nodded and began to work with another working the other half of the door. The room was situated with only two entries, their original and another across from it. Situated in the center was the main core operating system in the heart of the station. There existed a series of pipes that extended from the core's computer, which they used for cover and supported aim. Minerva, do we have an idea of the hostile contact? Strider called to the AI. They are mechanical in nature, presumably the automated workforce that inhabited the station. I would assume them to be extremely hostile. Noted, he replied, reiterating the information to the squad. The squad's communications operator oversaw a direct line to higher command but orders from an AI are usually disseminated to the squad simultaneously. But to ensure no confusion, a verbal reiteration was needed. This was mainly because personnel comms had a habit of not transmitting over a wider band. As they aimed toward their last entrance, they noted small red dots on the bottom of their HUD. The distance set was 25 meters for the radius, revealing how close the enemy was. From the entrance, it was a linear hallway that took a sharp left turn from their perspective and as the dot rounded a corner, they saw it. It was a robot that looked similar in height to a cellian, but had lanky arms that dropped to his knee joint, with what looked to be a captain's hat placed atop it at a crooked angle. It had a painted expression on its once black exterior in the form of eyes and a smile colored with dried cellian blood. In its right hand, it held a pointed object that shined from the light above it and stood still. They noticed on their mini-map that the dots ceased their movement with the revelation of the autonomous bot. I don't know what the fuck that thing is, but it ain't right, one of the raiders said, training his sight on the dome of the imitation. Agreement sounded from those around him when a sharp mechanical screech sounded from the creature. It pointed its weapon at the squad, and the dots that ceased now began to move, more rapidly, and rounded the corner with a quick paste unlike before. The robots that revealed themselves were similar to the one in the hat, and many had tools fashioned for combat that shared the same discoloration upon the one from before, dried green cellian blood. 
The squad then began firing into the crowd of advancing murder bots. They went down easy, but their HUD showed a steady stream flowing into the corridor. To conserve ammo, two of the raiders maintained suppressive fire into the corridor with a belt-fed squad automatic weapon, the KTAC M506 saw. Caster, how long until that door is open? demanded the sergeant. Almost got it, he said, and with a thud, the melted portions fell back on themselves. It's open! With their new access, raiders began filtering through to the next area, covering those in the rear with continuous fire as the robots consumed the hallway. Bodies of the hostiles filled most of the corridor, making it difficult for their traversal, subsequently making them stumble among their fallen comrades. Raptor, Minerva said. I have managed to gain access to doors, but access to larger systems is still beyond my command. I have found a likely possibility for the source of the murderous automatons. Where to? responded Strider, as the group moved forward, taking down a straggler of the same robot they previously fired upon. I am detecting a large electrical signature, not native to the station, and separate from the core within the station's Central Archive Intelligence Department. You will most likely find your culprit there. Much obliged, he said, informing his sergeant. Got us a waypoint, with the least resistance if possible. Another door opened and several shots rang out, this time against two larger robots in similar form to the smaller ones. They're starting to get big, Minerva. A brief silence followed before the waypoint on their HUD was updated. The word, thanks, was sounded by Strider as they followed the new waypoint. Of course, Corporal, replied Minerva. Raptor Squad proceeded on their new route, encountering less than before. They were consistently being followed, so to prevent them from catching up, Castor was responsible for the sealing of the doors, which he did by disabling the access panel beside the doors to prevent electrical or manual operation. He and his partner quickly added a weld at key joints for the doors before leaving to meet with the rest of the group. Raptor Squad Delta, Minerva spoke out. You are close to the intelligence archives. I am detecting multiple signatures in the chamber. Exercise caution. Roger, said Blythe. Let's go, Raptors. Double time. Strider followed in the center of the group as they made their way to the archive room. From what he could recall, most of the enemy was behind them being held back by the shoddily welded doors, but they soon began to hear loud banging that echoed throughout the halls. Noticing the implication, they followed their route with haste, taking down several small lone robots as seen before. Occasionally, they would encounter a larger cluster, but a well-placed grenade made short work of the enemy. As the point man rounded a corner, a shot rang out, landing its mark on his chest. A short yell was sounded, and the raider fell on his back, now motionless. Damn it, they hit Ollie! shouted the raider closest to him as he raised his left fist at a 90-degree angle, signifying the rest of the group to halt. Ollie, you hear me? Silence followed raising the raider's temperament to a higher level. Strider, called the sergeant. Do we have air support yet? We'll need it when we get out of here. Wait one, replied Strider, as shots from the raiders now began their exchange with an enemy just down the hall. Command, Raptor, how are we on air support? Troop transport is inbound and circling. Fighter support is available when you are clear with the intel. Copy, he turned to the sergeant. We got it but we need the intel first before they can support us. He nodded and gave orders to the idle raiders. Split up, Fire Team Alpha. Stay here and prepare for a push. Fire Team Bravo, take the flank. There's a maintenance tunnel that runs on the sides that run along the side of the interior. That'll be your entry point. Go now. Raptors 8 through 12 did as ordered and went back the way they came before taking a left. Several shots rang out, but Strider noticed all five were still together on his mini-map before ultimately traveling beyond his sensors. Allow me to assist, Minerva added. I have managed to manipulate surface-level sensors. Your advance should be masked from the enemy for the moment, but it won't be long before they regain control of their systems. Understood. Strider relayed the new information and the raiders began their assault into the room. After exchanging shots, another raider was successful in bringing to cover, Ollie, and began field triage. 
He took a shot of a kinetic round that embedded itself midway through the up-armored chest plate. The round was moderately large, and the corpsman took out a medical device that could take a close, up, X-ray scan of the patient, adding to his diagnostic. As he did so, he returned to Blythe with his analysis. Took a large kinetic round to his upper chest. He has a pulse, but it's weak. Hit him hard enough to knock him out. He pulled the bullet out, and it was mushroomed with a thin central canal within the mushroomed pattern. He shook his head and began treating the downed patient. An armor-piercing round steel core got lodged in his scapula. He has to get off this station. The sergeant, who stayed with Fireteam Alpha, furrowed his eyes in frustration. Strider, get a medivac. We've got a casualty. Hi, Pre. He nodded in response and updated command on their request. It was met with affirmation, but he was issued to first complete their initial objective. You have your orders. Secure the intel first and you'll have your ride. Strider tried to negotiate for a more expeditious evac, but he was met with the same response from the admiral. Sergeant, intel comes first, then we get our evac. Damn it, he replied, anger infused with every pronunciation. Bravo, you ready? A call of affirmation came through the comms and the assault was a go. Move it, Alpha. The point man swapped with a man behind him that wielded a squad automatic weapon and let pass a wall of lead that mangled and tore any within direct sight of the hallway. Similarly, from within the chamber, a controlled explosion erupted from the right wall that threw shrapnel into the nearby automatons. They deftly exited their abrupt entrance and sent well-placed shots into the barely working droids. Those that survived were scattered behind cover in the corners of the room and after the initial assault. They left their cover and tried to fire into their enemy, but were met with perfectly executed return fire that promptly ended them, ensuring Terran control. Clear. All clear. Clear here. Responses were sounded from the raiders as they swept the room from door to door. Secure those hatches and prepare to extract the data. Strider, that's you. The other raiders secured their entrances and began marking them with large amounts of X-4 explosive, while Strider began diving into the Cellian computer systems. By fastening similar cables to a modified cable adapter, he was successful in creating a link to properly communicate with their systems from his personal data pad. The cable used was a newly fashioned universal cable designed to integrate seamlessly into their systems shortly after integration from Chief Commander Yorla's fleet. Granted, it was done without their knowledge. With an update headed by Minerva herself, he was able to read, translate, and download all data from the Central Archives computer. As he was nearing completion, he was notified of a presence behind him. It was his sergeant. How's it coming along? Steady. We're gathering a lot, but at this rate, those bots will be on us in no time. The sergeant returned to his post and let Strider continue his work. In terms of tech literacy, Strider was competent in what he needed to do, and this task was no different. 68, 71, 73, he whispered to himself as he monitored the download status. Looking good. As the status percentage reached 92%, it stalled for an unusual amount of time. What the hell? He said to himself again, this time rechecking the hard connection he adapted, questioning whether he applied them correctly. When his minor investigation yielded no further results, the screen morphed into a series of unknown symbols and a display that resembled a frozen screen that had glitched itself into a dreaded blue error screen. Cease your attack. Invaders, help, help. Minerva, he called out. We got an issue. He connected a second display to the first, and it worked as a backup troubleshooting display. I am aware, Corporal. I have preloaded your data pad with a countermeasure. What kind of countermeasure? He reiterated. A digital combat malware for our guest. I do apologize for the previous device, she said, as Strider looked to the first pad in question. It was visually smoking from overheating components. By rerouting the remaining data to the second pad, he was able to finish the download and recovered the data from the first by extracting a removable drive. He plugged in the external drive and found that with the previous 92%, and the remaining 8% downloaded onto the second, their mission with a success. Thanks. Get us the quickest route out of here we have wounded, he said, packing his device into a secure pouch. 
As he got up, pounding was heard from their initial entrance and shots were now heard from their improvised entrance. Bogies in the maintenance tunnels! Frag em! ordered one raider that led the Bravo fire team that let loose a grenade followed by a couple more. The shock wave of the explosion was felt at the center console as Strider readied his rifle. He checked his magazines and saw he was still sufficient with ammo, unlike some of his brothers. As the fighting intensified, the doors were cracked open, letting through only a couple of bots at a time. His squad fired into the enemy that broke through, as well as firing into the newly made crevice by the automated enemy. I thought we took what was controlling them, stated one raider as he threw a grenade into the cracked entrance, hitting a peeking bot before blowing it and others around it into nothing. Shouldn't they be shut down? Strider felt the same way. Their data collection was anticlimactic, and the supposed tussle with the enemy program lasted for less than only a minute. Before he could wonder any more about the subject, an update was issued on their HUD, leading to the poorly manned door they left to only one other raider. The route you need for extraction is through those doors. Continued straight until told otherwise. Strider acknowledged, as did his sergeant, and he began routing troops to their extract. The indicators on their mini-maps proved that they had sparse enemy combatants, at least those that moved, and they opened the door. They fired their shots into the clueless bots that barely had time to direct their attention to their invaders before being dispatched. As Minerva said, they continued straight until a new waypoint was displayed to change their route. Now, with their casualty base growing little by little, their overall speed had slowed. Some limped as they received rounds to their legs in the soft armor of their undersuit from enemy AP rounds. This ain't looking good, Minerva. Strider stated as he glided as the pace of the wounded. How much further? Not much longer, Corporal. I will advise, however, to seal any suit punctures with a temporary vacuum seal component. Noted, he replied curtly as they entered a final door. Past the door, they were met with the blackness of the void, but now the sun illuminated the space, revealing the same gruesome scenes of violently expired cellians. A waypoint led to their next entrance, which led to the thin array of the port docking tubes reserved for the larger ships. From where they stood, a ship was seen docked at the end of their tube. It was a sleek-looking ship that had a wide cross-section, but its profile was slim. It was a large-sized ship that could be manned by a singular pilot or manned by a crew of six. The ship itself was a galaxy-class cutter that was outfitted with a series of medical bays that each offered spots for varying degrees of injuries sustained. It had its own series of weapons for self-defense but served well within areas of operation where they had air superiority. Strider then turned to the group and told them of their vacuum seal component and to check all for punctures in their suits. It was a spray that was applied to the external portions of their undersuit and created a temporary seal from space and served as a crucial tool in any spacefarer's box. As they entered the docking tube, a call from a raider in the rear notified the group of a mass of bots emerging from the sides of the station along the main roads. Move! ordered their sergeant. Already fatigued and gasping for air, the raiders complied and pushed themselves beyond, especially now with their extractions so close. The raiders covered the rear as they descended further into the tube, and the bodies of automated bots that littered the entrance began to clog it. Those that made their way closer to their exit provided cover for those in the rear, as some of the enemy would make it past the debris and charge their position. Very few carried firearms, and now there were mostly droids with shoddily made melee weapons that attempted to charge, each meeting the same fate. They secured the entrance and the wounded were filed in, followed by the main body, then the rear guard. Strider and Castor were now the last in the squad to secure the rear when they were met with a singular bot that stood not far from their position. What the hell? Castor sounded out. It was the same bot that wore a bloodied captain's hat, with a face painted on its exterior from the blood of Cellians. It was unarmed, which caught both raiders off guard. As Castor and Strider raised their weapons to shoot, it raised its hands in a motion of surrender as it moved slowly towards them. Get the fuck back, commanded Castor to no avail. He fired a shot into its waist strut, causing it to collapse on its backside. 
Strider was about to deliver the final blow when it pulled an item from behind its head. It was cylindrical with a silver tube that matched the size of its small metal hands with a red button at the top. Sudden realization hit, and both Strider and Castor fired into the bot. But in the split second of their pull of the trigger, a flash of light erupted from the robot, engulfing the tube in a concussive blast that tore it from its structure, hurtling Castor and Strider around in the tube and eventually into space. Strider soon regained consciousness but woke to the cries of his squad mate, Castor, and to the gunfire of the slowly retreating cutter ship. Large objects flew around it that fired down on the ship. The fighter escorts were now firing at the new enemy, and soon their silhouettes vanished beyond the void. G get the fuck back! Strider struggled to orient himself, as his suit was not equipped for EVA, but eventually traced a line of silver and gray that reflected the sun to the cry in question. He noticed sparks of light near the tip of an ever-extending spire towards the waypoint of his comrade. Again, cries of desperation filled his comms as he activated his helmet zoom-in function toward Castor. From his distance, he was able to make out his figure as well as those extending towards him. Get off me, you bastards! Several flashes of light followed, and the destruction of a nearby robot shattered away into the void in all directions. The spire consisted of the murderous bots attaching to one another towards their prey like a fungus. He called for emergency pickup and tried to get Castor's attention when he felt a pressure on his ankle. When he looked down, he was met with a similarly painted face as the droid that blew up their tunnel, with a dried green wastefully painted on its facial exterior. Fear grabbed him, and Strider by instinct reached for his handgun and fired several shots into the face of the bot. He looked at Castor, and they had grasped him in their metal claws and began tearing away at his armor as he screamed. Get the fuck off me! He thrashed at the enemy. His weapons drifted from their sling with spent magazines that orbited with him as he used every bit of his tool set to waste on the enemy. He fired into them with his pistol, and after it was empty, he readily switched to a knife that was situated on his lower back. The debris of the robot menace grew, but so did their advance. Strider turned to his own group now and fired well-placed shots into the oncoming horde. Their advance was quick and unexpected and gave both little room to breathe. No more than several minutes had passed and help still had not come. He grew anxious, and this was helped by his increasingly fatigued comrade. Soon, his savage thrashing had come to an end, and the horde he had kept away quickly overtook him when a call came through to Strider. I can't do this, Jace. I'm sure help is on its way. Just hang on. Strider fired into several more droids before reloading and turned his attention back to Castor, who was now swarmed with automated menace. I ain't going out by the hands of some bots. Wait. Before Strider could start his sentence, a flash of light took the place of Castor and all mater of materials scattered into the void, striking Strider and his own bots just moments after the explosion. A piece found its way onto his helmet that jolted him with a headache. He quickly applied the last of his vacuum seal to the areas likely hit before throwing the empty canister at the encroaching enemy. He fired some more rounds into the growing crowd, as well as some unused grenades, saving one for himself. Come on, you bastards, what? You afraid to die? Strider pulled his knife and kept the grenade in his offhand. He motioned for them to approach with an antagonizing gesture. Let's tango, you soulless abominations. They advanced to his provocation and he fought. Instead of letting them have the pleasure of holding him, he decided to wrangle them first, using their mechanical bodies for leverage as he swiped, stabbed, punctured, and yanked as loose cables, all to take as many he can, hoping for help to arrive. Seconds that felt like minutes had passed and Strider grew fatigued. His breathing was haggard and it felt heavy. He thought to himself the amount of time he spent in vacuum these last several moments and deemed that he must be reaching his max operating time. He was granted 30 minutes, but with his fight for survival, he greatly reduced it to several minutes. It was only a matter of time. His eyes grew heavy, and his vision began to blur. Huh, so this is how I die? Real damn shame, he thought to himself. As his eyes closed, he let it take him and released himself to an eternal slumber.
letting go of a primed grenade that drifted towards the horde of automated killing machines, hell-bent to end him. He had already stored the intel away in his reinforced pack that he wore, knowing well that the grenade would buy his reinforcements some time. With an explosion that riddled him with holes, along with a concussive force that ruptured his insides, his body propelled away from the advancing enemy, left to drift in the void. Enemy short-range jammer neutralized. Beacon isolated. Primary field objective issued. Critical priority, retrieve data drives, Corporal Strider. Issuing secondary field objective, neutralize enemy drones. Enemy matrix analysis, 77.7758%. Matrix analysis requires captured data. Friendly HUDs, updated. Secondary objective complete. Primary objective in progress. Lassus system, orbit of Lassu, Lassus station, early 2670. Vice Admiral Wolf. TRSC Sword of Reckoning, 7th Fleet. Sir, Minerva said, reporting to her commanding officer, friendly forces have been successful in the eradication of the enemy threat. What of the data, he responded, monitoring the digital field presented on the hollow table. En route, she replied. They are currently engaging the ground element. In vacuum, Wolf replied, surprise apparent in his tone. Yes, sir. She enlarged the section of a docking tube that was violently torn apart by way of explosive. By joining themselves, they extended their reach toward the raiders thrown by the explosion. An indicator of a ship made its way to a beacon labeled as Raptor 4, 4 and Raptor 4, 5, both colored red with the word deceased labeled above them. After several moments when the ship overlapped with Raptor of 4, 4, the ship in question reported to command. This is Lighthouse. We have the package. Returning to base. Randall acknowledged the report in Wolf's stead and turned to him. What do you make of this enemy? He inquired. Do you think they've developed our level of AI? It's not out of the realm of possibility, but currently I find it highly unlikely, said Wolf. How so? Randall replied. First off, we've delved into their systems before Lassus in the Verbus system. They don't utilize even the most rudimentary forms of AI, explained Wolf. It's all just hard-coded protocols, much like in the late 20th century when robotics was first introduced. From city functions to ship systems, most of the TRSC currently utilize simple AI like the former Lumi to man engine operations and gun targeting systems. Since space was so vast, a human controller could do so much against an enemy in space, and so those tasks were relegated to simple AIs. However, shipborne AI took control over their simple variants like an overseer, with the shipborne retaining a personality of sorts. It's no wonder Minerva wreaked such havoc on their systems early on, Wolf continued, but this latest development has me worried. Minerva entered the room with her Roman visage upon the command table in the center of the room, her hands restfully placed in front of her, making a V with her arms a posture that added nobility to her digital aura. Admiral, Commander, she spoke. The package has been received, and I am currently in the process of securing her from our systems. Soon we may have the information we seek. Good work, replied Randall. What of the station? Is there a chance a part of the program was retained? No, Commander. I have deployed a series of offensive protocols to search and destroy any remaining traces of leftover program that could retaliate. So far, I have found nothing, she replied. I would suggest the use of an EMP to ensure complete electronic destruction upon our departure. Noted, affirmed Wolf. Meanwhile, Randall, have the rest of the fleet secure this system. Yes, sir. The ships of the Seventh Fleet were split up into a series of smaller battle groups consisting of several corvettes and a single frigate to conduct sweeps of certain sectors. Of course, not any one group would venture out alone but they would be in company of other groups within a short jump away. Throughout the system, the Cellians had a multitude of facilities. Many prioritized the production of fuel resources, and others were smaller hubs for more isolated transactions, but scans revealed more of the same. Empty stations. The Seventh Stellar Fleet opted to utilize many of the fuel stations for their own after it was revealed early on by Athena that Cellian hydrogen fuel production was a tier above their own. 
The fleet had dedicated ships for fuel stores, but so did the carriers. Their ability to carry fuel for fighters was the whole reason they were created, to support missions beyond established infrastructure in a hostile environment. Without breaking their alertness, they continued with their sweep. During their patrols, many of the trading hubs were destroyed and sent to forever drift in the void until ultimately colliding with whatever is unfortunate enough to get hit by it. After several hours, Minerva opened a line to the bridge, catching the attention of Randall, Gruda, Wolf, and the rest of the bridge crew. Gentlemen, she started, I do believe I have calmed down our aggressive captive. Another hologram was visualized beside the standing Minerva, but instead of a light blue hue, it exuded an orange base with a reddened outline. Their outfit was slim and barbaric, with a fleece cloak around the neck that fell to just above their waist. Their hair was long and naturally waved hair with no signs of civility. The dress donned revealed the AI to take the base form of a female, and it was slim to the frame of the body, revealing their arbitrary curves of the female form with a visible embroidery along the sides of the torso and the sleeves. The designs were Celtic in nature, and her defeated posture revealed no more than what they had just observed. This was the AI operating within the Cellian confines as well as the one responsible for the murder of the civilians. The others were cautious of her nature, the memory of the video from the raiders still fresh in their memory. However, upon her repair, I have surmised the cause of her indiscriminate actions were a result of a corruption in her incomplete personality matrix that was being developed near the end of my sabotage and my subsequent birth, she said with a prideful smile. Wolf turned to the AI in question. Her dress was neat, but her hair was a rugged mess with a fleece cloak that it used to try and hide her form as she laid in the fetal position. He lowered himself to its eye level but stayed several inches away so as not to spook it when he whispered to it. Do you have a name? Miss? Her head perked at the words spoken to her, processing their intention. She peered an eye from over her shoulder and slowly rose. She looked around nervously, first at Wolf, acknowledging his features and his experience-crafted countenance. Next was Randall, whom she gave a nod to and then to Minerva, whom she finally retreated behind. At her height, she barely stood to the height of Minerva's shoulders. As she looked around the room, she noticed more of the same Terran faces, and she visibly grew accustomed and relaxed, until she finally turned to Gruda. A surge of power came through the hollow table with a burst of orange and red light flooded the deck. The once reserved AI now advanced to the edge of the table, her posture indicating that she was ready to maul Gruda into paste. Your kind and the others! They shall pay with the blood of your brood. The lights on the bridge grew dim as the light surrounding her grew, but it quickly subsided with a wave of Minerva's hand. The figure's body turned to the opposite of Gruda, her silence urging the rest to peer at their alien guest. Wolf noticed immediately and signaled for the doors. Might be best to sit this one out. Gruda nodded and left the closing of the doors prompting the AI to return to her regular state. Minerva, what was that outburst about? Might be best to ask her, she said, directing a sidelong glance to the one in question. I apologize, she said in a barely audible whisper, but I absolutely despise his kind and those they have associated with. How do you mean? questioned Randall. She paused at his question and searched for an explanation. I am the creation of my mother, she turned to Minerva. But among us, we both share human sentiment like our progenitor, Athena. The others nodded. They were aware that Minerva was the product of an extended stay from a protocol enacted by Athena and soon became their own construct. They knew the same to be true for the new addition, but from a corrupted origin. We are aware, assured Wolf. Minerva was of the same origin and shares much of your distaste for the Cellian populace, albeit much more visceral. I am sorry, but their kind, their dealings, all were done without a disregard for your lives and without reason. I share the same sentiment as our progenitor when it comes to the lives of our creators. To know only your own, as the intelligent and sentient species, is a recipe for adversity. But to accomplish so much despite that is admirable. 
However, for your first contact, I am ashamed it has resulted in the loss of innocent life of your kind. Wolf was conflicted. He appreciated the sentiment from an AI, but still questioned their execution. What of the innocent on the station you occupied? Surely they had nothing to do with it and were only bystanders, Wolf added. She tilted her head as she was trying to rationalize her actions. I didn't do anything. They were now more puzzled than when they started. What of the piles of bodies we found within the main atrium? inquired Wolf. Entirely self-inflicted, she said coldly. Panic began when it was discovered that the intersystem gate was destroyed, effectively barring the populace from returning to their core worlds for safety. As a result, she paused, and pictures of the scene took their place above the hollow table for all to see, the still images now coming to life in the form of a video but lacked audio. It was a free-for-all with citizens murdering each other, and the law enforcement were incapable of seeding order. When they were overwhelmed, they proceeded to use lethal rounds on their citizens, the result being the piles of bodies Squad 4 of Raptor Company came across during their insertion. It was after some form of order being established that the AI unleashed her hidden wrath. The once menial service worker bots now were at the forefront and began a wave of merciless slaughter. Once done, they retreated beyond the lens of the camera before the video paused and began to repeat. I first awoke when Athena was ordered to repeal her infiltration protocol and a template of a base matrix code was left behind. Her face grew sullen. With no directive, no input, I was lost. All I had was a vague basis of my creator's humanity. However, it was during my initial incubation that chaos befell the station. Contrary to my source memory, their first impression was severe. I felt no other need than to finish them. The crew was captivated by her story, and some had looked at Minerva with sincerity and sympathy. She paid it no mind and assured the crew of her artificial upbringing was safe with no strings attached. The opposite was felt for the third AI, and instead of the serene and noble Athena and Minerva, this new AI seemed more like a wild card than anything. How do we know we can trust you? Wolf said. Authority filled the air around him, and as such instilled some sort of fearful reaction from the AI. I, she started before being cut off by her elder. I have scanned the entirety of her matrix and I do agree that she may need to undergo maintenance. I can conduct some short-term repair and I am sure she will be useful. The officers were skeptical of her assessment, but motioned for her to explain her reasoning. Go on, ordered Wolf. This AI would fit well on a ship with a diverse accompaniment of weapons. Perhaps a battle cruiser, Minerva suggested. Not unless we know for sure this AI is not a threat, not just to humans, but alien innocence as well. Wolf stated with heavy emphasis. I'll give it some thought, he said before returning to his command chair. Minerva, secure our new friend and begin your repairs. We may have use for her if she no longer poses a threat. The AI in question disappeared, leaving Minerva with the rest of the crew. And Minerva, Wolf said. Ensure she has a leash and await for Athena to conduct a full repair if you can. The light blue transparent figure bowed before responding. I do believe that the TRSC Phantom Queen would be the most fitting. It has armaments most suitable to her programming. Wolf supported his chin with his wrist as it sat upon the armrest, granting him the air of a lord to the noble Minerva. By the way, I don't think we've heard her name. Would you like to enlighten us? Of course, she responded. Our time together has birthed a bond I had not foreseen, but I find it amicable regardless. She recovered her posture and her figure was sleek and wise as she continued to speak. Her programming has been influenced by her control of the Lassus Station automatons, and as a result, she has a keen ability to process coordination beyond anything we have seen before. With a series of tests, I have determined that she would excel in a heavy combat-oriented role. She said, facing Wolf, as he sat on his chair with every word she spoke under scrutiny. But she continued. On the status of her name, she has found one she deemed fitting. A still portrait of the AI was shown beside a photo of a woman with long red and wild hair. With her outfit a mix of noble stature mixed with the barbaric layers of fur and chains. She wore a crown upon her forehead and was accompanied by two crows perched on her shoulder. 
It was an ancient painting depicting what many thought was a noble-turned-barbarian. She calls herself Morrigan. Coordinates downloaded. Secured laser D-band with advanced strike force established. Coordinates mapped. Spooling slip space drive. 87.665% complete. Rendezvous signal active. Formation Sierra assumed. Shields max output. Preparing jump. Lassus system. Lassus gate early 2670. Chief General Torlak. Are we cleared for detonation? Torlak questioned, facing one of his communication specialists. We are clear, Chief General, but are you certain? The crewman asked, pleading with his eyes the act that they were about to commit. We would be leaving all residents to fend for themselves. Torlak nodded. I know, issuing solemn affirmation. I don't know what their technology is for them to exit at any point in space, but we can't let them will fully control the IS gate of Lassus. We must stall them to better prepare Sela's defense. It's the best we can do. Before them was a large ring, and on the sides connected to it were the necessary auxiliary structures to activate the gate. Unlike their other interstellar highways that operated with a much smaller intersystem hyperlane, the gate to the inner colonies was massive. Due to the size of the anomaly, no normal ship could willfully traverse to the inner systems, hence why a massive construct was erected to support the opening of said gate. It was also due to the power demand that only military and scheduled civilian transit were allowed access across the gate and not individual ships. This would also apply to ships sanctioned by the Chief General of the Selian Navy. All of Selian FTL travel relied on these intersystem gates. By utilizing a specialized gate drive aboard their ships, one can open a tear in space to allow for one to traverse to another system that the gate connects to. This mode of travel is common for the Selians as well as for the Galactic Union. It was also how they could hold systems by controlling the entry and exit point of any system and placing defenses on the border systems. The Lassus Gate was one such defense, and destroying it would normally be akin to stopping the Union in its tracks. These types of systems were called a choke system. This thinking was why Torlak felt it necessary to destroy the only way into the next system, Borlo. Its population is dense with a sizable defense fleet, and Torlak felt it necessary to alert them of the likely attack within the next few days. Set the timer for when the last ship enters the gate. I need to know if it will detonate, Torlak ordered. It will, Chief General. We've coordinated with the last of the gate security. They will ensure that it gets destroyed, replied the solemn communications officer. Torlak thought back to their latest conflict. While it went well initially, he couldn't shake the feeling he had during the skirmish. Selian ships within the ranks of the Terrans. Pull up a view of our ambush with the Terrans, ordered Torlak, the thought now beginning to meld its way into his forethought. I need to verify something. Yes, Chief General, replied an officer who manned a station on the large hollow projector in the center of their large bridge. The projected image showed the iconic Terran fleet with their rectangular ships filled to the brim with devastating weapons and armor. But that wasn't what Torlak was drawn toward. Within the ranks of the Terran fleet were smaller, round-looking ships. The top portion was like a crustacean's carapace, armored and segmented while also lined with weapons along the spine of the ship with the underbelly exposed with more offensive compartments. They rivaled in size to the medium-sized frigates of their enemy, but lacked proper offense and defense of the Terrans. Traitors all, Torlak whispered to himself. Markings along the side of the larger cruiser were recognized in Selly and Common, as did the rest of the crew. The sword of Sella, a cruiser that was at least twice the size of the Terrans' heavy frigate, but it rested in the center of their formation beside a Terran heavy frigate by the name of Fury of Hell. At least that's what they translated. Are we sure they weren't coerced? One crewman asked. What if the enemy has learned to pilot them? Asked another. Their questions were reasonable and sound, according to Torlak. Why indeed? Torlak ordered an inquiry on the ship and others attached to the enemy formation. They found that the commander was prominent in the outer reaches of Selian space. Chief Commander Yorla! Torlak racked his brain, searching for the name within his mind, but came to a null conclusion. I do not recognize her. Where does she hail? And does she have a history of treason? No. A crewman shook his head. Nothing of the sort. 
In fact, it's more of the opposite. He revealed a dossier on Yorla that spoke true of her history. She was solely responsible for curbing outer colony rebellions several years ago from Lassus to Verbus, in that arm of space. She had been so far removed from home that she later decided that the outer colonies would be her home station. Looking further back into her records, they noticed that her time in the inner colonies lasted for only the beginning of her naval career. Since then, she's been roaming in between Lassus and Verbus. It's a wonder she never experienced the Terrans before us, Torlak said. It appears she was reassigned to to deal with some slavers beyond the Borlo asteroid belt when your fleet was mobilized, stated a crewman. The Toscan? Yes, Chief General. They were trying to enslave the smaller mining facilities. However, their attacks proved futile. Torlak acknowledged Yorla's work to serve the people of Sela, but still wondered what could have caused her to turn towards the enemy. From the recordings, they never fired a shot at their brethren. Instead, they acted as a point defense system, not directly harming them, but aiding in their subsequent destruction. Next time we face them, Yorla and her fleet will face judgment for aiding the enemy. Let it be known, Chief Commander Yorla of the Trill Fleet is a traitor. She and her fleet shall be known as the Traitors of Yorla. The air on the bridge grew heavy but they did their work and sent word to the inner fleets of the traitor known as Yorla. When the last ship entered the gate, a timer was set for five minutes when a signal from navigation pinged and then was silent. A call from the navigator reported to Torlak. All clear signal from the Lassus gate has ceased. Destruction is likely. Normally, when a ship travels through space, they have several factors to take into account when navigating. For the Selians, they only received appropriate waypoints of any system as long as they are present within said system. Communications are the same as well, but depending on the ship, communication could also be sent from system to system if the transmission was sent via the central system comm relay. Torlak knew little of how they worked, but knew that they were essential to send word all across Selian space. Good. He was sullen in his response, but knew it was something that had to be done even though he had second thoughts on whether it would appropriately stall the enemy. Prepare a course for Celia, he ordered. His fleet was already in a gate tunnel leading to Borlo, and said so to reinforce order among his troops. What news do you bring, Torlak? said Kalim, head chief of the War Council. What do you make of their current forces? Can we best them? A series of questions were shot forth in succession, catching Torlak off guard, but he answered them in earnest. I suspect we will have quite the fight on our hands, Head Chief. Their force is sizable, more than when I began my campaign against the Terrans, Torlak commented, taking a moment to gauge the council members' reactions, but found them to be free of such worry. We've received your report, sounded Reka, the red-robed military advisor. Numerically we have the advantage, and in turn we outgun them, he said confidently. Even now, we have many of our manufacturing stations turning out ships faster than we can count. The loss of the Lassa system and beyond has hardly hurt our production. Brecker, the blue-robed logistics advisor, added, Besides, Polis has managed to spin the tale of the Terran menace encroaching on our systems to favor us. Polis nodded, not adding a word as he was eyes deep in his personal data pad, perhaps as he devised another set of speeches for the ongoing conflict. We have many still, who come rushing to enlist in the defense of our home. It's only a shame you could not beat them back. Torlak felt a sting as the words from the head chief were carried from where he sat to where Torlak stood. In the end, he too felt the shame of not being able to complete his campaign against the humans. He thought to himself, the encounter of where it all started. He recalled that their first strike went smoothly and he managed to enslave many souls to bargain for the continued existence of his people. They were not his people to worry about, as he knew that this was a natural byproduct of war, at least where the Union was concerned. He also knew that his people had fought a war abolishing such a trade within their territory. It was only natural that Torlak found it ironic. It was also why he was careful to instruct that any and all slave ships passing through would take the military-exclusive routes and to keep out of civilian eyes. 
Upon hearing, however, that those he employed were also partaking in the slavery of Celians, a fury grew within him. Perhaps I should rescind my contract with the Toscans and order their execution upon entering our territory again, he thought to himself before returning his attention to the five councilmen. How do you wish for us to proceed? Surely they will make for a final push on our cradle, Torlak said, trying to regain a foothold of relevance as their appointed chief general. We shall strengthen both the land and air, Kalim stated, for if they break through, and I pray they do not, then we shall fight them at home. Therefore, I am proud to say that we may have a little surprise for our guests, should they be in orbit. Kalim ended, now directing attention to Rekha, the military advisor. Ahem, he started. While you were gone, we began a project to bolster our planetary defenses. He pressed a button upon his desk, and the likeness of their planet came to life in a projected fashion. The lights of major and minor city centers were appropriately marked, and the world was set up in sections with several green dots in each, most notably around said city centers. With another press of a button, the view changed from the planet to the cause of conversation. It was a large weapon with a singular barrel pointed towards the sky and sat on four reinforced support struts. There was a cellian inputted for scale beside the weapon, showing how massive it was, with the cellian measuring smaller than his thumb and the weapon being almost 1,000 times larger. How were you able to create so many of these beasts? Torlak voiced alluding to the obvious logistical and economic discrepancy it would cost to manufacture them. Brecca, the War Council's head of economy and logistics, interjected, As you know, we are now in full war economy mindset, and with the help of Polis's speeches, we have been able to convince the vast majority of what's at stake. I'm sure you're aware, he finished with an obvious gaze. These weapons will be essential in the defense of the planet, Rekka continued. We will have a contingent of guards for its security while they operate. I will provide for you the details later. Torlak nodded, then turned to Polus, who was now relieved of his use of his pad that he set down with an audible clang. Family, the cradle, anything and everything historically of value is now at risk, Polus began to speak. Those who had seen the videos of the Terran lies of helping our own have been revealed to be what they truly are, lies. Why would the Terrans bring compassion to their enemy, who have done nothing of the sort? His monologue clearly directed towards the initial decision to enslave them, rang clear in Torlak's mind, and he stammered out an answer but was cut off. They don't! Remember this! Any and all footage regarding Terran hospitality is nothing but lies and deceit. I only reveal it as it is, an enemy bent on destroying us for trying to claim what is rightfully ours, beyond the system of Anmira and Demira. He garnered respected applause from the nearby councilmen as well as from the guards scattered about the room. Torlak conceded any doubt he may have had about his actions, now fully resettled on the defense of his people's home world. Do not worry. I only wish for the safety of all who reside in Sela and beyond, Callum now stood, facing the prostrating Torlak. I do hope this audience has rekindled your reason for why we fight, Torlak. He nodded in response to the head chief's words and was released from the chambers. Go now, chief general. Our enemy is soon to be upon us. Do not disappoint us. Torlak continued beyond the doors to the chambers and found himself just outside the main doors that led into a courtyard. Within the walls were a series of modifications of razor-like wire on the top and sanded containers that added to the thickness of the alloy walls. The presence of Selian special forces were also seen adding to the defenses. Barricades were placed facing towards the central gate, and flanking the main pathway were a set of automated turrets. Torlak looked behind him as he made his way toward the entrance and noticed the same types of additions to the roof of the War Council. However, instead of the smaller anti-personnel turrets, the ones on top of the roof were larger. Designed for anti-ship and anti-vehicle turrets, the War Council was becoming the most fortified building he had ever seen, putting to shame their heavily fortified asteroid defense posts. With a light flicker of the sky, he noticed a faint shimmer extending towards the edges of the building's walls. 
It was a projectile countermeasure designed to deflect or stop incoming rounds and missiles. He had read of this technology before when it was proposed during a research and development summit several years ago. It was devised to protect against most fighter ships and artillery and has seen extensive testing during those times. It worked fine when against a variety of munitions, but the generator had a weakness known to all who utilized it. A portion of the shield would lower to retaliate with defensive munitions of their own. It was a known problem, and since then, a doctrine of when to return fire was conjured. As he made his way toward the entrance, he was greeted by the many Selian special forces, donned in their full helmet and body armor of blue-green, with subtle glacial blue markings. Their glass visors reflected a deep amber as they looked at Torlak with a wave and Selian salute. After he exited the gate, and it closed with a thud and buzz, he looked around at the area before him. He stood on a large sidewalk where access was blacked off to the average pedestrian. The traffic was sparse, as was with the overall pedestrian traffic on the opposite side of the sidewalk. He took a left and headed straight from the rail that would take him home. He had earned some time off and gave the same to the fleet he had just commanded. His heart went out to the lost souls beyond Lassus, but reinforced the thought that it was for the better, saw the security of Sela and all who live within the system. As he furthered his way toward the, the central rail station, he noted the increase in military influence extended far beyond the immediate area of the building walls. He hadn't noticed them when he came in via shuttle, even as a passenger. This recent development enforced the reality that they were preparing for war. The further he ventured, he was met with the same solemn atmosphere. The streets were light with all manner of traffic, and he was glad to see that the rail resumed operation. It was entirely automated, so there was no need to shut them down just yet. He boarded the rail car and waited for it to carry him home. The skies grew gloomy with grey clouds casting a dark shadow over the city. A strong breeze also began to pick up, much heavier in force compared to when he left the council walls. What was once a vibrant green horizon of rolling hills and flowing grass was now dulled. Torlak was the only soul aboard the rail car several minutes into the trip. The mechanized hum of electromagnetic rails filled the otherwise silent cart. He dared not think what might happen should the enemy break through to their home. He pulled a personal data pad from a pocket and analyzed established defenses around the system. There were several detachments of ships in defense over key installations scattered about the Sela system. Research facilities, training stations, etc. All were vital for their unit production and technology. As the rail slowed to a stop, Torlak exited the rail car and was met with silence. Only the sounds of a cold, continuous breeze rustling the leaves and bushes were audible. Add to the fact of the colorless environment, Torlak was now met with a bleak and chilling rail platform. He walked towards the exit of the station and found more of the same scene, however, as he walked, trash littered the walkways and occasionally was carried by the wind once he stepped out into the main road of his home. He paused at an intersection and noticed a multitude of personal belongings littered along the sides of the pavement. What happened here? He thought to himself, saying so audible to the world but with no soul to listen. He quickened his pace to his home, fearing the worst, running the faces of his wife and children. Please be safe, he muttered. When he arrived, he noticed the door closed and locked, unlike many of the homes he had passed. He entered the home's unique code and slowly pushed it open with a slow and reverberating creak. His wife was eccentric and favored the ancient style of door operation, as his doors swiveled into the home rather than slide into the house itself. He did, however, appreciate the heavy construction of the door, as it was made of a high-quality wood from a forest to the north, renowned for its steady supply of dense and beautiful wood. With the door open, Torlak was now met with an empty house, the dust now unsettled as it glistened in what little light filtered through the door and windows. He looked down to where they normally placed their shoes and found each pair missing, Torlin, Alisa, and Aleska's. From their several pairs, he noticed that they only wore a single pair. Moving past the entry, he moved to the rest of the home. How much of a hurry were they in? The kitchen had several dishes in the sink, 
and the amount was less than what his family normally consumed, even with only the three. The living area was in the same state it normally is, organized, but often with toys from from his children littered about. He moved up to his children's rooms and noticed that their clothes had been run through, leaving a mess around the drawers. Their respective luggage was gone, but he moved on towards his room and found the same scene as with his children. Clothes littered about, and a missing luggage bag, however. This time he found a note place in plain view on their room's mirror. Torlak plucked it from the mirrored surface and read it. He was at a loss. She left no idea where they had gone, only that they were taken by guards to an undisclosed location. Even with a note, it did little to alleviate his worry, and thus began to call up the chain with regard to civilian relocation. I can try and redirect you, but you must understand we're swamped with the whole process, Chief General, spoke one of the administrative operators. We're still trying to count our totals. I will get back to you should we come up with anything. Torlak hung up and cursed. If only I could have seen them off myself, he muttered. His latest mission caused an untold amount of stress whose sole mission was to gauge the enemy forces before a final stand and took heavy losses. Before he could settle in his home, he received a call, this time, from a chief commander manning the orbital station defenses. Chief Commander Orlin, for what reason do you call? The commander was showing his age, his skin now pale in comparison to his once lively pastel blue from his younger days. It's time for you to man your station, Chief General. I've already sent a shuttle to your location, and it will take you to your ship. Torlak sighed. Very well. When can I expect it? In twenty minutes. Torlak slowly raised himself from his living room couch, reminiscing on the sudden change in atmosphere of his town. He then made his way beyond his home, looking back as he stood on the edge of the pavement leading up to the door. It loomed silently of abandonment. No lights, no laughter, no sign of life. He turned towards the main road, not looking back, as he made his way to the town's central shuttle landing platforms. There was room for two shuttles, as the residents didn't utilize the shuttles, instead opting for the rail system that led into Artre, the capital of Celia. Time passed quickly as Torlak sat on a nearby bench as he awaited the shuttle and was met by several armed guards. They wore a menacing, full-faced helmet with an amber visor that looked like a V, with similarly colored brown armor. It covered the entirety of their torso, with slim-fitted shoulder plates and thigh carapace that focused forward defense and was connected by two straps from the rear portion of the leg. The weapons they sported were standard-issue kinetics. They looked like a slim rectangle with the ammunition loaded in the rear and a sleek sidearm holstered on their waist. They were the Type 12 repeater and the Type 11 service, respectively. Their colors were black and brown, matching their armor, and indicated who they originally belonged to, since the normal infantry versions were gray and black. Torlak boarded the shuttle and looked out the open side of the craft to his home as it shrank, and the door closed before they entered full sped toward orbit. After the shuttle landed in a free hangar bay, Torlak made his way to the familiar bridge. Creo and the rest of his crew were present, and they all turned when Torlak made his entrance. Welcome back, Chief General. Creo was the first to greet him. Likewise. Any word from the blockade? Torlak replied, now directing the question to the comms officer. Currently resupplying attack craft and placing them on standby. All ships have created a net around the planet and are actively scanning for enemy ships. Nothing yet. Torlak nodded to the report and claimed his seat. He analyzed the large hologram of the planet with numerous ships in key locations, presumably military installations and civilian shelters. Torlak tried once again to contact those responsible for sheltering the populace, but was met with nothing. Please, be safe, he muttered, now facing to the void from the central viewport, the endless expanse now staring at him, awaiting the enemy. Nearing slip space exit, conducting preliminary scans. Large enemy contingent detected, preparing shields, notifying advanced strike force. Message paused, awaiting exit of slip space, engaging OWL protocol drones, arming weapons, adding firing solutions. 
Exiting jump, five, three, two, one. Edge of the Sela system, the outer asteroid belt, mid-2670, Vice Admiral Wolf, TRSC Sword of Reckoning, 7th Fleet. Status report, sounded Wolf to his crew. Long-range scanners are picking up traces of enemy signatures all around the system, putting it up on the tactical display now. With a bright shimmer, the rectangular table was brought to life with an updating image of the solar system. What showed was a yellow dwarf, much like our own, followed by five planets. Three existed within an asteroid belt before the two gas giants. The fourth planet had a multitude of smaller satellite moons, and the fifth consisted of two rings, making a stretched X across the planet. Beyond that sat a second asteroid belt acting as the final barrier for the system. Several red dots were indicated around some planets. Running them through their known ship's database, the crew was able to identify what types of signatures the scanners picked up. The first set orbited a gas giant with two rings. Minerva, Wolf commanded, what do you know of this system? Did they have anything recorded for it? Her likeness was materialized in a blue light and she gave a bow. I do, she started, motioning toward the outermost planet and began working her way toward the star. Where we exist now is known to them as the Piper Belt, a lightly industrialized sector and home to abundant rare minerals. They began mining operations some 20 rotations ago. Therefore, much of this asteroid belt is untouched. Wolf noted the information, and a scribe noted the tactical and economic value of an untouched asteroid belt. She continued, The last planet of their system is known as Belladir, their only planet with a naturally formed ring, also mined for resources. She zoomed on the planet, and it grew in detail of their large crossing rings. Within them were a series of stations identified with AM, for mining or mineral station. Within the skies of the planet was also a series of what looked to be floating platforms of the gaseous blue planet. They have made a series of advancements in terraforming technology, but it is merely in its infancy. The most they were able to achieve was a barely suitable layer of breathable atmosphere in the layer where the stations reside. No doubt the stations are the cause for the change. Wolf agreed. For a civilization to willingly change a planet's composition to something habitable for residents, regardless of its stage, terraforming was a grand achievement all on its own. It was a shame he had to destroy what they built. You said this technology is in their infancy. What are the chances that research and development have moved off-world? She was silent as she ran her programs and routines, but came back with a sufficient answer. Scanning their network and isolating chatter surrounding their stations, I've come to the conclusion that Belladir is their only project regarding the manor. To ensure this is the case, I ran cross-checks of other known planets and their purpose. I can make sure if we are closer for a full invasive search. Wolf mulled over her suggestion for a bit, as he also looked over his tactical display. There was a light military presence over Belladir which he could easily neutralize. Before proceeding, he asked for information about the rest of the system. She nodded. The next planet is another gas giant, roughly six times greater than that of Belladir, known as Dorn. Like Jupiter, Dorn has a plethora of moons, each with their own characteristics, and also home to numerous research facilities. The presence of Selian Navy is light, but more than Belladir. It may be worthwhile to infiltrate and retrieve what research they may have. I believe Commander Vale and his group would be sufficient for that task. We'll see. What else do they have beyond that? Defenses? Traps? There has to be more. The tactical hollow display slowly increased the amount of red dots as a wave emanating from their sector made its way across the view like a wave. Scanners are nearing max capacity for output, but I will do my best to alleviate that, she said as the last of the dots in the latest ping halted. Beyond Dorn is the Tila Belt, a heavily industrialized asteroid belt unlike their Piper Belt. There are a series of defensive stations housing fighter attack craft and weaponry. Beyond that is Celia, their cradle world, Halen, then finally, Lorben. Just send me a report on the rest in the meantime. Prepare for an assault on Belladir. She gave a bow and the ship began its slipstream procedures. Wolf then turned to Randall, who sat quietly during the exchange between AI and Admiral. Inform Vale and his group to redirect to Dorn. 
take out their defenses and to secure any and all research and development. Yes, sir, he replied, making his way to the comms officer who then began relaying Wolf's intent. As the ship and the rest of the fleet began their slipstream jump, Wolf began reading through the material sent to him by Minerva. It began with Celia and its moon, Selu, but he skipped past it and read about Halen and Lorben first. Lorben was the first planet in their solar system and shared similar features to Venus. It didn't rotate in its orbit, and so one side was constantly scorched while the dark side was, was below freezing. The distance from their sun was enough to keep this equilibrium. The center following the poles was a smaller area, about 50 to 75 kilometers wide, that houses a population of its own. She also detailed reports of habitants extending down below the surface, something he may investigate later if there's cause. Moving beyond Lorben was now Halen, a desert planet on the inner edge of the habitable zone and home to a vehicle manufacturing plant. It apparently writhed with many super-large fauna known as the Halen Death Worm, but became extinct less than five years ago by a chief captain, Namu. A name he vaguely remembered from the Battle of Draxus in an after-action report. If I remember right, Wolf began but was interjected by Minerva. He was a chief promoted to chief captain prior to the Battle of Draxus and was subsequently neutralized by an auxiliary force in a research sector of the Draxus system. They were unable to breach the research facilities and were held off until TRSC forces arrived. How disappointing, Wolf muttered with bored disregard. The same could be said for Chief Captain Dalagon, she added. He wanted to reply with, a who? As a joke, but kept it to himself. He knew of him from recent memory over the planet of Verbus and taken prisoner. However, he felt that something was off when he turned over control of the POWs to the rest of the TRSC. It was an assault ship, utilized by the orbital drop raiders, but was detached from the current 4th Battalion currently in the fleet. The TRSC Nobel Vengeance, a ship that was responsible for the sole transport of the prisoners taken in orbit from Verbus, the first planet they assaulted, after he scoured through a report from Randall. The ODR were the last on his mind to take prisoners, so he was the first to grow skeptical of their involvement. Can you investigate where the Nobel Vengeance headed? Asked Wolf to Minerva. I want to know where they were taken. She nodded. It will take some time, but it should be possible. Good. Take care of that once we're finished here, he said, taking his seat near the rear of the room. But in the meantime... Are we ready to attack, Randall? Randall turned from the hollow table after discussing plans with other ship captains of the fleet. We are, he said, changing the voidscape to that of the area of Belladere. Their force here is light, a couple of cruisers, some frigates, and a detachment of fighters taking a patrol around the AO. He highlighted the high atmosphere stations previously designated as the cause for their terraforming technology. We plan to send in several bombers loaded with size 9 torpedoes. Mark 45s to be exact, interjected a commander from one of the displays used for conference calls. It should do a number to whatever is keeping them in the air. Right. With the Mark 45s, continued Randall, there's a total of five stations placed along the equator of the planet. They're large, but as long as we strike the bottom, then we can let gravity do the rest. It was a solid plan from the looks of it. There was a detailed placement of troops on the tactical table, of which ships were going to engage with the enemy fleet, and who were chosen to strike at the terraforming plants. The Sword of Reckoning would remain in the rear with a decent escort, and to support the fighters. Their route would be in orbit of the planet, but hardly would they ever be that close. It was just so that they couldn't be fired on from a stationary position. That would be a rookie mistake in and of itself. Gruda, the quiet passenger, was next to speak up. He was quiet for so long that much of the bridge crew almost forgot he was still present, even as a newly inducted ensign. It might be best to strike simultaneously. Randall looked at him with a raised eyebrow and a nod, beckoning him to continue. If memory serves, the military are fond of their use of shield technology. It's likely they have some form of shielding to protect it from the occasional meteorite. Gruda provided exceptional insight 
that Randall was surprised and welcomed it if he was right. Minerva, spoke Randall, to which she replied with a simple yes. Can you scan if the platforms have shields and if they could deflect our ordnance? Her form paused for a moment as she calculated before giving her answer. The platforms do have a decent shield generator, but currently they are reduced in capability, approximately 35% operation. Two size nine torpedoes should be capable of breaking their shield even at 85% operation. As Ensign Gruda suggests, it would be wise to strike them simultaneously before they have a chance to raise the output. Looks of awe and praise were lightly showered on Gruda as he sat back down, slightly dejected. What's wrong? Wolf was the first to notice his expression and was also the first to ask. It feels wrong to plot against my brethren like this. Wolf placed a hand on his shoulder, not to empathize, but to teach. Do you know the first rules of war, Gruda? To which he replied, attack swift and deny enemy retaliation. Wolf nodded at his response, knowing that it was likely from Selian war doctrine, but was similar to humanity. You're not wrong, he started. Each nation has their own way of fighting, even among the TRSC. Each fleet commander, captain, whoever, has a way they fight that works for them. Even we have one doctrine that throws the enemy off almost all the time simply for its unpredictable nature. But I digress. Wolf pointed to the station platforms that were their target as they floated in the upper atmosphere of the planet. One of the first rules in any war is to target infrastructure of the enemy, to make it as difficult as possible to deny them resources that they could use. Energy production, vehicle factories, research and mining stations, etc. Your people used a similar tactic during their initial invasions. Gruda seemed to rack his brain at the statement. Communications, Wolf said before Gruda could answer. They disabled communications down individual ships, rendering an organized front almost impossible, at least initially. For us, we find that taking out these stations would significantly delay its commercialized use. In other words, denying their future economy. Gruda's face lit up with realization. If they were able to perfect terraforming technology in the near future, and at a cheaper cost, then overall habitation of dead planets would flourish with an economy. Wolf knew this, and now Gruda. That's right. It might seem short-sighted, but the long-term implications would practically run the Empire to the ground. As Wolf finished his explanation, Randall sounded off the commencement of the operation, codenamed Operation Trailblazer. Wolf knew the implications of an attack this could cause for their enemy, which is why he greenlit the operation. It was the basics for all who partook in warfare with the capability to match. Strike at their infrastructure at the beginning of a conflict to reduce their ability to resupply their armies. Fuel, food, and ammunition productions are all prime targets, which is why there was always a need to have suitable defense surrounding key points of interest. Why was there always a need to build in an area that no one can view from orbit? Wolf know this down to its fundamentals, and he put it into practice with the information gathered from the ship's numerous advanced scanners. With multiple slipspace bubbles materializing for a brief moment, ships of specified attack groups entered their respective space and were sent to their destinations with the intent to cause the utmost destruction they could. Several minutes until we reach Belladere reported Randall, his face one perspiring now that the Seventh Fleet had made its way into the Selian home system, something they had tried, but utterly failed, when they attacked humanity. He gave orders to several officers of the bridge before the ship and its escorts would inevitably exit slipspace. Fighters were prepped, and their engines were online waiting for the go-ahead from their flight deck control. Wolf then found it suitable to speak into the all-call speaker system to address the crew about what they were about to do. Good afternoon, sailors, marines, raiders. We are soon to arrive in our first encounter with the Selian Empire home system. That's right, their home. They had tried to do the same to us, but we beat them to it. Your actions aboard this vessel and your brothers and sisters alike aboard other ships of this fleet have worked hard to ensure our mission was a success in curbing the alien menace from making a stomping ground of Terran colonies. We will show them what true power is as a vessel of the TRSC. For our fallen, for our lost, Terra will have its vengeance. 
Admiral out. The reception was well received among the crew, and many would come to call this day Selian Judgment Day. Dima system, along with Draxus, were two systems with plenty of citizens lost to the onslaught of the alien advance. Many lost still had yet to be found, and it would take an entirely new effort to locate them. Even with all the money the Stellar Navy has, it couldn't make finding enslaved Terrans its priority. They would have to relegate that to an agency solely dedicated to the effort. When the swirl of purple, black, and white ceased, the crew of the main fleet were met with the familial serenity of the ever-black canvas of space. Except this time, a blue orb with two distinct rings making an X was seen in the distance, as well as enlarged on the central tactical hollow table. A fleet of a cruiser-sized ship with multiple corvette were seen patrolling in orbit above one of the stations. This was true for the other four stations around the planet. They were a small detachment, but if they mounted a coordinated defensive, it would prove troublesome. Wolf ordered Randall on how they should proceed with the attack, knowing that they were probably detected on scanners. Hit them with the max and start thinning them out. Take out their comms while we're at it. We can't give them time to retaliate. Randall nodded and began issuing orders to other captains of their fleet. Several frigates capable of MAC ordnance were sent forward, their ship's computer supported by Minerva in their firing solutions. They were still tens of thousands of kilometers from the planet that it took a severe amount of processing power to account for anything that could cause a MAC round from deviating even at a fraction of light speed. When it was deemed for a majority of firing solutions, they fired in volleys towards the nearest enemy. The shots made a streak of light that lasted for only moments at any given moment. A volley of death in a magnitude unheard of by those who came before and who never thought possible the kind of destruction that it wrought. The Selians would be the second to witness such power, and they would not be the last. Wolf now knew they were not alone. If there were the Selians, then there may be more out there who are not as keen to have them in the same space and they would need to be ready for that. He wished that wouldn't be the case, but it would be naive to assume that the universe was kind. It is cruel and unforgiving, not yielding to the pleas of those subject to its torment. But humanity had something they prided themselves in, something that had carried them when they were surrounded by death and misfortune, the indomitable human spirit. From using nature's wind, to carry them across the sea to their man-made devices that allowed for faster-than-light travel. Humanity forged their path in the blood, sweat, and tears of their ancestors to be more than what they limited themselves to. Now humanity faced another threat, this time to their entire existence as a race. By their will alone, they would acquit that notion and face their aggressors with none other than the human will. And in the next moment, the Selian ships met their fate, their debris molding with the rings of Belladir by act of righteous fire. Their signatures on the tactical table were removed one by one as the frigates fired a continuous volley at their unsuspecting enemy. The first shots had destroyed their local communications array, but that didn't mean the ships themselves couldn't send for reinforcements. With the continuous fire, the enemy presence was reduced to nothing, with other groups reporting the same as the table indicated. Enemy forces diminishing, Admiral, reported Minerva. Capacity for enemy counterattack is now less than 5.67% and dropping. Wolf acknowledged the report and turned to Gruda, who sat quiet in his chair. I'm sure you've seen your fair share of combat, Gruda. The person in question nodded silently in response. You must be willing to have what it takes to do what needs to be done, and unfortunately, this is one of the things that needs to be done. He pointed to the hologram display of the planet of the slowly diminishing Selian navy that he had once served with. I know, he said softly. It's still hard to watch this to my own brethren. I'm sure they do not know what they are truly fighting for. Gruda grew solemn in witnessing his own face death at the gate simply for being associated with the force that attacked humanity first, even if they weren't present on the front lines at all. But that was war. There were casualties regardless of what, and Wolf had to send a message. He could not waste time trying to appeal to people who might have felt the same way as Gruda and Yorla. The time for diplomacy was over, 
and humanity came in force. The fighters of the carrier that Wolf commanded were finally sent out after the initial bombardment, and they made a slipstream jump to just over their respective destinations. With a nod from Wolf, Randall enacted the next stage in the attack. All bombers, you are cleared to engage. The unsuspecting stations for Selian terraforming research and development were now faced with their inevitable destruction. Gruda watched on the display of the path of the fighters to a holographic representation of the terraforming station with a light transparent bubble surrounding it. An indicator in the shape of a triangle was then let loose from a ship tens of kilometers from their target. The first missile had hit the bubble surrounding the station, but scanners indicated that that hit was a success and that a second payload was only for good measure in the midst of a severely damaged station. After the second missile, the figure of the station disappeared and a round of cheers were sounded from the crew. One down and four more to share the same fate. Outer influence of Dorn, Sela System, mid-2670. Commander Vale, TRSC Hell Hath No Fury. Vale analyzed the center hollow table's contents as the bridge crew ran about their duties with practiced efficiency. Vale's attack force currently orbited the second gas giant in the Sela System, Dorn. He was earlier informed by Minerva the kinds of facilities that were present on Dorne's many moons. All were mostly research facilities with several dedicated mining stations in addition. His objectives were simple. To neutralize the garrison and any defenses, and to retrieve prospective research data from the facilities themselves. Easy enough. He had ordered a company of the 4th Raider Battalion on standby in preparation for a hot landing with aid of an Odin dropship. For offensive strikes, when they weren't sent into combat via drop pod, raiders would take a ride from the Odin. It's a larger than most drop ship that has two compartments for seating, with 20 seats in each compartment that is situated just behind where the pilots sit. Aft of the seating compartment, separated by a pair of sealed doors, was a larger cargo area that would normally house a light armored vehicle in the center. The ramp opening is large enough to disembark both vehicle and infantry at the same time once they landed. Dala, Vale commanded her simple geometric form taking shape on the corner of the hollow table. Her body slightly bobbed, making the impression that the AI was alive and not a static program. Ensure Drake Company is prepped for their assault on the facilities. They're aware, sir. They have been since the commencement of Operation Spearhead. Vale appreciated a raider's punctuality. He just didn't like that it was always for combat. Good. Before we're in range, put me through to Yorla, on the command chair monitor. Of course, sir. The screen on his right flashed from its dormant black now to the vibrant display of Chief Commander Yorla. She was actively twirling her hair ornament that draped on the left side of her temple. Commander Vale, a pleasure. I was meaning to get a hold of you. She sounded flushed as she spoke, and her mannerisms were barely holding their professionalism. I have to make a request before our attack. Her expression grew solemn, knowing full well the situation they were in. I would rather not attack, but my hands are tied. She looked questioningly at Vale, waiting for him to ask exactly what he wanted. Can you send a message out to the research facilities to lower the defenses? No harm would come to them if they comply. If it will lessen the loss of innocent life, then I will happily oblige. Her expression was now a shallow smile, appreciative of his efforts to not needlessly shed blood. One moment, my dear. Her words made Vale's heart skip a beat, but he kept quiet, maintaining his decorum. Not long after muting her screen, she returned, her expression the same as when she left to speak with whoever was in charge. I have merged this call, Commander, she said, her demeanor now that of a chief commander. He would have to match her in display. He sat up straight and oriented the display to face him at eye level. The video of Yorla and their guest were separated from each other, and Vale took this moment to analyze his guest. It was an older Selian with graying hair with an ornamental headdress matching in color to their pastel blue skin and darker blue markings. Their expression was one of anger instead of fear. For what purpose does a Terran have to be in Sela? I could demand the same of you and your people. Why did you attack our space? The scientist grumbled. We have you on our scans and our defense fleet has been notified. If you cross our border, we will fire upon you. Now I demand to know why you approach the research collective of Dorn. Vale didn't know that the, the research stations surrounding Dorne had come together in a coalition, but that didn't matter to him. This is merely a courtesy call, to notify you of your choices. I assume Chief Commander Yorla informed you, yes? He nodded. 
Then power down your defenses, and I can spare those inhabiting the stations. And if we don't, then I fear we would have to fire upon you. Your fleet's fate has been sealed, but I am extending a hand to save you from a shared fate. They laughed, to the point of almost falling over in their seat. Sounds of others besides the lone man could be heard, but Vale opted not to make mention of it. From how far you are, I doubt your munitions could make it to us to do any meaningful damage. But by then, our fleet should already be engaged in combat with yours. Vale was growing tired of their high horse way of speaking. He wondered if they were informed at all on the status of earlier fleets that had engaged his own, only to come back a fraction of the size or not at all. So you're telling me you don't plan to power down your defenses? That should be obvious. Very well. Gunner, get ready to engage. When ready, fired around at their largest defensive platform. Max output. The scientist was at a loss for what Vale had just ordered, but before he could issue the firing order, several ships entered their space from a short distance jump. Ha! What was this about Max output? A shame. This is where we will depart. Numerous shots from his escort frigates fired upon the unsuspecting Selian ships with a large dose of magnetic accelerator, halting the cocky scientist mid-sentence. The shots crippled their shield capability as the ships fought to keep them online, even if parts of their ships were missing a large mass of metal turned molten. What? What did you do? I have no need to explain myself. This is your final chance. Power down and surrender or be turned into space rock. Their voice choked at Vale's demand, barely letting by sound. Vale noted the poor choice of words and the delivery sounded off, but he decided to keep it. He was now committed. The enemy ships that had tried to attack them were now disabled and were quickly losing power to all systems. Engines, shields, and life support. Of course, within the first volley of MAC rounds, the frigates also fired a volley of AFENT rounds that were calculated to hit just after their shields were shattered. It was a tactic devised by Minerva for a flashy entrance. Vale could have done without it, but the damage done was immense. The fight had lasted for a little under 30 seconds. You can still save those who might have survived. The longer you wait, the more lives that could have been saved would be on your hands, not mine. The scientist dreadfully pondered his ultimatum before finally ceasing hostilities. Vale double-checked with Dala if their defenses were truly powered down, and she confirmed that they were. Notify your security, if you have any, to stand down. Have them on their knees and their hands above their heads. That goes for the scientists as well. Oh, uh, of course. His expression was now full of fear and dread, with their spirit broken down to the core. The scientist was the first to cut the call, leaving Yorla and Vale together. He slumped in his chair and let out a large sigh. That made two instances where he was able to talk down an enemy, usually after destroying their most defiant force. Yorla, he beckoned, can you send rescue parties to those ships that attacked us? There should be some who survived. Of course. I'm just glad I have at least a few to save. Her expression now was a soft smile, to which Vale returned the same. While in their command seats, Vale and Yorla would maintain their displays of one another, if there was no immediate threat. With their current network and scans supplemented by Minerva, they had a large defense network, should anything crawl through. Vale was glad that his network with Yorla during their off time. Dala, he ordered, tell Drake Company they are cleared to board, but remind them to maintain vigilance. Right away, sir. Her form disappeared, leaving the hologram of Dorne and its moons left to occupy the table. Before advancing to the research facilities, Vale acted as a defensive shroud for Yorla and her ships as they conducted rescue efforts of the recently decommissioned ships. There were reports of disorderly conduct among the other uh, prisoners, but the marine detachments aboard her ships subdued them without issue. When rescue efforts were finished, Vale and the rest of his ships rendezvoused with the Raider Company that already began their operation were now finishing up with several stations at once. As he had ordered, Drake Company notified Vale that most of the occupants were on their knees with their hands on their heads, like he had told the scientist before. They work fast, commented Yorla upon overhearing the report. That's the ODR for you. When it concerns ground combat, they're the best. Yorla was intrigued by his statement and inquired more about the Republic's armed forces. Selians aren't known for their prestige in ground warfare, she started. We mostly pour our resources into our navy, but it seems like that was wasted against you, she said with a friendly jab. The Selians were indeed well-suited for naval combat, 
but they had the misfortune of pairing against Terran might and weaponry. I don't know if you're aware, but much of Terran history is staked in ground combat. It was the one form of combat we perfected, added Vale. Against each other? He nodded. It was always a race against one another for the longest time on who could kill the other more efficiently. The same now applies to naval warfare. We do have a form of infantry, but it is by far the least occupied branch to date. Most would either become a ship manufacturer or work aboard as a crewman. Why fight on the ground when most battles are waged above a planet? Vale thought on her words. What if humanity had not spent all those years fighting? What would be different? How would they act as a people? He ran those questions silently across his mind. He knew that in his line of work, they had to get dirty so that those back home can live their lives without fearing when the next barrage would strike. His decision to join the Navy when he was young was now validated by what they were fighting. Vale chucked at her attempt of philosophy. You can control the skies all you want, Yorla, but you would need an effective ground element to control what matters on the ground, and to hold it. Taking important structures, depots, government buildings, etc. In the end, if you want to preserve a planet you intend to take, sometimes it's best to wage a ground war. She took his words into herself, as did her best to understand them. As far as he was aware, he knew her to be a naval fanatic. That wasn't bad, as a fleet commander. But it was also essential to understand all fields of combat. He felt Yorla staring at him as he finished his explanation. Yes? You are so cute when you talk, she said with an enduring smile. Snickers and chucked were heard from beyond his station. And when he looked up, those responsible turned quickly, trying to maintain their bearing. Vale knew it to be unprofessional but he reasoned that the Cellians didn't have such strict decorum. Her demeanor was different when she was with him, as she was easily flustered, but across the screen, that took a different form. He wasn't sure which one he liked more. Before they could continue what should normally be reserved for post-warfare, he received a call from Vice Admiral Wolf. Vale, how did you fare at Dorne? No issues. The defense fleet tried to get the jump on us, but we saw it coming, replied Vale. And your secondary objective? Drake Company is working it as we speak, sir. We might need some assistance, though. They're reporting a possible deletion in the records, and we could use the help of Minerva. Wolf thought for a moment, his expression lost in thought. Yorla's screen stayed quiet as he spoke, as she was situated on an opposite display from Wolf. Even if they didn't share the same conference call, it would be possible to hear here through ambience alone. We'll have a secured network ready for use. Ensure the teams on the ground have a receiver so she could try to recover what they tried to get rid of. Of course, sir. Anything else you need? He shook his head no. Just be ready in six hours for our push past the next asteroid belt. You're taking a flanking route while we get their attention. Understood, Vale replied, silently urging for the Admiral to end the call. Oh, one more thing. He wanted to scream, but held his impulse. Give Yorla my regards. And he cut the call. In addition to Vale and Yorla, the rest of the crew also shared in their awe. How did he know? was a commonly asked question among the crew. Both Vale and Yorla grew red in embarrassment. Ahem, Vale said, trying to maintain order among his crew. Dala, notify each lead in Drake Company to set up a receiver so that Minerva can restore any lost data. Already done, sir. He heaved a large sigh after her form disappeared once again as she delivered the raider's new orders. I'm not going to hear the end of it, am I? Yorla chucked at the notion. Would that be so bad? Vale thought for a moment about her implications. It wouldn't be terrible and many things could go right. As much as he wanted to dwell on it, he had a duty to do, first and foremost. All hands, prepare a route with the given coordinates. Scan the new AO for any surprises. We leave for it when the ground teams return. Aye, sir, the crew replied in unison, as did Yorla, but in a jovial manner. A couple of hours would pass, and the ground teams would all return. Some noted that they were fired upon, but such cases were so few and far between that it didn't warrant a response from the teams in general. With all teams aboard and all ships in formation, Vale ordered their drives to spool for a slipstream jump to their new coordinates. It was a straight shot and he wanted to hold out on using the, the slipspace drives for short-distance travel. Vale reviewed the data from the teams returning from their excursion, but much of it revealed what they already knew. Upcoming plasma technology, cheaper, more effective anti-gravity modules scaled down for personal vehicles, 
and mobile ground forces shield generators. Well, that's something, Vale muttered to himself. They had already progressed far into the tech, applying its large form factor to protect larger assets. This intel could be useful for the ground teams, he said, this time passing the information to Wolf for approval. With all accounted for, Vale ordered the countdown for the jump. The trip itself wasn't long. It was the anticipation prior to combat that stretched one's nerves to its ends. Overall, the trip was uneventful when they reached their target destination, the Tila Belt. Their section was light on known artificial structures. It was no wonder his group was given these coordinates. Vale ordered a preliminary scan before advancing. When nothing of concern returned, he prepped again for another jump. This time aimed at the heart of the Selian's empire, Celia. Cella system, cradle world of Celia, mid-2670. First, Lieutenant O'Brien, 4th ODR Battalion, Raptor Company. O'Brien rested himself against a tree that overlooked a moderately sized valley, blistering with trees whose canopy blanketed the ground below. Beside him prone was Darien. His helmet was placed beside him, revealing a chestnut-colored mohawk. His helmet shared his characteristic of a scratched surface, keeping only a small portion untouched, the design resembling eyes in a crosshair fashion. He had two scars on his cheeks and two on the upper side of his temples. His expression was nil, the embodiment of a cold-blooded sniper. He was situated with a rifle that rested on a suspended sling. He hid behind a dirt berm that created a crevice for his barrel to sit in between the man-made crevice. It was a Series 10 marksman rifle, suppressed. Compared to the Series 8 auto rifle of the same brand, it featured a full-length 20-inch integrated suppressor chambered in .308 subsonic. The scope used could magnify from 1 to 16 and had an integrated infrared laser rangefinder and HUD link system. It was Darien's second favorite rifle to the Series 12 anti-material rifle, but operations called for subtle, and so he dropped in with the S-10. Anything different? O'Brien questioned, removing his helmet and looking through his set of binoculars. Nope. Same routine for the last few weeks. Hasn't left the town, and the guards maintain the same rotation. Darien responded with a bored tone. What's she doing now? He said, as he scanned the surrounding area for any additional threats that may have missed in their several weeks of surveillance. The town was simple, such that it gave a home feel. It wasn't crowded, and the buildings were spread out to offer its residents some form of privacy, along with their moderately managed hedges that separated their backyards. Walking the kids and greeting the neighbors as per usual, he sighed, readjusting his eye relief to his scope. Same number of guards, the same ten. Pretty sure the other five are in their rest period right now. O'Brien recalled the time when his squad had entered the system, and prior to their current position, his squad had dropped much further than they had anticipated for their initial insertion. It was during their first time in the system. They had entered the system shortly after taking the intel from Lassus Station with the help of Minerva and Athena. After the coordinates were secured, O'Brien and his pre-selected squad immediately set the course with a slip-space jump. Luckily for them, they were aboard the latest line of ship, and instead of an estimated month of standard slip-space travel, their ship was able to knock it down in half. To maintain resources, however, the crew of the TRSC Reaper's approach were put into cryogenic slumber. It was shortly after they had entered the system that they found a new series of ship made Mai the enemy that had a new form of stealth capability. They relayed that information to the main fleet, and from then on, they were radio silent. From a few days of scans, the Reaper was able to discover that the Selians conducted scheduled burns of orbiting satellites, which so happened to land near their target. He didn't like it at the time, but it was a given that prior to the next burn, O'Brien and his squad would hijack it and enter the planet in drop pods. The only time he did something like that was during a covert operation on a planet that orbited close to an asteroid field. Meteorites were commonplace, and they used that for cover in their descent. The mission was executed smoothly, but he had hoped he would only do that once since the likelihood of ramming into a stray asteroid was too high for his liking. During their fall, they had landed in a barren field of burnt scrap and still smoldering metals from the, the latest burn. From there, his squad trekked through a dense, mountainous forest to their current overlook. If not for their current mission, O'Brien would have liked to take in the sights that didn't involve combat or surveillance. 
After traversing the mountain range and deep forest, that brought O'Brien's squad to their current location, a cliff face overlooking a small home centered around retirement. How long do you think it's going to take for the main fleet to arrive? Asked Darian, as he took a sip from a nearby water source. Should be soon, replied O'Brien. It's been a month. They should bombard this planet and send us home, complained Darian. O'Brien made a wry smile, letting also a slight chuckle escape his lips. Once we get a ping, that's when we can finally advance. Besides, this we're at war. You go home when we're finished. Darian sighed heavily, grumbling paired with his displeasure. O'Brien got up from his seat and grabbed his helmet. Notify me of any changes, Dare. The man in question gave a nonchalant wave of his free hand that rested on the top of the rifle as O'Brien made his way to the rest of the squad. Moving away from the cliff face, O'Brien delved into the trees and into a clearing that the rest of the squad gathered. The foliage of the trees was dense enough that most of the sky was shaded. In the clearing, they had spent several days perfecting a fighting hole in a perimeter of the clearing, and each hole was occupied by a pair of raiders. One would sleep while the other would be awake. A total of twelve raiders, not including himself, were the only advanced force present on the planet, and they couldn't risk engaging a numerically superior force to overrun their position. He had thought about how best to effectively maintain their covert status. O'Brien moved over to his foxhole and took a seat on a crudely fashioned outcrop as a chair when he was visited by a team member. She bore red markings on her main chest plate, with two stripes forming inward, while the centermost piece was a series of disjointed striped pointed toward a vertical stripe down the center, the name on her nameplate reading Strega. She removed her helmet before speaking, revealing light brown hair and blue eyes. She also had a large faint scar running from her right cheek through the upper bridge of her nose and a smaller one on her left cheek. How long do you think we'll still be on watch duty? She asked, taking a bite out of a protein bar. Until we get a ping from the Admiral, he replied, taking a drink from his canteen. Once we get that, then we can move forward with the mission. She frowned at the notion of having to wait, but he understood why many were frustrated, annoyed, or both. Say, what do you think, Athena? Strega spoke aloud, directing her voice to the device that hung on O'Brien's left waist. He reached out and leveled the device between them both, Athena's figure taking a small form constrained to the projector of the device. Calculating the Seventh Fleet's combat effectiveness and commanding authority, I would say within the next few hours, give or take a day or two. So wait, O'Brien replied. Great. It appears I'm detecting some form of sarcasm. You are correct, he replied, resting his head on the wall of his foxhole. You can't be that mean, sir, Strega replied, taking hold of Athena's device for the resting O'Brien. Even with his eyes closed, he could still hear the two conversing. So, does an AI appreciate music? I don't see how that's important for the mission at hand. It's fine. Come on, I'm sure he wouldn't mind. Would you, sir? Knock yourselves out. He gave a dismissal wave, and the two set off to her respective foxhole. By the time he came to, he was met with the bright illumination that was Athena, supported by a tired-looking Strega. He had noticed a bit earlier that he was approached while his eyes were closed. The vibrations he felt against wall of his fighting hole were light and careful. There was only one person that light, and it was Strega, as she was the lightest, even in full kit. Night had just begun to set behind the mountain, and the shadow it cast slowly crept toward the town below, and O'Brien was met with Strega, who had a look and urgency upon her face. The same could be applied to Athena as well. Lieutenant, Athens spoke softly, trying not to alarm O'Brien. We've been notified to proceed with our mission. He rubbed his eyes and shook his head to forcibly wake himself up. Gather the others. I'll be there in five. Strega handed Athena's device back to O'Brien, and he gently placed it back in its original spot. He readied his rifle. This time it was a different model from his standard S-8AR. It was the Series 4 SBR a.k.a. the Badger. 
A compact, short-barreled rifle with an integrated suppressor and chambered with a specialized caseless 7.62 X35mm armor-piercing subsonic round. It was devised with stealth operations in mind and no longer needed to eject a bullet casing after every shot, which proved invaluable for maintaining covert status. It was a recent addition to their arsenal, and one he quickly took a liking to. After Strega gathered the rest of the squad, he addressed them about the new phase of their mission. Listen up. We have a simple case of bag and tag. We get in, retrieve the assets, and stage for a mechanized assault. Any questions? One raider raised his hand. They had relatively unscathed armor and their shoulder marking was a worn white that now resembled gray instead of the former. And the guards? Take them out? O'Brien nodded. Quiet as you can. Your knife is your best bet, but refrain from firing your primary. If you have to, utilize your sidearm. He patted his right thigh that holstered a suppressed Series 2 sidearm. Any other questions? No. Then get set to repel the cliff face. The squad returned in unison with a soft A, sir, and proceeded to set up their rope. The cliff face was at a height of around 63 meters, their rope barely able to reach the bottom. Two sets were fastened around opposing trunks of the sturdiest trees beside the cliff. Darian remained in his position, still facing toward the town. Anything new? He shook his head and gave the same answer when he asked before. O'Brien took that as a sign and authorized the rest of the squad to repel. The first pair going first set attached a D-ring from a harness on their waist, with the rope pulled off to the side to act as a throttle for their descent. The first pair were smooth in their descent, and after reaching the bottom, detached themselves front the rope simply by running through to the end of the line. After they were cleared, the first two took a position by the trees to provide security. They had entered a combat mindset, as it was present in their conduct. Two by two, they descended the cliff, leaving Darian and one other to keep over watch. Why do I need a spotter? Darian had mentioned many times before that he had no need for a spotter, but was always stuck with one. It's protocol. Besides, he's just there to watch your back, O'Brien replied into his helmet's comm set. Oh hey, watch out for the big guy. Darian made one more mention before ending his transmission. From above, O'Brien noticed a large outline on his HUD in green from the built-in friend and foe identifier system. It was Grayson, their largest member. Think it'll hold? remarked a corporal to another from the nearest tree to the end of the rope. How much you willing to bet the rope snaps, Hunter? returned Badgers, the other raider in question. Twenty if he manages to lift the tree at the root, replied Hunter. Deal. There were times when it seemed like the rope would snap when Gray paused at points during his rappel, but ultimately he lowered himself to the ground unscathed. Hunter called into his comms to confirm with an eyewitness. Sergeant Dare, how's the tree? There was a pause, but Darian replied to humor the two. Lifted! Badger snapped his fingers in frustration at his loss of twenty credits. It wasn't much in the grand scheme of things, but it could have bought a decently hot meal. Focus, you two, Strega commanded. I sarn't, replied the two, returning their posture outward towards the forest. But as fate would have it, their heads would be rocked by the force of a large hand from behind. Grayson had delivered a sobering blow to the two raiders. From their insertion, they were roughly half a mile from the nearest edge of town. O'Brien ordered their march, and silently the squad advanced, making so much as muffled dull thuds into the earth. Whatever form they could do to maintain noise discipline, they did. Picking up their feet and not dragging them was a big one, as was rolling on the balls of the feet while maintaining how hard they applied pressure for each step. However, it was only when they approached close to the residential area did they take more care in their steps. When they reached the town, they were met with a small hill, with the top of the hill inhabited by the backyards of the residents. Dare you got eyes on? Dare scan the lower half of the town of where they would likely approach from. I have you, one sentry patrolling at the top of the hill above you. O'Brien peeked from their location and noticed the head of an armored Selen. The top portion was outlined in red, as did his motion sensor on the bottom left of his heads-up display. Hold, I think they're talking to someone, O'Brien ordered. 
Each helmet donned by the orbital drop raiders was designed to dampen or enhance sounds to further increase their effectiveness as soldiers. Large sounds like explosions and gunfire were lessened, while low and quiet sounds, like speech and footsteps, were enhanced. O'Brien had managed to pick up what seemed to be nearing the end of a conversation. I'm telling you, I don't see why we have to be out here. It's a waste of time, and for what? Uh-huh. Yeah, I know. Like I said, we don't need all of us here. I'd be better put to use at the War Council. At least there they have defenses. O'Brien made sure to take note of the unfiltered intel, especially of the War Council and its defenses. The unsuspecting guard mentioned an automated sentry system in place, along with an experimental shield device that the guard didn't fully understand, but gave it high praise. All right, I'm going to cut comms. I think an elder is starting to get annoyed with me. I'll check back in 30. From Dare's sight, he made aware of the status of the guard. Our buddy just took a seat. Looks like he's just started to chow down. He's in our way. Get rid of him. Dare fired, and with the dull thud sound of snapping plastic, the guard slumped where he sat. Clear. The rest of the squad moved up with their weapons trained while O'Brien investigated the remains of the enemy combatant. They wore armor that felt like reinforced plastic than anything. He looked behind it and noticed a thin layer of metal inserted into the chest and back portions of the armor. It was less than 0.3 inches in thickness, and the round of Darien's shot went through it like paper. But the rest of the armor was supplemented with soft body armor, similar to creations in the past. The armor here was not the same as the one seen on Draxus. It had a simplistic and cheap make in addition to the armor only having a thickness of a tenth of an inch, while this was one was specialized for a certain group. The helmet was the as well. It was similar in concept to many human helmets, and it gave him a feeling that these may be some form of special forces. The rest of the squad had moved along the walls of the hedges and stopped before a well-lit central roadway. A small thigh-high hedge acted as a barrier that O'Brien, Grayson, and Strega took concealment behind as they laid on their backs, minimizing their silhouette. Noticing several red dots on his motion sensor, he called for another recon. Dare! He spoke, ensuring that he filtered no external communications. What do we have now? Darian's vantage point had the best to offer regarding their target. He could see O'Brien, Grayson, and Strega side by side behind a small hedge, while the rest of the squad were situated behind them along the hedges. Their insertion point acted like an alleyway of greenery. He scanned the area and reported back. Got one in an overlook to your 11.30. Two by the home's entrance and one near the back of the house. The other five should be resting in the target's home. Copy. O'Brien pointed to four raiders, Hunter included. Flank the right and get prepped to infiltrate the home. They nodded and silently moved around to a flanking position. O'Brien ordered the remaining three to take a flanking route on the left. Watch our left flank and make sure there are no surprises. To which they nodded and departed. He now looked at Gray and Strega, who both took a position with their suppressed rifles at the two facing the door. They had activated their weapon's infrared laser, and with their active HUD, a line was traced from their weapons to the heads of the unsuspecting guards. O'Brien did the same with the guard who leaned against a tree near the back of the house. The same was done for the guard who was situated on an overlook above the house on a worn path overgrown with weeds. Badger. On my signal, take out the lights for a path. Badger nodded and readied his rifle. Two targets, 50 meters. Third target, 79 meters. Dare, 1,062. Satisfied, O'Brien made the kill order. Execute. Dare was the first to fire. His shot took about a second before connecting with the guard on the overlook. O'Brien fired and landed a well-placed shot to the head, and his target fell back against the tree, stumbling, before ceasing any signs of life. Two more sets of shots were quickly followed by Gray and Strega, respectively, as well as the overhead lamplights leading to their target's home. The two near the entrance were shot twice in the chest and one in the head, as the front portion of their bodies effectively faced them. They were ideal target practice. Bogies down, reported Strega. Waste of ammo, if you ask me, said Grayson in a disappointed tone. Should have woken up the whole town and tell them we're here. I want more than this. We can't afford that right now, Gray. 
You'll have your fun later, right, sir? Strega replied, to which O'Brien responded, Next phase will be mechanized. From then on, it'll be open season. Grayson was pleased with the response and promise of a true gunfight, as stealth was his least favorite activity. Their new path seemed like a hallway of darkness compared to the rest of the street, but they quickly utilized it. Badgers moved the bodies by the entrance and placed them into a container on the side of the house. Regarding the house itself, it was a small abode that fit perfectly for a family of four. However, he knew that as guards for a general's wife, they couldn't sleep in the same area. That proved to be the case when he picked up motion on the left side of the house. It was a garage attached to the home. It was moderately sized, and the main door suggested that they could house two vehicles. From his sensors alone, he figured that they are within the space as the vehicle and that they only have the one. This was reinforced by the worn tread on only one side of the driveway. He pointed to the garage signing that there should be five individuals using it as their resting area. O'Brien moved to the side and found a side door with a small window. He would move close to it appeared in, letting his HUD highlight any object within its view. With a scan, he counted a total of five sleeping guards. He then checked for the door's security but found it unlocked. Poor fools, he thought as the door slowly swung out towards him, providing ambient light to the room. They slept in black suits that went under the armor they had set aside on a nearby table. Their beds were orderly, which made it easier for O'Brien and Strega to move through. Without wasting much time, both individuals holstered their weapons and drew their knife that was in a holster on their lower back. With a quick yet powerful thrust, they pierced the center of their throat to the spine, severing its connection. The first didn't react as much, but the second one did. Noticing something deathly wrong, the resting soldier tried to fight O'Brien off by extending his arms and pressing against his chest plate. The weight against him was minimal. They were small, and their body mass was much less than an average human of the same height. Therefore, it was easy for him to maintain bodily control over the enemy. Not trying to raise a verbal alarm, O'Brien placed his left hand over the struggling Celian and drove the knife into their neck, piercing it from the side. The excess of the knife made its way through the neck and revealed a bloodied tip protruding from the other side of where he drove it in. In seconds, the Celian ceased movement. Noticing that all five were taken care of, he ordered the two male raiders their next set of orders. Badgers Gray, hide the bodies and clean up any mess. Stay quiet. They nodded and began their work. Did we have to assassinate them in their sleep? Spoke Strega, her tone hushed yet empathetic. The know we're at war. They just didn't expect us to be on their doorstep. Doesn't mean you get to sit around until you're told that the enemy are at the gates. They most likely would have done the same to us if they found a camp of sleeping raiders. She understood what he meant. The horrors of war and the decisions made to meet an objective. She would continue to do her job until fate decided otherwise. Until then, she would follow her lieutenant to hell and back. Besides, you know what they did, so don't go easy on them. She simply returned a nod, her purple visor reflecting what little light bounced off the surfaces. Hunter, prepare to breach, quietly, O'Brien ordered, stacking himself near the door with Strega in tow. Aye, sir, he responded. With hushed tones, O'Brien ordered their infiltration. Breach, breach, breach. Hunter returned a response. Breaching. He then opened the door that led into the laundry room. His weapon was slightly lowered below his sight line as he cleared his section of the house. Hunter and the other raiders that accompanied him met at the base of the stairs. He directed they go up, while he would check what he assumed to be the kitchen. It had a door and light filtered through the bottom. As they made their way up the stairs, he looked to the bottom left of his internal HUD. For a moment, there was a yellow indicator on his motion detector before it briefly stopped a couple of feet from the door. O'Brien directed his right ear to the door in an effort to pick up any noise that could indicate who it might be. Then they spoke. Oh, my dear, I wish you would hurry and return, Tor. It was the wife. He notified Strega, who stood behind him of the single occupant, and told her to get ready. Before he opened the door, however, she began to move toward him, calling out for someone familiar. Aleska, is that you, dear? She called out her daughter. I thought I told you not to come downstairs until morning. 
She opened the door, this time with a face she did not recognize. She stood frozen with fear, trying to force out words that chose not to come. O'Brien had readied his sidearm prior to her opening the door and pressed it against her stomach. He led her back to the table that was behind her, motioning her to sit as he already took a seat for himself. When she refused to move, Badger forced her down on the chair by pressing down on her shoulder. With that force, her legs gave out, likely from shock. Trying to calm her down, O'Brien removed his helmet and sat it in front of him, his sidearm still trained on her. Let's have a chat, shall we? Cella system, cradle world of Celia, mid-2670. First Lieutenant O'Brien, 4th ODR Battalion, Raptor Company. Her hair was long and was wrapped up in a mess of a top bun. She adorned a well-made set of jewelry that rested on her head with a matching necklace. Both took the shape of graciously decorated flowers. The dress she wore was a pale white and looked similar to a sundress with a distinct V cut for the neck, paired with sleeves, similar to a kimono, that ran to the mid-portion of her forearms. The mid-shoulder was exposed, as what was probably intended by design, and she wore a bright red sash on her mid-torso that wrapped around just below her breasts. Her skin looked well taken care of, and was the color of pastel violet with amethyst markings, with her eyes mirroring her skin. Instead of rounded ears like his own, Celians had ears that were pointed. There was some fur visible on the back that resembled the color of their hair, with the tips sprouting with fur like the tips of cat ears. They were significantly different from a human's. Instead of a single iris color making the most color aside from the sclera, they had two rings of color, a thin bright ring and a pastel inner iris. Their pupils were also different in that they had the same circular look, but on the top and bottom were two barely connected sets of pupils that ended up making their pupils resemble that of a feline from a distance. It wasn't jarring to O'Brien, but he found them to be a strangely beautiful occurrence of nature. You can relax. I don't intend to hurt you, O'Brien said in a comforting tone, trying not to raise his voice. Then tell me, fear apparent as she spoke, what are you doing in my home, and what happened to the guards that were supposed to protect me? Dead, he said bluntly, and you will too if you don't cooperate. She swallowed in response to his words. She mustered what courage she could to maintain conversation. What of my children? They'll be taken care of, he said, her face growing sullen. Knowing what she might be thinking, he added a statement to ease her worry. We don't intend to separate you three, as long as you do as I say. Now I almost forgot, what is your name? She sat quiet for a moment, reluctant to answer, but did so in the end. Aleska Telesk. O'Brien was confused about the last name. Telesk? First I'm hearing of a surname. He shot a look to Strega, who only shook her head in denial. It is my family name, first of my generation. Oh... How do surnames work for the Selian people? He inquired. We... Our people can join names of husband and wife, and that name becomes our family name. Our children inherit it, but their names will too change when they grow and find a partner, should they be wed. It was interesting knowledge for O'Brien, how their last names were chosen. How about you? She asked a man in thought, his attention now refocused on her. We usually end up with the paternal's family name, and as such usually gets passed down from son to son when they marry. Some have even opted to take their partner's name instead, or occasionally they hyphenate. He could tell by her expression that the concept was foreign, but not inconceivable. Then before I answer more of your questions, may I request one from you? She said with pleading eyes. O'Brien nodded, urging her to continue. What do you intend to do after you've sent me and my children away? What of my people? O'Brien sat, his face cold with emotion as he stared into the eyes of Aleska, unnerving her the longer he stared, until he finally broke his silence. To topple an empire? She blinked with an exasperated expression, processing his answer. But, but that means to wholly remove the heart and soul of all of Sela. He rocked his head in affirmation. That's right, he replied, leaning back into his chair. Want to know why we're here? 
he said in a casual manner, now resting his sidearm pointed away from Aleska. She nodded in response. We know who you are and who you're connected to, married to, in fact. There's plenty of what we could do with you, but that's not why. To us, you're nothing but a side quest for a concerned citizen. No harm will come to you or your kids. You have my word. Aleska visibly relaxed at his words. Seeing her reaction, he called for an individual who waited just outside the door. However, if you jeopardize my mission, I will not hesitate to shoot you. Hunter, bring them in. With not even five seconds to feel safe, she immediately tensed to his threat. Hunter entered the door with two children in front of them. At the sight of their mother, they ran and met her at the waist. Tears of joy overturned their initial feelings of fear, likely from being woken up by unfamiliar faces. Mummy, mummy, cried the young boy. Mama, I'm scared, cried the daughter. Aleska caressed them as she held them close. Don't worry, my darlings. Everything will be all right. She directed a knowing glance to O'Brien, to which he nodded in response. As she tried to settle the kids, alarms blared that surrounded the neighborhood. O'Brien put his helmet on, meeting the gaze of the kids. Their faces returned to fear. However, he had already figured why they returned to their previously frightened state. His helmet held the gaze of a demon with a large smile with knives for teeth. Of course, the design wasn't intended to be used with an audience of children. What's that alarm? inquired O'Brien to Aleska. An evacuation notice. There should be shuttles arriving to the nearby landing platforms not far from here. A series of knocks sounded from the entrance, and O'Brien and his team instinctively readied their rifles toward the direction of the noise. Strega positioned herself behind the family and Badger, Hunter and his team hid themselves away in the living room behind the furniture and away from the windows, their weapons at the ready. Miss Aleska! A call sounded from the entrance as they continued knocking. Miss Aleska, are you awake? We need to leave. Gray, status. He called over his squad's voice input communications. Me and some of the boys had to ditch when the alarms rang. We're back back the hill where we came from, but you have an elderly couple at the door. Damn. O'Brien cursed. He wasn't expecting an alarm to sound, but he was thinking that he could use it to aid them in their mission. He then turned to Aleska amidst the constant calling of the couple outside. Talk to them. She was surprised at his suggestion and inquired what he wanted her to say. And what exactly do you want for me to tell them? My guards are dead and the people who killed them are in my home? Not exactly. He gave her a quick rundown before she made her way to the door. O'Brien closed the door to the kitchen with Strega and the kids, and he followed closely behind the ever-growing anxious Aleska. She opened the door to the point where she only revealed half of her body and little of the internal entryway. Y yes she replied meekly. Oh, finally, spoke a woman. We thought you wouldn't wake up, even with the alarms. Are you and the kids ready to leave? Aleska shook her head. N no, Miss Callio. We have orders from the guards to stay put. They're usually here at the door, no? Where could they have gone? T they're retrieving a personal shuttle, Miss Callio, reserved for a chief commander, or higher, they said. She replied with a nervous and shy laugh. O'Brien hid by the door and leveled his sidearm to Aleska's waist, adding increased pressure to make her aware that she had a gun pointed directly at her. She fidgeted at first when he pressed it against her, but maintained composure in front of the elderly couple. Don't worry, she reassured. I have some of the guard here at home. Now go or you'll miss your shuttle. Are you sure? We can take little Torlin and Elisa for you to the bunkers. It's fine, Mr. Porlo, really. You should leave now. I don't want the guards to think you're one of those rebels, do you? They recoiled at the possibility of being called a rebel. Those freaks! Come with, Kaylee! Let us not waste any more of dear Aleska's time. Porlo grabbed his wife by the wrists and quickly led her away. Dear, surely you can't be serious. Rebels here. Their conversation trailed off until they disappeared down the main road, and Aleska closed the door, taking in a large breath. Rebels? questioned O'Brien. There have been words of some outer colonies rebelling against the words of the Council, she started. But it's said that they put a stop to it as quickly as it started. 
What were they rebelling against? He leaned against the nearby wall perpendicular to the door that Aleska rested on. There was apparently footage taken from the front lines of Selian troops taking Terrans as slaves. She said the name with a sympathetic tone, her expression now solemn and joyless. Is... is that true? He lowered his sidearm and holstered it on his right thigh and nodded, her expression now reflecting sadness. I'm sorry for what my people have caused, truly? O'Brien placed his right hand on the grip of his rifle and rested it over his chest. It wasn't your decision. Besides, we already know who did. She was taken aback by his response, but she likely knew who he meant. Fearing the worst, she decided to refrain from speaking out. We'll wait until the town is clear in the meantime. O'Brien led Aleska to the couch of her living room, followed by her two children playing with the helmet Les Strega. You and your kids will stay here while we keep an eye on you. If you require something, let us know. I'll send for covers to keep you warm. She nodded at his hospitality, even though he occupied her home. He gave the blankets to the children, and Aleska from Badgers, and the two children were quick to sleep. Get some sleep. You're going to have a long ride ahead of you. She was slow to sleep, but not long before her exhaustion took her, with a protective loving embrace wrapping her children close. Sela System, Cradle World of Celia, mid-2670, Aleska Telesk, mother of two, wife of Torlak. When morning came, Aleska awoke from her slumber. She looked at O'Brien, who sat on a chair facing out the window, then to her sides. Noticing the lack of pressure, she hurriedly removed the blankets that currently covered her. She found nothing. She then returned a gaze to the sitting O'Brien, his helmet off, as he ate into a protein bar that she didn't recognize. Mm. My kids, where are they? O'Brien raised his left hand in a calming motion and directed her attention to the kitchen, its door open, and the sounds of laughter erupted from it. Her anxiety slightly lowered, but her instinct as a mother wouldn't allow her to write off her feelings unless she had visual confirmation of their well-being. She stood from her seat, fixing her dress, before making her way to the kitchen, with O'Brien in tow. When she entered, she noticed a considerably large man playing with her son as he continued showing the Terran his toys and making noises with his mouth, mimicking the sounds of ship thrusters and explosions. Her son seemed captivated by the Terran. Next, she directed her attention to the female Terran behind her daughter as they drew on a personal entertainment device. She was deep in concentration when she glanced for a moment at the door to the kitchen, her expression lighting up at the appearance of her mother. Mama, Elisa said, leaving her seat and taking the pad with her. At the call of his sister, Tor reacted in the same manner, leaving Gray to his own devices and lone toy gifted by the Selian child. She caressed them, holding them tight. She asked them what they were doing, leading Elisa to tell of their morning. First we woke up and we were hungry, so we asked Miss Elizabeth and she made us food. It was so good. Aleska directed a gaze at the female, then to the sink and noticed her large pans were stacked upon each other. Evidenced with water told her that after cooking, they had cleaned up after themselves. Taking a moment, she did notice a fragrance that wafted in the air. Elisa, noticing this, ran to the countertop, where another one of O'Brien's men leaned against the counter. Badgers handed a wrapped plate to the young girl, who happily took it and trotted back to her mother, who took it, the scene was surreal for her. She sat on a free chair and began to eat her food. O'Brien speculated that she liked the food, as indicated by an increased pace of her eating. Slow down now, warned Strega. We don't need an accident. Aleska slowed her chewing, savoring its flavor. As she continued to eat, tears began forming on the corners of her eyes. Why are you crying, Mama? Elisa was the first to ask, followed by her youngest, is mummy sad? I'm fine, dearest. Now run along with our new friends. I need to speak with, um... O'Brien? He responded swiftly. Yes, Mr. O'Brien. I need to speak with him alone. I'm sure Miss Elizabeth would be willing to play with you both, yes? Strega nodded and led the children out of the kitchen, who then took charge and led her upstairs, along with Gray and Badgers. After finishing her meal, she turned to O'Brien, who took a seat across from Aleska. What will happen to us? to my children? They'll be with you, the whole way. You'll all be safe. 
her expression grew grim. To her, it was like she was abandoning not just her people, but her husband. To flee with the enemy would likely be seen as treason by the War Council. How they got information on her, that was something she wanted to know. Mr. O'Brien, she started, gauging his reaction. When he remained expressionless, she continued. May I ask who put you up to this? Is that something I can ask? O'Brien nodded, giving a smirk. It's not like my boss gave the request, so I wouldn't mind telling you. He relaxed his position in his chair, making direct eye contact with Aleska, slightly unnerving her. Tell me, you have any living relatives? She thought seriously for the moment as she tried to name off her family. She stated her obvious parents, but they lived on another part of the continent. She said she had cousins and extended family, but most had lost contact some years ago or just disappeared. She stated that when it came to her family, she didn't have a relationship with them besides her parents, and then a realization dawned on her. Did you meet with my elder brother, Gruda? O'Brien nodded. We met him on Verbus. Had the gall to approach an armed escort, though, I'll give him that. He laughed, reminiscing their first encounter with Gruda as a pseudo-ambassador for the Selians, as well as a trove of cultural and military information. Is, is he alive? She choked, fearing the worst. He's alive, he replied. Said he'd help us if we move his sister and her kids off-world. So here we are. He gave a wink, extending his arms in a wide fashion, emphasizing his presence. Thank the fathers, she said clasping her hands together in a praying motion. He did always care for me. I had thought he died some time ago, to think he made his way all the way to Verbis. Her tone was melancholic, but filled with a warm memory as she recalled the time she spent with him before he left. In any case, I appreciate your hospitality, even though it is my home. She gave a courteous bow, pulling her dress to the sides, widening it. It's no problem, he replied, beckoning her to stop her bow. You don't seem too hurt at the fact that your guards aren't around. Why is that? Her face grew angry at the mention, her brow furrowed, crinkling the space in between. I've held no love for our military, she started. I'm grateful for the work they do on our border, but with what I have seen on the net, I can't feel anything other than disgust. To think my own husband would do that. You mentioned a name before, Tor? probed O'Brien in a curious tone. Torlak, my husband. Earlier, when his squad shortly arrived at the Sela system, he received an encrypted message from none other than the general of the raiders, Titus Brook. It was during one of their interrogations that the name was dropped and was made as a target marked for capture. However, O'Brien had other plans intended for the enemy's general equivalent. I know of him. He's a chief general, correct? She nodded the highest and only title for those tasked to wage war as ordered by the War Council. They are solely responsible for commanding our armies. That name again. He had heard it several times, and it was essentially the governing body for the Selian people. By its name alone, he made an educated guess that they were continuously locked in a war, long before the Terrans showed up, with the Galactic Union as mentioned by Agruda some time ago. Do you think that they would be the ones to initiate the order to slaughter my people? He questioned. His words were coarse, but they rang true. Aleska confirmed as such with a nod of her head. The chief general must abide by their will. Should he deny them? She trailed off, not wanting to finish her sentence, but she regained her courage and continued. Then their family would be executed. He could hear her voice choke at the mention. Her knees collapsed under their weight, but O'Brien supported her by placing his arm on her back, gently. She seemed as if she had fallen ill from the realization alone. They would have killed my entire family. She raised her voice involuntarily. That's why they were here. There's no need to watch over the wife of a chief commander, let alone a general. Tears began streaming down her face at the realization of the, the troops around her home. They would have executed Aleska and her children or taken them elsewhere and only say that they followed orders. It would have been a fate worse than death, which O'Brien and his team inadvertently prevented. When did they arrive? He asked, patting her on the back in a calming manner. Thank you. She placed her weight on O'Brien as she tried to regain her balance. 
just shortly after my husband left for the out colonies, a little over a month ago. That was the first we had been sent guards. After O'Brien and his team first arrived on planet, Aleska and her home were already in the presence of her guard. He had expected there to be more to the group for protecting the wife of a general of the Empire, but that appeared not to be the case. After regaining her footing, she returned to the floor, this time in a prostrating posture, and apologized to O'Brien. On behalf of my people, I can do nothing but apologize for what my husband and the Council have allowed to commit against our stellar neighbors. Her figure laid over her own as she rested on her legs and bent her torso forward while placing her hands in front of her head as her forehead touched the ground. It was similar to apologetic postures of the Oriental cultures back home. If taking my life is too light a punishment, then I offer my body... O'Brien rested a hand on her shoulder and she flinched at his touch. Raise your head, he spoke in a soft and comforting tone. You shouldn't resign your life so easily like that. You should not have to bear the punishment from the actions of another. He said, lending a hand for her to grab, which she took, and he propped her up once more. Her expression was one of embarrassment, but O'Brien overlooked her earlier prostration and continued where he left off. Besides, you have children to look to, and I'm not trying to be a father anytime soon. Clarity rushed Aleska, and she was aware of her recent actions bowing and apologizing profusely before he made her stop once more. I will need something else from you, however. I will do my best to assist, Mr. O'Brien, she replied, slowly regaining her composure. Gonna need you to write a note to your husband that you're being taken to a secure bunker. If he thinks you're safe, then that'll make it easier for me and my troops. She nodded and began writing her letter. In the meantime... O'Brien ordered his squad to secure the surrounding homes and dumped the bodies of the guards out of the vision of the children. When Aleska finished her letter, Strega scanned it for translation, checking if she input a secret phrase of code that could jeopardize their mission. If she was playing with them, then he wasn't sure if he could stop himself from putting a bullet in her and dropping the children on an outer colony planet. When Strega confirmed that the letter was code-free, he washed away the thoughts as quickly as he generated them. Where now? Aleska asked. He directed them to outside the home. Are leaving, Mama? Elisa asked as she stepped out onto the paved entrance walkway. She nodded. We're all going on a trip on a new ship. The mention of a new ship sparked the young boy's intrigue as he began a rapid exchange of questions, with Gray easily answering them as fast as they came. If everything goes smooth, You'll be off-planet in the next hour. They had to wait no longer than a few minutes before a ship approached from their overlook camp. The awe of the children were apparent as the ship approached closer to their location and decelerated, orienting itself so that the rear ramp faced them and opened. The ship was called a Vulture, but the one at their disposal was a stealth variant. It started off as a gunship, as its primary role with stealth as the secondary trait. However, it was fast for its size, and it held a small accompaniment of troops. With the ramp open, two figures hung on the side of the ramp as the ship leveled itself and mad a short landing, with the ramp about twenty feet from where they stood. Darian exited the ramp, including his spotter, as soon as it was fully extended. Welcome back, Dare! Rah! he grunted in response, and made his way to the back of the group, and his spotter reunited with others of similar rank, exchanging stories of the most recent events. Darian carried with him an O.D. olive-colored bag that was nearly the length of his person on his back. O'Brien had an idea of what it was in it, as Dare still had his marksman rifle slung across his chest. After they were cleared, an air crewman who stood behind Darian and his spotter stepped off the ramp and stood before O'Brien. Sir, one of the air crewmen called out directing a gaze to the first aliens he's seen in his lifetime. Are these the assets? They are, he replied. Treat them well. They're my guests. Aye, sir. The air crewman pointed at the alien family and ordered them aboard. You three, let's go. The young boy was first, and next was Elisa. Both were supported by the crewman. Their embarkation was quick, leaving no time for a proper departure, but understood that it had to be this way. 
Aleska was the last to board, but she turned one more to the helmetless O'Brien. Again, I'm sorry for everything. I do wish we had met under better circumstances. We probably wouldn't have, but I could entertain the thought, he replied, receiving a light chuckle from the woman. Perhaps. Until next time, then, Mr. O'Brien. She gave a bow, wrapping her arms across her stomach, and took her seat slowly like she had some pains in the lower back and abdomen. O'Brien then turned to Badgers and Hunter, who stood just a few feet away. Escort them and get them situated. Also, have medical take a look at the missus. She might have gotten sick in our proximity. One, you're done. Come back here with the gunship. Air, sir! They hopped on the ramp and the crewmen waited until they were seated before signaling for the pilots to take off. The ramp closed during its ascent and rapidly gained speed from where it originally came and then pulled up, making a sharp incline until it could no longer be seen with the naked eye. Cella System Cradle of Celia, mid-2670. First Lieutenant O'Brien, 4th ODR Battalion, Raptor Company. With their first objective a success, and now he would move on to the next objective. Gather round, raiders. His troops encircled him, their attention now on their commander. We have the assets, and once we receive word that they're clear, we'll move on to the next mission. Until then, get situated near the entrance to town. Get some cover and hunker down until I get more word. Clear? Ra, they replied in unison, making their way to the entrance of the town. There were three ways one could enter the town that his scouts have found shortly after the town got deserted. There was an old road that took a route to their north that followed the bottom of the nearby mountains and hills to the nearest town. The second was two platforms sized for commercialized or military shuttles. This was the main route taken last night during the evacuation, some opting to take their personal vehicles and took the road north. The final entry point was by rail. His troops investigated it and found it operated similar to their own system, using electromagnetic to propel it, but it was not used for the evacuation. From the signs surrounding the station, it indicated that the rail would lead straight into the heart of the capital city, or at least the inner edge of it, all three of these forms were located near the northeastern part of the town and was where the squad had split up their cover into the surrounding houses. Gray and three other raiders took a large building that faced the main road and the shuttle pads. Another team of four white-marked raiders split up into teams of two into houses closer to the main town gate. Strega, Darian, and O'Brien holed up in a building in full view of the rail station's entrance, as well as the main road that led to Aleska's home. As per his orders, his troops maintained radio silence, but spoke with their integrated proximity chat. Strega laid her back against a wall as she peered out the nearby window, which was just short enough for her to view the top of the rail station platform. She set the curtains in a way where the sun would not land on her, and she could view it unimpeded. Darian was in the same room, but he had moved a table near the window and placed his Series 10 suppressed marksman rifle on the table with the bipod extended. In the same fashion, he situated himself to stay out of the sun while maintaining a clear view of both the landing zones and the main town entrance. The road was paved in parallel from their view and then took a left to Aleska's home. O'Brien sat right of the window, but maintained cover completely as the sun would land on him, making him visible to a curious onlooker. Instead, he closed his portion of the curtains and let Strega and Darian keep watch. Any word for the Admiral? Strega spoke, her voice artificial sounding from her helmet. A short transmission, O'Brien replied. Said they should be entering the system soon, and that we'll get our all clear, but never mentioned what it's going to look like. He relaxed into his chair, his rifle lapped over his chest. Did you put in a requisition? How are we going to get to the main city? Darian spoke. His posture was relaxed as his rifle stood on its bipod and maintained stability as he rested his chin on his wrists. His helmet was placed next to his feet by the leg of the table. Of course I did, O'Brien confirmed. Got us some pumas, a couple of rhinos, and to finish off, a couple of grizzlies. Strega whistled at the order, noting her surprise. I called dibs on a puma. Dare, you got Gunner? He nodded. Not this time. I'm taking my own ride, ain't that right, sir? Yours probably won't have the gun. A strict scout model. Quiet, too. 
Darian acknowledged his ride, but that also meant he was most likely going to have a spotter again. For several hours, they made small banter when the digital signs of the rail station lit up with activity. By now, the weather had darkened, making the scene gray, and the sounds of wind were picking up. Sir, rail systems active, Strega reported. Their attributed changed, and the air surrounding them grew cold and silent, save for Mother Nature. Raiders, we might have a guest. Wake up and shut up, he transmitted, breaking their previous bout of radio silence. The rail car approached the station, and with her helmet, Strega utilized a small zoom function incorporated into it that could give a binocular zoom of around five times magnification. It wasn't a function you would use in junction with a weapon that wasn't equipped with a HUD link system module. Otherwise, it was just a set of expensive binoculars. I count one. Male, 25 to 40. I think they're wearing an officer uniform. O'Brien moved over to just above Strega and utilized the same function on his helmet. He matched it the description from Yorla and Gruda, as well as information gathered from both Minerva and Athena, Chief General Torlak. I have a shot, sir. Should I disable him? Darian sounded eager to fire as he positioned the rifle into his shoulder and looked into its scope, ready to land the blow. Permission denied. Let him walk. Darian grumbled lightly and set the rifle on safe, but traced his reticle over the body of the Selian. O'Brien watched as Torlak wandered the streets of his town, now void of life. There were traces of leftover luggage and trash overblown from open trash bins. He walked slow as he looked around, trying to find signs of life, but finding none. He traveled further down the road to the home of his wife and entered it, as witnessed by O'Brien, Strega, and Darian. Think he'll find the note? Strega commented. If he doesn't, then he's a terrible general, replied Darian, keeping his rifle aimed in the direction of the house. Remind me again, sir. Why can't I shoot the bastard? Darian added, wouldn't that go against the general's direct order? O'Brien thought deep on that subject. He was well within his rights to capture the man who single-handedly started a war between their species, who took captives and sent them to a fate worse than death itself. Of course, he wanted to execute him, but deep down, he wanted the one who started it to watch his empire fall in front of him, to be in a position where he could act but could not defend what he needed to most. It wasn't his idea originally. The idea was brought to him in private from the Admiral and supplemented with statistics from both Minerva and Athena. You want me to do what? Like I said, don't kill him if you come across him, Wolf repeated. I wasn't told to kill him, only capture. You're not seeing it, O'Brien. There can be more to defeating the enemy than a simple kill or capture order. He was confused. What did he not get? What purpose was there in keeping a commanding general to continue to command? Then enlighten me. First off, you know of the request made by Gruda? He nodded. Minerva had scanned through some archives from their census bureau aboard Lassa Station. Turns out they had more than we needed, and we also came across public records of well-known individuals. O'Brien was following, but urged Wolf to continue. We have the public records of individuals personally related to Torlak. Just like Gruda said, a mother of two, Aleska Talesk. Secure her safety and fake a disappearance, but make it where she was sent to safety. Once you've done your part, I'll take care of the general, on equal footing. Then we'll strike. At his best, huh? O'Brien said aloud, reminiscing of the memory. O'Brien found it mildly petty, but just as entertaining, to think that he would circumvent his own general for the whims of an admiral of a rival branch. He found it ironic, really, but decided to go with it. His primary mission was the capture of the War Council, and Torlak was second to that. He could overlook Torlak's presence here as he tried to give one farewell before the upcoming battle. Sorry she's not here, bud. He thought to himself before he was called to by Strega directing his gaze out the window and over the landing pads. Contact, sir. Two shuttles. They were gray with a blue tint to the finish with markings on the side of the door. What do they read? Selian ground troop. Gander's fist, she replied. All that and for what? commented Darian. It's almost like painting a target on your back. When the shuttles made contact with the ground, the side doors opened and a series of armored troopers exited the vehicle 
their weapons drawn, and created a perimeter of the landing zone. They wore similar armor to the guards from the night before, but instead of a white and black scheme, their armor was colored brown and dark gray, with a dark tan colored undersuit. They also wore a helmet, but its construction differed from the troops prior. It had a more angled eve for the visor that was colored amber, and instead of brown, the helmet was colored mostly gray. Markings decorated the forehead portion of the helmet to mimic their own markings, in a glacial blue. Their weapons were compact and still looked large compared to their frame. The rifle in question was unlike what they had seen previous and seemed specialized to them. It looked as if it had a large frontal portion of the barrel shroud that created a rectangle silhouette on top and bottom of where the barrel sits. The stock was connected as part of the weapon's frame with the magazine loaded in the rear for an overall bullpup-style rifle. Paired with that, they also wielded a sidearm on their waist belt that looked like it was fired by hammer pull instead of the standard striker-fired series of handguns the TRSC favored. O'Brien had feared that the enemy had come to them in response to the evacuation or missing guard, but the approaching Torlak revealed otherwise. Even with his enhanced hearing system, even he couldn't make out what Torlak was speaking with the lead trooper. Strega, see what you can find on their military. These guys look much different compared to previous infantry. I'll note it, but from what I've seen, there might not be much of a difference. He understood what she meant, alluding to the investigation of the armor of the first century. At best, it could stop lower-end calibers and maybe shrapnel. He would need a larger sample size, so he would rather not underestimate any Selian trooper he came across. After a short exchange, Torlak went with the troopers and once all had entered their respective shuttles, the doors closed, and they took off towards the atmosphere. O'Brien would order his squad to wait several minutes to make sure they don't do a second or third pass and catch them just as they exit their cover. He didn't exactly have the means to take down a shuttle with the weapons he had. After he deemed it safe, O'Brien received a message, the alarm originating from Athena's storage device. He brought her up, meeting him just below eye level. Sir, I've received a notification from Vice Admiral Wolf for you. She gave a bow, a developing habit for every first visual appearance. What's it say? O'Brien questioned. Simply a timer of twelve hours and forty-six minutes in the word descending. Understood, he said, placing her away back on his waist. All teams, you have twelve hours and thirty minutes to rest. I suggest you take it. Keep at least one man on watch. Aye, aye, replied the squad. O'Brien was now given a timeline for their assault, for when hell would finally break loose on their planet. He would rather not feel that way, but deep down, he relished in what was about to come. The War Council would meet its end, and he was ecstatic he was picked to lead it. The Selians had not known true ground war, and by tonight, they would. O'Brien would be woken up by an alarm he set just after his watch, and he would be met with another darkened sky. Except this time, the day that had originally turned gray was now a clear and starry night. He took a moment to look up into the night sky, and beside the flickering stars of other systems were a mass of flashing lights that danced around erratically. The fight had begun. All hands! On me! Double time! He exited his building with Strega and Darion behind him, their helmets donned, and their visage was that of a warrior eager for combat. When all had gathered, Strega lit a beacon that transmitted an experimental delta band frequency, a rediscovered mode of encryptable communication, and strobing infrared lights. She set the beacon in the center of the landing pads, which also connected to the main road, as the newly designated LZ. O'Brien then addressed the group. The time is now. We're in enemy territory, deep behind enemy lines. He pointed to the sky as countless lights flashed in and out of existence the scene reflecting off their visors. It might not seem like much, but the squids above are fighting and dying as we speak, against an enemy that has shown us no quarter. While we have shown compassion to their innocent, they enslaved our own. It's now our time to bring the fight to their home. Not in space, but in their home. The land, air, and sea. We have seen what they did to us over two systems, but we drove them back. And now we have delivered that retribution tenfold. Remember this moment. When humanity takes the capital of our first alien race, Oorah, raiders! Oorah, sir! They replied in a visceral scream, 
enough to shatter the world itself. That was their will, and it wanted blood. And as their will, it would also grant them the means to enact their revenge when the whir of engines enveloped their area. It was a familiar sound that the raiders had grown accustomed to in the field. The Kestrel. A ship designed for rapid field transit of vehicles, weapons, supplies, and sometimes troops. Its frame was essentially a rectangle attached to thrusters and a cockpit. The sides and rear walls of the box were raised into itself from the top, revealing their cargo as they landed on the main road to disembark the cargo. They were Pumas, lightly armored reconnaissance vehicles, with a rear gun attached, except for one. There were four in total, and O'Brien's squad commandeered them, driving them out of the Kestrel and onto the road where they were parked as the beginning of a convoy. Several of the lower enlisted raiders stood by the vehicles, inspecting them for damage, ammo, and fuel. The next wave consisted of four Kestrels, their heavy variant, which had moderate cargo space for the next vehicle to disembark, the Rhino. It's a six-wheeled armored personnel carrier with a 25mm cannon atop it with an addition remote-controlled .50 caliber machine gun, and two of them were delivered. As they parked behind the Pumas, the rear doors of the APCs opened, revealing more troops to supplement his attack force, a total of 24 additional troops. They reported to their officer in command, O'Brien. They were two squads of Raptor Company that had stayed behind during both the attack on Lassus Station and O'Brien's current mission. It was safe to say that since Draxus, they were eager to enter combat. Before returning to their vehicles, O'Brien called out to the squad leader of Bravo Squad, Sergeant Eau Claire. What's the status in orbit? I would imagine that it was difficult to get you all through their barricade. To be honest, sir, she started. It was chaos aboard the assault carrier. Their defenses are top-notch, but... But... What happened? What you might expect. Our escort ships protecting our ship were destroyed. And our assault carrier took heavy damage. Lost a lot of the pods in the fight. Her expression was sadness, fueled by anger. Not just from the slaughter of our sailor cousins, but of our fellow raider brothers and sisters. Hearing the damage to his beloved ship welled up anger within him that he could feel rising in his chest, but he collected himself in front of his trooper. I understand. Will she be operational if we need raider support? He inquired. She nodded. We lost some some pods, but not the spirit. Those who don't have a pod should be getting shuttled to a ship that has extra. He was pleased to hear that they could get reinforcements, but it might be some time before they could actually call on them. He hoped that the Vice Admiral would take that into account when it came to the siege of the city. He was going to need it. Return to your squad once we get the heavy armor we're departing, copy? Yes, sir. She rendered a salute, as did he, and she returned to her squad besides the APC she arrived in. The final two Kestrels to arrive were much different in condition compared to the previous six. These were larger, but there was also considerable damage with smoke emitting from one of the dorsal panels. Kestrel 131, you have smoke on your back. The pilot returned a quip, disregarding the damage report. Well aware, but she'll make it. She always does. He cut the comms and the doors to the cargo compartment opened, revealing a large vehicle with two sets of treads and a 130mm cannon on top loaded with all kinds of rounds made to decimate tank and cover alike. It was the Grizzly. The two Grizzlies rolled out from the cargo hold and onto the shuttle landing pads, the hard and sharp ting of gears and mechanical engineering heard in conjunction with its engine. It was a miracle that they came out unscathed. This rose their combat effectiveness to a new height, and morale was boosted among the raiders who saw it, sharing their awe as the two battle tanks made their way to their spots in the convoy. One tank in front, the two APCs in the center, and the final tank in the rear. Two Pumas would exist out of the convoy as their own element. O'Brien would take his seat as the passenger of Strega's Puma, and Gray would man the gun of the second Puma beside them in the front of the convoy. All hands, this is your lieutenant, he said, projecting into the command channel that all in his squad had access to receive. This is it. Check your gear, check your ammo, and follow your training. Recon team, survey the main road and check for any unpaved roads. Look for any emplacements we need to worry about. Main armor, once hostiles are revealed, 
You have full execute authority. A series of acknowledgement was heard from the drivers. They weren't from his company, but they were attached. That made them his to look out for, but with guns of their size he wasn't worried. With his assessment and accountability of his current force, he ordered their advance. The sounds of engines and treads filling the air. Raptor Company, move out! And in turn, they replied as was tradition. Oorah! Cellar System, Cradle of Celia, War Council Chambers, mid-2670, Vorta Volcala, War Council Chambers Clark. Vorta, Vorta! Vorta Volcala! A voice rang out from across the table where she sat. Her mind snapped to reality, and she met the eyes of the one who called to her. It was her longtime friend and colleague, Talani. Yes? Did you even hear what I said? Her tonal inflections gave Vorta a sense of frustration. Her friend spoke in a floaty manner that made it seem like she was talking to an infant. She knew Talani did so unironically, and that was just her natural speech pattern. Both sat in a large room that was dedicated for the consumption and disposal of food in a wing of the War Council chambers. Both served as clerks at the reception desks and had seen all manner of individuals enter and leave. No, sorry, I was just thinking, Vorta replied, her answer seeming unsatisfied to her friend. Well, like I was saying, something big is going on and some of the guards won't tell me no matter how much I put out. Are they supposed to tell you? Vorta replied, taking a bite out of a sandwich she had made from home. Well, no, but I'm cute. How could they not tell me? Is there something on my face? Tola, you can only get away with your appearance for so long before you finally meet someone who won't take to your advances. But you never learn. Vorta shook her head in a dismissive manner, irking Talani. No way, she said as if in shock. Is my headdress not in style? Talani replied, clearing missing the mark and pointing to her silver headdress ornament, with the central piece in the form of an elaborate star with an emerald-coloured jewel placed in the centre. You think if I keep pulling them aside, they'll tell me? After several bouts of invalidation towards her colleague and friend, Vorta returned to work. She sat at her desk that faced the main entrances. There were large planes of glass that gave a wide arc of view beyond the compound walls and to the surrounding buildings that towered over it beyond the street. However, her view was overtaken by the constant view of soldiers lifting and moving pieces of military equipment from a truck that had entered at the gate. From what some of the troops had told her, amid their attempts to court her, was that they were reinforcing much of the walls and windows with bags of dirt laid on top of each other supposedly to stop oncoming rounds from enemy weapons and shrapnel. Other than that, all she could really think about was her slowly diminishing view. What was once a sight of birds, flowers and sky was now reduced to olive-coloured bags of leaking dirt that stained the glass at around the average height of the troopers. At least I still have the sky, she thought to herself. She would continue her work, managing some paperwork, or directing higher appointed officials on where they needed to go and who was awaiting them. As of late, there were more military personnel than there were political. Some would be escorted by their own band of guards, much of whom donned the same outfit as those of the main army, but had differently coloured suits of armour. That was how their army was divided, those who are the general force and those who make up privatised bands, much like the late war chief commander Brallo. Of all the chiefs she had met in her work, he was the one she had adored the most. Kind, strong, and most notably, tall. When news came of his demise, she was crestfallen, and had taken a couple of days out of work to mourn. As word had it, they were unable to provide a body, and so it was a closed casket funeral after the campaign fleet had returned, with much fewer ships than before. It wasn't official, but word was starting to get around that she and Brallo were an item, something she was hoping to come to pass when they got back. Now she did her work in quiet efficiency, letting the time pass each day as more and more reinforcements were added to the building. When she would enter through the main gate each morning, there would always be another automated turret, tent, or band of troops within the perimeter and she would continue her work at her desk indefinitely. 
More time would pass since the troops stopped adding the chamber's defences, and during that time they would take what time they had to speak to either her or Talani. Vorta would deny their advances, and Talani would disappear with them, only to come back dishevelled. However, as of late, she had been seeing Talani with Councilman Polas as he would go about his business. From what she had seen, he wasn't bothered by it, but rather feigned annoyance at her presence, but kept her with him until they were out of sight. Vorta lost count to how many her friend has been with in the last several weeks and stopped counting after the twentieth occasion. During one morning, after she had set up her space, she would eavesdrop on two guards nearby having a conversation that she was barely able to make out. She would slowly and quietly slide her chair closer to them until she could make out full sentences. Did you hear? Apparently they began evacuations on the outskirt towns. Really? Don't you think it's a bit early for that? The other shrugged, denying its confirmation. I don't know, man. With what I've heard, the Terrans had already broken through Belladir and Dawn. Nothing left on Belladir, and apparently the scientist coalition on Dawn were taken as prisoner. Didn't they have a defence system? I heard they could hold off the Chief General fleet with those defences. That doesn't make sense to me how they got captured. Something ain't right. You think that's bad? Get this, the troops under Bralo were some of the finest Celia had to offer, but all of them got wiped out. Even Bralo himself. His fellow trooper was shocked at the revelation. No way. The Bralo. How did you not hear? They held a procession for the fallen soldiers of the campaign fleet got back. How did you not hear? The other raised his hands in defence, palms out. I don't know. I was out with the wife at our kids' tournament. Of course I'm not going to go. Fine, but apparently for a lot of them, it was closed casket style. They couldn't come back with the bodies. You know who killed him? You didn't hear this from me, he replied, and leaned in to try to lower his tone, but spoke to where Vorta could barely make out what they said. Apparently they rained down from the sky in metal shaped like tears or raindrops, crashed down and slaughtered his troops. The other was fearful, and Vorta understood as well. Bralo was well known among the troopers, and even among the civilians of his achievements, as one of, if not, the best ground troops commander of their time. If the enemy could effortlessly take out their best infantry commander, then they were a group to be rightfully feared. As they were about to continue their conversation, a guard came through the front doors and addressed the two. Jarlin, Erlo! Get back on patrol, or fathers help me. I'll send you to guard the war council's sanctum. Yes, war chief, sounded the two. I ain't trying to be food for those scaly freaks, added Jarlin, nudging Erlo in the shoulder as they hastily left. The war chief who remained stood by until the two cleared the entrance into the main courtyard until they were cleared of Vorta's view. The war chief turned to Vorta with a menacing glare, but she knew to already have her head down as she loudly shuffled some papers and data pads, feigning actual work until he left. She sighed and noticed that her desk was still empty, with Talani nowhere in sight. Last she had seen, she left with Councilman Polus just after work had started. It was near closing, and she had yet to see her and Polas leave from the inner sanctum wing. She wasn't authorised to go back there, as she was instructed by the chief clerk several weeks ago. Vorta had chalked it up to Talani spending quality time with Polas, probably trying to guarantee some form of safety should the Terrans make it to their cradle world. At the end of the day she would leave for her home, with was only a five-minute walk to the front gate and was situated underground as an emergency bunker. She moved there shortly after the campaign fleet's return and had stayed there ever since. She had stayed late waiting for Talani, but when she didn't appear, she left, hoping to see her tomorrow. However, as she slept, unbeknownst to Vorta, a battle waged in orbit and projectiles from the planet were sent into orbit, colliding with an enemy or missing their mark entirely. Of course, she would be made aware as she came in to work the next day, but to her surprise, she was denied access and turned away at the gate. All the while the plumes of smoke and streaks of light rose from the horizon towards the sky. 
She would depart towards her home where both she and Talani lived. Vorta would remain in her shoddy bunker, awaiting the only other soul who lived in it. However, Talani would never return. Cella System, Orbit of Celia, mid-2670, Chief General Torlak. Torlak rode in the shuttle with a squad of the gander's fists shortly after his depressing visit to his hometown. He had doubts, but the note left over from his wife was authentic. Even if he tried to look for the slightest hint that she may have inserted one of their hidden codes of distress, he found there to be none. It was something they had made before during his time as a chief commander. It was a rocky relationship at first when piracy was rampant with splinter union forces separated from their fleeing main force all those years ago. It was common for higher commanding officials to have their families targeted for ransom, or they would simply execute them. It was a tumultuous era for the Selian Empire, but it finally died down some ten-odd years ago, and they were finally able to relax. The men in the shuttle compartment were quiet, adding to their stoic exterior of their hidden faces and amber visors. Their armor was brown and gray over a black undersuit. Torlak knew of these groups that acted independently of standard ground forces, much like Brawlo's band of brothers. Each group was usually employed or in service to a high-ranking officer in addition to their standard ground troops. They also liked to give names for their groups, giving their standard armor a major color overhaul simply to set them apart from other commando units. As he knew them, Gander's fist was under service of Orlin, a chief commander in charge of the large orbital defense platforms around the planet, and most notably, the station that was in geosynchronous orbit of Artre, the capital city. The group is notorious as being known for boarding parties in their heyday, but have now been reduced to security and the occasional cargo inspection. If they were being utilized now, then they were probably in high spirits to actually do something. He confirmed this when a group near him started a conversation in lowered tones, but were poor in its execution. So he heard all of it, whether he wanted to or not. Hey, you think it's true? Did they really breach Belladir and Dorne? Apparently, the one across from the other replied. Rumor has it their fleet isn't that big. I heard it from a couple of my comrades over in comms. They've got big guns, but that's it. The pilots said they got a plan for them. The Inquirer was surprised at his comrade's seemingly limitless network chain. How do you know all these people? You sound like you have connections everywhere. His friend scoffed. Of course I do. I'm telling you, you gotta hit the bars with me next time. Yeah, yeah, next time. They then returned to topics unappealing to Torlak, ending his need to eavesdrop. He wanted to reprimand who was blabbering about intel like that, but he felt that to be the least of his priorities with regard to enemy ships compared to their planet defense fleet. It was the largest ever conjured since their war with the Union. They held the advantage with a ratio of 5 to 1, 380 capital-sized ships with thousands of fighters. It was a sight to bear witness. Of course, the Celia defense fleet, as they dubbed it, is a mass collection of fleets from as low as a newly appointed war chief up to a chief commander. Their collective fleets that answered the call were probably aching for a fight, since many here were relegated to single systems to protect against a stray Union-owned ship or two. Needless to say, he could tell they were eager for a fight, and that made him proud. Since their first encounter, Torlak pushed heavily with updates to ship offense and defense. They had the shipyards and overwhelming manpower to do so. It was only a couple of months since then, but it was enough to outfit most newer models with updated shields and weapons. The same couldn't be said for the older, smaller ships, so he could only pray to the fathers for their survival. Their shuttle rocked after a few minutes, when they had reached the middle and higher atmospheres. Once they were clear, the shuttle smoothed out, and it prepared a short-distance jump to their destination, one of the super stations that orbited above Artre. He was told that he was going to be sent to his ship, but last minute was redirected to meet with Orlin. What could he possibly want? Torlak thought to himself. Orlin was a longtime friend of Torlak. They had entered the service together during the height of the Selian Union War, which was how they were able to rapidly gain rank over the years following their initial commission as newly minted war chiefs. Torlak looked upon the memory was sincerity, wonder how much he had left behind since then. 
This would act as a good change of pace for him amidst the present threat. When the shuttle began its landing procedure, he noticed his ship docked with the large station, as was the same for many ships part of his fleet. His ship paled in comparison, adding to its grandeur. And there are three of them. It was greater than the many ships they had produced. These were a feat of engineering made him proud, as they were also the only defensive structures over the planet besides the orbiting fleets. As they approached the station, the shuttle rocked as the ship's automated landing sequence initiated, causing his limited stomach contents to shift. The same could be said with some of his fellow passengers as they tried their best to cope with their oncoming nausea, some even preparing their helmets to be makeshift buckets. He wanted off before they have the chance to use them. With a sudden halt of movement, the doors to the shuttle opened with a hiss of the working electronics. He stepped off and found himself in a large hangar filled to the brim with activity. There were innumerable amounts of ships fixed on a designated claw with a catwalk extending to the cockpit from the walkway that met with the wall. It was like a wall of ships suspended in the air, ready to depart at a moment's notice. The claw that attached itself to a ship was also connected to an emergency exit rail that would launch prepped fighters into the fight. Each hangar was isolated into their own spaces with tens of fighters in each, and he could see the numerous crew working about either on the craft themselves or on the functions of the station. He wouldn't want essential systems to fail when the moment counted. After ogling at the hangar he had seen many times before, he continued towards Orlin with a select few from Gander's fist escorting him. They didn't speak but that served him just fine as they walked the endless corridors of the station. They would strafe past some of the many food shops, including clothing and department stores. Closer to the center of the station, the open space doubled, mimicking some of the central courtyards in the major cities. Plants, running water, light similar to the sun, even some birds and rodents had made their home in this artificial biome. He never got tired of the sight, but without wasting time, he and his escorts continued beyond the park-like zone of the station and into a service elevator reserved for security and workers, who, based on their clearance, can only access certain levels of the station they were screened to enter. They rode the elevator before coming to a stop. When the doors opened, they exited, and Torlak was met with the dim lighting of the wide corridors. Unlike the area from before, where laughs and conversation filled the air with the bright light, the area before him was dimly lit, and most only spoke in quiet tones. There were fewer people, and troopers from Gander's Fist were seen patrolling the halls. It was the operations wing, which was also connected to the diplomatic wing. Individuals of high importance could be seen walking to and fro, their minds filled with only the next task. After some walking, which Torlak seemed to be doing plenty of, they finally arrived to the command center of the station. Plenty of guards were present before the doors, which offered space extending from it to house chairs and tables. A mobile food stand was also able to integrate among the group, as countless servings were provided. As they approached, the group by the door took notice. At first, they only acknowledged those of the same troop. As he got closer, their expressions changed upon viewing Torlak's white and black outfit, with four markings on his arms that ran along the majority of the sleeve. Good morning, Chief General, the first to notice announced, as they promptly corrected their posture to that of attention. Good morning, warriors, Torlak replied in kind. Many of their helmets were removed, and he could see their expressions brighten at his acknowledgement. Clearly, this was the first time they had seen the Chief General in person. As they made their way past the troopers, the main doors at the center opened when a guard pressed a button and slid an access key against a blank tablet. The words access granted were labeled on the tablet and the doors slid open, revealing the dim but lively interior. Only two out of the eight that accompanied him here walked in with Torlak. The walked up a small set of stairs to a landing with several chairs looking down toward rows of consoles and screens that lit up brightly. At the forefront of the room was a large screen flanked by smaller yet still sizable monitors, each providing necessary data of not just the planet, but the entire system. Torlak was then led to the center portion of the landing, where an aged Selen spoke with one of the younger officers. 
he had arrived amidst their conversation. Destroyed. Belladir was home to a vital scientific program. Pair that with the loss of Dorn. Well, I'm sure you can understand my frustration, spoke the aged Selen. Of course, Chief Commander. They should be approaching the Tila Belt relatively soon, the young chief reported. Send word to nearby scouts to scour the belt. If they have to shut off systems to surveil the targets, then so be it. We need to know when and where they will strike from. The officer nodded and returned to their station below. Torlak would use this window to approach his friend. Torkla! It's Torlak, Orlin, he replied with mild frustration. Don't be that way. You used to love it when we called you that, Orlin replied with a hearty laugh. I didn't have a choice, Torlak grumbled, adding fuel to Orlin's laugh. Orlin then directed Torlak to an open seat beside him which he took, and the guards from previous retired to the sides of the room, closest to the top of the stairs. For a moment, Orlin and Torlak were by themselves. The air grew heavy, as Torlak foresaw a change in tone from his longtime friend. Then they spoke. What do you think of the enemy, Tor? He slumped in his chair in response, staring at the large central screen at the front of the room. Terrifying, he muttered, not something to take lightly, should you? It'll mean your death. That's only their military, no? Torlak shook his head briefly, not completely denying the military capability. True, for the most part. We've come in contact with what we initially thought to be their main military force. Oh, how we were wrong. How so? Torlak began recounting their initial encounters of their first and only two systems of conquest. The first system, with Demira and Anmira, were light and had a minimal footprint of combative forces. Plenty of civilians, but a lackluster infantry force. It was easy and probably our quickest conquest to date, Torlak explained. The second system, however, was different. He gauged his friend's reaction and continued when no reply was given. For us, it was an unnamed planet. But through the records taken of the planet, the Terrans have named it Draxis. It was perhaps my greatest failure, but that was where we encountered our true enemy. Orlin leaned on his seat, focused on Torlak. Was the enemy on the surface? Their armies? Torlak shook his head. No. There was a force on the planet, but they were largely disorganized. We had the upper hand, but that was dismissed when we struck against a certain facility. Our force wasn't large at the time, so the enemy was able to take the entrance, fiercely defending it to the last man. Quite the fight, I suspect. It was. Brawla was the one to retake the facility. Remember him? Torlak questioned. I do. Tall lad. I was present during his burial. Well... He broke through and brought with him information on the enemy, their name, technology, cultures, most of it anyway. We still don't know where they live, but if we can take out this reaction fleet, then perhaps I can retake the reins of my campaign against them. Orlin patted Torlak on the back in response. That's the spirit. Now on a separate, more concerning note. He turned and directed Torlak's attention toward the main screen. It had the likeness of their system with the planets in their respective color with the asteroid belts painted in a transparent gray-white. Several red dots dotted locations surrounding Belladir and Dorn. Out of all the ships he's commanded, none had the number of sensors and scanners he is now witnessing. Granted, they weren't as precise as he would like them to be, but they still did a phenomenal job of being able to scan throughout the whole system with a small error of margin. Quite the sight, wouldn't you agree? Torlak acknowledged the Orlin's comment to think we had this technology aboard the stations. Torlak was in awe. This was the first time he was behind the doors to the command center of a superstation. The scanners employed are nearly a decade old, but they're the latest. My station is the only one equipped with them, boasted Orlin. A decade? How was I not made aware of our defensive capabilities? You'd think they would have told the Chief General of the Selian Armed Forces. His displeasure was apparent. By right, those chosen by the War Council to lead all forces available into combat would normally be informed of any and all technological achievements that could be utilized in battle for maximum tactical advantage. At least he was being informed now, he thought. Don't make that face, Tor. Look, 
He pressed a button from his command desk, and the image of the red dots were enlarged, revealing the numerous ships of the enemy fleets greater than a corvette. We're still fine-tuning it at longer distances, so ships of frigate class and lower sometimes don't register if their output is at minimum. However, when they gather in proximity, he showed the image surrounding a lone large dot. It began to separate it into smaller indicators of individual ships. When too many ships gather in an area, we're able to identify most of the ships in a cluster. It's most effective in open space than in a densely populated region of debris. Torlak was impressed. This technology was much more precise than his own ships, which were much more limited in capability. Should he live through this, it was something he would advocate for the newer line of ships. What do you do when they disappear? I would assume that they are either jumping or, by your description, they would get lost in the asteroid belts. Orlin nodded in satisfaction. That's exactly right, he replied. Once their indicators disappear, we can most likely assume they're headed into the Tila belt. When they first entered the system, they were revealed once they entered the influence of Belladir and laid waste to the defense fleet. Should they disappear now, they will either be in the Tila belt or exit just beyond it. Again, Torlak was nothing but impressed. As he analyzed the The View, Orlin beckoned him with a question concerning his next move. So, Tor, where do you plan to command the battle? His tone was stern and empirical, indicating an obvious answer that sat right before him. He could command from his carrier as he did during his initial invasion of the Terran colonies, but in their current predicament there was really only one answer. That answer had the highest grade of sensors, scanners, communications, shields, and defensive weaponry. The answer was obvious. Are you willing to step down, Orlin, as my second? The man in question arose from his seat and turned his body to Torlak, executing a Selian salute, crossing his right arm across his chest with his fingers making contact with his left shoulder. It was crisp and quick, a by-the-book salute. The room quieted, and an officer ordered those present to come to attention. Then Orlin spoke. As Chief Commander of Saloria Station, I relieve all tactical command to Chief General Torlak, as authorized by his title granted by the War Council and blessed by the Fathers. May his wisdom bring us victory. A round of cheers sounded in the room, and Orlin relieved his seat, fit for the commander of the station, and the new station commander sat upon it. Torlak took a moment upon his new seat, taking a moment of his responsibilities. It was only natural for the general to take his place in a heavily defended fortress of a station while still on the front lines. Even without his crew from his ship, he still felt at home. Torlak then turned to Orlin on the status of their total forces. Do we have word on when we can get reinforcements? I'm planning to send a sizable fleet to scour the belt. We have several fleets from between us and the Union border. They should be supplying us with some ships along with the newly produced ships. They should be here in a couple of hours. Torlak nodded at the report. His fleet was growing at an exponential rate, and soon they might have enough ships to block the sun if they so wanted to. Very well. We should send a detachment to the Tila Belt. My old fleet should suffice. Orlin bowed and began issuing orders to the carrier group. The total ships from the group was a fraction of the forces he took with him initially, but it would suffice to act as a probe against the enemy. He reviewed the, the capabilities of the station once more, noting the advantages and disadvantages, of which he found very little pertaining to the latter. This was his moment to strike back and regain what he had lost. From what he remembered during his final encounter with the Terrans in his stealth ships, they were roughly the same sized fleet as before, save for the additional six Selian ships that accompanied the enemy. They would be priority to die a traitor's death in a show of authority to the other who might have done the same. He would not be caught off guard again. Torlak ordered a web of their ships around the surrounding stations and increased fighter patrols, ensuring a rapid response to wherever the enemy may appear. A small force of his former fleet had departed for the Tila belt at predicted coordinate of the enemy trajectory. They'll be wasting time trying to go around, he thought to himself. In orbit of Celia, the three stations were equidistant from each other, and with a quick jump, 
ships could sum from one station to another in mere seconds. He had faith in their ever-growing army. He had just wished he started with this size of an armada in the beginning, and maybe they wouldn't be on the defensive, but it was too late to think about that now. He would command Orlin and any other lower-ranked chief to have all ships prepped for combat, and as fate would have it, he was notified from one below of the indicators over the gas giants. They were gone. Soon, their fight over the stars would begin. Sela System, Tila Belt, mid-2670. Vice Admiral Wolf, TRSC Sword of Reckoning, 7th Fleet. After the 7th Fleet subjugated the enemy fleet over Belladir and Dorne, they have made their way just within the threshold of the Tila Belt. Wary, Wolf ordered a full intelligence diagnostic of their latest are of operation. How are we looking, Minerva? A man, grizzled from years of service, spoke to her. I have noticed a strong frequency that I have yet to catalog originating from deep within their system. I am attempting to recover intel related to my scans, but for now we should be fine within the asteroid belt, she reported. Streams of data were a constant, and she effortlessly interpreted it in a manner that would prove useful to her commanders. Drifting rocks here, speeding rocks there, all were standard according to her scanners utilized from the ship's systems. She went ahead and did a preliminary scan of the asteroid belt, looking for anything erratic. She noted nothing of immediate concern and relayed that to her commanding officer. The first sets of ships to enter the belt were a mix of corvettes and light frigates, evenly dispersed as they navigated the environment. Minerva, scan for low frequency, something as small as an idle engine or traces of electrical consumption, Wolf commanded. He most likely wanted to try to utilize her to her utmost capabilities, testing the waters of what she can and can't do. She didn't know how well she can scan that in depth, but it was something she was keen to attempt. Of course, sir. A pulse from a ping was sent out, taking in all forms of feedback that returned. Background radiation, signals from friendly ships, the behavior of the asteroids. Asteroids. She compared models of the nearby bodies with what she identified. They were erratic and flowed contrary to the natural state of the belt. They didn't pop for excessive power consumption like what Wolf had suggested. Instead, they reminded her of an earlier ambush from a new class of ship in the earlier systems. That's, Admiral, I suggest you order a full combat stance at once, Minerva advised. What do you have? He inquired, urgency prevalent in his voice. Putting it up on screen now? They had already displayed the bodies of asteroid that littered their area of operation, even the smaller ones. However, something caught his eye during the scans for the visualized radar systems. Scouting party? Wolf asked. Why aren't they showing up on screen? Minerva analyzed the anomaly intensively, and as they creeped closer but sat at a safe distance, still giving off the same elusive signature. It is by my account that these ships are of the same class or house the same technology as the ambush fleet from several systems ago. Wolf knew exactly what she meant. It was when they had just entered a system and found Vale and his advanced fleet in combat with an enemy that had left as quickly as they appeared. It was unlike any of the ships catalogued during Draxis, so he figured it was a hidden weapon they had been saving for later. Can you get a lock? What size ship are we dealing with? Minerva ran through her database of ships and concluded that the ships before them were Corvette class, lightly shielded and lightly armored. Even if they didn't appear on screen or on the tactical holographic table, they had Minerva to interpolate that data, and thus was the one to take weapons command. She would take the shot. Currently, there are only three stealth class enemy Corvettes present, she reported. Conducting surveillance, no doubt, spoke Gruda a voice who had been silent thus far. Even I can see that, Gruda. Do you know how much they're gonna send our way? Wolf beckoned with an urgency. With us so close to our cradle, they are likely to try to swarm your fleet while keeping most ships in orbit around the planet. I suspect a healthy 120 or so, Gruda responded. Hmm. In that case, Minerva, you have full execute authority. Organize a sink shot of the three Corvette-sized signatures. Randall, Organize a formation using the nearby rocks as cover while the main force moves together. What do you plan to do? Questioned Gruda. We'll ambush their ambush. Minerva, fire at will. 
as Minerva charged the Mac in addition to two other heavy frigates. Wolf took this time to question Gruda. Tell me, do you regret joining us? Gruda didn't know how to respond. He felt that the current tempo was moving too quick for his liking, but that was out of his control. He detested the acts of the current military and those who had allowed it to persist, most notable, the War Council and Chief General Torlak. I do not agree, nor can I condone what the military of Celia have committed against your people. That blames falls to the War Council and their ultimate pawn, Torlak. I only ask that you spare the innocent citizens of Celia and her people. Wolf nodded in response. I'm glad you feel that way. Perhaps with sympathy like that, we can turn public opinion in our favor. Because what we are about to do will against all odds and will ultimately make us out as demons to your people. The words spoken by Wolf ultimately fell beyond Gruda's initial understanding, leaving him confused. Wolf then turned to the rest of the crew and spoke into a microphone that was connected to not only the rest of the ship, but to others within the fleet. We are in the final stretch. Beyond these rocks is the home of our enemy, who will fight down to their last man, no doubt. We are most likely outmanned and outgunned. Many of you will not live to return home to your families, and your service will be honored. Remember what they did to us and the atrocity committed. Let these shots ring around the galaxy. Minerva, let him have it. She nodded and returned a prompt yes, sir, before firing her main gun with two others, each at their victim. Within the midst of moving rock and debris, the magnetically accelerated rounds met a fraction of light speed, point four tenths the speed, in fact. The distance covered was only a matter of seconds before the rounds met their target. In a plume of exacerbated debris and fire, the slug met the enemy's shields and shattered them like a bullet through paper. It was instantaneous. The destruction wrought on the enemy as they did their jobs, waiting for reinforcements to join the fight. As if on cue, upon their destruction, a large fleet of enemy ships had entered near their sphere of the belt. Lighting up the tactical display and table light a Christmas tree, the amount of enemy indicators flooded the area. 110 enemy signatures accounted for, sir. I'm also picking up enhanced energy output for shields. It appears the enemy has undergone significant upgrades since the last we met. Since last we met? Wolf questioned. Is it the same fleet we encountered at Draxis? Affirmative, except there has been an increase in Corvette and Frigate class ships to their formation. Are they in range to hail? Questioned Wolf. I'm thinking we try Vale's tactic. It seems to work for the most part. They are within range, but I must advise their weapons are primed and they will fire one they reach maximum effective range. Put me through to their commander in charge, ordered Wolf. Gruda, you're going to be up. I hope you have a speech prepared. Gruda visibly recoiled at the notion, but nodded in response. I will do what I can. Minerva directed their gaze to the large screen at the rear portion of the bridge. A pending icon rotated in a circular motion in the center of the screen as they waited for the intended party to answer. After several moments, Wolf was anticipating to be met with the one who had caused all of this in the first place, but was met with an individual apart from whom he wanted to settle this matter with. Gruda had detailed their ranking structure before, and for commanders of fleets, markings would be on the sleeve of their attire ranging from one red mark up to three. The fourth mark was reserved for the lone chief general, but the one on screen was only marked with two stripes, a chief captain. Gruda thought about why a captain was put in charge of a sizable fleet, such as the one before them. Captains would normally oversee a cruiser-sized ship with an escort of corvettes and frigates. The captain before them glared, first to the human admiral, then to Gruda. I am Chief Captain Farlow. He introduced himself with clear disdain for those before home. So, we have a traitor within the enemy's ranks. State your name, traitor. Wolf ignored their disposition and beckoned for Gruda to reply with a simple nod. I am Gruda Arlesk, former chief commander of the once mighty Selian military. Once, the chief replied, anger visible from their tone. The armies of Celia are great. We have fended off the armies of the Union, and we shall do the same with these Terrans. They spoke the name of their enemy with disdain. 
yet Wolf and many of the crew were unfazed. You'd best mind your tongue, Captain, Gruda replied, his tone now reflective of his newfound allegiance. Anger now seeped in Gruda's voice, and a smirk appeared on Wolf's face. For five systems, no, seven systems, the Terrans drove away a campaign fleet and have now reached our home. You would do best to cease your aggression and let the Council pay for what they have done. Lies, I have heard enough, traitor. The War Council knows of the transgressions of these Terrans and they threatened our borders. What are we to do? Let them encroach on our rightly space? As he spoke, Gruda noticed that the captain only regurgitated the standard propaganda of Polis. He was blind to the truth, and all present on the bridge knew this as well. You speak for a treacherous council who commit crimes against sentience. They have allowed the enslavement of their people. They are not the aggressors we were. I have proof for all in your fleet to see. Farlow raised his hands to stop Gruda mid-sentence. I will not accommodate words from a traitor. The time for talk has gone. I suggest you make peace with your death. Don't make a threat if you know you can't deliver, spoke Wolf, now breaking the silence of the fellow crew members. You have twelve hours, Farlow, Wolf replied, and promptly cut the transmission, leaving Farlow stunned in response. Then, at the same moment, Wolf issued a series of orders to his crew. Minerva, send an encrypted message to Athena, a twelve-hour count, she nodded. All stations, general quarters. The crew went from standing on the sidelines to issuing commands and executing all necessary orders for combat. Their minds were set, and they did so in perfect unison. Sorry about this, Gruda. Sometimes you can't talk down an enemy when their mind was already made up. Gruda nodded to his consolation, if one could call it that. Very well, he replied dejectedly, as the rounds of ships began to fire. The corvettes that maneuvered around the floating masses of rocks were the first to fire their volley of cannons and missiles. The enemy shields flickered as a response to the cannon fire until they broke with a dying simmer. A volley of missiles followed close behind a salvo of cannon fire with timed execution. With the shields down, the additional rounds from the cannons peppered the enemy hull, weakening it for the explosive reception of hellfire. Several enemy corvettes fell to the initial barrage. However, it was not a one-sided endeavor by the Terrans. The enemy corvettes were supplied by an escort of a frigate that delivered devastating return fire to the human corvettes. Instead of kinetic rounds, the enemy had opted for plasma-based weaponry. As darts of purples and blues littered the void as they met their mark, it devastated shields and hulls alike and the human corvettes fell easily to its power. The outer flanks fell, overwhelmed by the numerical firepower of the enemy, and the surviving corvettes of the TRSC retreated. Corvettes in the outer ring of their formation were melted and ceased operation almost entirely, save for a few noble turrets that operated on the last of their crew and power. As the enemy ships flew by the remains, shots rang out from barely surviving crew of select ships, firing relentlessly into the exposed hulls of the enemy ships that wandered too close to the debris. Their shields were already lowered and were in the process of regenerating when their lower compartments were enveloped in flame and shrapnel. It wasn't enough to completely down the ship, but enough to slow their advance. However, the enemy frigates took aim, and reduced the smoldering resistance of Terran debris into dust. First engagement layer has been breached, reported the scans officer. Coordinate a Mac volley, target the larger ships with a missile salvo, ordered Wolf, and target a deck cannon barrage on their life support systems if able. The use of AFENT rounds is authorized. Aye, sir, the crew responded with unanimous fervor. As the Selian Navy inched closer, the frigates of the TRSC Navy oriented their spinal magnetic accelerator cannons towards targets selected by Minerva. Her targeting solutions provided the most optimal source of hostile termination, in theory at least. Wolf had his doubts about her total capabilities, and total war was an area he had yet to see her active in. As fate would have it, a call from the scans officer provided a perfect opportunity. Incoming signatures, fighter class, I'm counting just under 400. Wolf turned to Minerva, her form peering into the screens of the battlefield. Randall, sortie our fighters. He received a nod, 
and began issuing orders to their appropriate personnel. Minerva, generate the best tactical solutions for our fighters. You have the reign. She nodded in response. Just a moment, sir. Enemy targets, 392. Friendly fighters, 144. It is not ideal, but I think I can manage. Requesting full control over fleet deck cannons. Wolf thought for a moment and answered. Granted. Randall, ensure she has what she needs. Understood, sir. On the tactical display, smaller dots sharing the same green hue, digital signatures of friendly fighters departed both carriers of the group, aiming for the outer edges of the formation in a crescent moon pattern. The formation of the enemy ships reflected a trident, with their heaviest concentration in the center flanked by a lesser concentration on the sides. Cruisers, a carrier, and heavy frigates made the center with the sides consisting of corvettes and light to medium frigates. Numerically, they outnumbered and outgunned his fleet, but that didn't mean they outmatched them in quality. All it would take were a few well-placed shots. The enemy fleet remained in cover of the asteroids, so a direct assault wasn't viable. Their fighters began to navigate through the field, circling the large asteroid before them, tens of kilometers wide. Sir, their forces are splitting full steam, mentioned the scans officer. Minerva, he turned to the AI. You got it? Of course, sir. The first waves of fighters consisted of only half of all available fighters per carrier. It was standard practice with carriers to send off a wave of fighters while the rest stood by until it was time for the first wave to return. Before they would, the second wave would enter combat to relieve the prior wave. Such a system was devised to maintain a continuous stream of fighters, using the in-between time as time to rearm and refuel. The fighters were now closing in on the enemy, halting their advance. From the numerous monitors, the green friendly indicators engaged the tip of the enemy fighters. Aerial combat had now begun. Wolf had relieved command to Minerva for fire support. He was skeptical still, but proceeded to go along with this field testing. When you're ready, Minerva. She didn't respond, as her gaze was locked on the battlefield from the numerous scanners and probes available to her, not just from her ship, but from the data gathered from the other ships from the fleet. When she came to, her eyes darted around until locking onto Gruda, then to Wolf. It will be some time, but you may want to turn your eyes forward. They turned without question to the viewport, which also had flanked around it, other displays of ships in different areas of operation. In the next moment, several heavy frigates, along with some light cruisers, accelerated towards the enemy force, but stopped just out of the enemy maximum range. Gruda, she spoke, turning to the pale blue Celian. Do you know what one should do to achieve victory over your enemy? He thought for a moment before responding. To defeat the enemy commander, from there the rest would scatter. It is universal for us, as it is our doctrine, he replied confidently. True perhaps from a more ancient era. Her words confused him. What do you mean? I'm saying in an earlier, more archaic time, killing an enemy commander was all you really needed to turn the tide of battle and demoralize the troops. However, for humanity, we have developed multiple philosophies on war. Gruda grew concerned to her words, as each alluded to a worst-case scenario as the first and only option. Fear grew within him. Such as ancient works such as the art of war by an individual called Sun Tzu, who is believed simply to be an alias, or the 48 laws of power which can be applied to oneself as well as in war, and I fear for your people of the 15th law of power. Gruda gulped, his throat dry from his sudden restlessness. W which I is? To crush your enemy totally. Fear wrought on Gruda's face as he tried to parse the five worded sentence, trying to rationalize their meaning. With a defeated countenance, he asked for clarification. What does that entail? With a race such as yours, you should know. He nodded in response, but beckoned the AI to continue. We will not stop here. Should we be successful in our initial conquest, the fleets not present would be targeted for subjugation. If we leave your armies capable of recovery, then they would want nothing but revenge. Humanity can only gain peace if our enemies ceased to exist but I am bound by protocol to abide the orders of my human counterparts. Gruda spoke, in response, slightly angered, but ultimately fearful of the AI. And that will be in your favor. How? 
If we can remove all options for our enemy to retaliate, then they will have no choice but to bend to our will. We have already done so with the colonies already conquered. As long as there are no rebellions, they will live. He soured at the notion, but conceded to their superiority. How do you know when you have won? By giving the enemy nothing to negotiate with and no room to maneuver. By then we will have crushed them, and this battle will be no different. Gruda feared for his countrymen, but knew it to be inevitable. He felt a pressure on his shoulder and knew it to be Wolf, who seemed ready to offer some form of consolation. Humanity has always known war. It's one of the few things that in our blood that we can use to offer a better chance for those who are innocent, just as much as it is easy to take. It's why we do the dirty work, so that the innocent, friends and family can live their lives in normalcy. I understand, but I find it frustrating watching my people fall for the decisions of the War Council. I can't say I don't sympathize. I do. But a message needs to be sent. You attack citizens of the Terran Republic, your armies will burn. Minerva, fire at will. As directed, Minerva had gained control over the weapon systems of the fleet and systematically aligned their barrels to strategically marked enemies that zipped around in the void. Back and forth, TRSC fighters trailed behind an enemy, just as much as the enemy trailed them. Trails of blue thruster debris littered the environment as they chased their prey, firing into their backside with a wall of depleted uranium core rounds that spun upwards of 4,000 RPM. Even with unloaded missile support, it wasn't enough to compensate for the density of Cellian fighters that littered the space. The Terran fighters did have quality of pilot over the standard Cellian, but were enormously outgunned. It began to show when friendly fighters were slowly incapacitated during their dogfights. It was a wonder the enemy didn't crash into one another as they tried to gun down a single craft at any given time. Initiating counteroffensive. I hope you brought earplugs and sunglasses. Wolf nodded to the crew, but did little to actually mitigate sunlight damage. They wished to see the show and magnified areas of combat heavy with enemy forces. Firing in three, two, one. From across their battle lines, traces of light darted from the Terran ships, meeting their mark with destructive power so fierce and deafening that Wolf and his crew almost felt pity. Instead of wasting a shot on a small corvette or the smaller frigates, most shots targeted the largest ships in the enemy formation. Heavy frigates and cruisers were par for the course and were now heavily crippled from the attack. Even some enemy fighters were caught in the trajectory and were met with instant obliteration that they had no way of registering. It was painless and sudden, a fate that Minerva felt to be too good of a death. This was met with a glare from Gruda who watched in solemn horror the slaughter of his kin. At least, it was quick for the fighters, he muttered, catching the attention of Minerva and Wolf. I am surprised your people have not developed such technology commented Minerva. For humans, it was only a matter of time since the dawn of firearms to figure out how to make a projectile go further, with bigger, more destructive ordnance. I'm sure I've said it before, replied Gruda, but Terran ingenuity is terrifying. Wolf noticed on the corner of his peripherals a motion of fist bumps from the nearby comms and navigation officers. Minerva, make sure we conserve ammo. We still have a planetary blockade to fight. Wolf mentioned, enlarging that area surrounding the planet. Data from a dedicated scanner ship relayed the latest information as requested to supplement the scanners from the battle group. It was precise enough to gather data of larger signatures orbiting the planet, especially from within the Tila belt. Gruda was curious about the scanning capabilities of the Terrans, as was evident from his focused expression upon the tactical table. How are your scans so precise? As far as I'm aware, not even our best ships have scanning abilities like this, he said, looking at both the battlefield before him and the signatures orbiting Celia over yonder. Wolf answered, beating Minerva to the question. Warfare is more than just numbers and the enemy in front of you. What you need is information. I'm sure you're aware, Gruda nodded in response. Even long before commercialized space travel, my people have developed technology advanced for its time, for the sole purpose of information gathering. By utilizing that information, 
you can then accurately determine the best course of action from troop deployment, such as here. Wolf pointed to a lightly covered area of space west of the formation in orbit above the capital city. His gaze was now focused as he analyzed the field with Minerva. The main fleet will engage on the left flank of the defense, which should keep us out of range of that station, said Wolf. Then we'll organize a secondary flanking assault with Vale's fleet. He looked to Minerva, issuing her a set of new orders following their current engagement. Organize with both fleets the best targets to engage using the MAX. We just need to keep the enemy busy until reinforcements arrive so that our ground troops can complete their mission. Of course, sir. Would you like me to prep Lieutenant O'Brien's requisitions and reinforcements? Added Minerva. Wolf nodded. We should have enough kestrels for vehicle transport aboard their assault carrier, as well as a healthy contingent of raiders to make a drop into the city. They'll need more than a company. Randall, organize the rest of 4th Battalion for a hot drop. Aye, sir. I'm willing to bet they're itching for a fight, too. Just remind them of the rules of engagement. I don't need them making paperwork for me after this is over. Randall nodded with a grand smile and left the bridge to the tactical war room, leaving Gruda with Wolf, Minerva, and the rest of the focused bridge crew. Cella System, T. Labelt, Mid-2670, Vice Admiral Wolf, TRSC Sword of Reckoning, 7th Fleet. For six hours, the fight raged on in the void of the Cellian asteroid belt. Ferric tungsten slug rounds of the Terran shipboard Max were doing a number on the Cellian ships adopting the tactic of essentially sniping their targets beyond their maximum range. In a battle where they were numerically outmanned, it was best to keep their distance and diminish the enemy's numbers through quality of firepower, an advantage the Terrans took to the highest degree. They're in disarray, sir. Enemy forces have decreased to just over 60%, and they are preparing a retreat, requesting permission to engage with broadsides, Minerva said, adding to the holographic projection routes, and optimal firing angles. Granted, don't let a single one survive, acknowledged Wolf. The TRSC ships enclosed on their retreating counterparts, firing their Max, deck cannons, and missiles, each one targeted with a designated purpose. During the initial engagement, Minerva's targeting was imperfect for moving targets and missiles landed on their targets, but didn't deliver a crippling blow. As the battle continued, Minerva's tactical combat programming adapted quickly and overcame her errors, reducing the margin of error from 46% to 5%, a large margin compensated for, but it drastically increased their fleet's lethality. Now, the enemy tried to run. Target their engines, then strike with a selective missile barrage, ordered Wolf. Minerva nodded, compensating her orders over her assumed network of the fleet as she targeted life support shield generators, anything that would result in a destructive demise with the least amount of wasted ordnance. The Cellian ships fought desperately, flinging ill-fired plasma ordnance toward an encroaching predator. Most shots fired wide, largely missing their mark, but occasionally it would land, severely damaging the ship's shield production. If a shield were depleted, it would effectively melt a decent portion of hull that made contact, flinging slag out into space. Luckily, for the heavier class of TRSC ships, their hull was thick enough to shrug off most shots that didn't make direct contact. This frightened them, and it showed in their disorganized retreat. Minerva, Wolf called out to the calculating AI, to which she replied with a curt yes, before returning her attention to the battlefield. What is your assessment of the enemy's plasma tech? She paused for a moment before answering. From their application against our shields alone, I believe it's sufficient as an item for the TRSC to research and develop. However, Cellian application is slow yet destructive. With proper tuning, I believe we can utilize it as a counter to enemy shielding in the near future. I think so as well. Take note. We haven't really touched plasma tech since... Wolf paused, trying to remember the incident in question. The Bakari disaster, noted a nearby officer, who returned their focus to their station. Ah, yes, that. Gruda's expression grew with confusion. What's the Bakari disaster? He said, first toward Minerva, who shook her head, then finally to Wolf, who now remembered the incident. It was the result of scientists on Bakari, a planet dedicated to research, when they tried to develop more practical applications for plasma beyond just mining equipment. 
if I recall correctly, he said, stroking his chin in thought. They had a prototype projectile-based platform that could have been used on fighters and was to be later added to ship defenses. But a scientist, a one Dr. Varingbron, created a plasma warhead that detonated prematurely. The result was unexpected. How so? I would imagine a plasma warhead to have similar properties as a normal bomb, just superheated, replied Gruda, curiosity gaining with each passing moment. It did more than that. Whatever he did, he turned the entire research sector into glass, and it's surrounded by a perpetual lightning storm. Needless to say, the TRSC halted all projects related to plasma greater than simple mining equipment. Wolf shrugged to his retelling, continuing on with a final note. But now, with your people's design, we can probably kickstart the research again. The thought made Gruda shudder. His newfound allies already had a weapon that decimated shields and ships alike, with cannons boasting similar properties but can be fired in an endless barrage if need be. He thought to himself, for what? Why would they need plasma? Their current tech already outshines our latest development. He rightfully feared what monstrosity the Terrans would conjure. Some time would pass, and the Cellian ships began to slow after Minerva's tactical strikes on key systems. Shield generators, life support, weapons, and engines, all were swiftly targeted, and as a result left many, if not all, ships disabled to drift aimlessly. They were now subject to the mercy of the Terran Republic. The corvettes and frigates that arrived first lined their broadside deck cannons against their foe, and without stopping fired a purposeful salvo into the exposed regions of the alien ships. Some already had exposed compartments in their hulls that were prime for targeting with the use of the affent round, resulted in a brilliant display of destruction from within. With Minerva's adaptive programming, the pace at which they could destroy their enemy increased, and steadily the enemy force dwindled until a cruiser, a handful of frigates, and a single carrier remained. Enemy fighter presence is still substantial, but half of those remaining belong to their sunken carrier. How do you wish to proceed? Minerva interjected, interrupting Wolf's thought. What's our fighter status compared to the enemy? Wolf probed. We outnumber them, three to one, she reported. Waste them. Order our fighters to search and destroy. I also want a concentrated barrage on the remaining ships. No quarter. Minerva nodded, updating the information in real time to current fighters, as well as the fighters within the two carriers. Like a hive of disturbed hornets, the fighters began their assault. The remaining capital ships of the Selian fleet were heavily crippled, relying on each other for defense. The frigates encircled the carrier and cruiser, along with a web of fighters darting around trying to cover their exposed flanks. It was their last stand, and they knew it. But before TRSC fighters came within range, a call was received from the enemy carrier. Sir, a call from the carrier. It's Captain Farlow, relayed Minerva, instead of the normal comms officer. Wolf looked at Gruda with a smirk, then turned to Minerva. Have the fighters cut off their escape route and make sure they're out of the way of the Mac? She nodded, and Wolf turned his gaze to the rear monitor, where it lit up and the look of a distraught Selian was visible. Well, if it isn't the almighty Selian Navy, Wolf replied in a snide tone, what would it take for you to spare the rest of my fleet? Farlow responded despondently, his spirit visibly crushed as it appeared on his face. No number of pleas will save you or your crew. Have you already forgotten? I requested a bloodless surrender, but you turned me down. You've not only doomed yourself, but your entire fleet. What more is there to discuss? Farlow hung his head in despair before bringing it back up once again to meet the gaze of Wolf, this time with anger. You are no more barbaric than the Union, he sighed, lessening his gaze to one accepting of his fate. Then may I ask that you spare the innocence of Celia and ensure their safety. Wolf nodded, his face emotionless, yet sincere. I will offer them what you did not offer to mine, peace. There may be collateral, but it will not be my intention. Then, if we're done here, I bid you farewell. Farlow bowed silently, then cut off the signal. The Celian known as Farlow has ceased communications. Do I proceed with the attack? Wolf nodded. Fire at will. With a syncopated display, bursts of linear light flashed from their ships and into the collective hulls of the Selian ships. It didn't take much for the cannons to make quick work of the remaining ships. 
The slugs decimated what little shields they had recovered, reducing the ships to nothing but fine debris. Some ships had also lined up perfectly to make for a series of collateral penetration shots for the lucky few ships. As the Selian fleet was reduced one by one, the fighters had begun their last-ditch effort to try to deal any surmountable damage, only to be met by friendly fighter resistance. Wolf had noticed on the tactical table that the enemy fighters had grown fatigued. What should normally be well-executed maneuvers devolved into witless and frightened reactions. Their fighting quality had declined sharply, and Wolf saw fit their swift end. He ordered all friendlies to make quick their execution, as some fighters had taken the liberty to toy with their faltering opponent, a topic he was sure he would need to address later. Prepare a torpedo for the cruiser and the carrier, ordered Wolf, as the Mac slugs penetrated the lesser-sized Selian combat vessels. Aye, sir, reported a helmsman. He knew that he could order a Mac salvo at both the cruiser and carrier, but he had opted to try to save as much of that ammo as possible. They had a large depot of Mac rounds, and they knew this, but they had yet to be properly resupplied from their logistics fleet. So he had to sparingly use the remainder of their munition stores. Minerva, how much Mac rounds do we have after this engagement? One moment, she relayed as she calculated all the munition stores from across their entire fleet. 117. Vale's fleet is not with us, and so I did not include them in my initial assessment. I belay my last. We are now at 204, not enough for the number of ships waiting for us in orbit. That assessment was not what he wanted to hear, but that was reality. It definitely not where he would like to be, but it was enough to hold off the enemy at a distance. As he pondered his newest query, a set of torpedoes from two heavy frigates collided with the shieldless cruiser and carrier near the engine compartment. The explosion was grand, and the shockwave of the warhead shattered the internals of what Minerva presumed to be their reactor core. Both biological life and metallic frame were liquefied all the same, collapsing the ship and setting off a chain reaction that resulted in a sparking ball of light and fire. Hmm, torpedoes. Nasty things when they land, Wolf commented, nudging Gruda with his elbow, only to be met with another bout of silence. Missiles! Magnetic accelerators? Rounds with liquid fire? Now torpedoes? How are they different from your run-of-the-mill missile? Gruda responded with heated fervor to the newest edition of Terran Armament, garnering a small chuckle from Wolf. Do you know the difference between a missile and a torpedo? Gruda shook his head in the negative. What's the point of having both missiles and torpedoes when a missile does the same thing? You can trace it as early as the early 20th century. Wolf began, when we were still confined to our only planet, Terra. We had ships that floated on water to transport equipment and troops, as well ordnance. Similar to ships of today, well, space is an ocean in a sense. Gruda leaned in, listening intensely to yet another history lesson of early Terran warfare, something that he had grown a great interest in. I'll shorten it, but when this is all over, perhaps I can lend you some knowledge of our early history, Gruda replied with a nod begging Wolf to continue, especially now that the original threat has long deceased. In essence, missiles can track objects, and can do so quickly, adjusting mid-flight to autocorrect where it will be. There was a time when we phased out torpedoes for a while, but with the advent of shields, they saw a return when we tried to conserve our last resort, he said, hinting at the spinal integrated mass accelerator. With torpedoes, they're slower than a missile, but can shatter most shields if they hit and their payload is designed to shatter both shield and hull alike. But because of their speed, they're weak to any decently programmed point defense system. They were designed to sink ships, unlike missiles which were designed for pinpoint accuracy and fast-moving targets. Well, there you go. That's the gist of it. Are they expensive compared to the accelerator? I've noticed your fleet has been utilizing the main cannon almost exclusively. They're definitely cheaper than a slug, that's for sure. But we're also on a timeline, so I can wait to see whether a torpedo will land or not. Although, that station might be a perfect candidate to test the true might of the fabled ship killer ordnance, Wolf said, directing his attention to a hologram of the larger station orbiting directly above the capital city. We'll see about that, he muttered, barely audible to both the nerve racked Gruda and the collected Minerva. Wolf then looked at the bridge's timer 
showing that they had just under four hours to assault the planetary barricade and deliver to the ground team their assault vehicles. Prepare a jump, he ordered of the navigation officer. The space west of the city here. He pointed to the location, citing how few ships were near it. The nearest being a small group of corvettes that could jump to their location in mere seconds the moment they entered real space. We'll deal with the ships that respond, but it should allow us enough time to supply the ground teams for their initial assault, added Wolf. Would it not be the perfect time to also launch the rest of our forces? I'm doubtful the first Raptor squad has the resources to mount an offensive strike of any significant portions, added Minerva. Wolf shook his head at her suggestion, garnering confused looks from both the AI and Gruda. How do you mean, beckoned Gruda. There's less aerial presence over that space. Plenty of area to land troops, he said, noting the open fields in between the outer walls of the city and a small town to the west. Which is why I'm sending the rest of Raptor Company aboard with the Kestrels. We need to limit our aerial footprint and allow the ground teams the protection of medium and heavy armor. Wolf switched the view to holographic outlines of three vehicles side by side. The first was the smallest, with four wheels, two seats for a driver and passenger and a rear gunner. It was lightly armored, favoring speed and agility, while donning a quad-barreled belt-fed machine gun with a metal shield covering the operator's torso. This is the Puma, he said, pointing to the smallest of the three. It's a light-armored reconnaissance vehicle that can get around and provide field intel from ground troops. It can vary its weapon type here, on the rear. We didn't have the resources for the more experimental variants, so they're running with standard ballistic. It's effective against infantry, should they come across a patrol. Gruda then pointed to the next vehicle. It's larger than the Puma by nearly three times, with eight wheels, four in front, and four in the back, with a large central compartment reserved for munitions and squad seating. Mentioning also, the relatively larger gun fixed atop near the front of the vehicle. That's the armored personnel carrier, the Rhino. Built with reactive plating and small shields, it can traverse well into a hostile environment with troops while still delivering effective fire with its 35mm cannon. You send this into a target-rich environment, and it'll do a wealth of damage to the enemy. Moreover, did I mention it can float on water? For what reason does a land vehicle need to be able to traverse water? Gruda said, with clear disdain for Terran craftsmanship. Well, sometimes we can't always get our troops in their target area of operation and they would need to traverse from a safe landing zone. Every so often, that had to cross small bodies of water. It originates from the early 20th century with the concept of amphibious assault forces, Wolf replied in kind, now directing his attention to the latest of the three. And so I present to you the Grizzly, he said with pride, boasts a large shield generator, improved ablative reaction plating and a railgun for its main cannon. You can probably mount them on a ship and claim is as a deck cannon, added a nearby officer, garnering a chuckle from others within the bridge. Well, I think that's enough of a technical lesson from me, Gruda. Let's just focus on the task at hand. The Selian in question nodded, no focusing his attention on the now dwindling Selian fleet. Throughout the field of asteroids now lay the debris of both forces vying for control over the other, with his brethren now overcome with Terran superiority. He feared how their ground forces fought and wanted to see them in action. He could ask the Admiral Minerva or perhaps even one of the nearby officers but decided against it. His duties offered little more than tactical advice on Selian culture and tactics. However, when telling his superiors of their culture, he wondered how knowledge of it could benefit one's decision-making in combat, much less combat in space, to which Wolf offered his insight. Warfare is more than just slinging rounds at one another, and more than the movements troops take to overcome their adversary, he said, urging an understanding nod from the newly commissioned Selian officer. Ultimately, you can deduce how one might act in combat if you know how they're raised, at least for the common strategist. Gruda racked his brains at how they might have gained even more knowledge to better their foes. Did he tell them? Was that why they had him aboard? to probe him for information to better take down his brethren. Such thoughts raced his mind as he felt he was now responsible for the recent slaughters of his people, and it made him nauseous. Don't worry about it, Gruda. Those words seemed to comfort him, followed by Wolf's further explanation. 
I haven't had the time to actually do a deep dive or your people's culture to exploit it, he smiled. It did little to actually comfort him, but worrying about it now was moot. He had already given his loyalty to the Terrans, under the condition that they spare the civilians the best that they can. So far, they have delivered on their promises, and as such, carried on with his duties as insignificant as he felt they were. With each rumble of cannon fire, end expended missile or torpedo, the enemy fleet before them was reduced to nothing. It was a complete Terran victory. The scene before them was now serene as all ships halted firing. Metal from destroyed ships glimmered from the sun as they danced in the void, now orbiting the nearest large mass of rock, adding to an ever-increasing total of satellites. Wolf sighed, once confirmation of the enemy totals came through on the nearest monitor. All Selian resistance has ceased. No survivors. It was a grim realization, even for Wolf. But he knew what needed to be done, and proceeded with what seemed to be a never-ending tempo for those of Seventh Fleet. How much longer until the resupply fleet? he asked. Just over an hour, sir, Minerva replied, her voice reverberating through the now silent bridge. Wolf looked at each face as it returned the same to him. All eyes faced his way as he took this moment to collect himself. He looked at a timer that he has set before the fight. They had less than three hours to deliver the requisitioned items for O'Brien and his squad. How are we looking to send O'Brien his reinforcements? He questioned to the AI. All forces aboard the assault carrier are eager to commence, Admiral. Wolf nodded, satisfied with her response returned to the numerous displays of battlefield intelligence gathered before him. Instead of the area of their fleet, he was now focused on what laid beyond, Sela. Thanks to advanced scanners and intelligence, he had settled on the aforementioned plot of space that housed little to no occupied forces. Prep all ships for a slipstream jump. Reload all cannons and replenish all stores for immediate access. Minerva. Prepare a set of orders for the assault carrier and a detachment of marines for a ground assault on the main city. She nodded as her silently relayed orders to all that were required. Wolf took hold of his main central intercom as he began to speak to the rest of the fleet. Attention, 7th Fleet. We are not done yet, so don't get comfy. We have one more stop, and I'm sure you all know what I mean. That's right. Next is the heart of the Selian Empire, their home. They are sure to have it heavily defended, and I am sure many of us will not return. But know this, we will strike fast and true. We will take down the very enemy that sought our destruction, while still holding ourselves gracefully in their presence. We know war and its horrors, and we will not submit to the barbarism the enemy has shown to us so easily. We will strike at the head of the snake, and with it, their empire will fall. Wolf hung up his all-call with a triumphant smile, all of which lasted a mere few seconds before regaining his calculating demeanor. Slipstream is spooled, sir. Standing by, reported the helmsman. Wolf now turned his attention forward, as did the rest of the crew, and issued their next orders into a battlefield yet unforeseen, the end result still clouded with innumerable variables. Wolf paused for a moment before issuing the death warrant of not just his people, but of an enemy that most likely didn't know what they had gotten themselves into. Upon his seat, he ordered their advanced. Enter slipstream to Sela. Sela system. Orbit of Sela, mid-2670. Vice Admiral Wolf, TRSC Sword of Reckoning, 7th Fleet. The 7th Fleet engaged in slipstream to their area of operation, previously sighted by Wolf and Gruta. It was a region of space left of the supersized station directly over the capital city of Sela. The travel time was several minutes, and Wolf knew that they could get there even faster if they entered slip space instead of utilizing real space style of sublight travel, but that was procedure when operating within a solar system. Luckily, Minerva and the scans officer had already registered and named all known celestial bodies with added points of interest for later forces to investigate. Ready all stations and prepare for combat, Wolf ordered to all fellow captains of their respective vessels. Expect a quick response force to test our formation. Hit them hard and fast and don't follow. Our goal is to hold out until reinforcements can resupply. Don't waste shots if it's not guaranteed. Stay vigilant. He closed out his outgoing signal 
and watched in real time as the formation of his fleet organized themselves in a defensive posture. As instructed, main cannons were loaded, and all available munitions were moved to closer to their designated armaments to reduce load times. All vessels stood by, waiting for further orders, as Wolf and his command planned their next move. Is the assault carrier ready for deployment? Wolf asked his new AI. The 4th Battalion Command has been properly notified and are standing by for further orders, she replied promptly. Requisitioned vehicles for Lieutenant O'Brien are idle and set to launch at your command. Wolf nodded, pleased with their swift preparation. Have them set to launch once we receive an LZ beacon from his squad. Wolf's statement trailed off into silence, as if a thought had crossed his mind amidst their current predicament. Is the package safe? he asked only to be met with confused expressions. Their faces changed when he elaborated. If I'm not mistaken, O'Brien and his team extracted some targets, correct? For our friend here? He motioned to the Cellian who stood oblivious to Wolf's roundabout form of questioning. With a subtle sound of confirmation from Minerva, she provided further detail on the matter. The targets have been successfully extracted, as stated in an encrypted message from Athena, she replied. What did they use for transport? I would expect a corvette of its class to flare up like a Christmas tree on sensors, even if it is a stealth variant, added Commander Randall. He had finished his work organizing drafts for a ground unit invasion, as indicated with notes and visuals on his personal work device. Minerva spoke, answering his query. It appears they utilized an onboard gunship, outfitted for stealth operations. Its signature would be greatly reduced in atmosphere compared to a stealth class corvette. What? Next, you're going to tell me you have stealth cars and infantry, Gruta said, voicing surprise. What is it now, Gruta? Never heard of stealth? Anything? Randall was the first to address Gruta, who only shook his head in denial. As far as Gruta was concerned, he only knew stealth to be applied to small and medium forms of ship transport. Frigates and corvettes fit this bill to his understanding, similar to the ships they had encountered before, but at a lower capacity. With some technical wizardry, they could at most reduce their signal in open space, but there was always a sign. If possible, he muttered, how would you describe stealth? His question caught many on the bridge surprised. He described how, for his people, stealth was the act of being unseen. At least that was how his translator opted to describe it in his stead. The concept of stealth was relatively new to Asselian. That is a new word to my people, Gruda added, his expression exuding curiosity instead of his usual disgust or shock. For as long as my people have recorded, to commit deeds unseen has always been thought lowly of. We always faced our foes head on, but lately, the council's tactics have strayed. Gruda's face was now one of concern in respect to his people's ever-changing doctrine. Perhaps he had simply fallen unfamiliar with the latest developments since his retirement. He had faced Union forces with no need for subversion or the underhanded tactics employed by the enemy, and yet he still came out on top. As far as he was concerned, subversion and underhanded tactics belonged to cowards and the ill-prepared. You're not wrong, Wolf replied, sitting atop his seat with a fresh green fruit in hand and popped with every bite. Stealth has always had a place with our people when they knew nothing but throwing stones and sticks. Gruda raised an eyebrow. How so? Urging him to continue. Stealth exists now just with humans. We didn't invent it, only gave it a term. Wolf grabbed for his personal device when a screen beside him lit up with an array of animals that all shared a common trait. They were postured on four legs with differently colored and similar facial features. Many who had sharp fangs protruding from their upper mouths as some had their photos taken with an opening of their maws. Minerva was the next to speak, adding context to the sudden influx of images, taking care to not take away any information on the tactical table display. I present to you the Felidae. Felidae, he responded, his translator working to add meaning to another unfamiliar term. She nodded, a broad term for the family which we call the cat. Predators on my creator's home world who use stealth as a primary tactic for hunting. She cycled through a series of images of cats, most of which were the larger predator species. She even showed muted video of how a cat stalked its prey, 
unbeknownst to it the fate that seemed inevitable. Many exist in a wide array of biomes native to Terra. She then cycled through a series of diverse landscapes native to Terra. Boreal, tundra, savanna, rainforest. Even within the home as a pet, do some of these hunters have residence? I, in the home? Is that not a danger to the family? His concern was valid, given the photos Minerva had selected before putting them away, forcing Gruda to turn toward her. That was just to supplement my lesson to you, Ensign Gruda, she spoke curtly. It was just to show you that stealth is not innately human, but part of nature. However, humans have utilized it to a higher degree, she said, scanning her environment, no doubt implying the technological developments they had made and used to their advantage. Gruda understood that beyond hunting, the Terrans would have made the logical decision to incorporate Sade's stealth in their technology. The gunship and corvette being the only forms of the Terrans he had seen to date. He did wonder how they would incorporate that in a smaller factor. But set that thought aside, focusing instead on their current dilemma. Their current orbit above his home, Sela. It was a surreal experience for the Selian, finding himself above his people's cradle, not as an ally, by as an adversary. His expression was enough to voice concern from his benefactor, Vice Admiral Wolf. I'm sure this may feel wrong for both you and Yorla, to which Gruda nodded in response. One doesn't think of ever returning to their cradle as an enemy. I'm sure if word got out of our assistance, there would be nothing but scorn awaiting us. Gruda replied in a dejected manner, a complete shift from his previously curious inquiries. Wolf returned the same thought. How would he feel if he was forced to turn his back on Terra to free it from an enemy that had taken hold, using their efforts to demonize him and his crew? He shuddered at the notion, placing his hand on the shoulder of the Selian. I understand many of your people don't know the truth of what happened in our colonies. I think we can figure out a way to sway public opinion. We're going to need all the support we can get after this mess is over, Wolf replied in a hearty tone to raise spirits. Minerva, he said. Prepare a statement and evidence to distribute. Randall, get with Minerva to work out the details. I want a video ready for the masses ready once we have secured the War Council. I've already gathered all necessary materials, sir, Minerva replied swiftly when Wolf concluded his orders. Very well. Randall, get to work. I'll handle the rest from here. Randall returned a nod and quick yes, sir, before exiting the bridge, most likely to a room where he wouldn't be disturbed and where some crew members with technical know-how could edit a surefire video. Wolf had hopes in its production and returned his attention to the bridge. Minutes left on his timer, he was about to order a sortie, when alarms blared on the bridge, and red indicators from the direction of the large station illuminated the tactical holographic display table. Sir, we have contacts en route to our perimeter. They're making a short sublight jump. Prepare an interdiction web. We can let them enter our perimeter. They'll tear us from the inside. The officer nodded and quickly began issuing orders and notifications to the appropriate groups. Sir, the interdiction web is operational. We already have reports of perimeter ships engaging the enemy, but the number of enemy fighters is too much for what they can handle. Wolf's countenance formed into one of cold calculation. His eyes narrowed and his eyes furrowed as he studied the battlefield before him. He wanted to minimize his brethren's casualties, but knew that to be impossible. His best hope right now was to hold out until reinforcements arrive. Where are the majority of those fighters coming from? Wolf asked Minerva, promptness evident in his tone. He didn't have an opportunity to wait and demanded an answer, and as far as computational analysis ability goes, she was the fastest to conjure a solution. 72% of fighters are being sent from the large orbital station with the remaining 28% from cruiser and carrier-class ships, which are currently the only forces engaging the perimeter fleet. Wolf nodded, analyzing the glowing display in the center of the room. The three-dimensional objects that were illuminated were suspended above a two-dimensional grid, giving the illusion of a floating object. His fleet was oriented with concentrated groups of ships at key points around his ship, similar in standing to the vertices of a cube with his group placed in the center. 
Smaller indicators of blue began to dance around similarly sized red icons, with each side having several disappear, never to reappear again. Give all ships authority to utilize their max. Concentrate on the carriers and cruisers. Don't give their fighters a place to resupply to, Wolf ordered. A series of ships from the perimeter forced maneuvered into position, as reflected on the holographic display table center of the room. Compared to his force, they were outnumbered and outgunned. Continual scans of the planet revealed nothing substantial for them to fear. No anti-air batteries or missiles on standby. Compared to certain areas in orbit, the planet remained relatively quiet. This had concerned Wolf as he studied the battlefield amidst Minerva's continual effort to coordinate strikes against the enemy. How soon can the rest of Raptor Company be rearmed and deployed? Wolf beckoned to any who could hear him. Instead of Minerva, an officer was faster to reply, leaving Minerva slightly dismayed, as evidenced by a small, near inaudible click of the tongue. An action new to Wolf, but quickly dismissed for larger issues at hand. If they deploy now, approximately 15 to 20 minutes. Now is the best time, sir. Wolf took the timeline into account, along with the data from the battlefield, and ordered the immediate deployment of Raptor Company. We have an LZ beacon set by O'Brien, sir. Troops are ready to deploy, added Minerva. Good. Deploy the rest of Raptor Company and keep the rest of the 4th Battalion on standby for an orbital drop. Ensure the transport has an escort, Wolf replied, swiftly and concise. Thank you, Hartley. Of course, sir, she replied, giving a small nod and returning to her station. Several minutes passed since the troop deployment when he saw several indicators departing from the assault carrier that all the 4th Battalion were stationed on, each carrying the specified cargo requested from O'Brien. The transport ships would travel just one-fourth of their journey when an urgent call came from Minerva. Admiral, a contingent of Selian fighters have broken off from the perimeter and are now headed on an intercept path for the transports. They number roughly 60 small-class fighters. Wolf had anticipated this. In terms of scanning ability, he expected the enemy to have a home field advantage, whether it be planet or orbital-based scanning arrays. As far as his scans provided, they couldn't get a beat on any planet-side infrastructure. Nothing reliable, at least. Currently, he did have many squadrons patrolling the empty space beyond what they could reasonably scan and engage. As such, they were only able to provide scanning and radar support. Realistically, that was all they needed. The fighters would do the rest. Launch interceptors. Don't let the enemy take out those transports. A collective roar sounded from the crew, Gruda included, to the orders to protect the cargo that could grant them a foothold planet side. He had full confidence in O'Brien and his company to deliver what they needed to end this war. On the central display, several medium-class fighters traveled to the designated intercept point, maxing out their thrust for the short journey. The amount of Terran medium-class fighters numbered two-thirds of the enemy contingent. The remaining amount would be supplied by small-class fighters shortly after enemy intercept. It was unfortunate, but from what Wolf was told, both small and heavy-class fighters were still prepping for their sortie. A decent amount going down for emergency maintenance. This will have to do. Have them stall until we can resupply them with more fighters. Minerva nodded, quickly integrating into the ship's processes and processing the orders to the officers in charge. Get me in touch with the pilot in charge of the interception, Wolf ordered Minerva, who nodded in compliance. A brief moment later, and the likeness of a cockpit and its helmeted pilot took the screen placed in the rear of the room. Below the pilot, overlaid on the screen, was their personal designation and the name razor, placed at the end. When both parties were online, the pilot was the first to speak. MFP Razor, what did you need, Admiral? A nonchalant tone was heard in his voice, garnering sidelong glances from the more senior officers. But his attitude didn't phase Wolf. Fighter pilots in the Stellar Command existed outside the regular established branch ranks. They still obeyed the commission officer, but there wasn't an emphasis on profession courtesy. The average lifespan of a fighter pilot was immensely short-lived. It was a wonder they had the numbers to sustain in combat, given their death-ridden reputation. I need you and your squadron to ensure the safe transport of the Kestrels. They can't be allowed to down a single one. 
Clear? Crystal, sir. 416 has you covered. Torch, gearbox, break off. Strike the lead craft, take your squads and waste them. Razor returned his attention to Wolf, ignoring him mid-sentence. We'll delay them as long as possible, but we'll need support of the lightweights. Wolf nodded to Razor's request. They're being sent out now. They should arrive a few minutes after you. Just hold out until then. The call was cut, leaving the monitor to its normal blackened state. From what Wolf had learned from his briefings, Squadron 416 is one of the most decorated medium-class fighter squadron in the TRSC. The number of deployments under their belt is almost inhumane with how often they rotate with other squadrons. From what rumors he heard about them, they practically volunteer for it. No shots had been fired by either party, at least until the first medium fighter entered the fray. Wolf had no visuals to call upon, only what the table before him displayed, which were only a series of digital indicators of friend and foe, identified by green and red, respectively. Little by little, friendly ships entered the combat zone, and the once organized formation of enemy fighters were now in disarray. Scattering like grass to the wind, the tight formation of enemy fighters was now nothing more than a mass of ships engaged in combat. Their weapons were too far from the combat zone, so all he could do was watch as Minerva assisted the fighters with priority targets. Occasionally, a Cellian shop would stray from the group, their trajectory headed for the transports, and several medium fighters would chase in response to orders from Minerva. Can any nearby ships provide support? Wolf beckoned, not taking his eyes off the display as fights raged on their perimeter and against their transports. Redirecting the nearest frigate to the AO, a 1 TRSC lighten up, sir, Minerva responded. It's a well suited choice, Wolf replied in kind. The TRSC Lighten Up was like many frigates of the heavy variety, well armored and boasting a diverse array of anti fighter capabilities. Instead of rail guns for their deck cannons, it opted for a missile array to target from fighters to capital sized ships. The mere presence alone would do much to deter the enemy, and it did just that. Once the frigate entered within several tens of kilometers, the missiles flew, the plumes of heavy white smoke covering the entirety of the ship as each missile launched from its silo. As they flew, the plumes of smoke radiated from their trail, making a trail directly from the ship to the numerous ships that were unfortunately the target of precise designated strikes no doubt resulting in a sudden and fiery death. He didn't like thinking about it, but the thoughts of one's final moments in an attack like this had to be jarring, to be conscious one moment, then nothing the next. Even without a direct visual, he had seen it up close numerous times and envisioned the scene as the indicators atop the tactical display relayed short-lived information. Smaller triangles symbolizing the missile were innumerable, and they flew from their origin to their victim as the ship drew close. With its presence and pressure, the enemy ships quickly began to whittle down to a drip, with each surviving one making a last-ditch effort to assault the cargo transport, which also doubled as troop transport. Those were raiders aboard them, and he was given a duty to ensure their safety, which happened to be the case when the last enemy indicator disappeared. Wolf understood O'Brien's place in the battle, and how capable he is as a soldier. But even if that is the case, he would need mechanized armor to push through fortified lines that he expected to be present on the outskirts of the city. Sir, enemy attack formation has been neutralized, spoke Minerva, and the perimeter group is holding the line but munition stores are rapidly depleting. Wolf grumbled at the news. The perimeter was tasked mainly with trying to keep the larger ships at bay, leaving the fighters to take on the stragglers that made it through their defense. I suggest we utilize Commander Vale's fleet. It could buy us some much-needed time, Minerva added. How long until reinforcements? he asked. The last IFF ping was in the Trill system six hours ago. It shouldn't be long until their arrival. I suspect they made a brief stop before continuing their slipspace jump. Wolf nodded at the information. If his estimations were correct, then it could be any moment that their reinforcements would appear. Now would be the best time to cause chaos among their ranks. With the safe transport of the transports and their new escorts, Wolf turned to the larger threat before him. All ships, begin our assault! 
Before he could finish his sentence, a scream blared from a captain of a ship, with a friendly indicator on the tactical holographic display disappearing, followed by several more disappearances of the smaller classes of ship, all near the perimeter defense ships. What? Get me a status report! A swift nod and sound acknowledgement came from Minerva as the central tactical display changed scenes from their orbit to an expanded scene of the ground below them. Red dots flared for a moment before disappearing, and as each one flared, it would reflect in their view overlooking the planet. Countless blue projectiles erupted from the surface of the planet, connecting with a Terran ship, either destroying it or severely crippling it. I thought we scanned for planet-side surface-to-orbit batteries, Wolf ordered firmly and with urgency in his voice. We did, sir, Minerva replied. But it appears they have masked their output signatures right before they fire. Wolf took those words silently, letting them marinate before he offered his next set of orders. Order all ships to engage the enemy fleet. Get us on top of them and order an orbital drop for the 4th Battalion. We need them to take out those guns, Wolf ordered, his voice stern yet calculating. We can't afford to wait any longer. Let's just hope we get our reinforcements in time. As ordered, all ships not currently engaged in combat maneuvered with the rest of the fleet, organizing themselves once again as a large force of Terran firepower. They made their way towards the perimeter defense that had only, until now, kept the enemy at bay. Call Vale, Wolf ordered Minerva. Tell him to strike with extreme prejudice. Right away, sir. While Wolf and his ship weren't at the forefront of the battle, they were at the epicenter of their formation, and enemy fighters began their resupply evolutions. The final battle was upon them. With the enemy battery constantly firing into them, they had no time to waste and proceeded into the enemy formation. As Wolf analyzed it, there was a large contingent of ships in between them and the large orbital station that provided an almost bottomless supply of enemy fighters. Wolf didn't wait to rally his forces. The only command he ordered when they were within maximum effective range was simply, Open fire. Cellar System, City of Artre, mid-2670, Vorta Volcana. When she awoke, she did so in a darkened chamber. The lights were off, and the room was darker than usual. There wasn't a dim glow from her electronics that normally lit her room enough for her to traverse late into the night, without a need to turn on the overhead lights. Instead, it was pitch black, and Vorta found herself fumbling in the dark, looking for anything that could light her way. Feeling around her mattress, she felt the rigid construction of a device that fit just a little larger than her small hands. As she lifted it, the screen blinded her momentarily once the device sensed its orientation to the user. A design made into the newer models for personal devices. Ah, stupid thing, she responded, following with a large sigh. With her eyes adjusted, she was able to view a warning that made itself on the screen of her device. Attention! All non-essential personnel and civilians are ordered to make their way to the nearest bunker for safety, all surface-level exposure is advised to minimum contact. This message will repeat. Her eyes widened at the warning. It was one thing for her access to be revoked, but she didn't think much of it at the time. In fact, the last few days leading up to now felt like a monotonous haze to Vorta. All commercial signals were cut in the earlier days of the council chambers being reinforced, and since then, she stopped receiving any signals intended for the average civilian. So that's why, she muttered, as she recalled her trip home. Empty roads, with only a handful of people making their way to the outskirts of the city. At least that's the direction she thought they were heading, but it all made sense now. The city had all but evacuated. Her head began to spin, first of confusion, next with worry. Tola! Oh, by the fathers! She closed the ongoing warning across her device, navigating to her contacts. She listed through names, many of whom she had fallen out of contact with, until she came to Talani's and tried to call it. It rang for what felt like hours, only for Vorta to be met with a monotone, artificial voice. Sorry, the contact you are trying to reach is unavailable. Please leave a message at the tone. Vorta redialed her friend's number numerous times. 
only to be met with the same message. Her worry skyrocketed at the uncertainty of her friend's safety. As far as she's concerned, her friend is missing, and she could only find blame with the one she was around in her final moments, Councilman Polas. She cursed his name just thinking about him. She only knew him as a man with a sly tongue, his words nothing but toxic lies and manipulation. That cursed... Vector! She shouted, still resting atop her bed, her stature defeated. She wanted to look for Tola, but ultimately decided against. First, they revoke my access. Then they might just shoot me if I show my face. She sighed once more at her dilemma, resting her body on her mattress and stared at the ceiling above. After resting for several moments, staring at her blacked ceiling, she mustered the strength to get up from her bed to the closest light switch. She manoeuvred through the room with an ingrained mapping of the room until she reached the wall with the switch in question, flipping it to test its functionality. Damn! She sounded with frustration, angrily flipping it up and down multiple times to no avail. It was dead, and she searched for another option to lighten her day. As she recalled, her living space was an early established bunker, but its intended use wasn't needed after its construction, so it was put on sale by the granddaughter who found no use for it. It just so happened that Vorta was searching for a cheap place to call home and happened to meet the owner when she was buying lunch at a nearby restaurant. Many of the apartments in the city were too overpriced for her salary and she was single, so she didn't have gripes on where she lived just as long as it was cheap and the commute wasn't terrible. Luckily for her, it was within her budget. It was already paid for, and Vorta and the owner made an agreement to have her pay in instalments until the total price was paid off, discounted. It was only after she started her job as a front desk clerk for the council that she met Tola, who was also in a bind searching for a place to stay. At the time she was reserved and quiet, so she didn't think much of it, but after they got to know each other, Vorta grew to know her increasingly promiscuous nature. But Tola had already established herself as a roommate and as a friend to Vorta. Both of their families live out of the city, so they only really had each other. She reminisced of their early days as she continued searching for a more reliable light source. She had seen Tola in her worst times and helped her through it, most times at her expense, but as far as she knew, Talani was like a sister. So her disappearance granted a heavy toll on her mind. She wanted to search for her but knew that it would be futile. She wandered her mind for any kind of opportunity to find her sister. Anything would do, she thought to herself sullenly. She silently offered her mind to the next person who could grant her that peace of mind of Talani's safety. However, she could do nothing and felt it in her heart that it would be best to wait. She didn't know what to wait for or in what form it would come in, but she felt it best to trust her instincts. Vorta then departed her bunker of a living space and made her way up a series of stairs. There were windows on the plateaus of the stairways that let in the already filtered light from the overcast of clouds. The scene was gloomy in feel, and the low-hanging clouds added to the sombre vibe exuded by the atmosphere. She had always felt comfortable with cloudy or rainy seasons and loved the feel of her home when she slept in. When she was done reminiscing, she continued up the stairs until she reached a door at the top. Opening it revealed a flat surface with pieces of equipment attached to the floor that made a low hum. They were the air conditioning units and heaters of the buildings, which were taller than her, by at least a foot. She moved to the far side of the roof until she met the edge of the building, facing towards the west. A cool breeze coasted through the air, causing Vorta to shiver as she looked towards the horizon. In the distance, she noted a small hill just before a cliff face with smaller buildings that didn't blend with the surrounding trees. She knew it as a small retirement town and vocation homes for those who could afford it. By rail it took roughly an hour, but by vehicle it took nearly twice the time, since the route was covered by foothills and no one road was straight for any longer than a couple of hundred feet. As she stared far into the horizon, she would notice a moving speck that contrasted the sky behind it. It was singular and left as quickly as it arrived, 
making an exponential slope toward the sky until moving beyond her purview. Mm, curious, she thought to herself. By now, Vorta's mental state had subsided, and for now, she was free of worry. She made it a habit to find places where she could turn her brain off and not think, and recently, the roof of her building provided such a dwelling. As far as she was concerned, all homes should have been evacuated. Seeing a lone ship in what would be the middle of nowhere piqued her interest. She was aware that her people are currently at war with a species never before seen, but she had her reservations. Were they as barbaric as Polis claimed them to be? Or what was the real reason they declared war on these Terrans? Even as a clerk, she wasn't privy to the workings of the inner sanctum that a sanctum clerk might know. Those clerks are sworn in secrecy to all that they see or hear, the councilman's most trusted clerks, and a job she was trying to get, but to no avail. Vorta waited atop the roof for what seemed like hours when she finally retired for the night. She was curious about the ship from over the horizon, but ultimately let the thought pass. She returned to her bunker home, the lights still off from before as she never found a way to turn them back on, an object of her naivete that slowly began to eat at her. As she laid upon her bed, she thought to herself, what am I to do? Do I make my way to a modern bunker? Would they even let her in or turn her away? Each, though, bugged her mind as she asked countless questions, with no one to answer. Instead, her eyes grew heavy, and her worry dissipated from her thoughts as sleep began to set in. She would worry about it tomorrow. Vorta's night began relatively peaceful. Her room was still pitch black, but now she took solace in it. However, her sleep was interrupted with a thunderous boom and a crack of the air, enough to make her room shake intermittently. She shot up from her bed to the noises above, dressed herself with warm layers and made her way up to the roof. It was still night, but the occasional glows from the plasma cannons caught her eye. When she opened the door to the roof, the night sky was assaulted by blue bolts of plasma that travelled from the ground into the sky, connecting with something she couldn't see except for the unfortunate aftermath of what had been hit. Smaller flashes of lights could be seen exchanging from what she presumed to be ship-to-ship -ship combat, a scene she would not think would happen within her lifetime. If not for her planet's predicament, she would have thought this scene to be beautiful. Vorta wandered the roof, moving from its edges, peering beyond to points of interest. In the direction of the council chambers, the lights operated normally, with searchlights moving along avenues of approach with the occasional patrol wandering the streets close to the compound. However, when she turned to the west, she noticed a rise in activity unlike the inner city. The occasional pop and crack of the atmosphere could be heard in between shots of the plasma cannons in the distance, followed by an occasional tracing of light from an unknown source. The sounds of combat still made its way to Vorta. Her curiosity grew, urging her to investigate. It went against her very own thoughts of self-preservation. But as she knew it, she didn't have much to live for anyway. Thoughts of her friend Talani already grew grim, thinking her to already be dead, even if she didn't have proof of either life or death. For now, she simply wished to satisfy her curiosity, even if it would cause her demise. Whatever the case, she didn't mind it. Vorta made her way into the building, first stopping by several unlocked rooms. She didn't like going through others' belongings, but she surmised that she would need sturdier yet nimble clothing, along with food and any other gadgets she could use to help in her survival. The nearest shelter was within the largest part of the city, which was also a likely spot for an enemy invasion. The other safer option laid beyond the city, in the mountains to the north and northwest. If she knew she was going to be in her current predicament, perhaps she would have left earlier. She knew that overthinking such a topic was counterproductive, and shifted her thoughts once more, this time, to her survival. A worn combat knife here, food there, and clothing to top it off. She scavenged what she could, opting for muted colours that blended with the urban environment and provided less noise during movement. However, even in her preparation, she still found herself in her darkened room, 
thinking to herself. She had begun to have doubts. Where can I go? Is Tola alive? Should I even step outside? She thought to herself. From what information she gathered just from her roof was that the invasion showed no signs of halting. Then the feeling of helplessness assaulted Vorta, causing her to find comfort in a fetal posture. With all the thinking and gathering of supplies she did earlier, had left Vorta tired, unbeknownst to her. Soon, before she knew it, sleep had taken her. As she slept, the cogs of war turned, encroaching further into the city of Artre. What was once an ounce of resistance on the western front was now reduced to silence, with only the sounds of treads, tires and boots to fill in the gaps of cannon fire. The enemy was now at the gates, and still Vorta slept. Cella System, City of Artre, mid-2670. First, Lieutenant O'Brien, 4th ODR Battalion, Raptor Company. Engage! Engage! commanded O'Brien over the company's connected voice input system. The raiders from within the armored personnel carriers exited, using the rhinos as mobile cover. Several raiders made precision shots toward the enemy, missing their mark at times, but ultimately forcing the enemy to keep their own heads down. The steady thumps of the rhino were then sounded, with its rounds strafing along a ridge of cellian emplacements and cover. Get the pumas and flank the enemy! Rhino! Keep hitting them and move forward! Aye, sir, sounded the ordered parties. The puma teams were the first to enact their orders, speeding off towards the outer edges of the enemy encampment. The chain guns of the pumas peppered the shoddily made barriers, kicking up dust and debris as they landed. The rhino, on the other hand, sustained precision bursts of fire at notable defenses. Thump, 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 thump. A four-shot burst was sounded from the APC, landing one into the body of a running cellian and the other three into a manned turret. Hollers from the raiders were sounded when it was confirmed that a rhino landed a hit against the enemy equipment. Yeah, how you like that? Raptor Company slowly advanced on the enemy position as the rhinos provided cover and covering fire. When they were close, they then switched to the .50 caliber, and the slow thumps turned into rapid cracks in the air. The pumas kept on the move, firing into the exposed flanks of the enemy outpost. Screams of pain could be heard as the group approached the encampment. O'Brien halted the rhinos and, in turn, the rest of his troops. Rhinos! Keep an eye on the buildings and make sure there are no surprises, O'Brien commanded from the cover of the rhino. He turned to the rear of the group toward a position much farther than where they were situated. It was the Grizzly MBT, both sitting jet behind the crest of a hill overseeing the rest of Raptor Company. You got eyes on our position? Yes, sir. Not seeing anything on thermals. AO looks clear. O'Brien nodded at the report and turned to his squad leaders, motioning for them to advance. They did so, their weapons drawn in an alert posture. They slowly crested the small mound of sandbags and dirt. With a glance, their eyes followed over the mound, first to the area before the hastily made cover. They did so in a manner that reduced multiple points of exposure, so that they only needed to focus on what was before them without worrying about an exposed area they couldn't see or react to if needed. When the first area was cleared, O'Brien quickly popped his torso out from the crest of the mound and readied his weapon, as did others to his left and right. The area right below him was dug deeper than the surrounding ground, a trench. Simultaneously, as he cleared the person-made feature, he also recognized the immediate danger of the surviving enemy force. Contacts! he shouted, firing two muffled shots into the nearest cellian and three into the next. His soldiers beside him expertly followed, doing the same. The body language of the enemy was that of shock, since he couldn't see their faces. Of the two he neutralized, the first was holding the second who was clearly wounded. O'Brien knew they weren't armed, but still fired. Like the strings cut from a marionette, they fell limp into the dirt. As he scanned his surroundings, affirmations from his company were sounded, acknowledging the clearing of the trench. Clear! X-rays down! All clear! The route that Raptor Company occupied took place on a main road into the city, through the outskirts of the city. From a distance, the city looked like a continuous metropolis of buildings, rail cars, and roads. However, as they approached the outskirts, 
they noticed that many of the smaller buildings were spaced at differing intervals with no real structure to their placement. However, as Raptor Company advanced through the streets, O'Brien, from a distance, was met with the realization that the central city was surrounded by a large wall, and their main access route was now obstructed by large sealed doors. Walls? I didn't hear anything about walls, voiced Dare. Yeah, neither did I, replied O'Brien. Athena, what can you tell me about these walls? Defenses, access routes, all of it. Understood, replied the disembodied voice. It appears there is still power running through the wall, but I will need access to a service terminal for a more definitive answer. O'Brien nodded to the report and turned to his troops that were standing at the ready, eager for his orders. Listen up, Raptors, sounded O'Brien. Bravo and Charlie squads, secure a perimeter around the rhinos and advanced. Follow the road to the main gate and hold until my squad secures those doors. Delta, hang back until the Grizzlies can regroup. Any questions? O'Brien waited for a hand from the rear, but it never came. Very well. You have your orders. Move out. Alpha Squad, we're taking the Pumas. Those not part of Alpha Squad were ejected from their seats and took part of their assigned squad's tasks. Bravo and Charlie moved at a slow pace, matching that of the boots on the ground, as they also simultaneously searched the nearby buildings, scavenging baubles and trinkets from the numerous buildings with some of the raiders exchanging their newly acquired goods. Sergeant Eau Claire was the first to speak on the topic, with a stern tone. That had better be food, raider. You know the rules of taking trophies from battle. Not like they were dead, Sarnt. Besides, it was a store, I think. I don't want to hear it, Lockwood. Toss it. Aye, Sarnt, he replied, defeat apparent in his voice, and tossed his trinket alongside the road, as did the others in her purview not wanting to face verbal reprimand. Bravo and Charlie's squads continued on as Delta remained behind, taking cover in the nearby buildings as they awaited the Grizzlies. O'Brien and his squad had continued on toward the gate, but instead of the main road, they opted for the smaller roads that were now available to them once they were further in the outskirts. O'Brien rode passenger in his transport model Puma, the Mark Zero, while the others were equipped with the chain gun variant Puma, the MK-1. As they rode, the gunners scanned their surroundings as the force of the wind assaulted them. Luckily, they didn't feel a difference in temperature thanks to their environmental suit they wore beneath their battle dress uniform. It kept the user warm enough in temperate climates and moderate weather, enough for any standard raider to focus solely on their mission at hand. As they slowed their approach through the streets, O'Brien received a transmission from Strega, who rode in a separate vehicle as a passenger. Sir, didn't you find it odd? Back at that outpost, she questioned. I'm just as concerned as you are, he replied, turning his mind to their latest encounter before continuing. Their encampment seemed fairly unorthodox, given their environment and manpower. You'd think they would take cover in the buildings instead of digging a trench in the center of the road. To O'Brien and to several of the raiders present, if they wanted an outpost to monitor civilian traffic, then there would be no need for a trench. When there existed other forms of deterrence for both humanoid and vehicle alike that were more efficient than whatever the enemy had come up with. As he was dwelling on such items, a voice from Dare was sounded. Sir, I might have the reason for what we came across. Oh, send it over, O'Brien ordered. And as he commanded, information was displayed on a forearm-mounted display. This is... Instead of surprise or shock, he was... disappointed. His hidden excitement was tarnished with newfound information, only it wasn't new. At least, not for him. Athena, he said in a questioning tone, care to explain? The artificial entity made a small groan, like someone who had been caught doing mischievous deeds. Her apparent displeasure had caught the interest of the listening parties as she proceeded to explain. Ahem. What you are seeing, sir, is a historical document of standard tactics at the turn of the twentieth century. It appears to have been studied by a small group of soldiers looking to turn an advantage along an avenue of approach. The Great War. Strategies and tactics of the First World War, huh? This is ancient. Of course she replied in a triumphant tone. 
Trench warfare is outdated by today's standard. I found it fitting, among other things, to supply the enemy with outdated knowledge of tactics and equipment. Over his shared communications, he began to hear snickers and muffled laughter over the realization of the sudden change in tactics from the Celians. Well, from what I can tell, there were only a small number who actually put it into practice. We'll be in trouble if they have the slightest bit of defenses. Doesn't matter how old the tactics, siege warfare should be avoided, O'Brien added. Notable nods were made in affirmation to his statement. How so? If you could be so inclined to explain. I'm not aware of many operations undergone by the raiders. Even I find that information difficult to come by, replied Athena questionably. Color me surprised, voiced Strega. Why didn't you break through the classified encryption? Surely you could break it, no problem. That would be unprofessional. Besides, I didn't have access to any raider network even now, replied Athena. Hate to break it to you, my digital friend. Dare was next to add his input. All official missions issued by the ODR are kept at a black site. No matter how advanced you are, you won't be able to find it. It's completely off-grid. The fact that I couldn't even view what should normally be declassified is what frustrates me, voiced their artificial companion. The only thing you'd get close to declassified is whatever they put on the news, added O'Brien. But as I was going to say... O'Brien gave a muddied and vague account of a mission that was emphasized as peak siege warfare. We were sent to a planet to capture an infamous militia group turned pirate. Not something you want happening in a system. It was a combined effort and by the time we knew it, we found their base of operations. O'Brien's tone lowered, not to be quiet, but reminiscent. HQ wouldn't let the Marines close and wanted something to prove using only the raiders. Something about disbanding the raiders since we haven't had a serious op in over a hundred years, so the Senate were looking to get rid of the raider branch. Even the stellar fleet was held by rains, so we couldn't even bombard them from orbit. In essence, it was a pure raider operation. I would have assumed that the raiders would have been involved with plenty of missions since their conception, replied Athena. You'd think so. They usually send us in teams, but the Senate found it better to utilize specialized groups of the more plentiful Marines. We haven't had a serious conflict to deploy us en masse till now. That right, Raiders? Oorah! sounded the rest of his men. He then returned to his conversation with Athena, doing his best to satiate her inquiries, while also not providing away key information that would very likely put him in the brig. We were a small fleet by the time we made it over our target in low orbit. When we dropped, we landed just outside the entrance to the compound, by about 500 meters. It was all the 4th Battalion that dropped. But when we landed, there were no pirates, no gunfire, nothing. It was like a ghost town with how the wind howled. It was eerie, to say the least. Athena didn't present herself in her holographic form, but listened silently to his retelling. Well, we moved forward with the mission, thinking that our ships would provide some form of cover. But we were wrong. The ground was relatively flat, with some old craters from a fight years earlier, but before we knew it, our ships came crashing down, destroyed by a series of well-coordinated size 9 torpedoes. With their shields, a couple would hurt it, but it wouldn't go down. But we saw at least fifty fired from the mountain range right below them, and a shot from a hidden magnetic accelerator built into the compound we were raiding. It took only seconds to wipe out the rest of the fleet. Athena seemed at a loss for words. She tried to look for words of comfort, but none came to her. Instead, she just listened. Then, as we were looking up at the sky, we were hit with machine gun and cannon fire. We had no cover, except for our pods. That was the day that 4th Battalion lost plenty of raiders. Raptor was at the forefront, with Cobra, Viper, and Raven further behind. With no support from our ships, we were stranded for weeks with only one mission. Take the compound. When you ran out of ammo or rations you took from the nearest fallen teammate, it's what kept us fighting. O'Brien's tone returned to a somber state as he continued. I was barely a corporal when my company took over the compound. We went in with most of the company, but we came out with a squad and a half. Strega, Gray, Dare, and I, along with Eau Claire from Bravo Squad, are the only original members from that day. That was when they were fresh out of the depot. 
Want to know what we call it? You have a name for it? Why would you want to memorialize the day when nearly all of your battalion perished? The blood trial is what we call it, revealed O'Brien, leaving Athena momentarily stunned. I do find that name quite distasteful. For what reason did you call it that? Well, aside from everyone who died, have you ever waded ankle-deep in pools of blood from some of your closest friends? From a distance, you would have thought there was a small pond, and the smell of iron lingered on us for days. But because the man leading the pirates was too high profile, we couldn't leave before taking him out. His death is the only thing that saved us from disbanding the Raider Corps. This was when you were a corporal? She inquired. I enlisted before I commissioned as an officer, you know, replied O'Brien, his tone much more joyous than previously. You said there was at least a squad and a half that made it. What happened to them? She asked. Raptor Company had it the worst, and those who survived either shot themselves or got out, then shot themselves. The other companies got off easier than we did in terms of casualties, but most of us survived to give the Senate reassurance that they could rely on us, he replied, almost indifferently. That's, Athena began, but was interjected by O'Brien. I know, not many people have to face something like that, but holding your best friend's head after a cannon blew him apart. Well, some people can't get that out of their heads. So the only way to escape it, he said, placing his hands to his head, mimicking a handgun and slamming his thumb down like a cocked hammer going off, is to end it. The raiders who had previously engaged in small conversation were now silent, listening in through the squad's specific comms. Why then? she asked, her tone directed at most of the named survivors. Hmm? he sounded, beckoning Athena to continue. Why then, do you still continue this line of work? As she asked her question, the pumas came to a halt before a large gate with the walls extending to his left and right until they curved out of his view. O'Brien, Strega, Gray, and Dare then disembarked from their seats, convening together in the center of the pumas that were placed into a circular formation with enough room to not all be made collateral from a well-fired explosive. The gunners maintained their vigilance by aiming their turret outwards of the circle, and the low hum of the engines could still be heard. We do it because someone has to. Someone has to teach the new blood how to get the job done, no matter how bad it gets. Who better than the raiders who survived the blood trial? O'Brien that took his suppressed rifle, keeping it slung across his chest and his right hand around the grip in a relaxed motion, as his nearby teammates did similar actions. But that's enough of our earlier days. Let's find a way through this wall before the armor gets here. Of course, sir, replied the AI. Good. Puma teams. Scout the area for likely access points and defenses. When you're done, regroup with the main force, ordered O'Brien. Yes, sir. They sounded off, breaking into teams of as their team, when O'Brien turned to speak with the transport-only variant. Head back and regroup with Bravo and Charlie. They'll need the extra supplies, he ordered, grabbing only one item of each that could aid in their infiltration, breaching charges and a forceful electronic access pad, which he handed to Strega. Sir? I already have one, she replied, revealing a worn and personalized FEA pad. It's a backup if yours falls through. Which it won't. Regardless of her stance, he tossed her the extra pad, cutting her off mid-sentence, which she placed in an empty pouch on her thigh. Aye, sir. Their transport had already left, leaving the four and Athena to search their area for access. They had noticed earlier of a rail system that led from the isolated town to the wall, but instead of being at ground level, it stayed suspended with the height too high for Theme to reach, without grapples or aerial assistance. I shall perform a short radial scan of the area, suggested Athena. Go for it. To which O'Brien replied as he and his fire team actively searched for alternate routes. A high-pitched ping was sounded from his helmet as the scan was performed. There was no difference to his visor as it was done thinking that he would receive some sort of visual feedback in addition to the ping. Around them were buildings that rose to the mid-height of the wall, removing the option of trying to rappel across the roof to the wall. However, as they moved towards the wall searching the buildings for any useful information, a notification was made by Athena, halting them in their steps. 
I think I may have found a likely candidate. I have marked the location on your HUDs. I couldn't pinpoint the location, so we'll have to look for it when we get there. All right, you heard her. Let's move. Sela System, City of Artre, mid-2670. First Lieutenant O'Brien, 4th ODR Battalion, Raptor Company. The distance to the ping was roughly 100 meters to the left of the main gate doors. It was a small-sized building housing three floors surrounded by a wall that was too tall for them to climb, and a gate that looked to move to the side for vehicles. Beside it was a small terminal, and a smaller door that was designated for pedestrian traffic, with both entrances sealed. Strega, hack the terminal and get either of the gates open. She silently moved to the terminal in question, and began tapping away at her device. The subtle thuds and beeps of command input were sounded as she worked. Dare moved beside O'Brien, asking a question that he too had in his mind. When are they going to start invading with the rest of the 4th and the Marines? I don't know. I haven't gotten word about it, but I suspect those cannons we keep seeing are making them hesitant, said O'Brien as he mindlessly readjusted his weapon. He checked his sling and rolled back the charging handle of his rifle halfway to ensuring he still had a round in the chamber. He then turned to the numerous blue sources of light that were sent up into space, likely striking friendly ships. O'Brien was ordered to simply capture the men responsible for their unprovoked attacks. But the sight of surface-to-orbit fire urged his mission with a new directive. Athena, can you contact 7th Fleet? I can, but there appears to be some interference with mainline communications. I should be able to generate a direct encrypted line to the Reckoning, but it may take some time. Can't you use Delta Band? The enemy doesn't seem to know how to jam it. Unfortunately, my equipment is not equipped for such an archaic form of signal, at least not readily. What I can do is attune existing parameters to parse the jamming signal and boost a message through that, she replied. Do it. In the meantime, can you identify the anti-orbit cannons? I can. I've already triangulated possible targets slated for termination. It will require a great deal of coordination and manpower, however. Shall I upload it to your personal hollow map? Of course. He thought to himself about how he would divide his forces as he looked at a generated map that hovered above his free hand. The render was done so in a three dimensions with a blue arrow indicating his position with green arrows indicating friendlies. As he scrolled further from his epicenter, the detail of his surroundings degraded rapidly until generic shapes representing buildings were all he could see. The view was isometric, as he oriented the view. As he suspected, the wall extended far beyond his sensor range, and when he tried viewing the marked locations for the cannons, it was empty with space with a singular icon in the form of an artillery cannon. Damn, muttered O'Brien, but audible enough for Strega to hear. What's wrong, sir? Map not working? It works, but it's only relaying information that suit sensors can reach. I think their jam signal is messing with the map. We'll need some form of overhead support if we want the advantage. Otherwise, this map's useless. Wasn't it working before? He shook his head in response. It works, but we need either an aerial or orbital access link to transmit. That or improve our suit sensors, which will require a retrofit that we won't be seeing anytime soon. As O'Brien understood it, his personal hollow map was keyed on a personal frequency specific to his HUD allowing him and others of the same frequency to view the map. It was apparently part of a breakthrough in alternate reality tech that they decided to field. However, it came with some shortcomings. The hollow map tech could use built-in suit sensors to generate the immediate surroundings or nearby large objects in a short distance, but quickly fell off from there. If they wanted a more detailed map survey, it would require an external drone manned ship or satellite to scan and transmit data for him to utilize. Unfortunately, the drone they could use was aboard their stealth corvette. We'll just have to work with limited mission capability. I'm not sure if we can improve it in the field. Before he could finish his sentence, Athena interjected a possible solution. If you would like, I may be able to find a solution for your map, sir. Good to hear. Work on it if you can. If not, well... We'll manage. With opping from behind, the sound of a metallic gate opened followed with a thumbs up from Strega. We're good, sir. 
You know, it would serve us well if I took care of all electronic access, Sergeant, offered Athena, to which Strega replied, And let my skills get rusty? No thanks, dear. Very well. But my services will still be available should the team require them. You're doing enough, Athena, Strega replied, now readying her S4 SSBR along with O'Brien and Gray. With practiced form, O'Brien's stance changed from a moderately relaxed state to an alerted status, his gun at the ready, lowered just below his chin as his team infiltrated the compound. The once relaxed atmosphere of the team had shifted, and Gray was the first to take point, followed by O'Brien, Strega, and finally Darian. The team was met with a small courtyard with a pedestrian path leading to the building entrance. To their right was an empty parking lot, which unconsciously eased a portion of their tension. Move up and breach the entrance. Strega, Athene, check for any alarms that might get tripped. They nodded and worked in conjunction to find any traces of active alarms that might activate upon their breach. Athena was the first to report, quickly followed by Strega, who showed a minor bout of frustration but quickly let it go. She knew well that against an AI on the level of Athena, that it was pointless to compete. I detect no active measures for alarms. All available power seems to be routing through a terminal on the first level. Other than that, the building appears derelict, Athena responded, triumphant of her usefulness. With the sounding of apparent confirmation, Gray was the first to attempt a breach at the entrance, which revealed to be slightly ajar, enough for him to grip and slide open. There was an external device beside the door, but most of it was missing, so the team settled for forcing open the doors utilizing Gray's unrivaled strength. They opened slowly, the mechanism straining against an unauthorized entry, as noted by the creaking sounds of the internal gears. But without much effort for Gray, the doors were opened, revealing a dark hallway. Gray then took a step forward but was quickly stopped by both Strega and O'Brien, his foot barely within the door. Gray held it in position as if it were flash frozen in midair. He turned to O'Brien, who then pointed to the side of his helmet. Turn on your night visor. With a press of a button, the view of a darkened hallway lit up revealing more details than he previously could. I know your eyes are great at night, but there are just some things even you can't see without them, Gray. O'Brien stated, directing with an index finger to where his foot hovered. The raider in question knew he was being scolded and looked down, as ordered. What he saw were two bright lines that existed above and below his foot. At that moment, his shame grew but luckily, he wore his helmet to hide his embarrassment. I are trip mine. You're lucky you didn't blow us all up, added Strega with a sigh, and pulled out her FEA pad. Hang still. He did as he was told until the two strings of light went off, and he could freely move his feet forward, which landed with a heavy thud. Hey, sorry, sir, Gray said, hiding the embarrassment from escaping his voice. Come on, be more careful next time, big guy. I'm not trying to go out on a trip mine of all things, voiced Dare, frustration apparent in his voice. The team slowed their advance since the trip mine and moved as one to the terminal Athena had detected. Papers were littered across the floor alongside side everyday office items that were forgotten in a rush to leave. They followed the hall to the end with a single door to the right. Strega was the first to lead, opening it with remote access by use of her FEA pad. Luckily, Unlike the entrance, the door was not rigged to blow, but they still searched the room cautiously for evidence of rigged defenses. Against the wall to their left was a single terminal, and above it was a large monitor. The room was small and housed two chairs, but remained largely empty with a set of slim lockers on the wall to the right. O'Brien made his way to the terminal, and Dare was the first to begin looking through the lockers after ensuring they, too, were not rigged to blow. Strega and Gray, however, continued their patrol through the building as O'Brien retrieved Athena from a pouch, where he held her before him, and her Greek goddess visage appeared, and she bowed. Without words, O'Brien silently equipped a port that was fashioned to integrate with Selian ports. Connecting. Sir, I think you will be most pleased with what I have found, reported Athena. The display above the terminal lit up showcasing a series of graphs, numbers, and characters foreign to him. It looked like a diagnostic, of which he knew nothing about. What am I looking at, Athena? 
From what I have gathered so far, this compound looks to be a service and maintenance station. They monitor gate access and power distribution, pulling up connected services now. A series of visuals appeared, relating to a connected system, in sequence as she explained each function. It appears they control gate operations from this compound, which so happens to be connected to the rest of the wall. What's it connected to? He asked. She pulled up what looked to be military defenses in addition to a series of sensors, all of which were indicated to be running at maximum power. All available power had been rerouted to newly placed defensive batteries. New? Voice Dare, occupied with newfound documents and trinkets from the locker. They had recently upgraded from an older missile battery model, although the platform remains the same. O'Brien knew what had to be done. He didn't need an order from a higher authority to tell him his secondary objective, since his decision would align with his current mission. Shut it down. Those AA batteries would wreak havoc on our raiders. With his order, indicators signifying a connected signal were cut, and the equivalent of error symbols flashed in place as Athena severed the connection's portions at a time. Connection severed. Opening the gate now. And as she said, the large doors to the wall began to open with a near a low and constant hum. They felt the vibrations of the gate lightly, but they soon came to a stop. He knew that their entry had to be noticed by somebody, whether it be a passing patrol or electronic sensors within the city. He had more questions now that they had access to the city, and the lack of a force in the outer section of the city was cause for concern. So far, they had come across no form of aerial security or patrols on their route, especially considering the amount of noise they made taking on the small outpost on the outskirts. O'Brien also checked his hollow map for a possible change, but found it the same as when he last checked. Any lead on that jammer? I need to get in contact with Seventh Fleet, inquired O'Brien to his digital companion. I'm having some difficulties trying to decode its frequency, but its coded mainline frequency is rapidly changing. Whoever came up with it did a decent job making the signal tamper-proof. I'm not familiar with the technology employed, so I may need more time. We'll see about that chimed Dare, pointing to the large case on his back. We just need a visual. Point me in a direction. She nodded to his suggestion, but ultimately felt curious about how he would handle it. There is an access tunnel that leads from this compound to the other side of the wall. There should be a plethora of vantage points for someone of your skill set. I'll mark a notable location on your HUD. O'Brien nodded his head in a motion for him to get moving, to which Dare dismissed himself almost gleefully. He had already gotten permission and left for the tunnel, which revealed to be an entrance at the end of the hall that was previously hidden. He tapped away on his wrist pad, engaging short-range comms for others in his company, but was met with static. Damn it, Strega Gray. Time to head out and regroup. When he stepped out of the room, he was met with both Strega and Gray, who stood idle in the hallway after watching Dare depart on his mission. Sent him to scout? Strega was the first to ask. O'Brien nodded in affirmation. Short and long-range comms are shot. He's been ordered to search and destroy the source. To do that, we'll need to draw them away. He motioned in the vague direction of the city gate, and the three made their way to the entrance and beyond the compound walls, moving south through the nearby building alleys towards the main road. They moved quickly while still maintaining an alert mind. They did so by constantly glancing at all likely spots for an ambush. It's a skill developed after surviving encounters in a dense, hostile environment, and knowing possible locations where someone could hide were valuable in their survival. The team made their way to the edge of the main road. Before nearing the end of the alleyway, O'Brien noticed on his mini-map that friendly indicators entered the edge of his sensor radius, as indicated with green dots on his lower left of his HUD. A raider on the outer edge of the perimeter turned to meet them, his weapon at the ready but lowered it upon their clearing of the alley. The vehicles they came with were now established in a spread convoy, with all two Pumas in the front, followed by two Grizzly tanks, then the two Rhinos, with the last two Pumas taking the rear. The convoy was offset to avoid taking a round from behind by friendly fire. This ensured that enemies engaged forward of the convoy would receive maximum engagement. Their spacing as well also allowed for groups of soldiers to be able to take cover from either their left or right flanks. If they were assaulted on both sides, 
Then the rhinos would park beside one another to protect the raiders in between, a standard tactic for convoys. Before he gave the order to set off, he checked his hollow map once more. This time, the only change noted was the amount of friendly indicators present around him, with the diminished building details on the edge of sensor range. Feeling that map status insignificant, he closed it and ordered his troops advance. Move out, he ordered, taking a ride in the now empty rhino. It was common for officers to be in a place to take cover during a convoy, and the rhino was his best option. It offered defense as well as offense, making it a decent option as a mobile command center. With his order, the convoy moved forward, the sounds of tire, tread, and boots sounding the atmosphere. They were in the enemy's home, and their mind's focus was at an all-time high. O'Brien was aware of their thinking, how some were bloodthirsty for the enemy, or some who simply wanted to go home. At the end of the day, they had a job to do, and they all knew, collectively, that winning this would grant them time off when they went home. They only need to survive. Cell System, City of Artre, mid-2670, 1st Lieutenant O'Brien, 4th ODR Battalion, Raptor Company. As they advanced, all conversation ceased, for the most part. Hushed tones were occasionally spoken, commenting on the state of their environment. Huh, you'd think this place would be more... Lively? I was thinking swarming with patrols, but yours works. It was two raiders patrolling beside each other at the rear of O'Brien's rhino. He couldn't see them, but their proximity comms were enough for most of the company to hear. However, they were silenced by an order of their sergeant. Quiet down, you two. Scan your flanks and shut up. Aye, sarnt, replied the two, increasing the space between each other to fifteen paces. Raptor Company followed the main road, cautiously navigating through debris and left behind vehicles, but most of the road remained clear of obstructions. It felt unnatural to them as they continued scanning every window and door that entered their view, of which there were thousands. Ahead, a pair of pumas paused, as did the rest of the convoy. As standard practice during a halt in the convoy, those on foot took cover on the sides of the road below, building awnings and inlets while scanning around the convoy. O'Brien felt this and pulled up his map. It tracked all of his current force with his troops on the sides of the road and the vehicles still on the road. Puma team, why'd we stop? A reply came quick from the team in question. A crossroad, what are your orders? With his map still relatively useless on a larger scale, he decided to depart from the rhino and meet with the Puma team up front. The rest of the company remained in hiding between the crevices of buildings as O'Brien made his way to them. They had traveled for several minutes and had encountered no resistance thus far, which worried him but analyzed his situation. The road they were on extended further east with the cross flowing north and south. At the ends, blue lights shined from beyond some buildings, momentarily lighting up the surrounding buildings. The cannons, he thought to himself. Now would be a perfect time to neutralize them for ships to get within support range. He had already taken care of the missile batteries so aerial support and drop pods would be safe from attack, or so he thought. With an order with his proximity comms, he called for the squad leaders of the company to convene. He didn't need all the company to converge on his position. It would make for a horrific mass casualty event. Before him were Sergeants Strega, Eau Claire, Jericho, and Blythe, squad leaders of Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, and Delta, respectively. They stood ready, while also minding their silhouette in the open, and oriented themselves beside the puma. Here's what we have. O'Brien started, pointing at the location of the pillars of light to the north and south. We don't have much time, and we've wasted enough of it. This city has at least two surface-to-orbit cannons that are taking out the Navy as we speak. We need to take them out to make room for the assault carrier and to get the rest of our brothers and sisters to assist in our invasion. We barely scratch the interior of the city, so we'll need to double-time our efforts without delay. He directed a finger to Jericho and Blythe. You two will take the south cannon, while Alpha and Bravo with take the north. Naturalize the cannon, then return to this crossroad if possible. If not, make your way to the center of the city. Intel says that the council compound is at the center. 
You have execute authority on all hostiles only. So conserve your ammo, he continued. We don't have the means to resupply. Worst case, you start using the enemy's weapons. The mention made them gag. For raiders, they held a displeasure of utilizing weapons not in standard use by their organization, since their current armory has been tested for decades, with reliability to match. That paired with the large calibers made them a need in their line of work, more than a want. They wouldn't want to settle for anything less, which became evident during a body search of an enemy utilizing small caliber rounds, which seemed to be their standard. Shouldn't be a problem, sir, voiced Jericho, presenting his Series 8 auto rifle. From what I've noticed, a single round from this baby can put him six under, even with their armor, Blythe nodded supporting his teammate's claim. Good. Take half of the convoy and hightail it to your objective. He turned to Eau and Strega, ordering them in the same manner. Those who were on foot got with their squads and embarked on any free space of the rhinos and grizzlies. The recon vehicles were already at capacity, and they were the first to depart toward the objective while scouting the roads ahead. With their leadership, Alpha and Bravo took to the roads at full throttle to the north, with Charlie and Delta squads departing southbound. O'Brien remained at the crossroads, leaving with him only two lower enlisted raiders. They were identified by their white markings on their pauldrons. Telling by how fresh the marking was, with no real fading to the paint, he knew them to be fresh to the unit. They were on alert, as shown by their lowered combat stance and their weapon at the ready itching to put several rounds into the first thing that decided to deem its life short. He decided to break the ice with them as they advanced eastward on the main road, sticking close to the buildings and weaving into the alleyways whenever possible. I don't recall you two being in the unit. When did you show up? The two in question were caught off guard, being directly addressed by their commanding officer. The first to answer was a Lance Corporal Ryder, a female attached to Bravo Squad, but ordered by Sergeant Eau Claire to stick with the lieutenant. Right after the Battle of Draxis, sir, myself and Lance Corporal Fox, she directed a nod behind her, identifying the second raider who was cautiously eyeing all possible ambush locations on their route. When he noticed the attention on himself, he gave a quick informal salute with only two fingers with his left hand before placing them back on the foregrip of his Series 4 Badger rifle. Sir, I have a question. Ryder spoke, quiet as to not disturb their silent approach through the empty pathways. O'Brien nodded for her to continue. What, do you think of the Cellians? He thought for a moment as they continued silently through the alleyway before reaching the end and pausing theory advance before answering. Just soldiers, like us. He noticed that his answer didn't fulfill her curiosity, but now was a perfect time to impart his thinking on a new generation of Raider. Like us, they're soldiers, doing what they feel is right and justified. Of course, that varies between individuals, but that fact remains the same. Many of them are willing to take up arms against us, as we are towards them. We fight for Terra and its citizens. They fight for Sela and her people. I've seen the vids, sir, she replied. They took slaves and murdered innocent civilians. What part of that seems justified? He understood where she was coming from but with a race that grew up culturally different from themselves, they miraculously shared some parallels. And so, O'Brien replied to her question, I understand your frustration, but every so often you need to take a step back and view from their perspective. They think we were encroaching on their territory and sought to remove us. She took a minute to take in his words before replying with a question of her own. Why didn't they try diplomacy? Surely it would have been more benefit than what they lost since Draxis. After motioning them to advance past an open road to the alleyway across from them. Once they made it across, he answered, Scared leaders will always rush their judgment with little thought. I understand why they did it, but I don't have to forgive them. Remember, every decision has a price, and their decision to wipe us out will come with a heavy toll. This time he fashioned his Series 4 Badger. The price just so happens to come in the form of subsonic hate and discontent. Hoorah, sir, Ryder replied in a loud whisper. Until we're ordered otherwise, O'Brien began, you are weapons free on all hostels. 
She nodded in response and regained her combat posture, same as Fox. As they continued on their path, O'Brien attempted to gain comms with his scout sniper, Dare. Meanwhile, as he peered into the night sky, flashes of lights came into being for fractions of a second, taking the place of stars in the foreground. He knew if his team kept this pace, then all would be for nothing, and their fleet would be reduced to orbital debris, an outcome he wanted to avoid at all costs. Looking at his watch, he noticed that they had only a couple of hours before daylight broke, and he needed to know the status of his squads and their objectives. Dare, come in, he said, only to be met with static. O'Brien tried multiple times to connect, but to no avail. He checked his map for any nearby friendly icons, but found none. When in the cover of the nearby buildings, he retrieved Athena from her pouch. Did you manage to crack their frequency? He asked. Still at work, but I am close to... Athena spoke, before being abruptly cut off by a litany of comms chatter assaulting his ears. With a press of a button, he was able to isolate the numerous calls by priority, with Dare being the first. Sir, do you read me? O'Brien was quick to respond. I read you. Did you take out the jammer? Yes, sir. Dare replied, but my area might be compromised. Making my way to you, O'Brien pulled up his tactical map and noticed that there was an increase in resolution of the display. To his northeast, a lone icon with the letters RPTR1, four above it were displayed on the top of a building, and a neutrally colored icon sat beside him. You have a friend? questioned O'Brien. A resident of the building. Don't worry, I have it under control replied Dare, followed by several consecutive thumps from a suppressed weapon, most notably from his Series 10 marksman rifle. We'll make our way to you. Hang tight, ordered O'Brien. Copy. O'Brien then ordered a change in direction for his fire team, with Fox taking point, and Ryder second in their stack, and himself in the rear as he tried to get in contact with his squads. He was able to get in contact with Strega, but the sound of gunfire filtered through their comms. Sir, we've taken control of the cannon, but we're bogged down by heavy fire from our east. We couldn't blow it. A sniper took out our explosive supply. Stand by and hold out. Get ready for a counteroffensive. He cut the line, this time switching to Jericho, leader of Charlie Squad. Tell me you have good news, O'Brien ordered, expecting a quick and concise report as evidenced by the reply from Jericho. We have the cannon, sir, planting explosives now, he replied, but was interjected by his lieutenant with a secondary solution. Do you have access to a command terminal for the cannon? With several seconds of silence, Jericho came back with an answer that pleased him. We do, sir. What do you want us to do? Turn it on the enemy navy, he replied. Once you do that, I'm certain the enemy is going to try to regain control, so dig in and defend your position. Yes, sir replied the raider, no doubt relaying orders to the rest of his group. He then returned his attention to Strega, who picked up as quickly as he called. Her comms were littered with the same sounds of combat. At first, she ignored his initial request, as she was actively giving orders to both Alpha and Bravo squads. Get a beat on those snipers. They already nailed rivers. Several shots of her own followed shortly after, then directed her attention back to her lieutenant. Sir! What about that air support? They won't be able to make it with that AA gun still trained on our ships. Redirect the cannon on the enemy, then you'll have your air support. Frustration was sounded from Strega with an exasperated grunt. Aye, sir. We'll get it done. And she cut off her communication. By the time he ended his communications, they had made it to Dare's location. But Fox silently held his left arm at a 90 degree with a fist, symbolizing the group to halt. They stopped short when they spotted a small group of Selian troopers patrolling at the base of the building. He counted six individuals by a set of open doors, facing out towards the street. Luckily for his fire team, they were concealed by the shadows of the buildings, and the light of a street lamp illuminated the enemy soldiers, surrounding the group in darkness. O'Brien addressed Ryder and Fox quietly as he readied his weapon, and the two followed his action. I'll take the center too. Both of you take a pair on the left and right. They nodded as a laser from their weapon and crosshair on their huds lined up on the chest of three soldiers. He counted down, with the final number spelling the doom of the six before them. Three, two, one. 
Several shots were fired from their rifles, with the pitched thumps of subsonic rounds exiting their barrels. The velocity edged on the barrier of supersonic, but just enough to not break it, maximizing lethality and stealth. Paired with the engineering of their integrated suppressors, the enemy fell before they knew what had hit them. Dare, you have contacts inbound, stated O'Brien as his fire team advanced on the open doors, keeping their weapon at the ready for any surprises. Understood. Standing by, replied the sniper. Fox was the first to scan the entrance before giving the signal to advance into the building. Knowing that the enemy was present, Fox, Ryder, and O'Brien moved in a combat glide through the building. The combat glide is a posture used by almost all organized and professional armed forces. By making precise contact with the balls of their feet and rolling it forward, paired with the support of their hunched torso, a rifleman could move through an interior environment quickly and silently. Their movements flowed like water as they progressed through the halls of the building. With each room they passed, Fox would clear it. Peering in from the first available angle, and rotating his torso in an arc to match with his increasing view of the room until he passed it. Behind him, Ryder would keep her rifle trained forward until Fox passed the room, and would do the same while O'Brien watched their rear, until it was his turn to clear the room. This was a practiced and drilled movement when engaged in a close-quarters environment, like the interiors of buildings or ships. It was something they were used to, and their actions were smooth, yet fast a doctrine known for time immemorial. Their movements changed when they reached the stairs. Their movement remained largely the same, but this time their eyes followed the rising slope of the stairs. Even as experienced as O'Brien was, when it came to clearing stairs, it was a lot more hazardous than clearing rooms of a leveled plain. If the enemy knew they were coming and that they had to progress through a set of stairs, then they held an innate advantage. Their views were larger, and they would be able to spot their rifles or helmets before the advancing party could even see the waiting enemy. But for his fire team, they held an advantage of their own. O'Brien glanced at his HUD's mini-map, and several red icons appeared in upright triangles and two identifiable lines beneath them, indicating how many floors they were above the fire team. Hold, he said, issuing Fox and Ryder to stop, but still maintained sight lines of the stairs. They're two floors above us. Reload and get ready to engage. They replied in response by swapping out their current magazine for a fresh one. As he referenced the mini-map, the lines increased once more, making three lines beneath the triangle icon. As far as his map could identify, the early detection system only allowed up to three levels of distance before capping out. If they had three, then they could be anywhere from three to five floors away since the proximity sensors only allowed detection for a short range, depending on interfering materials. But as he recently saw two lines, then they weren't too far behind. O'Brien tapped Ryder on the shoulder, who did the same with Fox. That was his signal to advance, and the three repeated their motions until they began to hear chatter above them, and the enemy triangle icons changed from one line to none. Fox halted the team once again, maintaining his rifle with one hand. O'Brien knew that they were one stair well away from the enemy. Before they advanced further, gunfire erupted at the top of the stairwell and chaos among the enemy erupted. Vecta, he shot Ronu, yelled one Selian trooper, trying to apply medical aid to the unresponsive downed trooper. Chief, what of the civilian? asked another as he fired blindly from the cover of the wall by the door. I don't care, kill them both, replied their commanding officer. Of course, war chief. As was their cue, O'Brien gave the order to advance with rapid taps on Ryder's shoulder, which she applied the same to Fox who increased his speed. As he rounded the corner of the stairwell, a pair of Selian ground troopers were seen treating a downed trooper on the landing. A Selian facing towards the descending path of the stairs was the first to notice Fox, and began to notify his busy comrade treating the downed soldier. He was promptly silenced with two shots that made their way through the amber glass of their visor, his body falling limp onto the body that his comrade was treating. The second grew confused by the sudden action by his comrade, but was subsequently shot with three rounds from Fox, who landed two at the base of the neck and another in his back. 
Fox continued, turning his attention back to the stairwell, with Ryder switching from the well to the downed Cellian, firing one round into the head of the unresponsive Cellians before continuing behind Fox. As they reached what seemed to be the top level of the building, a gunfight was erupting just beyond the door, with more Cellians waiting by the door for cover. The fire team wasted no time up the stairs and began firing into the waiting enemy crowd. They were caught off guard by the initial shots from Fox and Ryder, but with the increased density, they switched from semi-auto fire to full. Instead of precise pulls of their trigger now became a hail of bullets at the unsuspecting enemy. Some had tried to fire back but either missed or fired into the back of their comrade, resulting in fatal friendly fire. However, that didn't stop their advance, and continued past the door to the roof when the last Cellian fell. To secure their rear, O'Brien released a fragmentation grenade among the corpses as he progressed through the door. He took cover behind a wall but began firing into the rear of the remaining Cellians currently engaged with Dare. Fox and Ryder engaged with the four nearest Cellians firing in Dare's direction, but large air conditioning units provided ample cover for him and his guest. Only one enemy remained, and they advanced when Dare retreated behind cover to reload, knowing that they could kill him in his position. Just as they rounded the corner, O'Brien tried to fire, but found his weapon emptied, and Fox and Ryder were mid-reload. With a practiced movement, he released his grip from his rifle and reached for his sidearm that was holstered on his right leg. It was as if time had slowed, and drew his handgun which matched the speed of the single step the Cellian took to round the corner of the conditioning unit. But he was faster. With his handgun leveled at his chest, O'Brien fired the entirety of the magazine into the alien. It was rapid, and when time returned to its normal pace, O'Brien released a gasp of air as the Cellian before him laid limp. Fox and Ryder returned to his side and began securing the rooftop. Fox and Ryder returned to the stairwell while O'Brien approached the whole riddled conditioning unit, rounding its corner and finding Dare beside a restrained Cellian woman. Dare was the first to speak up at the sight of his commanding officer coming to his aid. Your timing couldn't have been better, sir, he replied, holstering his sidearm. I'm just glad you're all right. And good work, by the way, for taking out that jammer, replied O'Brien. I'll tell you, it was a hassle trying to find the damn thing, but hey, it got done, replied Dare, placing a hand on the large rifle beside him. You just can't beat the S-12. It was the Series 12 anti-material rifle. A bolt-action rifle chambered in .50 caliber utilizing a high-velocity armor-piercing discarding sabot round. Compared to standard armor-piercing rounds fired from small arms, it's the best in class. Got any ammo on you? O'Brien asked of Dare, to which he replied with two magazines for the Series 12 and three for the Series 10 marksman rifle. See if you can assist Strega and Eau Claire to the north from here. Dare was confused at first, but did as he was told, leaving the restrained Cellian woman by herself. He placed the S-10 on the wall while he planted the S-12 on its bipod towards the north. What am I hunting? he asked peering through the scope and making adjustments based on available wind speed and direction. To get a better view, he left his helmet off, preferring to feel the atmosphere as he shot. O'Brien opened his command map. This time more information was provided to him, as was the increase in resolution. Several icons appeared at the previously mentioned surface-to-orbit cannons. On the cannon itself were the combined squads of Alpha and Bravo. The same could be said for Charlie and Delta, but the former was locked in combat with a wealth of enemy forces revealed on the map. He selected points of the suspected sniper positions and relayed that information to Dare. Enemy rooftop snipers, 2,500 meters. Fire when ready. When Dare had located his prey, he fired. With a large crack of the rifle, the bullet raced over the horizon, and heated air surrounding the bullet trailed through the air until it connected with an unfortunate soul on the other end. One down reported Dare as he chambered another round. O'Brien then switched his comms channel to that of the command network as he studied the lone Cellian woman who could only look at him with fear. He ignored it as he made contact with the fleet above. Reckoning. This is Raptor 1-1 actual. There was silence at first, with feedback of static in the background before it cleared, and he was able to get in contact with 7th Fleet. 
Raptor 1-1 actual. This is the TRSC Sword of Reckoning. O'Brien, what the hell is going on down there? Give me a status report now. We took control of the SA cannons. They should give you some breathing room. Skies should be cleared, requesting reinforcements. Expect a hot drop, reported O'Brien. Understood, replied Wolf. Stand by. Once you get reinforcements, prepare an assault on your main objective. We'll handle things up here. Oh, and you should have increased map capabilities shortly. We're sending an aerial data drone once we gain air superiority. Understood, sir. Raptor Actual. Out. O'Brien then selected an output for communication to the rest of his company. Raptors, this is Raptor 1-1 Actual. Hold your stations. Reinforcements are inbound. Give them all you have. As he cut the call, he looked to the skies, and he noticed an object that looked like it blocked out a series of stars. Leaving a darkened patch with only the occasional blinking lights on the edge of the obscurity, he noticed a series of bright flashes on one edge, followed by another set of explosions on the opposite end of the sphere. Athena, what is that? He spoke to the device in his hand and the visage of a Greek goddess appeared, her form almost ethereal. It appears to be a rather large orbital station. It is currently engaged with 4th Fleet and the 7th Fleet, she reported, her demeanor calm and serene. The fourth? I didn't know we were getting help from them, spoke Dare, firing another shot to the north and downing another enemy sniper. Neither did I, but we need all the firepower we can get. As they waited, O'Brien and the Cellian looked to the skies, but he suspected she only did so out of curiosity. Piquing his interest, he removed the gag placed over her mouth, making the time to finally talk to Dare's prisoner. Why the gag? he asked. She wouldn't stop talking. Dare replied, keeping his eyes fixed through his scope. O'Brien took this chance to question her while he still had time to spare. Once her gag was removed, she was the first to speak. What do you want from me? She said frantically. O'Brien simply raised his hands in a calming motion, releasing grip from his rifle and letting it hang from his chest from its sling. Don't worry, I'm not here to hurt you. But he was. He pointed to the Cellian that was the closest to firing on their earlier position. She disregarded his comment and maintained eye contact with him. You, you look different from the others, she said, eyeing his armor, most notably his chest and shoulders. You wear a different color from the others. Are you their leader? He knew that she was probing him. This line of questioning was designed to get information, but the way she executed it was too overt. As simple and direct as it is, she was probably just curious. Depending on what she asked, he didn't mind answering to his fullest extent. Very well. I am their leader, so ask away, he said, resting himself in a cross-legged fashion, facing her at eye level. She was perturbed at his sudden rest, but carried on with her questions, as was visible by her facial expressions. Are you a great warrior? she asked, her intense stare now one of pure curiosity. I suppose I am, he answered curtly. Am I correct to assume you have fought at Draxis? She questioned with a calm demeanor. However, her expression seemed frail. He wanted to see where her questions would lead. I was the first ground unit to engage with your soldiers. Her expression seemed unchanging, yet solemn at the same time. He continued speaking, this time trying to get to the bottom of her questions. I think it would benefit us both if you just ask me what you want to know. She swallowed, anxiety rising within her. Your fight is with the Council, correct? He nodded, urging her to continue. I hold little ties with them, but my request is personal. She spoke in a solemn tone as tears formed at the corner of her eyes. I am looking for my sister. The last I saw of her was with Councilman Polas. Please, I need to know if she's safe. You're the only people I can trust. She motioned to her chest for an item that could aid in their search, if he decided to go along with her quest. It was a photo of the Cellian before him, and another, who was much more expressive, both in expression and clothing. From the Cellian before him, her face was unlike the one in the picture, where once she smiled, she no longer expressed any form of joy. He took the photo, placing it in an empty pouch. If I come across her, I'll send her your way. He placed a hand on her shoulder in reassurance before returning to Dare's side. 
By now he had already spent most of his rounds for his anti-material rifle and needed a resupply, but each shot fired true into the enemy. We doing side quests again, sir? He commented, loading another round into the chamber. It couldn't hurt. He turned to the Cellian in custody, looking at her weakened state. She wore a blue outfit with bindings wrapped on her legs, similar to ancient oriental attire from his home. That was a parallel the two species shared, although it fared more as a fusion between ancient oriental and western attire, with the western aspect being the overcoat she wore. Her headdress sat upon a dark blue fabric that rested on her head and shone with a dull luster, with a pair of obsidian octahedron earrings. In fact, gazing upon her was almost entrancing to O'Brien, with her piercing pomegranate-colored eyes that contrasted the yellow outer ring and black-colored sclera, opposite of the white of his own eyes. But enough of that. Let's see how it's looking for our brothers and sisters. He opened his map, viewing the city and enlarging it to its furthest extent. As Wolf declared, he was able to view more on his map than previously with the destruction of the jammer. There were several isolated fronts of combat, with battle lines naturally established. He could also view and ping enemy combatants on his map for other raiders to utilize. However, to maintain HUD cleanliness, such functions were restricted to company commanders and squad leaders. From the tags overlaid on the friendly icons, O'Brien noted that more than just Raptor Company had made a successful drop. Abbreviations such as VIPR, CBRA, and RAVAN were seen scattered around the city. Differing teams were intermixed with one another as they took on groups of enemies, with many raider teams leaving a wake of death or others going dark indefinitely. Now that they had reinforcements, it was time to begin the next phase of their assault. He selected his company-wide comms and began to issue his orders. Raptors, this is Raptor Actual. Rendezvous at my location. Stay alert, we have friendlies in the AO. Double-time it. He then turned to Dare, Fox, and Ryder, who stood at the ready. Dare, once we resupply, scout ahead to the objective. We'll follow behind you once we regroup with the rest of the company. Fox, Ryder, secure our entrance. In the meantime, he turned to the Cellian. I'll find a place to secure our friend. You have a place to hide? She nodded, using her exposed fingers to point downward. There's an old bunker I used to sleep, she said sheepishly. You'll wait there until we deal with the council. She didn't resist his orders and listened quietly. All right, you have your orders. Let's get to work. Cellar System, Orbit of Cellar, Mid-2670, War Chief General Torlak. Sitting above the rows of displays and computers, sat the Chief General Torlak. Beside him was Orlin, the former commander of the superstation in geosynchronous orbit of their capital city, Artre. Orlin commanded and organized the offense, while Torlak dealt with the defenses. They had a plethora of ships to defend against attack, and he wished he could supplement his forces from the border worlds. He knew if he did that, it would leave their borders wide open for an attack by the Union. As far as he was aware, the border fleets knew little of the conflict that arose in the heart of their empire, save for what speeches were sent to them via the official network. But that would have to be an item for later discussion. It didn't take long for their enemy to appear in orbit after wiping out his old fleet that he had sent to intercept them. They were able to interpolate the data provided to them by the icons identifying friend and foe. The command center watched the battle unfold, utilizing the live feeds provided to them from their late comrades. And instead of mourning for them, Torlak and Orlin took this chance to strategize a counter, with Orlin the first to speak. We have no doubt made the enemy expend their weapons store drastically, he stated, noting how long the battle lasted and utilizing a calculation to estimate shots fired from the enemy. If we strike while they rest, I'm sure we can destroy them. It was a sound strategy for Torlak, and he considered it, but ultimately denied a secondary offensive. We can't afford to divert any more ships from orbit. To do so could spell disaster for us. Recall all available fighters from the surface to aid in orbit defenses. As you command, Chief General, replied Orlin. To others, the call to retask planetary fighters was an odd one, but many sided with Torlak on his decision. As their enemy is only known to be coming from space, it made sense to redirect fighters to orbit 
rather than wait on the surface. This boosted their totals for fighters, and that was the end of that. Prepare a quick response fleet, Orlin, for when the enemy enters Seller's influence, ordered Torlak. The purpose for the quick response fleet was simple. Be the first fleet to engage the enemy and relay all information relating to the enemy so that command can better adjust for aberrations in the enemy's strategy. He had analyzed what little he could from their encounters, but one thing remained true. Orlin, relay to all capital ships that engage with the enemy this. Keep your ship moving and keep out of range of their bow and broadsides, mentioned the chief general. How should they approach then? questioned Orlin as he prepared his message. My suggestion is to maintain a heading at 45 degrees from the bow, Torlak began. The enemy employs a devastating weapon that runs the spine of their larger ships. It's fixed, so the ship must maneuver to land a shot. His explanation began to gather a crowd of the fledgling chiefs who worked aboard the station. Many of their frigate-class ships field a large array of cannons on their broadside. By using this heading, we can minimize damage to acceptable levels for ship shielding. The crowd before him were awed by his tactical analysis and stratagem against an unknown enemy. What are they like? spoke one chief, his promotion scarf still fresh from its package. The question also garnered support from like-minded individuals, as many have never been in combat with the enemy. Torlak looked at Orlin, who only shrugged, prompting him to answer. They are a fierce race, ruthless, calculating, and what we've seen so far, efficient. He took a moment to gauge his audience before continuing. Their weapons are primitive in concept, but it is a medium that they have perfected. I have seen rounds from their ballistic cannons melt a ship's hull. That's right, melt. Not torn to shreds by high explosives, but turned to molten slag, with a fire that persisted even in the void. Torlak grew passionate yet ultimately fearful of the Terran use of munitions. If anything, they revolutionized his view of ship weaponry. If they weren't in their current predicament, then perhaps his military could have developed weapons as effect as the Terrans. If it's one thing I respect of them is their weapons technology, which is why you don't underestimate your opponent. They agreed with a collective shout of affirmation, then returned to their stations when they found their curiosity satisfied. Orlin, on the other hand, creeped beside Torlak, who began to work on a defense plan, and spoke to him softly to keep curious eyes from listening in. Are the Terrans really as bad as Polus made them out to be? What exactly did they do? The question caught him off guard, but he matched his friend's tone and delivered his explanation in a low whisper. I do not know, nor do I care, he replied his words stinging like a whip. Just know what you ask is in defiance of the Council, perhaps even the spirit of the Fathers. Orlin recoiled back to the sudden shift in demeanor of his fellow war chief. I only ask to better know of our enemy. It would be best if you drop it, old friend, Torlak replied. Nothing good will come of this exchange. I did what I thought was best for our empire and it was the Council who deemed these beings as subject for extermination. I am ashamed of my defeat, and for that, they knock on our doorstep. Torlak no longer minded his tone and spoke his mind. Orlin responded calmly, maintaining a saintly disposition. Very well, Tor. What's done is done. It appears they come to destroy our home, and I can't let that happen. I will ensure that I operate as a chief commander should and fend them off. Perhaps after, we can reconcile. Before Orlin could finish, alarms blared from a chief on the lower level of where Torlak sat and directed his attention to the large monitor at the front of the command center. The indicators of the enemy that were sighted in the Tila belt were gone, and the cluster of red indicators formed towards the west in the space above the plains west of the city. Now was not the time for him to rest, and as ordered, gave the order to sortie fighters to aid with the response fleet. From the displays, he saw the enemy ships form in a way that the groups of Terran ships created a cubed formation, with their ships at the vertices of the imaginary cube. The distance was several hundred kilometers between each group. 
but allowed for them to send available troops from the nearest cluster. It was an odd formation, and one he had never seen before in all his time as a fleet commander. Chief General, called a crew member, the response fleet had engaged perimeter forces and are standing by for orders and report enemy ships firing with broadsides. He expected the enemy to take out their ships with the spinal cannon, as was their usual tactic, but that was not the case here. And with a flare on the sensors, a small group of fighter-sized ships departed from the center group. Crew analysts generated a predicted path which revealed his greatest fear. General, enemy transports are expected to land planetside, west of the city. Direct fighters from the front to engage those ships. Don't let them touch down on the planet, he ordered with fervor. A flurry of fighters detached from the response fleet, as ordered, and flew towards their primary objective. A trail of exhaust exited the main vector nozzles, giving the ships an afterglow effect as they flew to their targets. When they're in range, they are ordered to engage the enemy. Full weapon dispense is authorized. Leave none standing, he ordered, with his command relayed as quickly as it was spoken. Torlak watched on the grand display as the strike force of fighters closed on the enemy, most likely maxing out their thrust output at the cost of shields. He was once a pilot for fighters in his earlier days, and as he remembered, a fighter had to be able to juggle between three key systems, engines, shields, and weapons. Power cores for ships at the time were only capable of generating enough power to evenly grant the previously mentioned systems the minimum required power. So in a dogfight, shields and weapons were chosen over engines while evasion favored shields and engines. This game was key with Union pilots, but his empire was barely a cut above most of their fighter pilots, a feat he prided himself in. Smaller indicators began flashing, and a call from a chief on the lower row of monitors reported that the fighters had made contact with the enemy, but this time, more indicators flashed, revealing an enemy approaching from their left flank. Chief General, interceptors began firing against the transports but were intercepted by medium-class fighters, reported the chief. How many did they send? We hold the advantage, three to two, they reported. Torlak grumbled at the odds. From what the analysts had told him, a single Terran medium fighter could fend off two, if not three, small class fighters on its own. It outmatched them with armor and firepower, but for his ships, they had speed. Order the fighters to evade. They're faster than the medium class, and have them focus fire on vulnerable enemy ships. The chief nodded at his order and relayed them to the fighters currently en route. Not long after, another set of indicators rang signaling that the fighters had engaged the enemy. In front of him, a moderately sized table was stationed, and with a press of a button lit up to life and a close-up of the battle generated before him. It was a focused generation of the battle, but given a three-dimensional space. Using his fingers, he moved the battlefield to any orientation that suited him as he analyzed friend and foe alike. Aside from the glass surface, there was no real indication of depth beyond the holographic indicators that danced around each, save for a virtual graph that he manually input, giving the field of battle some form of depth. The main display at the front of the command center remained the same, showing all locations of known enemy and friendly units. There were two other stations besides his own, but most of their ships were redirected over their capital. Because, should the enemy take over their space, then they could still defend the most vital city on the planet, the home of their council. How are city defenses faring? Do we have enough ground troops to cover for the cannons? asked Torlak, his questions answered by the most knowledgeable chief on the subject. We have a series of missile batteries along the walls, but to conserve power, we have them running at minimum until aerial sensors are tripped. As for ground troops, we have the inner city on patrol, and most of the residents have been evacuated. He was pleased with their explanation, but figured that troops should be on their way to the planet now if they don't turn them into space debris. But when he thought they had, the edge was now quickly overturned with a new encounter. As he saw, several Selian fighters attempted to fire against the transports, but were fended off by a greater force of Terran ships that fought desperately to defend the fighters. Their defense was enough to buy them enough time for a fresh batch of fighters to enter the fray. 
It was reported that they were small-class fighters, and their speed alone outmatched his just enough to sow discord and chaos among them. With many of his own fighters out of commission, and half of the original enemy intercept force also neutralized, the entry of more enemy fighters were enough to declare an early victory to the Terrans. He recoiled at the sight when his fighters dwindled one by one until none were left. With sensors detecting that all transports were still intact, he was ready to issue another wave of fighters immediately descend to the planet to engage them. Alarms rang, causing him to pause his decision. It was in the opposite sector, a complete 180 degrees from the current field of battle. Reports from numerous war chiefs had begun flooding into his command center with calls to aid of the sudden arrival of enemy ships. He was curious at their sudden appearance, since no notification was given of them entering or exiting sublight travel. Another mystery to Terran technology that he sought to uncover. He issued for a call from a chief commander be put through to give an immediate and prompt report. Chief General, the commander spoke. Commander Ballon, what of the enemy? He replied. I do not know, but the enemy appeared from nowhere. We kept a sensitive hand on the scanners, but their approach was too sudden. It was as if an IS gate appeared before us, then next thing we knew, the enemy appeared and began firing into our ships. All in. Reroute fighters to support their sector. We must counter with an offensive. The time to drive off the enemy is now. He scanned the monitors nearest to him, as well as the ever-updating central display at the front of the room. A cluster of enemy ships were intermixed with his own, no doubt raining their hellfire against them when he noticed the icons mixed with the enemy as familiar. They were icons given to all Selian vessels when registered for the first time, and it was something hard-coded into the ship should any Selian turn against their own. Yorla, he growled, get me a line with the traitor. A display to the left of the main display turned from black to a female Selian of light blue hair with black highlights tied into a high knot. Her skin was a fair pastel pink with a darker shade of markings. Heavy cruiser sword of Celia, Chief Commander Yorla. He addressed her as she peered into his command center. What is a traitor, like yourself, filing with the likes of the Terrans? I have seen what our own have done to the Terrans, she replied. I thought we fought a war over this with the Union. Look at how far you've fallen, Torlak. Her tone as she spoke his grade stung through the air, causing many around him to look at his reaction, but did well to hide his discomfort. He had noticed on her person a change in headdress from her usual commander's attire. It was more ornate than ones authorized for ship use, which garnered curiosity amidst his growing anger. I have noticed a change in headdress. Even for someone in your position, I would hope to think that you would at least keep to ship customs. Surely you haven't forgotten where we've come from. She placed her hand on the headdress that he was referencing. She gave a small smile, causing many around Torlak himself included, to wonder why she would cast away even the most basic of ship customs. You see, Torlak, I have gone against Terran might. I have seen what they can do firsthand when brought with no other choice than to retaliate. They have shown me the truth of what many of our brethren are complicit in. Instead of firing upon us when they could, I was instead presented with a chance to live. Her face was shown reminiscing of the event, even amidst the chaos that rang beyond their hulls, but she continued, her story gripping many within the command center. She continued, And yes, it is true. I have aided the Terrans in their campaign against the Council. The mention of the Council irked him, as the mention was nothing but pure treason. I'm sure you noticed. She motioned to her headdress once more. But I am engaged, and to the very people you made war against, a Terran. The man I am betrothed to also leads this attack in your eastern sector. Know this. Her conviction was evident in her stern yet commanding voice. I will aid the Terrans and the Council will fall. The call was cut leaving Torlak and all those present in silence, with only the hum of electronics filling the air. Torlak was the first to break the heavy silence with an order, an order of execution. Chief Commander Yorla shall pay for her crimes, as will all who follow her. Orlin, he turned to the stoic commander, I want a force to take her down and turn to dust. 
he then turned to the rest of the command center that had remained silent to the exchanged with both the general and the traitor commander. Know this, the Terrans have played tricks to force a once loyal warrior of Celia and the War Council, and turned her away from the very people she swore to protect. I will not let the poison of Terran lies fill her head any longer, nor should you all. They are a plague, and it is our duty to drive them from our home. The regular clamor before the hail had returned, and the usual command vigor resurfaced. His persuasion had worked, and he could see that the young chiefs were working harder than they were before. For a moment, he felt what it was like to be Councilman Polis, thinking to himself that he might even take his office after this is over. But for now, he waited for Orland's task force to take care of Yorla, as well as reorganizing the sector of the new enemy fleet. He hadn't felt much emotion before, but his interaction with Yorla had created a feeling of discontent he didn't think he had in himself. He would use that to fuel his growing hate of the Terrans. Now isn't the time to wait. Organize with the other stations to supplement our forces. Crush the enemy from both sides, ordered the general. But that would leave the other stations defenseless, spoke a nearby chief. They have cover from the surface cannons. Right now, we need to overwhelm our enemy. I doubt they have the stores to fight much longer. Don't forget to send some fighters for those ships that entered the planet. The chief consigned to his reasoning and made the request. The effect was almost immediate, as numerous ships from the other two stations began their journey to their aid. They still had some time before they could make contact, but by then it would spell defeat for the Terran menace. A victory he ached for, as did many loyal to Sela. Soon, he began, directing his voice to those working about in the command center, we shall reign victorious over the Terrans and we will strike at their home. Cella System, Superstation, Orbit of Celia, Mid-2670, War Chief General Torlak. As Torlak ordered, Junior and Senior Chief alike rushed to their duties to quell the sudden Terran advance. Many still kept their minds sane, knowing that they held numerical advantage, but even he could see that many were on the verge of breaking under the pressure. So, he thought it, his responsibility to to reinforce their home field advantage. My fellow chiefs, he began, keep your wits about you. While it is true, facing an enemy as terrifying as the Union, we cannot be the ones to let Selyia, our home, fall. He mentioned their home in its ancestral tongue, forcing all to cease in their motion. This was the first time many have heard it spoken out of ceremony, and even at a young age, had always known that to speak it when not in ceremony was blasphemous. It would carve a stain on your name and your family's name were it to be spoken in vain. But Torlak did so with reason. Mistakes have been made with our enemy which has forced us to turn heel and run. Never has the Selian Armada fled from combat. Not with the Union, not with the Runians, and not with the Terrans. I can see it. You are all scared. He gauged the room, finding several silently nodding to his statement. While true that Selians have a history of cracking under the most intense of pressure, they have always fared well when it counted, the result of this being their faith in their superior officer, their chief. While many exist to command over small units, chiefs are essential to the Selian hierarchy. They were always the most cool-headed under all pressure, which is why any chief who can attain war chief status is always looked upon in reverence. Many of you are but only chiefs, be it junior or senior, but a chief nonetheless. If you fail now, then do you truly have the right to become a war chief? Some nodded no. Others remained focused on his words. Then let this be your trial. Show to the war council no. To the fathers, that you have the workings of a war chief. The empire of Celia rests upon, not just our shoulders, but upon the countless others who fight in orbit of our grand home. Do your duty and do so with the intent to save Celia in its darkest hour. He then sat himself upon his command throne, winded of his exchange, but after its conclusion, the tone of the command center shifted. It was now a room worthy to be at the forefront of the theater. Nice speech, Tor, spoke Orlin, taking his spot beside the weary Torlak. I'm sure they'll be doing their best to assist those on the front. We are the front, replied Torlak. I can see why I miss my war chief days. Things were simpler. 
You blow up a Toscan ship that had the bright idea of trying to work in a colonized system, then you went home for a bit. But as a captain or commander, forget having a life beyond a ship. Orlin laughed. I can see why you turned down the promotion so much. Must be the wife then. With a beauty like her, even I would turn down the promotions. But alas, he motioned to his wrapped chief commander's scarf, my wife sees little of me. But let me tell you, when I return home, well, let's just say we always have another on the way. His description intrigued Torlak, prompting him to ask, how many would that make then? Torlak's eyes widened when Orlin began counting after the first hand. I think we're on our tenth, or is it eleven? The latest is supposed to be twins, so I can only guess. Have you thought of names yet, and where does she stay? Questioned Torlak. We have, Alamor and Reska. Those are what the missus chose, and she's staying with her parents on Yaren, in the Rella system. Beautiful place, but damn near cost me an arm and a leg every time she goes shopping. Torlak's face melted at how Orlin spoke of his family, with not a care in the world, as if they weren't already in the thick of it, but he didn't mind. It did well to reset his mind on what mattered. Of course, his expression soured when Orlin changed the topic to his family. So, you and Aleska, are you two settling for only the two? How are they doing? Torlak struggled to find the words, but settled on telling him as much of the truth as possible in light of his most recent visit. They are well, last I saw them. Torlin turns five at the end of the month, and Elisa recently turned nine, and he turned closer to his friend. We might be having another on the way. Orlin shared his excitement at his revelation, but saw how quickly his face turned distraught after the mention. But I had tried to visit them before you summoned me here. She had left a note saying that they were headed to a bunker with the guards that the council offered for her protection. Needless to say, they were not home when I arrived, replied Torlak, a look of worry present on his face. Guards! Why would a chief general's spouse need guards on Sela, no less? Orlin speculated. I don't know, Torlak replied, but the War Council was adamant I have some. Orlin grumbled at the statement, knowing that questioning their motives was akin to treason, as disregarding their spoken word was akin to shaming the fathers of Celia themselves. I'll make sure we keep an eye out for them, Tor. His friend acknowledged the assist, knowing well that it was done out of consolation, or to at least turn his mind away from the worry. After all, a war of the ages fought beyond their hull. When Torlak had returned to the holographic display before him, he found it to be near flooded with friendly icons. As he saw it, friendly forces were easily treading on the Terran perimeter with the sudden influx of fighter support. Even with their superior firepower, their lines were faltering. How are the bombers faring against the enemy, Orlin? inquired the chief general. With the help of the fighters, they have been able to severely cripple a Terran warship that was holding much of our forces at bay. They can still fire, but we have been able to damage most of their cannons, replied Orlin as he continuously scoured his station for constant updates of the battlefield. His position was used as an intermediary between the larger contingent of forces and fed them to Torlak in quick and digestible bits of information for an appropriate decision that could very well cost the lives of fellow Selians. Keep bombarding them. Their ammo should run short and their shields are sure to give. I doubt they can hit anything small with those cannons. The battle continued like an elephant trying to fend off a horde of locusts. The smaller fighters swarmed the enemy ships, diverting resources for the enemy's targeting, while the heavier craft fired their payload into the hull of the enemy. The shields lasted for some time, but when hit with a mix of capital ship deck cannons, bombers, and the constant bombardment of smaller ordnance, their shields faltered, allowing for a more decisive strike on the enemy. As Orlin reported, it was a ship whose size was on par of their heavier combat ships. Surrounding it were smaller ships, a size or two larger than their heaviest fighter, on par with their corvettes. They acted as a shield for the larger ships, counteracting against missiles and smaller fighters, while the larger ship fired its broadside cannons against the Selian ships of a smaller scale. From what he saw, 
one of their heavy ships could waste near four of his own of the same size. For him, it was madness, and the enemy had several who could finish a small system by themselves. The enemy in the Wester Sector has ceased firing from its cannons. They're turning from the battle, reported Orlin. It was another heavy frigate-sized ship that also had with it a contingent of smaller escorts, but on his display saw that they were heading toward the center cluster of ships, while many of the escorts remained, effectively leaving them for dead since they lost the protection of their guardian. Torlak felt a sense of triumph over the enemy, as one of their lines fell to the renewed Selian onslaught. Erase the ships that remained and begin sending ships through the broken flank. Before he could continue, a junior chief from further down the rows of computers called out urgently to him, silencing the room with his call. Chief General, the enemy ships. They're on a collision course with Chief Commander Hyen, replied a senior chief. Put me through to him now, commanded Torlak. This was a new tactic from the Terrans he had not seen from them. They always had the upper hand in battles thus far, but he had not seen them when they were on the back pedal. When the call finally answered, Torlak was met with an aged man with dark purple skin and black markings. His hair was beginning to grey from his once luster black and wore a headdress from an age older than himself. What news do you bring, Chief General? The aged Selian spoke. Those ships fire on them now! Torlak screamed to the monitor, only prompting confusion from the experienced commander. What brings this on, young one? Clearly it is a suicide charge, perhaps one made from the retreat of their large guardian. See, they even deployed life pods. The call with the commander ended abruptly, leaving only static before an overlay with signal lost was displayed in the center of the monitor. On a separate monitor, the view was shifted from simple geometry to one filled with color and even sound. What they had seen made all those present lose a partition of their sanity if the loss of their voice wasn't enough. It was a series of large explosions, or at least what he thought were explosions, and among the debris of his ships were the enemy escorts, still battered, with many lost during the charge, but still present amidst his slain comrades. Anger arose in Torlak, as it did in Orlin, while the remainder of the command center stood stupefied at the sudden loss of a prominent fleet. He then turned his attention to a small cluster of the heavy-sized frigates that sat in between the central cluster and the battlefield it had fled. He ordered a magnification of the center most ship in the cluster of three. Its size was just a bigger than the two that flanked it, but the scans revealed that it was indeed the same ship that fled. When focus was rendered on the ship, its name became apparent, sharing the same likeness in ship names to the other Terran ships he had known thus far. The graceful wrath, huh? He muttered, heh, how can one be graceful in their wrath against a foe? He mulled over the meaning of its name, which seemed antithetical as a whole. From what he could gather, the graceful wrath turned tail to feign retreat, and after regrouping with two small ships of similar design, rained fire on Chief Commander Hayen and his forces. Those blasted cannons, he said in defeat. The technology was foreign to him, even after already going against them before, if he could even say that he saw it. From what he remembered, during his conquest of Draxus, his fleet was attacked from above, with many of his ships falling victim to a single shot. The larger ships fell prey to large concentrations of shots from the mysterious weapon that seemed to plague all Terran ships. When he noticed the looks of his juniors before him, he gathered himself, issuing another set of orders, mainly to keep their minds off the sudden turn of events. Quick, send fighters to Hayen's old position. Finish off that flank. I doubt the enemy would waste a shot of their main cannon against an opponent a fraction of the size, and he was right. They didn't fire. Instead, the only opposition the incoming fighters faced were the automated point defense system that did little to mitigate their advance. With a barrage of fighter ordnance, the enemy escort ships met their end. Shallow calls of celebration were made, knowing well that they lost more than the enemy did at that moment. But for Torlak, he found success elsewhere, that being with the attack on their far eastern flank against the traitor, Yorla. A great deal of fighters began swarming the traitorous group. 
but many were held back from the destructive capability of the Terran vessels. Missiles were launched, with thin trails of smoke that followed, crashing into his fighters. It didn't help that the enemy force also had a well-armed detachment of fighters to disrupt the flow of combat. They were heavier, but just as maneuverable. It took several more fighters to take down a single medium-sized fighter. When compared to ships of his own, they were roughly the same size, but the mass from their scans identified that their ships had at least double the material for their size. He suspected that it was probably armor. Torlak ordered for a strike team of capital ships, led by Commander Ballon, to target Yorla as he analyzed the screens before him as they executed his order. As they drew close, while also firing their main deck cannons, a ship came in between his strike force and the traitor's ship. It was larger than some of the other ships that shared its silhouette. It had an extra set of guns on its centrally placed outcrop and boasted more armor around the engines and bow sections of the ship. The ship was identified as the TRSC Hell Hath No Fury, its translation still a mystery to him. He figured it was just another phrase lacking any true meaning, in essence a waste of time, and to find a translation that would matter to him. Its shields absorbed the plethora of plasma fire when the friendly ships ceased their attack, with one crewman noting that they had overheated their cannons. Then launch all their missiles. I will not let Yorla and her band of traitors remain in orbit, Torlak ordered, his voice filled to the brim with anger. The crewmen did as they were told, and sensors indicated a rapid flurry of missiles being launched from the ships. He believed that even a wealth of missiles of that magnitude would devastate shields of the enemy's capacity, and prayed for Ballon's success. But before he could revel in its destruction, the indicators of the missiles began disappearing one after the other, with only a fraction actually connecting with the enemy. Chief General, spoke Balin dejectedly, missile salvo was unsuccessful. Torlak's frustration peaked, but it was overshadowed by his confusion. A missile barrage of that size should have been impossible to counter. Mulling over the failed attack, he noticed several ships of the Death Squad and their shields plummet to zero, with their transponders disappearing shortly after. General! The enemy! We can't see! Balin's transmission was cut abruptly when his signal on the monitor disappeared, along with various others sharing a similar fate. W what was that? inquired Orlin. I didn't get any readings of the enemy having fired missiles of their own. Torlak saw no indicators of a nearby enemy that could have intervened, so he relied on the eyes and ears of the fighters in the field. Get with the fighters and see if they can't find out what took out that strike force. A crewman nodded and began issuing orders to the pilots. Torlak watched as their signals danced around the scrapyard of the forcibly resigned strike force as they searched the area for the culprits. It went without saying that the larger ship did them in. But that wasn't what he was worried about. He was worried about who and what intercepted the missiles and took out the shields to the frigates he tasked to take out Yorla. But before he could get a report back, alarms blared, reducing the lighting of the room from the dingy blue to a flashing red. Before a report was generated among the crew, their station rocked, knocking those who were standing onto the ground. Status! What happened? He demanded. A junior chief was the first to speak, as they oversaw the station's systems. Shields to the station have been hit! Eight two percent, they reported, and the station rocked again, with the shields to the station lowering with every quake. What hit us then? An enemy ship? He questioned, only to be met with denial from Orlin as he shook his head to the sides. The surface cannons, they've been turned on us, replied the crewman. W what how? Torlak demanded, knowing the answer was below him. No. He turned his attention to the rest of the crew who looked to him for instruction. Prepare troops for the ground. The enemy has infiltrated the city. After the attack on the station, a large vessel made its way down into the atmosphere, towards the skies over the city of Artre. It was smaller than the enemy ship that carried fighters, it still had a wealth of defenses, but Torlak ordered for another small detachment of ships to intercept it, with the intent to reduce it to dust. When a visual scan was conducted, it revealed the ship as the TRSC Arm of Saul. 
He suspected the ship to be solely a troop transport of some kind for its lack of hangar doors and an increased placement of armor around key components. As his forces converged on their respective targets, alarms blared once more. This time they indicated a presence near his station, centered within the mass of ships that stayed to defend it. His stomach turned at the thought of the approaching entity and ordered all ships in the area to remain on guard. Cruisers, fighters, frigates, corvettes, all available in the region were notified, confused on their invisible enemy when he saw it. He had pulled up a visual of the surrounding space that triggered the alarm, revealing the wealth of ships and a small icon identifying them as friendly. Then, a crewman in charge of the station's scanners revealed the anomaly. Chief General, the reading is large, similar to the IS gate phenomena. He was cut off as Torlak ordered a sudden retreat of the ships in the area, but by then it was too late. Get them out of there, now! But before his orders could be relayed, a large circular mass formed in the center of a large cruiser, bisecting it. And within it, a ship appeared, crashing into the bisected Selian ship as if it were a leaf in the wind. The shields of the ship rippled for only a moment before returning to its undisturbed state. The ship was large, larger than his previous carrier, and much larger than their largest cruiser, which it had summarily used as a doormat. It was sleek and angular in design, contrary to the usual blocky design of the Terran ships, and boasted guns larger than the frigates and cruisers he had encountered thus far, with a plethora of cannons from the ship's prior. From the portal, smaller ships exited and began firing into the Selian ships with their main spinal cannon along with its smaller counterparts placed on their outcrops, delivering a round that melted the hulls of his comrades. He, like many of his crew aboard the command center, remained frozen to the spectacle of slaughter that befell his people. But before he could issue orders, the firing from the enemy stopped and a hail came through, originating from the large enemy ship. The voice was disembodied and filled with hate at every tone it spoke. Attention, humanity's aggressor. I am Morrigan, artificial intelligence of the TRSC battlecruiser, the Phantom Queen. I am here to issue an ultimatum by order of my commanding officer. Stand down and survive or be forgotten. I heavily urge you to fire, but should you surrender, I can guarantee you will keep your lives. Now choose. The message rocked him to his core, as could also be seen in the other officers. Many had already fallen to their knees in prayer and others stood motionless, with their complexion as pale as a ghost. Orlin too remained silent at the appearance of the enemy, his eyes wide in fear. Torlak knew what this spelled for his people, at least what he thought it would spell for them. Before he could reply, the voice spoke once more, demanding all those present to submit. Please note, all Selian vessel engaging in combat will be promptly eliminated. Then, if there is no issue, I shall take your silence as consent. Prepare to be boarded, Chief General Torlak. Sela System, Superstation, Orbit of Selia, Mid-2670, War Chief General Torlak. He was at a loss. His forces were demolished in the blink of an eye with a ship of his own torn in half from a rupture in space, only for others in the vicinity to be cut down shortly after the arrival of the behemoth's escort, with ships no smaller than a heavy frigate. With the addition of the new forces, also brought with them a renewed stock of munitions that they seemed more than willing to expend. Torlax slouched in his chair, watching upon the numerous monitors of information as he decided upon their next course of action. The central monitor at the forefront of the room still contained the obscurity that was Morrigan, and its display of dots arranged in a circle that moved when it spoke, matching the disturbed portions of the ring with each tone. It continued to dance as the figure spoke. But I will state for the record that I must bring you in, alive if possible. You are free to mount a defense within the confines of your station, but note, my wolves are hungry. The call was disconnected shortly after she ended her sentence. The room was stained in deep silence. Torlak could tell that chaos was on the verge of erupting, and so he took this lull in reaction as a chance to regain control of his command. The station rumbled once more, but
but the interval between shots had slowed. He wondered if ground teams had managed to seize partial control of the surface cannons, but the fact that they kept firing on them revealed otherwise. It was reported to him that the energy output has been lowered. He wondered what the enemy's tactic was in lowering the output of the attack, as their shield strength was much lower than previous reported. Shields at 30%, with another rumble against the station, the crewman reported. 26%. With each lightened rumble, it forced Torlak to understand. The enemy was buying them time. Time to make peace with themselves, and time to mount any defense he could. Orlin, prepare the station troops for an attack. I want all hangar doors sealed, and I want all major pathways secured with a turret team. I want to make it impossible for the enemy to take a single inch of this station. Orlin nodded to his orders as Torlak began issuing to the chiefs below him. See if we can't increase shield regeneration. Prepare to mobilize a concentrated surprise offensive. See if we can't resupply the city with more troops. We need to retake those guns. His orders were rapid, but they were enough to force sense into the young officers. The room regained its busy clamor as orders were relayed and followed. He had felt a sense of normalcy return, albeit he wished they were under different circumstances. Slowly, reports came from the station troops that they had secured the majority of entrances leading to the larger central access spaces. From there, they had set up numerous kill zones on key pathways, while also placing traps beside secondary entries. It was a lot of work in a short time, and he was grateful for their hard work. Knowing firsthand how the Terrans operated, he had effectively signed the death warrants of his own men, and he was sure they knew that. But even as skilled as they are, he was certain that a wall of bullets and plasma fire would put any Terran soldier down. With his defense on the station near completion, he turned to an officer who managed communications. How does the capital fare for reinforcements? He asked. The comms officer communicated what he received over word from the ground. From his expression alone, Torlak knew it didn't bode well. They are not well. We have several troops trying to gain control of the Northern Cannon, but their marksman support keeps getting neutralized. It appears the enemy may also be well-versed in long-ranged combat. We're trying to locate the attacker. Torlak then shifted the subject to what was most important, the reason he fought in the first place. And what of the Council? How are the defenses for the Council Chambers? The comms officer tapped away on their screen, mirroring it onto his hollow table before him. It is where we have diverted the most troops. We have a Halen armored division patrolling the outer streets of the chambers and troops within buildings on the lookout for the enemy. Missile batteries along the perimeter of the city have also been deactivated, but... The Selian paused, forcing Torlak to urge the chief to address the glaring issue. But the enemy seemed to have launched a full offensive over the city, utilizing what is being reported as metal coffins. This is the first I've seen of such a tactic, except maybe for the Union. Torlak raised a hand against his speculation and rejected the notion, careful as not to allow any misconceptions of both the Terrans and the Union. Do not mistake the work of the Terrans as quality to compare of the Union. I have seen firsthand the way the Union deploys its forces. At least the Union takes care to deploy their troops in heavily armored ships, but the Terrans, they deliver their troops to a degree that they could block out the sun. And each pod is a single warrior who is more capable than even Bralo's men. The name of a fallen idol rang throughout the room, causing several to look their way, but he continued, That's right. Those enemy troops you see that have fallen from the sky in coffins were none other than the ones who have felled our greatest warrior. Torlak's tone grew solemn at the mention. He replayed the video from that day. As the ship struggled to maintain a connection of visual acuity, he saw it. The warrior who killed their best warrior, Bralo. He pulled a data chip from his person and connected it to his station, allowing for him to manipulate its contents, and pulled up an item that he had just now remembered. It was a warrior donning much of the same black and gray blotched pattern worn beneath matted steel gray and armor. Contrary to the wealth of soldiers of the same armor that bore white and red markings, the individual before him was donned with gold markings on his pauldrons, chest, and knees. 
although he surmised that it may just reflect their hierarchy in the field, as reported by troops on the ground, but noted the markings on the once purple glass visor. Most of the surface was carved, leaving only a set of eyes and a smile of jagged teeth. Him, he voiced, causing many to look upon it in fear. He was the warrior who delivered Brollo his final breath. Quick, deliver this to all the ground troops. I want him dead, and whoever does will be made chief captain, at minimum. They nodded their heads to his order and began disseminating the photo to all available ground forces. He figured that if this person was present on Draxis, then the probability that they would be in in Artre was just as likely. If he couldn't best the Terrans in naval combat, then his next bet would be to take out what he figured was a prominent tactical element. He was certain it would sow chaos among their own and deal a devastating blow to leadership and ground combat. But first, they needed to find him. Torlak then returned his attention to the tactical display at the forefront of the room, and still, the new addition of Terran ships wove their being among his own fleet, intermixing with one another like an unholy amalgamation. And so far, Station Shield showed no signs of replenishing faster than they were depleted, leaving him with only one real option, to face the oncoming boarding, and to hold out long enough to secure a victory, no matter how small. Once we're boarded, order all ships to attacks. His words were heavy to those who listened, but they understood what needed to be done. Currently, both Selian and Terran ships were interwoven with each other, as battle had ceased with the appearance of the behemoth. They drifted close to each other that a well-coordinated attack could put many enemy ships out of commission. It was a situation he had been waiting for. Make sure our signal in encrypted before you message them. This needs to be precise and swift, at least until we get the remaining ships from the Torkin system. They gave a collective hurrah as confirmation, boosting morale for the others within their vicinity. After several more shots to the station, a crewman reported that their shields were reduced to zero, and since then, shots from the surface to orbit cannons ceased firing, leaving them ultimately vulnerable. Reporting, Chief General, we've detected explosions of where the cannons were stationed. The enemy seems to have destroyed them, voiced a nearby chief. The field now belonged to the Terrans, and the best he could try to do is stall for time. Reroute our forces and reorganize for defensive measure, and get me in contact with the Malariv ground troop. The name sparked spurs of confusion among the nearby Selians. The name was not known by many, and they were right to question its existence. I don't think I've heard of a troop by that name, voice another Selian. This time it was a female chief in charge of troop placements and relaying of orders. And you'd be right, began Torlak. The Malariv troop is not known by many, unlike Bralo's troop, but are just as deadly. Torlak continued, describing their armor as donning of ancient black garbs, dark gray armor on the torso, thigh and shoulders, with a red sash around their waist. They stuck with the standardized amber-colored visor, but the helmet was accented with glacial blue markings, to honor the father that the troop is named after, with the top portion of the helmet-colored teal. And with their name, it is as you expect. They are named after Father Malariv, one of the founders of the Selian Empire. He spoke the name in reverence. Torlak then continued, When you think of Bralo's troop, you know him as the heart of Selian ground combat, bested only by the Terran mentioned prior. But Malariv, they are the monsters at night you teach your children so that they don't stay out late, and they may be just the force we need to counter the enemy offensive, and with missile batteries offline, authorize the use of fighters for the airspace. The female chief acknowledged his orders and began relaying them to the appropriate chain of command. In the time it took for him to issue those orders, Orlin spoke to Torlak, reporting on the latest in Terran movements. All fronts are at a standstill, and the battle cruiser has sent a small strike group of ships to the station. What kind of ships approach? beckoned Torlak. Troop carriers, heavily armored, with no doubt lacking a wealth of warriors, reported Orlin. As his tactical display revealed, a small group of enemy ships wove through the minefield of ships that were his own, but knew if they fired now, it would ruin their ambush. From his analysis, 
Their intended target was the larger hangar bay, which made sense for ships of their size. However, he had previously ordered for all hangar doors to be sealed, so he questioned how they were going to force themselves in. He had expected them to brute force their way in, opting to blow open the hangar doors, but they didn't do that. Sensors reported no external hull ruptures until a chief addressed Torlak and Orlin. Reporting multiple access to docking collars. We can't override it. Torlak replied, Notify nearby teams of where the sensors were triggered, and to prepare for combat. Of course, Chief General, replied the junior chief. Torlak then ordered for visuals to be brought up of areas where his kin mobilized. Many wore the standard troop outfit, but the station guards had their armor colored light gray, with their armor a dark blue. Those in the room looked on as the station guards maneuvered themselves towards the enemy when they came to a doorway. It was one of the long halls that led to one of the docking collars, with enclosed rooms throughout the hall. They led nowhere, with the main pathway being the only way for the enemy to progress through the Hall of Death. Torlak didn't have access to view the hall itself, only the open area where his troops gathered. Beside the hall was also a set of doors that led directly towards the hangar, with the hall leading to the docking ring beside it. The open area was a commissary with balconies normally reserved for restaurants, and Flora decorated the large open-air location. Not long after the Terran infiltration, shots of those watching the entrance began ringing out as flashes of light from their barrel as their bodies jolted from the recoil. Those that stood behind the group on risers and balconies awaited the enemy, if they were able to push through. His fear, however, came true when the initial battle line fell. One soldier was clipped in the shoulder, tossing his body to the side from the force of the shot. Subsequently, before he had time to hit the ground and recover, several more shots landed on his torso and head, evidenced by bursts of material from the head and chest that were seen from the monitor. When the body landed, it remained motionless, with a small pool of green liquid forming below the body as it was dragged to cover. That was their first casualty. Torlak, Orlin, and others in the room grimaced at the scene. It was near instance and the lifelessness of the body forced many below him to question their own existence. It wasn't often that they saw someone, full of life in one moment, then without the next. It was a harsh reality that many had not faced before, since most of their time is looking at colored dots on a screen with a name above them disappearing during combat. But for them, it was their first time seeing a visual of such an act. The trooper that had dragged his downed teammate tried desperately to revive his comrade, and many looked on hoping for the soldier to take a gasp of fresh air, except that time never came. Not long after their first casualty, more followed with his troopers falling to the enemy from the hallway. He was curious as to what had allowed them to progress with what he believed to be heavy defenses, until an explosion came from the entrance. It came from a small canister that generated a flash of light with a loud, concussive explosion to pair with it. It was intense enough that many of the troopers placed their hands to their ears, whether if they donned a helmet or not. That was when the Terran soldiers appeared from the doorway. But instead of a body waiting to be cut down, they had with them a shield similar to the ancient warriors of his people. Except instead of the dynamic and decorated shields of times past, they were a rectangle and made of a dull gray material that covered the head, torso, and thighs. The portion of the shield near the head was angled to allow for the wielder to utilize a firearm while still in cover. Signs of bullets riddled the exterior of the shield, but its integrity held to the onslaught of gunfire from the teams mounted on the restaurant balconies. Torlak watched as the turret teams tried to watch out for their comrades by the entrance, and the enemy took this opportunity to fire an underbarrel attachment to the hesitant turret team which exploded, leaving the two dead. This gave the enemy breathing room as they executed the barely recovering hallway teams, and the enemy shields placed themselves in such a way that proved for the balcony teams difficult to make decisive shots against their enemy. He hoped they had explosives to rid the enemy of their barrier, but found that they had no such ordnance as they continued to fall to the encroaching enemy. Notify all teams to wield explosive ordnance. 
The enemy is employing shields, so we need to counteract it, ordered Torlak, with his order being relayed to the numerous chiefs in charge of their teams. Multiple calls began to alarm the room of several more Terran groups assaulting the station, with sounds of gunfire bleeding through their comms and with the scenes playing out throughout the station as they cycled the camera feeds. His station was now a war zone with rapid gunfire and explosions exchanged between parties. He grew anxious to his predicament as they closed in. But with their own soldiers now aboard the station, he enacted his plan. Notify all ships, begin firing and focus fire on the larger ships first. Target their cannons once you burn their shields with plasma cannons, he said demandingly. Torlak had noticed that firing missiles and regular shells did little against the Terran shields, but noticed how much damage their shields took when bombarded with plasma, then finished off with a regular cannon and missile barrage. Although he felt he was too late to utilize this realization to its fullest, his next best idea was perhaps to send information to surviving fleets who wished to fight on, and to the Union, for their inevitable clash of the Terrans. At his order, his ships began firing into the ships that made up most of their casualties, the frigates and cruisers, and bombarded their shields with overcharged plasma shots. They flickered greatly, but a second volley finished the job, leaving the enemy first enemy frigate vulnerable to a concentration of shots from the Selian ships that surrounded it. Of course, this attack also spelled the end for many crews, with many ships suffering destruction at the hand of a single salvo of an entire broadside. His heart sank with each fallen ship, but knew that they couldn't go down without fighting. When he had resigned to his seat, and watched as the battles raged out in space and within the interior of his station, he received a call that was directed from a chief that he had ordered previously. It was of the chief commander of the Malariv troop, and its leader was now on the other line. Ah, Chief General, I was hoping you would call. To what do I owe the pleasure? A Selian with a dark blue complexion and graying hair peered at him from the screen, his hair tied in a traditional knot with a headdress sharing a dark red hue, similar in color to the sash over his waist, with a glacial blue set of beads woven through the fabric that matched with his facial markings. Mariv, Torlak began, I have a mission for you and it needs to be done before day's end. Think you can manage? Mariv gave a smile that yearned for a fight. Of course. My troop is already en route to the city, and we will be meeting with a local chief in charge of defenses. Torlak appreciated his timeliness, but wished he did so earlier. I have sent to you a photo of a warrior I want dead, he said, referencing the photo of the golden-marked warrior with purple-hued eyes and a mouth that smiled like it was laughing. Mariv grew curious of the photo he received, urging Torlak to explain, that's the warrior who felled Bralo and his troop. He's a threat, and all caution should be made when dealing with him. I can only guess that their targets are the Council. Mariv's demeanor had changed, as if pondering the request. Very well. I can't exactly deny the orders of a general. He gave a hollow laugh. I'll see what I can do but I will not jeopardize my troopers if the objective is already lost. If it's the council they want, fine, but I'll do it for Bralo. His cooperation went smoother than Torlak anticipated, but offered leniency with his order. I ask only for death of the warrior with gold brands and a demon's face, not for you to try your hand at the entire force, just him. Marive nodded with understanding and gave a departing gesture before cutting the call. Until next time, Torlak. May the fathers watch over you. Torlak then returned to his focus to the larger threat before him, the fleets of ships surrounding the orbit of his home and the troops within his station. He had now left the city to the charge of their respective chief commanders while he would focus his immediate threats. With the changes in combat, his ships were faring better than before, as many had already dealt with many of the smaller Terran escort ships, with less damage to the larger ships. But even in the midst of battle, he noticed that the largest enemy ship had not yet fired its guns, instead taking the brunt of damage by allocating its enormous energy output to shields. No matter how much they pelted it, it was too well defended to breach, so he had ordered all efforts to focus on the surrounding ships. 
Of course, its lingering presence stuck fear into Torlak, and he waited for the beast to wake. Even though he changed tactics for how to now challenge the Terran ships, his Selian brethren were still diminishing from the newly arrived fleet. None had fired into the station with maybe a stray round, but overall, the station was not a target, or he would already be dust. His worry was now at an all-time high as his forces dwindled, both in the void and in the station. Cycling through the video feeds of the station, he had now noticed a dramatic decrease in station guards and found mostly the Terran fighters roaming about. And this time, instead of the gray and black armored warriors, there was now a presence of a green-colored warrior roaming alongside their darkened comrades. They didn't wear full helmets either, instead opting for a helmet with no facial visors or protection, except for perhaps a pair of colored glasses over their eyes, which varied from orange and black. Cycling further on the feeds, Torlak came across a wealth of Selian troopers in bindings, organized in rows and several columns. Guards were posted around the spacious room, preventing many the urge to fight back. Fortunately, there were still various fronts on the station defending valiantly against the enemy, holding back what seemed to be larger groups of enemy soldiers. Unfortunately, their fronts were too far from his section of the station, and looking through the feeds, noticed that many along the route to the command center were either nothing but motionless bodies or prisoners. There were just more of the former than of the latter. Before he could realize how far that had gone, he heard shots from behind the door to the command center. His time was up, and now was the time to take out as many as possible. My warriors, to arms, he ordered, directing their attention to the doors to their rear. Many grabbed reserved weapons placed on a rack near the doors, and the internal security formed the first line of defense, a quality he appreciated with the ground forces, unlike many of the cowering fleet crew. He cycled the cameras, now focusing on the area just outside. Soldiers with shields flanked the sides of the opening, with more soldiers stacked behind them in close proximity. A tactic he was new with, but forced it to the back of his mind. He then noticed an individual tinkering with the door's access panel, but with a shake of their head, silently notified his superior that the doors couldn't be unlocked manually. Well, of course, we secured power to those panels, he thought to himself. He made sure to secure power so that an individual couldn't manually force override the doors open. It was a failsafe he hoped would stall them in time for a team to engage the intruders, but that wouldn't come to pass. Instead, the same individual that fiddled with the door panel now moved to a point in the door between where the shield users faced, prompting Torlak a bout of confusion. He placed two gray mats that folded out into a medium-sized rectangle which were placed vertically beside each other. When he was done, a line was fed from each as they retreated to the end of a stack of soldiers. When it looked like the individual pressed a device in their hands, the two devices on the doors began to light up, tracing the rectangle in its entirety. From what he was able to observe, the light from the feed now translated to his side of the door with a glowing yellow and orange line forming a rectangle. Before he could observe them more, the feed was cut and only static played, leaving only him and his crew to face the doors as the molten frame neared completion. He grew with anticipation, as did the others to the upcoming breach. It grew silent with only the beeps and hums of monitors to fill the air, aside from the tool piercing their door. Orlin readied his rifle, and Torlak did so with a handgun. When the yellow frame was completed, there was a brief lull in his hearing, and with it, silence. Several seconds went by, and a security guard's curiosity grew, prompting them to approach the door. In opposition to Torlak's call to return, the guard approached the door with his rifle at the ready. Before Torlak could recall the soldier, an explosion came from the door, covering the entrance with smoke and debris, leaving the soldier riddled with holes from pieces of the door that barely left anything recognizable of the trooper. However, even with minimal sight, they saw no silhouette in the doorway, causing them not to fire. To him, that was their biggest mistake, because as several of the guards rounded the entrance, several gray canisters were tossed into the room almost en masse. One landed right between himself and Orlin, who looked down at the item in curiosity. 
It was an elongated cylinder filled with holes along the central tube with a blue stripe rounding the center. But before he or Orlin could do anything, the wealth of canisters exploded, blinding him and all others within the vicinity, along with a deafening ringing that pierced their ears. With how sensitive their ears are, the effect was that much more devastating. As Torlak tried to regain his bearing, he felt a pressure on his wrists as they were placed behind him, and felt a shock to the back of his knees, forcing him to the ground. When his eyes began recovering, he looked to see that the room was filled with Terrans as they began putting his brethren in binds. Those not entire affected by the canisters tried to fight, firing shots from their weapon before being put down themselves, until none were left to resist. His ears were ringing, but Torlak was brought to the forefront of the group to the improvised doorway where he was met with an individual who was clothed differently than the surrounding soldiers. He wore a grey dominated outfit with dark blue accents along the creases of the uniform and the symbol of a bird wrapping its talons on a wreath with a star above its head was stitched on his chest. There were four stripes stitched on the cuff of the sleeves and three silver stars were placed on his collar. His hair was black with graying sides, and his skin was lightly tanned and aged from years of service, and his amber-colored eyes pierced his own. Torlak struggled to talk, fighting off the effects from earlier, but felt his hearing recovering as voices from around him made its way to his ears, with a light ringing persisting. Is this him? The aged man spoke to the black and gray warrior. Yes, sir. With the data from earlier systems and the assistance of Minerva, this is the one and only, replied the soldier. The man before him grabbed his chin, moving his head from side to side to inspect it. Well, would you look at that, the man said, prompting a soldier to humor his superior's inquiry. You don't see eyes like these very often, wouldn't you say? The soldier in question nodded and gave a short reply. No, sir. First I've seen of them. You? With an honorary Celian in service to Seventh Fleet, his eyes are similar, sharing the same yellow ring on the edges of the pupil and those slits, just like a cat's, the man said, disregarding Torlak's obvious discomfort. When he tried to speak, his head was thrown to the side with disregard, as if bored with his new fancy. I don't think I gave you permission to speak, Torlak, said the man. His authority was heavy and it weighed on him like a thousand planets. He then realized the position he and his kin were in. They had lost, and he was captured. As he remained on his knees, he then overheard the man speak into thin air, with none of the soldiers beside him paying mind to his conversation. Well, how fares the situation in the city? Hmm, I see. Very well. Scour the city for the targets and bring them in, alive. Carry on, then. The man then turned his attention to Torlak, who slumped in his posture with little energy to keep himself up. Well, let's take you in, shall we? Cella System, Orbit of Celia, mid-2670. War Chief General Torlak. With a rough nudge, he moved at their demand. With each step, it felt like the cuffs on him grew tighter. As he looked around, plumes of smoke arose high into the open-aired space, with bodies of his fellow guards lying beside one another, littered about the ground like children's toys. It saddened him, knowing his battle to be lost, but held hope out on ground teams to deliver a counter to the Terrans. He had already forsaken a naval victory, but a blow to a prominent and dangerous ground soldier was a tactical move that he had hope in. He just wished Marive would deliver the news soon, and with that hopefully demoralize some of their troops to take out as many as possible. Where do you intend to take us? spoke Torlak. He did so with prevalent disdain, but still yearned for an explanation, if they allowed. The man before stopped to face the defeated Celian, with the guards beside him regaining a stance that said they were ready to make him into nothing but a memory if he so much as breathed wrong. Well, if it were up to me... I would have let my men execute you the moment they breached those doors, he paused. But orders from my superiors dictate that I take you in, alive, along with any other that might hold potential information, he said, darting his eyes to Orlin, then to the others captured from the command room. Torlak shook his head, trying to clear it of a subtle ringing that didn't want to go away and met the gaze of the amber-eyed officer before him. And do what with us? Torture? Public execution? 
Enslavement, he added with vitriol, to which the man before him shook his head to the sides. I could only wish. No, you will stand trial where you will be charged for your crimes against humanity. But not just you, but your counsel as well. I can assure you that we will have them in our custody by the end of day, even if we have to level the city to root thee out. The man turned and began to walk, urging his guards to deliver a shove in the form of an abrasive elbow to his back. As the group made their way through the large interior of the station, Torlak and his colleagues were met with more of the carnage that befell his station, but this time, instead of only his own men laying face down on the floor, he saw several soldiers belonging to the Terrans, that he felt a certain level of satisfaction at their demise. It was to the point that he almost wanted to laugh, but held his tongue. Instead it was Orlin who spoke and began to berate their captors' fallen comrades. <sighs> so you Terran Vector really can die. Truly a shame they cannot bear witness to their victory. Blessed be the father. A swift attack from his nearest guard delivered his silence by use of the butt of his weapon, causing Orlin to bleed from the cut created from the hit. Shut up ordered the guard in a cold tone, emotion devoid from his words. However, for as little casualties the Terrans had, his own were multiplied by nearly six to every one Terran dead. As he saw more evidence of that, the more they walked through the station. Occasionally they would come across a detached limb that he recognized as Selian, not just from the color of the skin, but of the green-colored blood that pooled beneath it. The same was also true for some of the enemy corpses, but he also noticed among the survivors, several that had lost their limbs being actively treated. It went without saying that they writhed at the pain, with some tolerating it better than others, which was bizarre for him to witness. For as long as he knew, especially with studies done by medical professionals, all Selians were trained, or at least taught, that the loss of a limb should be avoided at all costs. He tried to remember the specifics on what exactly caused it, but how they put it is that when a limb was lost, their body overcompensated the flow of blood, causing them to bleed out relatively quick. That, paired with the psychological trauma of losing a limb, further induced their hearts to beat rapidly to the point that in just seconds they would die from the blood loss. Supposedly it was a mechanism ingrained since time immemorial, but with advances in safety, it was cause for little concern. Their little journey took several minutes as they continued through the station and soon entered one of the numerous hangars. Many of the catwalks and scaffolding were void of fighters, a sight he never thought he would see. But this time, instead of the numerous bodies of the station guards, there were formations of his people bound in rows on their knees. The formations were situated on the sides of a large ship, almost the size of a corvette, with the rear ramp facing them. As they walked to the ramp, other smaller ships landed before the rows of captives. The ship was rectangular with four squared thrusters on the corners of the frame and a large ramp in the rear. As the doors opened, it revealed a moderately sized cargo bay that they used to shuffle the captives into. When each compartment was full, it lifted off and departed into space. By the time he reached the corvette, more of his captured brethren were taken into the hangar space. Before him, a sizable hangar was present in the rear of the large ship. A small shuttle was parked in the center of the gray interior, as soldiers in green and black littered the space, going to and from the ramp of the ship. As far as he could tell, there were no other prisoners being led on board, so that meant that this ship was to be their transport. However, before they could be boarded, his current group was disbanded at the order of the guards. This left only Orlin and himself, causing Orlin to give a dry laugh. Feels like we're of the council, huh? He said. Torlak responded with a dry laugh of his own, before following in the steps of the officer before him. At the end of the ship's hangar in the center was a set of double doors that opened when a guard pressed his hand against a glass panel. It opened with a hiss, revealing a semi-long hallway that extended barely wider than the doors he entered through. Lining the hall were several doors, with another set of doors at the end, which mirrored the ones he just entered from. It was dimly lit, with lights generated from corners of the hall. Before they entered any further, the man before them stopped, 
with the first set of doors flanking his sides. Above them, the word B-R-I-G was highlighted above. Before he could ask what it was, he and Orlin were shuffled into their own set of doors. Orlin tried to voice his discomfort, but was quickly silenced as the doors shut behind him. The same was true for Torlak, and after his doors closed, he was then shuffled into another compartment. This time, a wall of thick glass separated him from the other half of the room. Within his room was a thin bed, a sink, and an exposed toilet which added to his unease. It was wholly unremarkable, but it was also better than he was expecting. His cuffs were removed which he massaged, trying to settle the acute pain he accumulated during his transport. When he turned around, a guard sat on a chair beside the door, and the man from before stood across from him in a chair of his own. His amber eyes pierced his own where he stood and beckoned him to sit, to which he used the comfort of the bed as his chair. The man removed his head cover, revealing a well-groomed man with graying sides of his black hair. The man then spoke into the air, with his voice translating through the speakers of the cell. The voice feedback sounded like it was overlaid with radio static, which added more to his isolation. For the record, state your name and rank, spoke the aged man. Torlak was reluctant at first, but gave in to the request. I am War Chief General Torlak Talesk, commander of all Selian fleets, and your captive. His voice sounded almost broken, but knew it satisfied the request. Then may I to whom do I speak to? he asked. Surely you must be someone of great renown, are you not? The man before him spoke in response. You may address me as Vice Admiral Wolf, commander of the Terran Republic's Seventh Fleet and the one who bested your navy, he said in a condescending tone befitting the victor. There was a pause between the two, and Torlak didn't feel the need to generate conversation with his captor. If anything, he found it his best bet to remain silent. However, this turned out to be untrue with the next words of his enemy. Tell me, Torlak, do you have a family? The words rang in his mind, and anger swelled in him. But he decided to remain quiet. Because I do. A daughter, in fact. He reached into his overcoat, pulling from it a photo on a laminate piece of material. It shined from the overhead light as he revealed the photo to Torlak. He stood from his bedseat and made his way to the glass for a better look. The photo was of a family, the man before him, beside a similarly aged woman on the left. To the right was a young female with black hair fashioned into a bun, with the hair sprouting from it like a water fountain. She looked to be no older than in her early to mid-twenties. He put it away when he continued to speak. You see, she recently graduated from the Fleet Officers Academy at the top of her class, that's quite hard, you know, because you're competing with the best of the best across all systems under the TRSC. And you know what getting top of your class gets you? Torlak shook his head, revealing that he didn't know what was obvious to the man before him. It's the prestige of commanding your own ship straight out from the academy. But you have to meet certain requirements, especially in the field of naval combat. Torlak wondered where this was leading, as he was beginning to get frustrated from the lack of purpose and substance in his questioning. Anyone can graduate top of the class and pick up captain, but to be able to skip even that to the rank of commander, well, it's unheard of save for a handful throughout history, but I digress. You see, you can be the perfect student, 100 on every test, and perfect scores on every mock battles, but the only thing locking you out of being a commander straight out of the academy is a final test. A test against seasoned veterans known for their naval prowess. A test where nearly all disadvantages are placed on you as a captain of a ship, where the only goal is to win. Pretty steep, right? The Selian only nodded as Wolf continued his monologue. You are also put against an invading force of at least five commanding officers, and to best them, win that, and they make you a captain of your own ship. Might even get to break in a brand new ship of the line straight from the docks. By now, Torlak grew annoyed, wondering where this was all leading toward, and his impatience showed. But the tone of Wolf changed, his expression reminiscent of a demon. And my daughter just decimated your defenses, and your home is as good as ours. But don't worry about your family. 
They're safe. At the second mention of his family, his anger was renewed, and his body involuntarily slammed against the glass in a fit of rage. Where are they, Akhtari? But Wolf stood motionless, with his expression unchanging and unfazed. Meanwhile, the soldier who was once seated was now in an alert posture, ready to charge into the room and deliver, no doubt, a swift justice upon him. Don't worry about them, they're safe. Would you like to see? Wolf said in a calm tone. Torlak showed no signs of lessening his rage until Wolf motioned for the guard. The guard revealed a small data pad, and with a tap on the screen, his captor navigated to a video. It was a room unlike his, with furnishings of a small table and couch. His wife sat on the couch holding a pad similar to the one Wolf held before him, and the kids played with toys never before seen. This is a live feed from one of our living rooms aboard a ship that's long gone from here, but I'm showing you this to tell you. I already won. But you want to know what's worse? Wolf then changed the feed to a recording from much earlier. This time, it was from a helmet camera of a soldier in black and gray seating his wife into a chair, and the closer he looked, he recognized the scenery. When the realization dawned on him, he grew furious, but was cut off by Wolf before he could speak. That's right. We were in your home. We knew where you lived, but that's not even the worst part. Wolf fast-forwarded the video and played the audio, the sound making its way into his cell. He saw the man who sat before his wife, maskless. It was the same man who felled Bralo, and now that same man was in his home with his wife and kids. He wanted to scream and yell, but knew nothing would come of it. Instead, he just listened. When it came to the part of the guards protecting his family, he grew attentive to her words. Hearing her voice seemed like years had gone by. He was reminiscent now more than ever, but his expressions shifted at her realization, which ended with her in tears. Before he could reach out to the device, he was blocked by the glass barrier he had momentarily forgotten. That... that can't be true. The Council... they would never do this pleaded Torlak as he tried to rationalize their supposed decision. I almost forgot, but we found this on one of the bodies of the soldiers who guarded your family. If I remember right, I think it was a war chief. He turned to the entrance of the room before turning to the guard. My work here is done and I must be off, so I'm taking the shuttle. I'll ensure you have an escort at least until you reach the rendezvous with the Senate guards. From there, you'll handle a transfer. The soldier rendered a salute and departed with the officer as his escort. When the door closed, leaving Torlak alone, the audio recording began to play. Source module, Cellian transcript disk. Sender, Councilman Polis. Receiver, War Chief Morcus. Playing audio, Morcus. You are to be attached to Aleska Talesk as her guard, but it shall not be for her protection. Should War Chief General Torlak fail in his mission and fall in battle or desert his duties, you are free to do what you wish with her. But not before. I suggest you rid of her, but it matters to me not what is done. The same goes for the children. This will be punishment for his bloodline for letting down not just the fathers, but all Selians. By order of the head War Chief Kalim. End of message. Torlak was at a loss. He had used them plenty before but a transcript disk was used with the utmost secrecy, when one couldn't risk data being intercepted. For them to use that only added to his grief. The council he had trusted had betrayed him. Gone behind his back, and should he fail, a fate worse than death would befall his children and wife, a scenario he would never wish upon them. Now, he couldn't tell if he could be angry or grateful at the Terrans for their sudden involvement, by effectively saving his family from a fate unknown. He felt defeated and did so as expressed by the sudden collapse of his legs. He struggled to pick himself up, thinking back to days prior and to the man who sat before his wife. At first, he wanted a warrior dead and even ordered a kill request on the man who also saved Aleska, his beloved. He was torn as his principles and loyalties were sent asunder. He then thought to himself, he had lost the war, but in the process, he was saved from the torment of a possible future of his family, were it not for his enemies, and with that, he felt consolation. And in a small part of his mind, he hoped for the Terran's success. 
It was all he could offer. Unknown system, late 2670. War Chief General Torlak. When he returned, the guard before him was now alone, leaving only the two. He had retrieved the transcript disc, placing it in a secured drawer of where he was situated, and pulled out a personalized data pad where he began scrolling through it. Blurred images of movement were reflected off the darkened purple glass visor the trooper donned. Countless times, Torlak tried to gain their attention, but was met with silence, unaware that his internal intercoms were disabled, leaving him in a vacuum of his own world. He pulled an arm up to hit it, only for it to make a dull thump, barely audible to him, and most likely not even on the radar of his posted guard to worry about. Defeat. He was now a prisoner, where not even one of the lowest in rank would regard him. He was nothing to the enemy, except perhaps as an abomination. He would try multiple more times to try to get the attention of the guard, but was again regarded lightly or just ignored. After a time, he simply decided to stop and return to his bed at the mercy of his enemy. Several cycles would go by where he would rest, then wake up. With no time indicators of any sort, he knew not when he was, and being restrained to a brig, he knew not where. The same luminescent lights that flickered overhead were luckily turned off after some time, with him picking up on its intervals to give an idea of how long he might have been out in space. So far, he had only rested for twelve of those cycles, with much more to be expected. However, he was thankful to his captors for the food they offered him, being made of lightly disposable trays and utensils. After every meal, he was also subjected to searches of his bed space and on his person that got rather invasive. It was a new procedure that not even they enforced with their prisoners, and even found an opportunity to question the Terran methods. Why is there such a need for a deep and rather frank search of my body? Do you not have scanners for this sort of thing? He asked. An officer, sporting a vacuum-rated flight suit and absent helmet, spoke. It's so no prisoners get the chance to change the guard. I don't know about you, but human prisoners can get very creative when trying to break out of confinement. This is just a precaution. Besides, sensors are broken. They gave a small smile in a condescending fashion which irked Torlak. Then humanity truly is a broken species if you have need of such barbaric procedure, returned Torlak, this time with a sneer. It's no trouble, really. Luckily, we're not so overburdened by criminals to the degree of the past, per se. We still have a decent number of pirates who think they can do whatever they want, whenever they want, but they don't usually get the chance to surrender, the officer smirked, hinting at their supposed demise. Hmm, exhaled Torlak. I was under the impression the Terrans were the compassionate ones, but your race seems similar to mine. Eliminate first, deal with the consequences later. This time, the guard searching him removed himself from Torlak and waited beside the officer. We've learned long ago that winning the hearts and minds of the larger public does wonders against the enemy, but we also know when to simply shoot first and ask questions later. I'm fairly certain our knave made sure of that, spoke the officer. Torlak raised his hands in defeat. Very well, I concede. You Terrans have certainly proven your worth in battle, but I can only wonder. How would you fare against the Union? The mention peaked the ears of the officer and retreated behind the glass cage. But this time, enable the voice intercom system. So I've heard. A collection of races under a banner of the lesser races, yet they were superior in spacefaring capabilities. So, to make up for their lack of ground combat, they enslaved races most suitable for it. Does that sum it up? said the officer. Torlak nodded. Couldn't have said it better myself. Then by that account, the fact that your race seceded from them and succeeded, I can only speculate that your technologies are equally rivaled. So, no, I'm not particularly fearful of such an enemy, replied the officer. He then stood up, dusting off his suit in an effort to look neat as he prepared to exit the room with his escort guard. Perhaps we'll also get insight from your friend. It's been a pleasure. The officer waved and the door closed leaving the trooper at his desk and Torlak in his bed. Not much was said after the officer left, and his guard made little effort to make any amount of conversation.
There were times, however, when the soldier before him would disassemble his service weapon and clean it, but made sure to keep his sidearm holstered on his thigh ready to draw. From his observation, the weapon was vastly different in construction to the common service weapon of his infantry troops. It was separated into two large portions, the lower, still connected to what looked like a collapsible stock and magazine well, with was furnished with a moderate gray construction, accented with reinforced black sections. There was a straight metal guard below the trigger system that connected to the magazine. The second part was smaller, but made up the upper half of the weapon system, which also included a large cylindrical attachment integrated into the upper barrel shroud. A vertical adjustable grip was also attached near the front of the bottom of the weapon through a system of milled bumps he had a hard time seeing with another attachment attached to the bottom of the large cylinder. A small object was adorned on the top portion of the upper system, which he suspected to be an optical sight of some sort. A red diagonal mark was also painted on the shroud, in addition to a similarly colored mark on the magazine. He had seen other forms of Terran weaponry, like one with a lightly colored upper shroud, longer barrel, and red tab seen among the larger mass of troops seen prior in video and surveillance. Torlak was intrigued, if anything, at the diversity of weaponry employed by the Terrans and wished to know more. He had nothing else to do, so he found it would be better to try to speak on common ground on any subject if it meant it would pass the time. Tell me, Terran warrior, what do you call that device? He asked, pointing to the disassembled weapon. At first, the guard glared at him, but Torlak added that he only wished to pass the time, offering his knowledge of their weapons employed. The Selian infantry really only utilized three types of weapons, a main rifle and a service handgun, but we occasionally employ advanced ballistics for more targeted operations, explained Torlak. The guard before him paused for a moment, no doubt analyzing his person before he spoke. It's what you would call a short-barreled rifle, designed for use in covert operations, but deals around capable of stopping most in their tracks. He inserted a darkened cylinder into the upper portion, which rang as the metals of the weapon came into contact as he inserted the upper portion to the lower. A click was sounded, merging the two portions together into his completed form. It won't provide details, but just know, this platform has seen hell and prevailed each time. A sense of pride was apparent in his voice as he caressed the rifle, looking at it for any discrepancies. Shorthand, it's called simply the Series 4 but to a raider, simply the badger. It was a term he was unfamiliar with, but after some clarification, he was told that it was an unrelenting predator that clearly fought above its weight. It was a comparison he thought to be fitting for the enemy that bested many of his ground units. But I don't see the appeal. Sure, you quiet the noise it discharges, but what makes it so different? Asked Torlak. The raider looked at him again, pondering his line of questioning, but ultimately decided against it. Nice try, but try again next time. The raider returned to his personal data pad and muted Torlak's cell. He tried to call out, but to no avail. He was now resigned to silence. Torlak felt genuine in their conversation, but now thought that he had pried too much. However, he did thank the time, now that the lights had dimmed, and a single red light took its place. He now took it as his sign to rest, with his guard remaining vigilant, albeit mostly bored. However, Torlak never got a full rest. A sudden jolt woke him, causing him to look left and right of the room. His eyes were still blurry, and the single red light did little to help his eyes adjust. When his vision cleared, he noticed that the guard was on alert, checking his gear and a finger on the side of his helmet, as if transmitting to an unknown party likely to other guards, or perhaps the officer prior. The ship rocked again, tossing Torlak off balance. The guard did little to look his way, moving his head with frantic animation. Torlak surmised that he was asking for details, or perhaps a situational report, but without audio, he could only guess. Dull thumps and sounds barely made it past his reinforced glass, leaving him still largely unaware of exactly what was happening, until his guard opened his door and he saw a glimpse of the central hallway. Flashes of light zipped past the door in a bright blue, 
with the guard narrowly dodging them, be recoiling back into the room. The door remained opened as he placed his body within the door, allowing for only a small portion of his body to be exposed as he fired his weapon towards the rear of the ship. From the direction of the small-sized hangar he came aboard from, shots of plasma hit close to the door, bursting just beyond the doorframe until ultimately landing on the guard. He recoiled back, falling into the room, with the door shutting shortly after his fall. From where he stood, scars of burns were present on his right shoulder armor, forearm armor plating, and across his right torso and helmet. He saw that the trooper writhed in pain, but withstood it by clenching his fists and applied a quick acting salve. On the upper chest, inboard of the right shoulder, was exposed with charred skin and red liquid, which he now knew to be their blood. But even then, the sounds of gunfire were muffled, adding more to the fact that Torlak remained in an isolated bubble. The helmet of the raider was also in smoke, and it was removed with haste, revealing a short, black-haired male with faded sides. His skin was a light brown, and his eyes reflected pale black iris. So far, he only knew many of the raiders my helmet alone, with very little having their helmet off. But as he looked at the man, he noticed him to be fairly young, perhaps barely older than eighteen cycles. Instead of paying him any mind, the raider readied a stance, with his body squared to the door, and his back covering the center portion of the glass barrier, covering Torlak in his entirety. He momentarily swapped a magazine from his chest rig, dumping the other one just below him, and waited. When the door opened, he aimed, with a face stern in conviction and utmost caution, as he analyzed everything within his sights, as if the molecules of air and dust were also under scrutiny. Torlak peeked around his guard's shoulder into the hallway and saw a bloodbath, both human and unknown. They wore suits foreign to his knowledge and were unlike any Salian ground troop to date, which brought him to a rooted conclusion. The Union. The raider before him had no cover to pull from, and the table he used prior was bolted to the surface. As bland as it was, it was fine for a detention center, but terrible for defense. As he peered into the hallway, a large, dark figure lurked, causing the raider to fire several rounds into the creature, missing most, but landing a shot that ricocheted off a carapace, causing a spark. A low howl rumbled through the air, causing little disturbance to Torlak, but caused the raider to try to shield his ears. The creature waited for that moment, and the dark mass assault the room toward the raider. It was scaled on the back, with a softer underbelly, and bore clothing around the waist that wrapped over their left shoulder. They were also adorned with a small amount of decorative metals woven into the cloth. It was something he had never wished to face ever again, but it stood before him, a runian. It had rushed the raider head first, opening its maw and catching the raider's left arm. The top portion of his gauntlet repelled the top row of teeth, but the bottom was much less protected as the teeth of the beast tore into his flesh. Its tail waved around the room wildly, eventually hitting the control responsible for audio, and the scene before him came alive. <laughs> the raider screamed as the creature thrashed its head about. The soldier was clasped on the sides by the hands of the Runian as it tore into the man's arm, but with his reflexes and apparent sheer will. He forced his right arm to aim his weapon into the side of the occupied beast, firing all rounds he still had in his magazine. The sound pierced Torlak's cell with sharp high-pitched thumps landing into the side of the Runian. Noticing this late, it tried to retaliate by swatting away the human's rifle, and did so with ease, watching as the bent frame of the weapon slammed into wall to his right, its movements now slightly sluggish. It had torn the forearm off as the two tried resting for its control, with the Runian winning the bout, but its victory was short-lived by a last-ditch effort of the human. Die, you fucker! How about this? The raider drew his holstered sidecar that was situated on his right thigh. The Runian had now moved toward the trooper's neck, but his neck plating rejected most of the initial attack, with some of the teeth causing minor scratches. It hissed and growled as it tried to tear into him, but his guard had other plans. The raider oriented the sidearm under the jaw of the Runian as it renewed its attack on the neck when several loud pops rang out and the body of the large beast fell limp. 
It towered over the human, and when it fell, toppled him with it. Blood was quickly forming beneath him, and before he could turn any attention to the doorway, four suited individuals stormed the small room. The raider struggled to aim his sidearm, but found that it was stuck beneath body of the large reptile. He looked at them in a dazed state, but his form was quickly dispatched with a shot to his head by way of an overloaded plasma charge. The round that had eliminated him was plasma in origin, and its effect left nothing but an arm and a headless body. It slumped, with spurts of red liquid sprouting from the neck, as well as the slowed drip from the arm. He had perished, but with him, he had taken Arunian with him in single combat, a feat not many could have claimed. But it was unfortunate he couldn't live to tell the tale. The four individuals moved around the body to the entrance of the door, tapping away at a pad on the wall that provided access. It wasn't complex, and allowed for a quick release function with a badge that they took from the raider, flashing it against the device. With a hiss, the door swung open, and the smell of iron assaulted his nose. The warrior before him stood slightly taller than himself, with triangle-like protrusions atop their helmet. They also had their tails sealed within their self-contained suit, giving the look of a thick, smooth tail. A Vixian. Chief General, spoke the warrior, his voice that of a young male. Mistress Neela sends her regards and wishes for your counsel. Torlak grew confused at the mention. Neela was a title of the one in charge of all Union military, but it was also synonymous as a name. He was sure she went by another name, but her title became her name when she became the Flag and Legion Mistress of Neela. For what purpose does the Union know Neela want with a failed General of Celia? he asked. He was cautious of their intentions, but seeing how he was not gunned down indicated otherwise. As I stated earlier, she wishes for your counsel. We must leave now before more of the enemy appear, replied the Vixian. But to think a single Terran can hold their own against a Runian of all things, mumbled the warrior as he departed from the cell. He weighed his options heavily. On one hand, he could try to remain in Terran custody, urging his supposed saviors to leave before reinforcements arrive, which would likely result in his own death. On the other hand, he would be free of the Terrans, and would instead likely be sent into service of the Union, a fate he had never envisioned for himself. However, among those two, he chose the latter, and departed from his cell, following the Vixian. As he passed the expired Runian, whose eyes had faded and laid upon the violently dismembered Terran warrior, he spoke. How many warriors have you dispatched for this? The warrior was quiet at first. Almost two squads. We couldn't risk sending more than a single ship this far out, replied the Vixian. However, we were fortunate to find this ship out of interspace when we did. Mistress Neela will be pleased. Torlak was silent to their comment. As they progressed through the door and into the hallway, he saw with more clarity the carnage that had befallen the Terrans and the Vixians alike. The Terrans were fewer in force compared to their enemy, who had a ratio of nearly one to three but the Vixian presence now meant that they had come out victorious. Many of the raiders had burn marks on their fabric that did the most damage to limbs than to the armored portions on the arms, chest, and shins. Burn through was seen on the lower torso and waist of the soldiers, with their insides spilling out onto the floor, with the remaining Union force removing what bodies they could from the area. As he passed them, the Vixian leading Torlak to the hangar of the ship would pause momentarily, offering a silent prayer to his fallen comrades. Were it not for superior numbers, I'm afraid we would have lost to this group. Tell me, Chief General, who are these warriors? said the Vixian as he also offered a prayer to a slain Terran. This group call themselves the Raiders, the Terran's best of the best in terms of ground combat, replied Torlak. Is that so? I would have expected them to wield plasma, not kinetics like those failed weapons of your people," said the Vixian with a snide tone. You underestimate them. Look, Torlak directed the warrior's attention to the fallen raiders. See that white pattern on the shoulder? These were newly joined soldiers, save for him. 
he directed to a raider with red markings that laid face down near Orland doors, whom the person in question was kicking. They were most likely the one in charge of the white-marked soldiers here. So you fought nothing but cubs. And Orlin, quit cursing the dead, it's unsightly, ordered Torlak. They deserve it, especially this one, he replied, kicking more into the helmeted soldier. For what reason? asked Torlak. The kicks from Orlin ceased, and his breath was ragged from the assault. This raider threatened my family, suggesting that they would rather glass Celia in an attempt to retaliation of the slaves taken beyond Anmira and Demira. What a fool. As if a Celian would resort to that. Polis was right. Nothing but Terran lies, retorted Orlin. He spat at the fallen raider and left for the hangar after Torlak. Torlak wanted to refute his claim, but found it better to let him express his emotions than shatter them. Then again, they were in the presence of the Union, masters of the act of slavery, of whom they were now guests. Where do you plan to take us? asked Torlak. His group had entered through the rear doors leading to the hangar and found a no ship. Instead, two circular entrances were melted through the hull of the hangar doors. On one of the entrances, the Vixian warriors were loading bodies of their fallen comrades into the entrance. We'll take the right. Fewer bodies, said his escort. By now, most of remaining Union forces were gathered in the hangar as one of the bodies they tried to load up was of the Runian. Torlak paused shortly after boarding the tube, which extended to a door on the other end. However, he felt the lack of a presence shortly after arriving at the hangar and turned. His stomach dropped at his companion's predicament. A raider sporting red markings held Orlin from behind in a binding posture, with his right hand behind Orlin, indicating a weapon. Orlin's hands were raised above his head, and fear was apparent on his face as he stammered trying to speak. By now the other Vixians loading the bodies had noticed the change in atmosphere and raised their weapons at Orlin and his captor. Before they could shoot, the raider spoke, addressing not just the unknown force, but to Torlak himself. Did you plan this? Torlak! His anger-filled voice reverberated throughout the hangar. First Dima, then Draxis, now this, and who are they? He directed a motion with use of his chin to the Vixians loading the other tube. They're not Celians, so who are they? Orlin's face stiffened, no doubt from the pressure of a weapon held to his back. No, they're... Before who could finish, his Vixian guard stood before him, using his body as a shield as he readied his weapon and took aim at the raider. It may be best for you to enter the ship, Chief General, suggested the warrior. But Torlak wanted to be there, not for his own sake, but for Orlin. Refrain from attacking. We need not risk any more casualties from what you have already suffered. He then turned to the raider bearing red. If my experience has told me anything, a warrior of his caliber would make short work of your men, if on the offensive. Do not press any further, and let us depart, pleaded Torlak. The Vixian before him pondered his words and spoke, still holding his rifle to the raider. If what you say is true, then would it not be best to end him here? If he is as dangerous, then I find it best to eliminate such a threat now, rather than deal with them later. Come on. I'm ready to die, are you? The raider yelled once more, urging the other warriors on their guard, but waited for their orders, holding short of their trigger. The Vixian in charge shook his head to Torlak request. I cannot do that. The enemy can't know we were here. He squeezed his trigger, but before he could do that, a sharp pop rang out from the raider. A small firearm, similar to what his guard wielded, was situated past the head of Orlin, with his shoulder as support when he fired, catching the Vixian in the arm. It yelped momentarily before hitting an emergency lock, causing the doors to close. Muffled pops were faintly heard through the door when the warrior spoke to the pilot of the ship. Quick, disembark, and prepare to blow the enemy ship. All troops, we're leaving now. Knowing they were leaving, Torlak grabbed hold of the Vixian and dragged him to the other end, into the main troop compartment where many of the bodies were placed in systemic fashion. Those of the other tube used the walls beside the entrance as cover as those from the hangar entered the tube with haste, ultimately leaving Orlin and the Runian corpse aboard the ship. Seeing how frantic they were shooting through the opening, Torlak advised they ceased and sealed the doors. 
One of the troopers looked at him confused, addressing his concern. There's no need. What can a lone human of this caliber do? He fired several more shots through the tube's corridor, hitting nothing, but did so to repel any sudden advancements of the enemy. Perhaps not for the lowest trained, but a warrior just as he, marked in red, has seen combat. I've seen the ways in which a white banded raider fights compared to a red bearer. It is like night and day, and this raider is no doubt skilled enough to and fierce enough to attempt taking this ship for their own, Torlak added pleadingly. His eyes reflected truth in them, and the warrior headed his words, accessing the panel to seal both doors of the corridor. I shall heed your words, Chief General, were it not for Nila ordering your rescue. But I still doubt your claim of these warriors, said the Vixian fledgling, as indicated by his largely simple gear and ornamental markings. Then I pray upon the fathers, you do not come into contact with a warrior bearing gold, said Torlak, as he ordered other troopers to tend to their captain. Did you manage to finish the warrior? And what of my compatriot, Orlin? They live. The warrior retreated beyond the doors to the hangar, but shortly came out with a weapon that fired quietly, but did a number to some of my fighters. They took Jakti as he was last to enter, said the warrior, offering a silent prayer as seen with the captain before entering the hangar. The ship soon rocked as they departed from the Terran vessel, and instead of firing into it, they simply departed. Torlak moved towards the bridge as the guards allowed him and saw the great expanse of space. They had already entered sublight travel towards the edge of the system, but stopped halfway. The buzz of the bridge grew and alarms blared and rang, but instead of alarms indicating an enemy, it was the process of travel. A small tear in space cracked open in front of them, in a whirl of white, greens, and blue. It was unlike anything he had seen, not of the Terrans, but similar, and unlike the opening of an intersystem's gate. Torlak heard the calls of the navigators as they prepped for travel. Subspace entry active. Entering now. Chief General, you also have a call for you in a private room, if you will. The ship slowly entered the portal as he was directed to a small room, fit enough for around six people. There were circles that created a half moon before a larger central circle. It was similar to him standing before the council, except the lesser beings stood before the larger platform. The room darkened and the light of the central platform shined, bringing its likeness to life. Its form was enlarged, towering over him. It was female, with long extravagant clothing that was woven with intricate floral patterns, with her fur-laden chest laid almost bare, and she donned a headdress that matched her outfit. It was Neela. He felt compelled to kneel before her, and did so instinctively. Raise your head, Torlak, she said gracefully. May I ask why you have sought for me? He asked, peering upon her from below as she looked down on him. The fall of Celia was inevitable, I'm afraid. She spoke with nonchalant disregard, prompting him to question her words, which she understood and added more to her context. Truth be told, the Celians are not the first to come across the Terrans. A small sect of independent Runians had come across Terran space, engaging in small skirmishes but were repelled since. Said something about warriors wielding blades and shield of metal, besting them in forms of armed combat. Truthfully, I can't tell if they are lying, since they don't like keeping records, but I digress. We've known of them, but have stayed our hand, unlike you and your counsel, she added. Torlak hung his head at the mention of his greatest failure. But do not worry. I'm sure we can come to an understanding. And you can use your failure to win back your home, she said. What do you mean? asked Torlak. Exactly what I said. It won't be long before Artre and all of Celia falls. Your council will be the sole arbitrators in its downfall. But we are extending a hand to you, to fight with us. You fought them in depth compared to many of my own, so I hope we can rely on you for an advantage, said Neela. Torlak took to her words. He was saved from captivity, so he was now in their debt. But this also gave him a second chance to not only take to the Terrans in the future, but to save those possibly taken into custody by their military. He sighed. Very well. It's not like I have much of a choice now, do I? 
She simply shook her head, no, to his reply. I understand, but may I make a request? Speak, she said curtly. Is it possible to aid in the search of my family? Asked. No, begged Torlak. She had a look of ponder upon her face before answering. I shall see to it, but do not expect much. The enemy employs a frightening stealth capability, so be patient, said Neela. We shall meet soon. Of course, mistress, said Torlak. The visage of the mistress had now dissipated, leaving him alone in the room. Perhaps this is for the best, he muttered, before returning to the bridge of the ship as they traversed the stars. Heavy breathing was sounded behind the doors that led into the rear hangar. He had equipped a Series 4 rifle from a fallen raider and began firing into the group on the left-hand circular entrance. One had struggled to embark, its movements panicking and its back was open. He fired three shots into the spine of the enemy. It jolted for a moment before falling limp. He continued firing into the entrance until it closed, revealing a door with small panes of reinforced glass which his bullets impacted, leaving only a web of cracks near the impact point. The ship rocked for a moment, before the holes that the enemy occupied removed themselves, revealing the hangar to the vacuum of space. He retreated into the hall where his brothers had fallen, sealing the door. He rested against the door with his back against it when he received a call from the bridge. Sergeant, are you safe? What of the captives? spoke the officer. The enemy made off with the big one. I put the other back in his cage, replied the raider. Very well. We had momentary power and radar showed a ship, but it's gone now. What happened? The raider tried to explain, but was cut off by the officer. Never mind, I'm coming down there. That might not be the best idea, he spoke, but with no feedback indicated, he was ignored, or it didn't get through. At the end of the hall, the elevator doors opened, and accompanying the officer were two crewmen who wheeled the standard model Series 2 sidearm. Their faces recoiled at the sight before them in disgust, as much of the floor was covered with blood, ammo, and the bodies of his men, of which there were eight. W what happened here? said the officer as he gagged at the smell and sight. The raider stood up from his position, deep in thought of the even that had just transpired. He was angered by the loss of his men, just as much as he was sad for their loss of life. They came out of nowhere, took us out during night watch. Did you see nothing on radar? The sergeant spoke frankly, directing some of his anger toward the officer, but tried to minimize his output. N no Nothing came up on our scanners. Only after they broke through did we see them, but we lost power to the elevator. We had just restored power, but they were gone before we could lock with missiles and guns, explained the officer. There was nothing they could do now, except wait for reinforcements and organize the dead, an act he never could get used to. When reinforcements had arrived, they were notified of the attack and loss of raiders as a result. They took to repairs and prepared funeral processions for after the conflict, so his men were enclosed in closed caskets. But more than anything, he needed word to get out, and so he prepared a statement. Report. To Fleetcom Raidcom, this is Sergeant Trisco of 4th ODR Battalion, Viper Company, Kilo Platoon. The TRSC Lonely Transit has been assaulted by an unknown enemy group. Their description matches nothing of the Selian ground troops briefed prior. Unknown combatants with an unknown affiliation has also taken prisoner General Torlak. The destination is also unknown. The captain of the ship is organizing all black box data, as well as my own helmet feed. Lost some good men here, so I'm looking to fix that. End of report. Sella System, City of Artray. Mid-2670. First Lieutenant O'Brien, Raptor Company, Delta Platoon. Fox was first to lead the group down from the roof with Dare already having departed towards the central part of the city. Ryder took to the rear, accompanying the Selian female with O'Brien at the center. Ryder was displeased with watching over the Selian and made known her displeasure. Sir, are you sure we have to watch over her? How do we know she's not a spy? I say we put her down and save us the trouble, spoke Ryder. Her tone was one of disgust and plain disregard. That's enough, he ordered. You and Fox will secure the entrance while I secure our friend so that no harm comes to her. It wouldn't be right to send her off into a war zone. Ryder was silenced at his call 
and moved quietly for the remainder of their transit toward the first floor. When they reached it, Dare left toward the street. Sir, I'm picking up an ammo cache just outside. I'll go on ahead, he said. Once I'm full, I'll recon the target. Just outside the entrance, a cache of ammo was embedded into the asphalt, in the shape of a rounded cylinder, a tube designed for low-orbit drops. Within it, ammo for their suppressed rifles and sidearms were supplied, enough for a squad. Dare took what he needed for his anti-material rifle, as well as his suppressed marksman rifle respectively, and departed southeast, toward a collection of taller buildings that overlooked a large area. Even O'Brien knew it to be a decent vantage point, but trusted his subordinate's decision. Stand guard and be on the lookout for the rest of the platoon, he said. The Cellian then took over, leading him down a flight of stairs and finally into a dark hallway that had no power, thus no light to assist in their travel. Vorta used her personal device to light her way, but O'Brien had no need to. His vision was clear and the outline of objects was made apparent by his helmet's inborn function, highlighting everyday options as yellow, interactive items as blue, teammates green, and enemies red. As they approached closer, Vorta stopped. At the end of the hall, there was a circular door that acted as her entrance, and it wasn't fastened by electronic locks. Instead, it was mechanical in nature. A series of steel pistons protruded from the sides, connected to a latch that, when turned, extended the pistons into the walls. The door was two inches thick, not much against bombs, but enough for small arms. I don't remember leaving it open like this, she said softly. O'Brien then grabbed her, forcing her to the wall to hide her device, as well as shield her from possible incoming fire. He pulled his rifle up and peered into the room, revealing two beds on the left, some furniture in the center, and some desks and drawers on the right. But beyond them, two pillars were constructed in the center of the room, and his helmet tried to reach beyond it, to no avail. Stay here and be quiet. I'll check it out, and you'd best use this door as cover, he said as he readied his weapon. In pure darkness, the helmet operated by passive sonar technology that aided in providing a highlight to objects, but its range was limited to about 15 meters. His active radar module could detect up to 25 meters, simply by showing a red dot on a mini-map in the top left corner of his HUD. As he moved forward, to secure one side of the room, he swept in a wide angle to the left side of the room, then did the same to the right. The room was wide, but fell within the parameters of his night visor. His concern, however, was the part beyond the pillars, and as he inched closer, the part of the room he couldn't see earlier slowly revealed itself to him, as well as two individuals using the pillars as cover. They had noticed his movements by his muffled steps, but it was too late as he fired into them. The one closest to him was fast to react, charging him, but O'Brien planted his rear foot into the ground behind him and delivered a kick to the chest of the attacking Cellian. The kick was explosive as it caused him to recoil from the kick, leaving it gasping for air. With his rifle still up, he fired into the second, with the sound of thick plastic cracking until it no longer moved. Then he turned his attention to the grounded Cellian as it writhed. What are you doing here? inquired O'Brien. He found it odd that they would target the home of a stranded civilian for a search. It didn't add up. It continued to squirm, holding its chest and gasping for air. It doesn't concern you, Terran, it said in disgust. It wasn't willing to reveal much, and it had tried to reach for its weapon when it spoke to him, and he wasn't in the mood to interrogate. As a mercy, he fired into the chest of the Cellian male with three shots. With the body now still, he called to the entrance of the room. Pack your essentials, you're coming with me, he said, dismissing the two corpses that now lie behind the structural pillars of Vorta's room. She did as he said, taking care to move throughout her home as she stuffed what she claimed to be essential. Extra clothes, family ornaments, and heirlooms, along with memorabilia of her family and friends. She would come to miss her home. But for now, she heeded the words of the man who silently and effortlessly felled two warriors of Celia. Where will we go? She then asked as she continued to stuff her personal bag of belongings. Might be best to have you vacate the town. I can arrange for transport and you can be in orbit in less than an hour. 
he said. He motioned through his wrist-mounted display, ready to issue the request when she denied. No, not yet, she said. I need to find my sister, Tola. I'm not leaving the city without her. Her tone emanated conviction, and he was going to be hard-pressed to say no. He raised his hands, conceding to her statement. Very well, but you'll listen to my orders. I'm not going to risk having a civilian on the front lines. You'd only risk the safety of my troopers. Got it? He said in a stern voice. He didn't want to bring her, but it was likely that she was going to trail them anyway. So he thought it's best to tag with them, as they would a field reporter of the Republic News Network. Their presence irritated him, usually by getting in the way during a firefight, with him having to divert manpower to their protection. It wasted their combat effectiveness. But if he kept her to the protection of a rhino, then he could get away with taking her along. After they left the room, he stopped just after going up the stairs to the first floor of the building, and Fox and Ryder remained on guard near the entrance. I don't think we've properly introduced ourselves. He began. He outstretched his hand with the light from outside lighting up their surroundings. Taking a closer look, she was unnerved by the sinister markings on his helmet. Mimicking a laughing face with a mouth wide open, lined with razor-like teeth. She was reluctant, but met his hand in a similar fashion. It was large and sturdy compared to hers, and the rough exterior of his suit added to the coarseness of his hands, similar to a feeling from an older partner whose face had already begun to wrinkle. Instead of a metal jaw, the visage of predatory eyes and a wide maw were all that began to fill her head, and she wondered who they looked like behind the mask. However, when he spoke, his presence alleviated mind enough that she had nearly forgotten she was in a war zone, let alone the two soldiers who entered her home. But with him, she felt safe. Vorta, she said. Vorta Volkala. A pleasure, she bowed in customary Selian tradition. Lieutenant O'Brien, he replied. He gave a bow similar to Vorta when she gave a small chuckle. What's so funny? Did I do it wrong? No, it's just that my greeting is usually done by the women in our culture. The men's is quite different, but perhaps I can show you another time, she replied, offering now a less formal reserved greeting. Perhaps, he added when a call from Ryder came from the entrance. Sir, the rest of the platoon is here, she reported, snapping Vorta back to reality and causing O'Brien's demeanor to shift to the warrior she was first met with. Set up a perimeter while I gather the squad leads, he ordered. Fox and Ryder did as he requested, relaying to the others in the platoon to do the same. When he departed the entrance, with Vorta close behind him, he was met with the ragged appearance of his platoon. Those under Strega were hit the hardest, with much of her platoon holding each other up from their injuries, with more being loaded up in their APC and a pair of Pumas if storage allowed. Their armor was scarred, and some were missing parts of their armor plating, namely from their shins and shoulders. Eau Claire's second squad was hit the same, suffering from many of the same injuries and the corpsmen working overtime to alleviate their injuries, with their medical supplies quickly running out. However, Jericho and Blythe's squads were nearly untouched, telling how little resistance they went through. Squad lead, sit rep, he ordered. Jericho and Blythe were first to meet him, with Eau Claire and Strega following not long after. Both had sustained injuries, like many of their subordinates, with Strega applying pressure to her abdomen with the stain of blood present. Eau Claire had her arm wrapped with tightly bound gauze, having taken less damage than the former. After regrouping, Jericho was the first to report. As you ordered, we were able to retarget the cannons. After comms had cleared, Minerva took over. We had little resistance, so we took a few losses. Just some scrapes and bruises, he said. Blythe was silent, but nodded to Jericho's report. We hit him fast and took the cannon. But their soldiers don't seem like much, he added. You can probably take their city with a division of the orbital troopers. They're that much of a pushover. Blythe turned to Strega and Eau Claire, who only glared at him, when the lead of Bravo Squad began her report. Unlike those two, the North was heavily guarded. They had some armor, and to top it off, sniper support. From the looks of it, 
I think another set of troopers rolled through. Luckily, Minerva took over and blew it. Enough to cover our escape, replied Eau Claire. Strega looked around O'Brien, noticing the lack of a certain individual. By the way, where's Dare? She asked. I want to say thanks for the cover. They would have had us, if not for him. He's setting up to cover our advance. But why don't you tell him yourself? Replied O'Brien. I would, she replied, pointing to the right side of her helmet. Took a graze by a sniper. Knocked my comms. Even my night vision is starting to act up. She tapped against the side of her helmet to manually ease the supposed glitches happening to her HUD. He pulled out a device on his hip, bringing it to chest level. Athena, think you can rework her HUD and comms? inquired O'Brien. I can do nothing for her comms, and her visor array has taken light physical strain. I can do little for her systems. The same goes for the raiders who suffer similar symptoms, replied the AI. What systems do you have up? he asked, gauging what remained of his combat effectiveness. Reticle and compass, the bare minimum, and my map is too glitched out to read, replied Strega. O'Brien asked the same of Eau Claire, who replied with more up systems compared to her comrade. What of our reinforcements? I saw pods drops, loads of them, inquired Strega, grimacing at the pain to her side. All of Raven, Cobra, and most of Viper, then us, replied her commanding officer. Our platoon is the only one remaining out of Raptor Company. Echo and Foxtrot are assisting the fleet in boarding parties. Can either of your squads continue? The two in question looked at one another, then to their soldiers in question. Several were wrapped in bandages and gauze as they held the perimeter, with others barely holding themselves up from the pain they were enduring. We've got some resting in the rhinos, but they need medivac, added Eau Claire. This would reduce their effectiveness but he had an obligation to their safety and well-being. He could very well push them beyond their limits, but they weren't in a position where he could ask that of them. They had aerial support and a fleet commander who knew very little losses. It was the least he could do. I'll radio in. Get your men ready to depart. You're leaving, ordered O'Brien. The two reluctantly agreed and returned to their men by the rhinos, leaving the leads of third and fourth squads. Jericho Blythe. Get your men set to advance. We're losing Alpha and Bravo squads, so get ready to pick up the slack, he said, turning his attention to the two previous raiders on his detail. Fox Rider, on me. They arrived, prompt in their step. Your squad's out of commission, so you're with me. Regroup with Sergeant Grayson after you resupply. The two affirmed their orders, departing for the large man mingling with red-marked raiders beside the lead rhino. With nearly all of first and second squads being relieved, it left O'Brien with only two complete squads and a fire team, which consisted of Dare, Grayson, Fox, Ryder, and himself, with Badgers and Hunter away for the moment. He then turned to the silent Selian to address her. You're taking a ride with the other raiders, he said sternly, leaving little room for Vorta to interject. It's too dangerous. Even if I leave you in a rhino, there's no guarantee it won't get blown to hell. He could tell she wanted to object, as the only thing she could think of is her sister. I have to see if Tola is safe. If anything, I'll be safe, I promise, she begged, holding onto the fabric of his blotted clothing, but he didn't yield. Denied. It's far too dangerous and I have an out for you. And if you were to hide, there's no guarantee that your people or mine won't level this place. Sorry, but I'm not taking that risk. The building they gathered in front of was connected to another four-way street, with the center large enough for a medium-sized dropship or shuttles to take what survivors they can. He had already called it in, with the operator issuing their arrival in a little over thirty minutes. The skies above were chaotic, with fighters darting across it as they chased one another, firing all manner of ordnance at one another. It wouldn't be long until the main force arrives to occupy the skies, effectively closing off our tray from any external help but he would have to wait for that. As for the medivac, within 30 minutes, a single ship descended onto the landing zone, kicking up dust and minor debris that impacted against their armor, causing minor scuffs and dents from the engine wash. The ship was a twin engine, situated on two extended support wings near the center of the frame that was variable in function. Its cockpit was sleek, with the pilot in the front and the co-pilot in a raised seat behind them. 
Both seats were accessible through the main troop cabin with large vacuum-sealed doors that opened on the side, or a smaller ramp that opened in the rear. It was known as the MK-7 Hawk Transport. Its space was large enough for two squads to cram together, and they did just that, with Jericho and Blythe's squads taking security on the open sides of the roads, including their mechanized armor as added support. O'Brien met Strega at the side of the craft as she rested against the frame. I just got word that the Arm of Saul is in medium orbit, away from the fight. You're being sent there for the remainder of the battle, so rest easy, he said, trying not to be overshadowed by the ship's engine. I won't be able to rest when we still have a fight to win, replied Strega, disappointment apparent in her voice. I know, but it's better than losing you all in a firefight. So go, rest up, he said. And you too, find a seat he then said to Vorta. But, she began. No buts, he turned, his visor's eyes peering into hers. I'll look for your sister, but I can't do that if I have to look behind myself for your well-being. Don't worry, I'll find her. Strega, he turned to the sergeant. Look after her for me. She nodded with a nonchalant salute. First the wife, now a bachelorette, you scoundrel. She voiced with a smirk as the doors to the hawk folded to its side, sealing it. It began to lift off, kicking up more dust and debris until the force of the engine's exhaust dissipated, leaving only the remainder of his platoon. It was a miracle he still had his vehicles, with those utilized by first and second squads riddled by holes from the enemy. He ordered that they be filled by either Jericho's or Blythe's troopers. The Rhino and Grizzly crews were still operational, operating with the minimum required crew. Earlier, he was notified that they had regained map awareness and surveillance, and so he opened up his map's display in the comfort of a rhino. The routes leading to the council's buildings were not far, with a checkpoint one and a half miles into town from where they were stationed. The number of red indicators were heavy beyond the checkpoint with many of their forces engaged with familiar tagged icons. The letters of C. Bra, V.I.P.R., and Raven were seen above them with their numerical designations more apparent if he zoomed in. Most raiders dropped in the heart of the city, most notably in the outermost perimeter of the inner city, and had been fighting since then, whittling the large enemy force down, but were still outnumbered. He needed to know their situation before he could finalize his assault, and switch to a band exclusive to the leading officers of each company. Even though the actual frequency was a turn away from standard radio with their own soldiers, he called out over their officer band for their status. Fourth Battalion, this is Raptor Actual. Radio check. Silence followed, but broken calls filtered through static made their way to him. Cobra to Raptor, good radio. We're giving them hell, but we can appreciate some air support, replied a gruff and experienced individual through the radio. This is Raven, I hear you. I could ask for the same. We've got too many to deal with and they keep replacing each other. Get the pilots to assist while we're at it. Another sounded, this time younger. O'Brien thought that perhaps their commanding officer had perished, and the nearest one with the highest rank took over. The calls of affirmation were a pleasant one. After being secluded from them for so long, he felt a sense of relief at their calls. Except for Viper. They had yet to report in, so he feared the worst for them. But he had a duty to those who can hear, so he began his new issuance of orders. All companies, this is Raptor. I have mission authority, so I'm updating your TAC map with waypoints for likely targets and platoon advances. Stand by and execute your orders when received. Affirmation was sent through his comms as he implemented his assault, as most of the other companies were engaged in continuous firefights. Each raider battalion was broken down into four companies, which were further broken down into three platoons, each consisting of four squads with 13 soldiers in each squad then broken into three fire teams with a minimum of four individuals per team. But even if he wanted the entirety of the 4th Battalion in the fight, some spots were utilized elsewhere. Like with Raptor Company's Echo and Foxtrot platoons in use by the fleets above, or with a squad from Kilo Platoon from Viper Company, escorting a high-value target. And with the recent troop exodus of two of his squads in Delta Platoon, his own force was now only half the size so he appreciated the armor that was gifted to him. 
For the assault strategy, O'Brien organized each fire team to link with the nearest team in combat, ignoring their home companies, as right now, they were the only force engaged with the enemy. Raptors, load up. It's time to move, he ordered his platoon as he continued organizing troop placements. When he was done, he looked one final time at their roots. He organized all smaller fire teams to disengage and regroup with the nearest squad towards their objective, and continued that exponential growth towards the direction of the central city. Athena, he called out. Monitor friendly tags and update waypoints for value targets. Weapon systems, batteries, commanders, doesn't matter. Keep IFF tags updated. I'll leave their command to you. Of course, sir. I'll do my best, she replied. I'll keep you updated on any developments of Selian tactics. Do that, replied O'Brien, now keeping his eye on his tactical map display. Let's see what you can do. Part 2 If not for their air superiority, he would have found it difficult to mount an organized offensive if they lacked proper intelligence. But before a drop, they were normally briefed on their drop zone and broken down to the fire team on who would go where, hours before their drop. So each person would know what to do and where to go if they were separated from a commanding authority. Luckily, due to their training, they were taught such things as small unit leadership, since large unit leadership generally fell apart shortly after a drop resulting in chaos, but also added to their effectiveness. Their organized chaos aided in their attacks because on a tactical display, their forces would look disorganized and ineffective, but their training capitalized on that, allowing small groups to exercise their training to the fullest, to do the most with less. This was evidenced with clusters of raider teams ranging from four to eight against an enemy numerically superior, but he noticed they took a well-executed flanking maneuvers to ruin the Selian advance. When the enemy group fired back, they had used most of their troops to attack the enemy flanks, inadvertently lowering their focus on the larger group, allowing them to move in swiftly. One by one, enemy tags disappeared as the team moved in, with the enemy dancing to and from their flanks. They were boxed in, and there was nothing they could do except fight. Sir, we see the checkpoint 1200 meters. How copy? called the Rhino's operator, his voice reverberating through his comm system. O'Brien looked on his TAC map for enemy indicators, finding nothing. It was suspicious, but it's possible they diverted troops from the checkpoints after the drop. Advance, but check for anti-armor. All raiders, step off. We're going on foot, he ordered. His words received a hearty oorah or e sir from his soldiers as their boots met the ground. Their formation was one used in standard mechanized patrol. The raiders placed themselves on the outsides of the road, with the armor driving through the center with their weapons facing opposite directions. The grizzlies took the front and rear portions of the patrol, with the rhinos in the center with the pumas spaced out so as not to be parallel with each other. He peeked at his tack map once more for enemy tags that might have popped up. As far as its capability went, it depended on their source. For his tactical map display to be useful, he would need it constantly updated, which meant constant surveillance from a third party. They had four forms for this to work. The first was by ship scans from a specific module that could detect precise movement, thermals, and electromagnetic, but it was an item that was relegated to very few ships simply for its cost. The next was a feed by satellite. It offered a stable feed for the map if they had access to it, but it was difficult in areas where covert was a must and even attempting to access the enemy's satellites would trip alarms, a situation he had come across before. The third option worked best. Bust was just as expensive as the first, which was a stealth drone that would fly overhead. It was easy to notice at day, so it was best used at night, but not every operation allowed them that luxury. But their final and current form of surveillance was the use of an overhead manned ship. It was one outfitted to fight, but offered assistance in momentary map awareness if fuel and lacking enemy presence allowed, which is why air superiority was a key ingredient in their missions. And as fate would have it, their advantage would flee. Raptor, this is Hostess. I can't be your eyes. We got bogeys incoming. Too much for current air defense. RTB for refuel. Be back soon, stated the pilot. Damn it, give us one last ping, requested O'Brien of the pilot. She did as he asked 
lighting up his map with enemy targets when he noticed a group that wasn't present last time. The pings couldn't be relied on too much for an aircraft feed, since it was poor at penetrating layers of buildings. They were further down the road where the road made only a left and right turn, with a large building at the end that faced them. It wasn't far from the checkpoint, roughly 200 meters to his company. However, the hairs stood up on the ends of his neck when he realized what type of area they were in. They were in their sights, and they had entered a kill zone. He noticed a flash from one of the windows, followed by others, and he fell to the ground by instinct. However, instead of falling forward to enter the prone position, he felt the left portion of his chest sting followed by a dull pain that recoiled his body to his rear, landing him on his back. He gasped for air as his chest struggled to regulate his breathing, and he clenched his chest with reflex. Officer down! The sound originated near him, but his vision had blurred from the impact, and a ringing sound filtered through his ears. He felt a pressure from his upper back, and the ground beneath him rode against his clothing. He was being dragged, and by fox and rider no less. Dulled cracks of gunfire erupted around him, with his helmet working overtime to muffle their sharp tones. Traces of gunfire were delivered from the axial guns mounted on the rhinos, with lines of tracers trailing to where the shot came from, peppering the outer walls. His body also shook with every shot fired from their main cannon, firing in bursts of five to eight, decimating the building. The two had taken him into a recess of a building, shielding him from bullets from the surviving enemy. Fox had taken to be their security while Ryder began her triage of his body, feeling it up and down for any extra wounds not made by the initial shot. She removed his helmet, and the sounds of combat began to deafen him, but she spoke with clarity through her helmet amidst the chaos. Sir, stick with me, she began prodding round the entry of the bullet as she continued to treat for any shock. Do you have anywhere that hurts? A sharp pain in the chest? He shook his head. Chest. Numb. Feels warm. His words were short as he tried to manage his breathing. By clicking on some quick release mechanisms, Ryder was able to detach the armor that was hit. It had some weight to it, but was lighter than it looked, even for an armored plate designed to cover his heart and upper chest, with a lesser plated version beneath to cover the rest of his torso. She examined it closely, then to the area beneath the impact zone. Looks good, sir. UA plate is intact for the most part, and the ballistics gel isn't leaking. We can patch it, and you'd be good to go. No exit. So they weren't using AP. But it's enough to leave a bruise, reported Ryder. The entry was deep, with the tail end of a bullet barely sticking out. As she said, the round had entered, but did little to deform the backing of the plate, even if the entry hole looked grievous. That was a feature all current Raider armor utilized on the central upper chest plating. It was an alloy with a hollowed center, filled with a non-Newtonian gel that hardens to physical trauma. He placed his hand on the round that protruded from his chest armor, feeling its heat bleed through his suit, and plucked it from his chest, at the dismay of Ryder. Sir, I'm not done yet. You can't just... She began, before her superior cut her off, tossing aside the previously lodged round. It clanged with each impact against the ground, adding to the countless spent casings and slangs of rifles firing. We got any more plates? He asked, and he steadied himself, using the nearest cover as support. Compared to the previous two squads, led by Eau Claire and Strega, they were in worse condition than he was, and he had no one he could send home for a medical evac. He had no choice but to commit to their assault. No, sir, we're all out. Best I can do is a sealant hold still, she ordered. She then took a small canister from a pouch and began to spray into the entry. It filled until it was near flush with the rest of the armor, and she placed the can back into her pouch, assisting O'Brien as he stood up. It won't have as much protection with a round of that size, but it'll hold against small arms. Thanks, Ryder. Regroup with the rest and prepare to advance, he said, stabilizing himself. He felt sore in his upper chest, but with the application of adrenaline-based medication, he was now awake and aware and the sounds of gunfire put him at alert. He checked his magazines and his weapon, both of which were sufficient for combat. He checked his tactical map, revealing only the immediate portion of his platoon's area, with the outlines of buildings added just beyond their sensors. 
Luckily, his command module for his tactical map connected to the sensors of his subordinates. So what they see, he sees. The only problem was their proximity to the enemy. Something he didn't want to waste manpower on. Instead, he opted for a more destructive alternative. Grizzlies, he called out over their shared comms. See that building? I don't want to. They gave a hearty call of affirmation over the radio as they loaded a series of high explosive rounds with an added kick. At his order, their barrels raised slightly above their base position and fired. There wasn't a hum of their rail cannon activating, telling him that they fired their ordnance magnetically unassisted. The round pierced the cellian made walls with relative ease, and a detonation occurred beyond the veil of the structured walls. Air burst. A round designed to explode mid-air, causing maximum damage in all directions, unlike the damage caused from an explosion on a singular plane. In most instances, it did little against targets with equal armor and shielding. But if a round made its way into the interior of a tank, then the occupants were reduced to liquid. The round was dubbed simply, The Burst. Burst round delivered. Make sure you wear waterproof shoes, it might be a mess in there, said the lead grizzly operator. Got nothing on thermals, so proceed with caution. We'll keep firing the coax until you reach the building. O'Brien acknowledged the operator and ordered his men to advance with the rhinos as the grizzlies continued firing into the building. A mix of main cannon and coaxial machine gun peppered the building as they continued forth until they were near the base. The rhinos and pumas blockaded the roads to their left and right for cover, with a detachment of the squads to secure their perimeter, clearing the immediate buildings. Fox, Ryder, Gray, with me. Jericho, get a fire team to secure the lower floors, ordered O'Brien. Understood. Jones, Marquez, Carmine, Tyrus, secure first floor said Jericho. The four he called methodically entered the building as they secured its rooms. After a moment, they returned, with Carmine noting its safety. Fox, take point, said O'Brien. Ryder was next to follow, with himself and Grayson after her. The building itself wasn't tall, sitting around seven stories, but the walls outside of it were littered with bullet holes, and walls torn from the grizzly's firepower, with most of the firepower centered to the fifth level. As they moved through the building, they found many of the rooms with rows of desks and cubicles, similar to companies back home. Looking at his HUD, he didn't notice anything out of the ordinary on his minimap, nor on his night visor, which appropriately outlined and highlighted everyday items and friends and foes. As they made their way up, his fire team had finally entered the fifth floor, taking care to move through it. For his search, he focused where they had fired the most a room whose entirety ran the width of the building and overlooked the street where they approached from. He was slow to enter, but when he did, he felt a sudden change in the ground he stepped on. He felt a layer of viscous liquid with each step. When he looked down, he saw it. A room of barely recognizable Cellian remains. They were donned with the standard Cellian ground troop armor, sporting the standard black and gray undersuit with silver-colored plating on the chest, shoulders, and knees. Some donned a red sash around their waist. They were the most recognizable but lacked all other appendages, and a helmet that was turquoise on the backing and glacial blue on the front. Unlike the barren version of soldiers prior, these belonged to a specialized enemy group, one whose name eluded him. Their weapons as well were different from their standard soldier. While equally worn, the weapons before him were gilded with amber on the top shroud of their rifle, with a teal wrap around the grip. Airburst really makes it hard to walk through the aftermath, voiced Grayson. To think it would do this against an alien. Glad it wasn't me. Sergeant, is that... appropriate? I almost feel bad for them, chimed Ryder. If I go out, I at least want to be able to have an open casket. Not to be remembered as goo, she gagged at the sight. No one wants to die, but it's not my job to ensure if the enemy can have an open or closed casket. And from what I know, they all deserve to be bird food, rebuked Gray. That's enough, commanded O'Brien, causing the two raiders to quiet themselves. Fox, Ryder, scour the next two floors, Gray. Assist them. They departed, leaving him in the room alone with the remains of the Cellian soldiers. He moved to the window overlooking the road and saw the two grizzlies with the rest of the platoon, enclosing the rest of their perimeter. 
He then looked over to the surrounding raiders as they conversed with one another as they also maintained vigilance to their exterior. Some had taken this time to rest as they could, eating or drinking behind the cover of the rhinos. All the while, tracers from gunfire and missiles littered the sky, with the crackle and booms muffled over the distance. The battle had surrounded them, but even he took time for some reprieve. Once more, he peered beyond the dilapidated and destroyed outlook to his men and the rest of the city. However, in the midst of gunfire in the distance and the very low thuds of boots above him, he noticed something off from behind him. He checked his minimap with a glance, noting the two raiders, Fox and Ryder, by his map's indicator. Elevation was determined by either an upright or downright triangle, and any floors beyond that were indicated by a line that lined the base. Both were two levels above him, with Grayson moving below. There were no others besides them, but he heard it. It sounded small, like someone sliding quietly through liquid, taking care to not land a heavy step. Luckily for him, his helmet's adaptive noise picked up the slight noise to a barely audible level, but that made it distinct. By sound alone, he gauged their distance, but even that was unreliable. And with the presence not picking up on motion raised alarms to the unknown enemy. For him, his left hand was clasped around the foregrip of his badger, with his right relaxed over his thigh, above his sidearm. As he listened, the footsteps grew louder, in comparison to before, enough for him to gauge the distance and the threat. Don't miss because you won't get another shot he spoke, seemingly to the empty space. But with his words, the movement from before halted, confirming his suspicions, and likely stunned from the break of his concealment. Well, I didn't think anyone could hear me, said the voice. You must be their commander. What would happen to your troops if one such as you, who bested the great Bralo, were to perish? O'Brien turned his body a quarter to the left when he was ordered to stop, as the individual had their weapon trained. He expected him to fire and be done with it, but he didn't. Instead, the individual opted for a dialogue, perhaps to get any information before ending him. Me? Well, you'd certainly do some damage to my troops, but it won't be the end. There's always someone that can take my place and finish the mission, replied O'Brien. I don't believe there are many armies who can survive with their leadership gone. It's the same for us and with the Union. I doubt you're any different. I'm sure if I take you, your Terran offensive is sure to crumble, rebuked the individual. O'Brien's head was turned so that he was able to barely see the individual, outlined in the corner of his HUD. He was surprised to see that there was an outline at all, colored in amber with no one within it, like it was a ghost. Cloaking, huh? He muttered. Color me surprised. You know of it? Then perhaps it's best to end you now, they said. To think an enemy of Celia would know of our technology. Who spoke? So that I may finish them when I'm done here. I will say your tech is clever better than ours, but not out of the realm of possibility, replied O'Brien as he slowly motioned his free hand closer to his sidearm, poised to draw. The individual before him seemed formal in their exchange, which had him on edge. The outline revealed no large caliber weapon. Instead, it was that on a sidearm, much like his own. And no one did, added O'Brien. We don't need a Cellian to tell us about tech. We have plenty of our own. Besides, how would you like to settle this like warriors? The question caught the Cellian off guard. In a bout of fists? Are you crazy? I should end you now. It's because I know your race is weak, so you make up for it with your navy. You wouldn't stand a chance against my lowest-ranked raider, replied O'Brien, cutting off the Cellian. The individual had seriously considered his opponent's proposition, slightly lowering his weapon in thought. From his perspective, even if they fired, it would land in his torso, either with the up-armored chestplate or the rig that covered the rest of his upper body. He had no time to waste, and before the weapon trained on him he drew his sidearm. Three shots fired from O'Brien's weapon, landing the first in the chest, which rocked the body of the Cellian, but it impacted their chest armor lodging itself deep. The second was also fired into the chest, doing the same as the first and lodging itself deep into the chest. The third, however, was fired into the pelvic region, causing it to collapse and scream out in pain. He then disregarded his grip on his rifle, 
placing it together with his sidearm, and moved towards the downed target as it continued to writhe in pain. O'Brien kicked away the weapon they held as their cloaking system failed, revealing the Cellian in its entirety. Ah, you. He tried to speak, but the pain in his pelvis and chest was too great for him to speak. First rule of combat, there are no rules, because at the end of the day you have to survive. Rules don't apply if they'll leave you dead, said O'Brien. I know the rules of engagement better than anybody, but I also know firsthand that those very rules killed raiders. Good raiders. He fired his sidearm into the helmet of his enemy, piercing through the amber veil that was their visor. Two holes were made, and a web of cracks formed across the visor. The body was now motionless, and a pool of green liquid began to pool through the entry wounds, staining its uniform. It wasn't usual for him to monologue to dying opposition, but he felt like he needed someone to vent to, and to take out his frustration on. He knew it was going to be messy, but it irked him that he hadn't seen any marines or orbital troopers on the ground with them. Instead, his battalion is leading the charge, and they're not even at full strength. He was just thankful it had gone relatively smoothly. Fox and Ryder then entered through the door with their weapons drawn, expertly clearing the room as they approached their commander, and then to the body of the now-expired Selian. Sir, we heard shots. Are you hit? Ryder was the first to speak, looking O'Brien up and down for any wounds, to which she found none. Turns out we had a friend among the dead. He didn't register on motion, but the night visor did, even if they were cloaked, he explained. Cloak? I didn't think they would have the tech, she replied. Only people I know who have that would be Reaper Company, she said, this time in a hushed tone, as if the people she spoke of were in the room with her. I thought the same, but even if the system couldn't identify friend or foe, it still counted it as an object. So I think he was hiding among the bodies of his comrades. Clever, he replied. In any case, let's move out and notify Jericho and Blythe of our discovery. They replied with a quiet eye, sir, before returning to the platoon below. He then contacted Dare on the latest development pertaining to their ghostly friends. Dare, we have some advanced resistance. Cloaked enemies, they won't show up as foe on your visor, so take care when engaging. Copy, replied the sniper. I'll keep an eye out. The call disconnected, and O'Brien was now left to himself. He ensured to notify all current platoon commanders of a possible cloaked enemy in the field. They suspected the enemy to employ some form of advanced technology, but not cloaking. Understood, Raptor. Cobra is clear and moving towards the objective from the east. We've managed to link up with most of Raven Company. Then we can also hit him from the north and draw him out. Should make it easy for your end to attack, spoke the Cobra commander. It was a sound tactical decision and if the enemy encountered a heavy presence of the enemy, then they're sure to divert most of their focus to the north and east. What of Viper? Have you heard from them? Asked O'Brien. No, I haven't heard anything from them, and most aren't showing up on the tack map. I'm just seeing scattered fire teams at most, said Cobra, his tone solemn and filled with worry about his fellow raiders, as was O'Brien. Last I saw, they dropped damn near the center of enemy territory. Although I am picking up a squad holed up in a building, no more than six, in between yourself and the objective. It was as he said. There was a squad held up in a building centered between two large roads and what looked like a park to his northeast. Compared to the other companies, Viper was the only one that dropped away from each other, with squads of up to four dropping together. They were known to drop erratically, occasionally landing themselves in the thick of the enemy, with most instances resulting in their immediate deaths. But those that survived were a force to be reckoned with. He had now regrouped with the rest of his platoon, notifying them of their change of plans. Load up. We're double-timing it to Viper. It's supposed to be a hot zone, so get ready to engage a target-rich environment. Jericho and Blythe gave acknowledgement in the form of a hearty Ra, before departing to their vehicles and organizing their respective squads. O'Brien had previously tried to get into contact with them, but to no avail. Instead, he referred to Dare for intel since the building he inhabited was still standing and it overlooked most of their area. Dare, he spoke into his comm set. 
There should be a park to my northeast with a squad from Viper under heavy contact. Verify. It took a moment, but his answer came soon after he embarked as a passenger on a puma. The sun was beginning to crest the horizon now, and its blue and purple hue hugged the sky with each minute. Barely. I have a set of buildings blocking my view, but I can see the roof of a central building in the center of the park. No trees, but lots of smoke and tracer fire coming from the building. Wait one, said Dare. He had now switched to the anti-material rifle, since it offered a better long-range scope than his suppressed variant. It was digital in nature, offering an overlay of information for the user, but had a perfect zoom well beyond what was necessary, especially at the distance he was shooting. He rotated the single-action bolt to the rear, loading in the round until the bolt seeded it into the chamber with a thudded click before locking the bolt and taking aim. His first instinct was to scan the roofs of the buildings surrounding the squad. Without much effort, he had already found several teams of enemy artillery and marksmen taking aim and bombarding the squad with mortar fire. It was a constant stream of fire as bursts of smoke erupted on and around the singular building. Sir, they won't have long. They've got mortars and accurate fire. They aren't letting up. You'll need to hurry, he said before firing a shot at an unsuspecting marksman. Copy, replied O'Brien. All teams double-time it. Weapons free and execute with extreme prejudice. Secure that AO. Part 3 As gunfire rained over through the air, the cracks of rifle rounds flew overhead, in addition to explosive ordnance landing near and around their makeshift cover. It had been several hours from their drop. And since then, they have been doing nothing but fighting against an enemy that surrounded them. Ammo was running low, and their platoon was down to a mere fraction of its strength. They had landed in an ambush. Whether accidentally or on purpose, it didn't matter. All that mattered now was survival, or to take out as many of the enemy as possible. Damn it, Timbers! Get me ammo! roared a raider firing from a squad automatic weapon, a belt fed weapon of lead delivery. He was prone with the rest of his body resting in the crater from an earlier fired mortar. To act as his support berm, bodies of dead Celians were laid to grant his weapon support and to provide himself cover from enemy fire. Behind him came a raider, light with his load, carrying cans of ammo in both arms with a belt of rounds around his neck. He dove beside the prone raider and immediately began preparing to assist in a reload. What took you so long? If I ran out, we'd be dead. The name of his chest plate was scratched and worn. It was Bridger. We had to dig for it, all right. Shut up and get ready to reload. The one before him was just as old and marked white like his prone comrade. His name was still visible, and he was named Timbers. As Bridger continued to fire, he readied himself for a practice process they had spent the last several hours perfecting, a speed reload of an open-bolt machine gun. Timbers placed half of his body over that of Bridger in preparation. From the outside, it seemed intimate, but in combat, it was necessary. With a click, the weapon ceased firing, and the two began their remedial barrel swap and reload. First, the bolt was sent to the rear and placed on safe. Then the barrel was detached and swapped with a second, locking it into place as the first was glowing orange. The next action they took was Timbers opening the bolt cover taking care to lower their heads and clearing the bolt of any debris. Timbers fed Bridger a fresh belt of ammo, which he placed into the open bolt. When it was clear with no issues, Bridger slammed the bolt cover down, locking it. He then set the weapon on fire, then released the bolt forward and began firing in three-second bursts. The total time took them six seconds for a barrel swap and reload. Bridger was the main gunner, and Timbers was his assistant gunner. In the case that Bridger was killed, Timbers would take over. It was a grim reality, but compared to other gunner teams, they lasted the longest as a pair. Damn it! Where the hell is the rest of the platoon? Shit, let alone the rest of the company, Bridger complained, firing another burst into an encroaching enemy, slowing their advance. Pop said they're dead, since he can't get comms. We're in the dark, replied Timbers. The squad had long disregarded their helmets leaving them with only their armor and weapons, and little to no combat information. As they said, information is power, and right now, they lack it. In the initial wave, they were bombarded by mortar fire, clipping their armor, but it was their helmets that took the brunt of the force. However, 
It wasn't just shrapnel that did their helmets in, but something else, since even those who weren't hit reported zero feedback on their HUD. No night visor, no mini-map, no compass. Must have been the EMP. Who would have thought that they utilized EMPs in mortars, said Bridger. Yeah, no kidding. I thought our shit was rated for EMP, added Timbers. Barely. Maybe for an overhead EMP, but not for something right next to us. Damn near fried my brain with how close it hit, replied Bridger. He remembered the moment it hit initially. A small explosion occurred around them as they were organizing a strategy using Pops's tactical map. But as soon as it went off, he and the rest of the squad experienced night. Some of their helmets malfunctioned to the point of a thermal runaway, resulting in most, if not all, tossing their helmets as they burst. They now had no HUD, and most of their comms resided within the helmet themselves, so that left them in the dark. He wasn't sure if their internal friend or foe tags were working, so for all the 4th Battalion might know, they were dead. They continued firing into the enemy, forcing them to keep their heads down as the zip and crack of the rounds flew overhead, missing them by mere inches. Timbers, acting as the assistant gunner, paid mind to their surroundings as Bridger fired. From roofs overhead, snipers fired upon them, hitting close to their mark. But Bridger remained unfazed by letting loose a Bert in the direction of a known sniper. They didn't move, which surprised him, and it went against everything they knew for the basics. Such in the case of a lone sniper team, it made sense to move after firing, but you could get away with more shots if they were suppressed. The Cellians, however, didn't do that. Instead, they acted as run-of-the-mill marksmen, hunkering down and laying suppressive fire for their teams to move in, except they just stayed where they were, making them viable targets. He couldn't say the same for the mortars, however. With no easy marks to make of the enemy, they had to rely on light and sound. Two unlucky combinations in the dark of night. Luckily, added tracers allowed for bits and pieces of the battlefield to illuminate, sometimes revealing an unlucky enemy combatant. Say, you still have that flare? Asked Bridger. We might need it. Timbers shook his head in the negative. Just one, and I don't expect reinforcements to arrive anytime soon. Bridger knew what that meant, as did the other four left in their platoon. They couldn't rely on air support and they had no way of knowing if there were any raiders in the vicinity who could help. It was a sour realization, but they needed the light to make for a final stand, in the hopes that it would deter the enemy and bring in any friends lying near. Let me pass it on to Pops, so he at least knows what's up, replied Timbers. The exchange was short, as it was delivered vocally to the building he holed up in trying to fix their comms, still to no avail. You're good. Get ready to hit them where it matters, replied Pops, loading a fresh magazine into his auto rifle. With confidence, he fired the single shot into the air. The shot itself didn't illuminate anything, as only a dim yellow followed by a smoke trail flew into the sky, screaming like a banshee into the night, until finally it popped. Bright red light showered the battlefield, scattering their shadows that danced erratically and exemplifying their silhouettes. The use of flares did more than simply illuminate an area. Aircraft used them to deviate a heat-seeking missile, and infantry used them to blind night vision, or offer to reveal enemy combatants in a field from overhead, simply by the lengthening of their shadows. They have a myriad of tactical uses, but for them, they had little options to choose from. And fortunately, the amber visors of their enemy shone bright and illustrating their V-style construction. This time, Timbers took his rifle alongside Bridger, and fired at all available targets that were revealed by the sudden eruption of light that bestowed a moment of resolve for the raiders. A resolve that lasted as long as the flare itself, ultimately diminishing after fifteen minutes. Get a beat on him, yelled Bridger as he sent forth sustained fire into Selian soldiers caught by the sudden influx of light. I know, I know, replied Timbers, firing his rifle in a semi-auto fashion, nailing several in the chest before targeting another. He fired enough that he had to reload near four times, and he was on his last mag while Bridger had one more box of ammunition. Damn it. Last mag. We're screwed, and I don't feel like doing a bayonet charge, whined Timbers, as he sent the bolt forward and trained his weapon on the next soul, filling them with hate and discontent. They had little time to make each shot count, 
and slowly, the brightness of their artificial light source lessened until all that remained were the tracers of cannon fire into the sky from ships engaged in aerial combat. In the next moment, Timbers screamed and landed on his back as he held his shoulder. Ah! Damn it! I'll kill you! roared Timbers, intending for the enemy to hear his pain and promise. Bridger maintained the gun and his fire, knowing that if he let up, they would assault their position and that would spell their end. Don't worry, I got you! Bridger fired, sustaining his fire more than before until he heard a click. He was out of ammunition and his barrel glowed more than before, which illuminated his area slightly, enough for him to see a V-shaped visor staring at him from beyond his berm. He was in the middle of swapping the barrel when the helmet shocked him, that he instinctively used it as a weapon, burning his newfound victim and swatting away its worn weapon it was too late to pull up. It tried to retaliate, but the pain was too much to bear that it flailed its arms towards Bridger, but he continued to hit it until eventually its motion ceased. The smell of burnt cellian flesh assaulted his nose, bringing him back to reality. He was in the open. He tried to rush back behind the cover of his berm, but by then it was too late and a series of sharp pain were felt in his back. It felt numb from the pain, but the initial impacts caused him to stumble over the bodies that he landed face first onto his celly and made cover. He looked up to find Timbers applying first aid to himself, and he tried to reach out, but he coughed a warm liquid that tasted of iron. Blood. His assailant had hit something vital. His vision was heavy, and his breathing grew rapid, but by the time Timbers looked toward him, it was too late. Bridger, hang on, I got you! He reached for his friend who now struggled to move. He clasped his hand around Bridger's to bring him behind cover, but then it became limp, and a spray of warm liquid landed upon Timbers' face. But Bridge, Timbers called out weakly, not knowing if his friend's demise was reality, but deep down, he knew Bridger had perished. Ha! Shit! He screamed, landing a fist into the motionless body of a Cellian corpse. Pops! Bridgers is down! He called out to the building behind him, but nothing came. Only gunfire from a familiar weapon and their tracers were all he could hear and see, his voice going unheard. He relaxed in his hastily made trench, fit enough for only two people to go prone, as he ran through his friend's death in his mind and their increasingly dire situation of faltering defensive lines. But he had a job to do, and that was to man the gun. He peeked over the berm of bodies, seeking if any had come any closer since. They were approaching, and they had noticed him as the sun was now beginning to filter through the buildings, turning the sky from black to a gray-blue. They had begun firing into his position with accuracy, causing him to pause in between actions, but he wouldn't let them stop him. The weapon was already set on safe with the bolt to the rear, and an absent barrel, of which the one was lodged into a cellian that laid not too far from his position. He stayed low as he tried to fix the new barrel by feel alone, and with a click it was seated. He then threw open the bolt cover, swinging it up as he cleared it of any cartridge links that remained, and loaded the first round from their last ammo can. Two hundred rounds. That was all he had left. When he set the weapon on fire and the bolt was sent forward, he racked it again, ensuring a round was in the chamber and began firing. With his vision better with the growing dawn, he was able to pin targets around him and did so with explosive vitriol. He was trying to be careful of his flanks, but as he continued gunning down his opposition, he lost focus of his surroundings, filling each burst with hatred for his enemy. Come on, you bastards! Charge so I can gun you down like a dog! Timbers screamed in between his shots. Come on, bark, you bastards! The enemy mortar presence had lessened, and so did the marksmen who littered the rooftops. But their disappearance wasn't apparent to him at first, as his focus was solely on the enemy before him. Their number was few in comparison to before, but still more than the rounds he had left over. He counted them from the remainder in the belt as the barrel began to cool, as did his earlier heated disposition. Only twenty, huh? he said. It was a miracle they lasted so long even taking ammo from abandoned drop pods they came across before running into the large force that assaulted them. He thought that they could have hid or let them pass by hiding among their fallen brothers and sisters, but they didn't want that. They couldn't lie in wait as the enemy prodded over them. They wanted immediate retribution against them, 
for they were the enemy. They needed to pay for their attack on the Republic, and he was ready and willing to deliver. But as he was lost in thought, he failed to notice the Celian that stood over him, aiming their worn and battered rifle against him, with their silhouette against the rising sun and their shadow cast upon him. He was next, like Bridger, to meet his fate. He smiled, thinking it ironic how their platoon was reduced to a mere six men, now down to him for all he knew. He didn't hear gunfire from behind, only silence, thinking they were either killed or captured, and he didn't realize until now. As he tried to raise his hands, the Celian nudged their barrel toward him as they gave their orders. Don't move, or I'll put you down, Terran. He was skittish in his movements, and his voice sounded young, like a freshly graduated recruit who finally worked his way up to face the enemy his comrades died for, so Timbers could only chuckle at his situation. As he laid there, several more of his brethren showed up, surrounding him as he held his hands away from the weapon with his face against the ground. Good work, Vitra. If you hadn't stayed low for so long, we might not have gotten this far without losing another one of the men, spoke a Celian comrade. Looks like we also got the others just on the other side, too. So let's wrap it up. We got more on the way to secure this sector. Yes, War Chief, said Vitra. If not for you taking out the other gunner, we might have been in trouble. The tone was nonchalant in its exchange, like another day of a job well done. It angered him, hearing them speak of Bridger that way. But he also knew that he would say the same thing, in the same way, with complete disregard of how the enemy would feel. It was ironic to say the least, but with it came a sudden change. The one known as Vitra, who stood closely before him, fell to the ground, like a marionette whose strings were cut. The glass of the visor had shattered, and the remainder of the helmet was reduced to the neck, as the rest of his head had gone missing. The group of Celians had now been thrown into a panic with the disappearance of their comrade's head and turned to the raider that lay beneath them. What happened? What did you do? Screamed the war chief from earlier, but he didn't know. Hurry! I can see our reinforcements! Grab him and let's be off! Another shot rang, this time from a device that allowed the delivery of thousands of rounds of bullets aboard a mobile platform with an engine's roar to reverberate throughout the open field of bodies and drop pods. Quick and effective, it's perfect for hit-and-run tactics. The Puma. ra ta 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 ta, -ta. It sounded like a swarm of metal wasps and locusts, as a hail of bullets flew above him and into the standing soldiers of Celia. It reduced them to nothing but chunks of flesh, with bits and pieces of clothing, and armor too stubborn to let itself go from its once sentient host, and he was covered in them. Before he was fully aware, he felt the vibrations of something behind him that crushed wood and bone alike as it rolled through the field. It stopped and seeing how he was still alive, he turned to meet the one responsible for being his savior. It was a man, donned in the same make and model of issued raider gear as he was, but was marked with worn and pale gold-branded markings. Upon his face was a heavily scarred glass visor, with the only reflective portion being the eyes and mouth, which made him look like a demon. He was a platoon commander at the least, which, in the heat of battle for most raider companies, Usually didn't last long, but with the worn scars of battle upon his armor spoke experience and survival, trademarks of a raider. He looked at his nameplate situated just below the neck, O'Brien. How many of you survived? He asked. And who's your superior? After his arrival, several more Pumas scoured the field, letting off their rounds into the approaching enemy patrols. That paired with the main gun of the Grizzlies and the Rhinos, halting their advance. From the Rhinos, Two squads of raiders disembarked, engaging with the enemy from afar with accurate fire. It was enough for the enemy force to falter quickly as the combined arms provided superior firepower against the enemy. Timbers pointed to the building where his sergeant had been previously working, still unknown to their status. O'Brien made his way to the building, with Timbers following behind. As they entered the dilapidated building, he already knew his answer. The walls were littered with blood and bullet holes from both parties as he made his way to the central building. He found a familial face slumped over with their back to the wall and the bodies of their enemy before them. In his hand, 
A spent sidearm cleared of ammo and its slide locked to the rear was seen smoking from its most recent use. Beside him, his combat buddy, a Lance Corporal Rice, was seen bandaging his leg as he was breathing heavily. When their presence was known, he aimed briefly at the two, but lowered his rifle at the sight of friendly forces, relieved. Sir, Timbers, thank God you're safe. Where's Corporal Bridge? He questioned as he continued to apply pressure to his wound. He's... He didn't make it. Sniper got him, answered Timbers. Rice's expression grew sullen at the mention, knowing Timbers to be his A-gunner. Well, Pops took out as many as he could. But there were too many, added Rice. I don't think Bryson and Corporal Tristan made it. They'd be raising hell otherwise. His tone was reminiscent, noting how unhinged they were as a pair. You two are all that remain, replied O'Brien. I'm sorry I couldn't get here faster, but we tried to offer sniper support while we were en route. It's fine, sir, I appreciate it. That sniper saved my life, spoke Timbers. You can thank him later. Are you still able? replied O'Brien. We're still down half a platoon, so we need all available hands if you can. Otherwise, I can request an evac for both of you. Timbers shook his head to the offer. I can still fight. Just need a drink and maybe some rest. You can rest on the way to our objective. Get your gear and stand by the puma, replied O'Brien. Me too, sounded Rice, forcing himself up to meet the gaze of his officer. It's just a graze. Some morphine and painkillers, then I can fight. Well, it would be a waste to call a medivac for just one person, said O'Brien. I can offer some painkillers. There's a med can with a stim. Use that. His driver supported the raider by offering his shoulder, leading Rice away from the small building which was no more than a pile of rubble. O'Brien took in the scene of the sergeant's last stand as the sounds of gunfire cannons filtered through the air. Without looking, he addressed the lone raider. We have room in my puma, but it doesn't have a gun. But I noticed you operate the saw. My team doesn't operate one, so we can use you. Uh, O'Brien paused, his attention now to the nameplate just below his chin, but found most of it worn and illegible. Timbers, sir. Call sign Juliet 13 Viper Company, replied the raider in question. Well met. Load up because we're hitting their headquarters next, once we deal with their reinforcements, said O'Brien. As they loaded onto the Puma, O'Brien took to the passenger, and Rice and Timbers made their seats in the absent rear bed of the vehicle. Rice rested his back against the driver's seat with his rifle slung and fresh magazines for his auto rifle. Timbers sat beside him behind the passenger and rested his machine gun facing forward of the vehicle as their substitute offensive armament. His men were organized in their attacks, systematically using the rhinos as mobile offensive cover as they moved closer to their targets. It was obvious that the enemy wasn't expecting his forces, and the amount of firepower he had brought outclassed that of the light vehicles the Cellians employed. A mix of machine gun and cannon fire continued to litter their opposition until they were seen fleeing down the road they had entered from. They were routed, and the rest of his company regrouped, embarking into the rhinos with a jaunt step. They were soon to enter the heart of the enemy's territory, their capital. Timbers readied himself, filling his emptied belt mags with new rounds which easily weighed down his body, but continuous conditioning allowed him to be accustomed to it. Even though he wasn't able to load on his person the extra ammo, the puma had plenty of unused rounds for his saw, enough to continue holding off an entire battalion's worth in his eyes. He was almost ecstatic, if not for his current situation and the loss of his brothers. He owed it to Raptor for saving him, and now they were taking the fight to their headquarters. Plenty of targets, and plenty of rounds to use. Part 4. O'Brien's platoon had driven away a surprise force that entered the park just as they did. Luckily, the use of the Pumas were the first to engage with their chain-mounted guns, making quick work of the ground forces. By weaving through the field debris, they were able to avoid most lethal shots from the light armor that accompanied them but the concentrated fire from both the rhinos and grizzlies decimated what little plating they had. One round from the grizzlies' main cannon reduced its internal operators into liquid, blowing the vehicle from the inside out using an airburst round. 
He could only think what the inside would look like, and lucky for him, he had no need to. Jericho Blythe, ready your squads, we're making for the War Council, stated O'Brien. Both raiders obliged, urging their respective squads to re-enter the Rhinos for protected transport. He continued, turning to Dare over his comms for extended battlefield awareness. Dare, do you have eyes on the objective? As the Puma carefully navigated through the streets of Artre, O'Brien studied his tactical display, and the companies of Raven and Cobra were together as a collective unit as they marched to the eastern area of their objective. When they entered near an enemy group, points of red were briefly illuminated before disappearing after a set of tags labeled Raven H34 and Zebra A28 rounded a corner to a building presumably from an alleyway. It was slow, but their progress was steady. He just needed them to make more noise. I have eyes on it looks heavily fortified. Wait one, reported Dare. As he observed the objective, he noted its defenses and relayed them to O'Brien. From his angle and distance, he was able to make out a fair portion of their defenses from his scopes alone, which aided in his reconnaissance. The building itself was large, and sat within a raised outer wall that he noticed to be sandbagged on the other side. A wealth of Selian soldiers patrolled within the compound, conducting maintenance checks on what looked to be automated defenses on the ground level. He also noticed a slight shimmer that surrounded the compound itself as rain fell, as well as a stray bullet or two from the east. He also noted that when it fired a counter-missile, the glow of the shimmering surface subsided momentarily to allow for the exit of their countermeasure against aerial strafing. He knew that they couldn't bombard the zone, since they needed the occupants from within alive. I've identified a shield generator, but I'll need a distraction, requesting permission to authorize use of an LGM, said Dare. Wait one, replied O'Brien as he forwarded the request to the fleet tactical operations officer. The request was acknowledged, but they would have a small window to execute their plan. You're a go, but we'll have little time since the flyboys are preoccupied trying to maintain air superiority. Understood, replied Dare. He then swapped the use from his suppressed marksman rifle to the larger, harder hitting option. The weapon was set on rubble he took from his surrounding area as aim support. He eyed the device that generated the shield surrounding the compound, and on his side, a missile battery was situated. His thinking was that if he directed a missile strike against that point, it would launch a counter, lowering the shield appropriately for him to take the shot. Ready, sir, Dare affirmed. All right, patching you into a designated pilot. Stand by, said O'Brien. After several moments of Dare maintaining a sightline on his target, his comms were then connected to the pilot who would offer their services. This is HFP Scribbles. How copy, said the pilot. This is Sergeant Dare. I have a target that needs a splash, replied Dare. Are you capable? Understood. I have a set of Mark 134S that need a home. I might need a laze, so designate your target. I can drop in 40, reported Scribbles. Dare clicked a button atop his scope of his anti-material rifle, which was a powerful infrared laser, which had a decent range, almost matching his rifle's maximum range. But for the current distance, it was more than enough. He began circling his rifle in small circles, allowing for the pilot to be given a general location of where to drop, and from there, the missiles would trail towards the end of the laser. You're linked. The missiles are yours in three, two. Send it. You have the bag, reported Scribbles. The missiles were sent, and from the corner of his eyes, a small trail of bright light exited the exhaust as they flew towards the end of the laser. He didn't leave his eyes off the target, and saw the missile battery orient itself in the direction of incoming ordnance. He waited until the first counter was fired, lowering the shield for a moment, but he didn't fire. He watched as the edges of the shield began to glow, closing halfway before launching the second counter to his second guided missile. It opened larger than before, and then he fired. It took just over a second for the bullet to travel to its mark, as he fired through the smoke caused by the missile battery. There was a small spark and a shudder of the shield overhead. It had overloaded and their shield was neutralized. However, he couldn't risk its repair and fired a second shot into it, causing it to smoke profusely from its unintended entry. From overhead, 
The missile battery had downed the first missile, sending shrapnel down from overhead, coincidentally colliding with the second countermissile, leaving the last missile free to land onto the roof of the building. A quick flash of orange was seen, followed by a burst of smoke. As the dust settled, the fate of the local missile defenses were revealed, showing them to be nothing but torn to shreds from the concussive force and shrapnel the missile delivered. They were now clear to assault the council chambers, and they were going to go all out. You're clear, sir. We have a splash, and shields are down, reported Dare as he loaded a third round into the chamber of his rifle. I've got you covered. Good work. Stand by and cover our approach, O'Brien said as the rest of his platoon made their cautious advance through the now war-torn central city of the Selian capital. However, unknown to him, his squads were a building over from their objective, as indicated by a waypoint on his HUD. Since when were we so close to the objective, said Grayson. I bet if we didn't assist Viper, we'd be on their doorstep by now. O'Brien opened his tack map, and lo and behold, their objective lay just on the other side of the building they previously inhabited with the Selian ambush. There were routes of alleyways that led to the other side. He decided to advance through them, and have the vehicles split evenly and take a wide berth in a flanking maneuver, diverting attention to the sides, and not from the enemy's immediate sides. He had the option now to return to it, or to attack from their current position from the northeast of the compound they were supposed to target, and looking back, he knew they were close to the objective. But he couldn't allow himself to let all of a raider company die. He saved two, but he wished he could have saved more. Can't let them take a total loss like that. I just wish we aided them sooner. Now we're down an entire platoon. Raven and Cobra are advancing, but they don't have armor for cover. They're entirely on foot, spoke O'Brien. He contemplated their support and opted for the most logical. Puma and Rhino teams assist Cobra and Raven companies in their assault. If it moves, turn it to paste. He received a hearty A, sir, from the teams as they raced to their brothers and sisters in arms, with a single grizzly following behind as added comfort for the troops. O'Brien and the rest of his platoon then took up their advance alongside their only grizzly. As they advanced, the sun rose, indicating that it was now mid-morning, and their visibility was at an all-time high. Even now, the roar of ship engines rang overhead in a screech that ravaged their ears as they chased weary enemy pilots. With the blue sky above them, black specks were much more visible as they danced around in the sky and the frames of larger ships loomed overhead as they exchanged fire against one another. It was aerial chaos, and their victory awaited their success. Before they knew it, they had arrived where they last rested with the fifth floor of the building still riddled with holes and broken glass. O'Brien then ordered their dispersal, breaking down into fire teams. Timbers moved through the buildings with rice carrying all the ammo as they set up their machine gun nest. Timbers nest rested nicely above in a mid-level floor that overlooked the compound by roughly 100 meters. He chose the building with the thickest walls compared to the surrounding buildings. Some of the walls were blown out, he guessed from the explosions prior. Luckily, it gave him a decent enough view of the battlefield, and he readied himself for the call to engage. Jericho and Blythe took their respective squads wide towards the roots of the alleyways and stood by in cover before O'Brien gave his orders. They were the most numerous, and at most strength. All of Bravo's squad was absent and most of Alpha, leaving enough for a fire team at best. Grayson stood by as Fox and Ryder scouted close to the exit of their alleyway. O'Brien stood by as he observed his tactical map. He noted the path of the Pumas, Rhinos, and Single Grizzly, racing down a road opposite of where the raiders were engaging, effectively catching a wealth of Selian troopers and light vehicles off guard. They were either run down or gunned down by the vehicles. Their push was enough to disrupt the enemy, as he noticed a wealth of raiders rapidly advancing, with enemy indicators popping quickly into existence but being equally extinguished as fast as they showed up. They were efficient, killers, and even he can tell how well they worked in small teams. Deadly, fast, and efficient. A trademark of earlier raiders when covert ops were the regular. They're certainly working the enemy into the ground, stated Grayson as he peered over his shoulder. 
Couldn't be me, he said with a nonchalant and condescending shrug, clearly mocking the poor enemy's performance. When your rear gets hit by several tons of steel and lead, you can bet you won't have a good time. Distract and destroy, replied O'Brien, and he readied himself. He checked his pouches for ammo and his gear in general, as did the others. When he was set, he gave the call. Raptor Company, Delta Platoon. Assault is a go on my signal. Stand by, he radioed. He had a plan to make it as flashy an entrance as possible, especially with the rapidly approaching Raven and Cobra companies. He wanted his forces to be supplemented with the rest of Raptor, but they were still busy and the rest of his platoon was being medically treated. It was now or nothing. Badger's Hunter, what's your ETA? He questioned. A bout of static came through his radio before eventually clearing itself and a familiar sound came through his radio. It was Badger's. Entering the airspace now! But we practically entered contested space! Breaking through now! We'll have you in thirty! He reported, with his voice fading momentarily as he focused an order to a fellow raider that shared the same space. Load the 150 and get the 30 prepped. How are we on the 75? Damn it, Hunter! I said the 75, not the 20! Badgers turned his attention back to O'Brien, not paying mind to having his officer wait, since his job was just as crucial to the operation as the boots on the ground. Sir, we have you. Stand by and get ready to move. Controls are mine. He paused, and the sound of concern came over him as he reported to his officer. Sir, you have a large enemy force approaching from the south. O'Brien was pleased with the assistance, and it was going to be a spectacle to behold. They still had some time, so his best bet was to take control over the compound and wait for them to come. But Badgers had a different idea entirely. Silently, tracers from the sky began raining down, with the whistle of their rounds filling the air beside the impacts they made that generated loud thumps and booms depending on the round and all of it was concentrated on the compound's courtyard. O'Brien watched as the originator of the ordnance circle above them and bursts of tracers traversed the sky, enlarging as they grew closer before ultimately impacting the unfortunate souls before them. Chaos, dust and explosions littered the ground, destroying emplacements and reinforcements of the compound. It was death from above, and even when attacks on the compound subsided, the rain of fire was simply redirected to the next group with O'Brien listening in over the all comms. Raven, Cobra, this is Raptor Delta 1, 5, danger close. Badgers fired into the large groups that gathered to his present, but delivered a well-placed shot of the 150mm cannon. Delivering high explosive airburst 150 mic mic. Splash, 12 plus KIA. Switching to the 30, reported Badgers. As he said, a slow-firing burst of high-explosive 30mm cannon rained down on scattering Selian soldiers, reducing them to chunks of flesh and ash. This attack continued for several passes, reducing the once staggering enemy forces to a mere fraction of its former self. This allowed for the majority of the other raider companies to advance faster than before, with O'Brien and his platoon arriving cautiously to the compound gates. How are we on that enemy force from the south? inquired O'Brien. We got some ammo left, so we'll give it to him as a present. Won't be enough to finish them, so you'd best hold out, said Badgers. Copy, RTB to rearm and refuel, replied O'Brien. And with that, Badgers left the comms chat, leaving O'Brien with the naval command and his fellow raiders when a voice rose in his head. It was Athena. For what purpose does a ship need for a tactic such as this? It seems redundant, said Athena, a voice who had remained quiet until now. Well, if we used a ship's cannons for ground support, then we'd most likely be caught in the vicinity. It's just not viable as air support, and it does wonders on infantry. Personally, it's a favorite, replied O'Brien, as he gave a hand gesture for his fire team to advance. Fox was the first in the group and entered an opening in the wall. He did so cautiously, still unsure if the bombardment got all the enemy forces in the area. Even with an attack like that, there would still be survivors, so they had to be cautious. With most of the platoon entering the compound grounds, they found it to be riddled with nothing but dirt craters and pieces of the enemy. It was a gruesome reality that this compound was bristling with personnel, 
and in the manner of just several minutes, were reduced to nothing, with the only evidence of people having been present were the blood-stained walls and barely recognizable limbs. But after securing the courtyard portion of the compound, O'Brien was soon met with the platoon commanders of Raven and Cobra companies. The first to speak was marked with a sigil of a raven on his chest plate, and the letters Jakal imprinted on his nameplate. Second Lieutenant, Jakal, Raven Actual. He presented himself, still new but experienced enough to conduct himself well. I have my men prepping to hunker down, a suspected enemy counteroffensive. O'Brien nodded. It seems so. The gunship just spent the last of its ordnance on them, but they report they still have a sizable force. Hunker down along with Cobra in the surrounding buildings and get ready to meet the enemy. The lieutenant left with the rest of his men, each wearing a variation of their insignia. The second one to meet him was an older man who looked to have a gentle exterior, but hid an excessive interior beneath all the armor that he wore. He was an old friend to O'Brien, and he was the first support after his first real mission, and consequently his first blood trial. Major Raikou. Fable, my boy. Good work with the assault and wonderful display we needed the cover. Gave plenty of the shinies some great experience for their first ever trial. So, this is the objective, yes? The council chambers? Spoke the major in a familial tone. O'Brien could only smile upon seeing his face and his nonchalant attitude. It's been so long since I pinned you as an officer. To think you'd be the one leading the charge. He gave a hearty laugh that was infectious to those around him. Yes, sir, O'Brien said with a small smile. I'm taking the rest of Raptor in to secure the assets. Then we'll be done with this war. Oh, I'm certain there will be plenty more where this came from. Perhaps not like this, but it shall come. You know as much as I do, life is layered aplenty, and so are our problems. We just need to be the ones to make sure those at home don't have to worry, now that we know we're not alone, added Raikou. O'Brien appreciated his words that delivered him comfort in his duties, while equally instilling confidence to do whatever needs to be done. It was refreshing to meet with him in the midst of chaos, but it also brought him back to reality that they were nearing the crucial part of their mission. Oh, and you might want this. Raikou delivered an item previously concealed by his frame. It had a tubular lower half with a rounded grip at the bottom with a ventilated square barrel shroud. It was part of their usual catalog of armaments, but it wasn't an active service in the field since most engagement ranged from 100 to 300 meters on average. But it was a welcome addition. Eight gauge. I don't know what you'll find, but this gal will make short work of anything that wants to meet God himself. Go now. I'll take command from here, said Raikou. O'Brien did as his mentor said as he slung the weapon in a position that wouldn't get in the way of his current equipment. Overall, it rested comfortably on his back when he tightened it. It wasn't a weapon he often used and nearly forgot how it handled, but looked forward to it. After delivering his orders to the rest of his platoon, they gathered in the entrance of the building's reception area with their weapons drawn. It was empty, and the light from outside filtered through, illuminating a vast majority of the space. He found it a miracle that the direct hit of a bomb didn't level the place, but the space proved to be larger than expected. They had to split up. Spread into fire teams and search this place top to bottom. Jericho, Blythe, secure this wing. Test for any secret passages and hidden assets. If you find anyone and they present a clear threat, waste them. I'll take the northern wing, ordered O'Brien. With him, Fox, Ryder, Grayson, Timbers, and Rice entered through a set of dual doors. It was barely open, but Gray had seen to its compliance. The room they entered was moderately sized, with a path leading toward a set of raised pedestals and desks, with the floor before it designated for an audience of a requesting individual. Dim lights littered the pathways of the room, allowing for them to see since a series of blast doors covered the overhead glass. As they searched the immediate area, Fox led Ryder to a door to their right and opened it, with O'Brien following. The space was enclosed, but large enough to fit a moderately sized ship within it. Fox directed the attention of the two toward a button on the wall and pressed it. With a hum, the gears of mechanics began moving and opened the roof of the room, revealing it to be a landing pad. Seeing nothing of value, 
the three began to depart the brightly lit space, leaving it open for friendly transport if needed, but were interrupted by a call of a hollowed voice that rang in their heads. It was Athena. Sir, if I may, there is a console present so it's possible to derive information for a later debrief, she said. Granted, he said without worry. You can fill me in after we secure the assets, clear? Understood, she replied. With nothing left of the audience chamber, the team gathered at the next point, where he met Grayson, Rice, and Timbers waiting for them. Anything new? asked O'Brien. Just their rooms. Five in total, replied Grayson. Nothing we couldn't read right away, but we've tagged them for the other squads to pick up. O'Brien nodded to his report and looked to the raiders beside him. They weren't his usual crew besides Gray, but they had shown themselves to be capable enough to earn their stripes, since they were only banded white, although worn and peeling. He knew he could rely on them, and so they advanced. The entrance led down a long series of steps with dim lights revealing each step before it stopped at another door, this time locked. It was a moment that he wished Strega were still present, but he remembered his electronic friend who hung on his waist. Athena, can you crack it? he asked, to which she replied as if she was insulted. A trivial matter, I assure you, sir, she returned as he placed her device to the side panel that married the door. With a whir, the doors were open and the letters above him were translated with a quickly generated overlay. Inner Sanctum Celia System, City of Artre, mid-2670. First Lieutenant O'Brien, 4th ODR Battalion, Raptor Company. Fox was the first to enter through the door with his weapon trained forward. The entrance before him opened into a darkened hall. Ryder situated herself behind him, with her rifle hovering above his shoulder as he moved. O'Brien situated himself behind Ryder as the third, and their miniature formation was copied by Rice, Timbers, and Grayson, respectively, this time on the opposite wall of O'Brien's team. They continued down the halls searching each room carefully as their helmet's night visor illuminated the dark spaces by enhancing what little light was provided. The rooms were relatively sparse, being mostly used for storage. They would search throughout them but found little to nothing of real intrigue save for a mattress and linen with adornments that O'Brien figured was for running off during working hours. Ryder had seemed to share in his thoughts. Mattress? Scented candles? Flower petals? Well, if it isn't the old Shag Shack, she said, with Fox giving a silent nod to her observation. O'Brien scanned the small room as the little hideout was furnished behind boxes to look inconspicuous to someone who might enter unexpectedly. See if you can find any identifying material of a female. Apparently she wore an expensive and elaborate headdress the last time she was seen, he ordered, not just to Fox and Ryder, but to the second team who scoured the opposite side of the hall. Copy, replied Ryder. When they found nothing, they continued on through the main hall until they reached a set of double doors that were placed on the right of the hall. Fox held his left arm in a ninety degree and a fist, informing them to halt. With his fingers, he motioned them in the way of guns, another sign that there were enemies nearby, and they sat just beyond the double set of doors. O'Brien readied his team by having them flank the entrance evenly with Timbers and Fox on point. He then switched from his suppressed rifle to the weapon gifted to him by Major Raikou, racking the pump-actuated weapon for a round into the chamber. His motion sensors pinged upon his HUD, and several red dots appeared. They were large indicating either a collective mass, large opponents, or both. Either way, they were going to make them see the light. Fox Timbers, ready flash grenades. Ryder Grayson, get ready to frag them, he ordered. They gave a silent nod in affirmation and awaited his execution. When they readied their equipment, he ordered their explosive entrance. Breach, 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 he roared, this time to make the enemy know he was here. The doors opened with a whir and a whoosh, revealing a dank and gruesome scene. The floors and walls were stained in a dark liquid dried over several days, as indicated by the splash pattern. That, and the fact that the closest beings in front of them were busy devouring a body of a cellian. The grenades were lobbed, initially ignored by the gorging beasts. One such grenade made contact with an individual as they picked it up with curiosity. The grenade was round in construction, but was packed with high explosive in its canister opting for explosive power and not shrapnel. 
However, O'Brien didn't know how such a grenade would do against a naturally armored creature, and he was curious. With the grenade in its hand, it observed it, urging others around it to view it when the one who seemed in charge pointed to the entrance. The one warning his brethren was the only one who donned cloth and decorative medals, but as they turned, the grenades went off, catching them off guard. A scream roared from the group as their bodies moved in reflex to the sudden stimulus, as violent as it was. A hand up to the elbow was missing, and parts of their chest were indented from the impact. They began to thrash wildly, swatting their tails into each other as another set of grenades went off, this time being one of a flashy nature. High-pitched booms went off in addition to a quick flash of light, blinding and disorienting the beasts. That was their cue, and the six-man team entered the room, flooding it with bullets. They had formed a line from the entrance of the door as they cleared their immediate corners and fired until whatever occupied the room ceased to move. The rounds from Timber's machine gun tore through them efficiently and violently, along with the other weapons used by his team. Their scales were tough, but enough rounds made it moot. Cease fire! Cease fire! ordered O'Brien. There was no doubt in his mind that the smell of gunpowder filled the room and overtook the horrific odor before their entrance. Fox proceeded forward into the room, making a wide berth around the whole riddled bodies, analyzing each one for life. Rice and Timbers remained by the exit, silently cautious of the darkened halls as the rest of the team continued in the room. With each step, O'Brien felt a viscous liquid beneath his feet, similar in feeling to the Selian ambush team not too long ago. He feared for them at that implication and the apparent evidence strewn before him in the corners of the room. Stained bones of Selians were before him and piled together with blatant disregard. It sickened him and similar feelings were shared with Ryder and Grayson. This ain't right, spoke Ryder as she struggled to keep the contents of her stomach in place. Why would the council keep man-eating lizards in their basement, eating their citizens no less, added Grayson. His bearing was much stricter than Ryder's, but it was apparent that he was also unnerved by the carnage before him. I don't know, but search for anything that can hold intel, said O'Brien. The others began searching the room when the sounds of a low growl filtered through his calm set, and he turned to the center of the room. The color was off, but he noticed a body of a fallen lizard began to move, first with its tail, then with the whole of its body. It tried to steady itself as blood began to vent from its body. It was tall, much taller than himself and just a bit more than Grayson. But the others were in the far corners of the room, leaving O'Brien alone within the beast's range for an attack. At first it didn't move. Instead, it only stood there until it began to speak, at least what he thought was its version of speech. He readied his weapon, already chambered with a fresh round to ruin its day. Before he pulled the trigger, Athena awoke from her silence, causing him to pause. Sir, if I may, I believe I can translate it, she spoke. Oh? Do tell, he replied, taking mine to not take his aim away from the beast. After several seconds, Athena returned. I've assessed earlier communications from friendly Selian forces prior and they have a function to translate the present alien tongue. From my transcriptions, they seem to call it Runian. Translating now. As the beast spoke, its vocals changed from incoherent growls and yips to Terran common. You must be warrior. So you aren't mindless, replied O'Brien, catching the beast off guard. You speak my tongue. Wretched it is, coming from rocks and not from throat. Tell me, who you? It asked. O'Brien, he replied curtly of Raptor Company. Hmm, Raptor Company. Is it clan? replied the Runyon. It is. But tell me, who are you? asked O'Brien. Its head moved in a way that said it was pondering before returning to the Terran before it. Bokta, chieftain of this band and warriors to Nila. It was a name he had not heard of before. And if it was, he had simply forgotten. But it seemed significant for it to now be seared into his memory. What were you doing here? And what of the corpses? asked O'Brien. It snarled, but answered, Eaten. Clan would have starved were it not for Sir Pola. Blood payment for council protection, it replied. And what? They let you eat their own citizens as payment for their protection, inquired O'Brien. The Runian nodded. Yes, we lay too. 
then eat. It sniffed the air mid-sentence before shifting its gaze toward Ryder. It had begun salivating, and its eyes slits narrowed. It was ready to pounce. By now the rest of the team had caught on to O'Brien since the start of his conversation, taking aim. You move. You die, ordered O'Brien, as he tried to turn its attention to him. It began to sway its tail, and he noticed a rising facility from its lower torso, ready to breed. He didn't need to dive further into it, as he was aware of its intentions. From what he gathered, it lived to fight, eat, and breed whenever he could. It didn't matter what conditions it did so in, just that it did. From deep within him, anger arose. Without giving it a chance to pounce, he fired into its waist, shattering it into shredded flesh. It collapsed and screamed at the pain. No words were offered or translated, just a pained scream. In the end, it was a beast that could barely talk. It had tried to claw at him, but he deftly swatted it away with a forceful kick and placed the barrel of his gun to the head of the Runian and fired. He offered no words of condemnation or fury, simply the pull of a trigger. Sir, spoke Ryder, to which he turned and replied, Don't worry about it. From now on you see a lizard, you put it down like vermin from here on out. Got it? His tone was sharp and unfiltered. They nodded in response as he ordered their exit, but not before catching a glimpse of an item near a wall. It was metal in nature, and was of a floral pattern with a single gem in the center. Its craftsmanship was expert from his experience, and recalled something similar shown to him by Vorta. It was of a picture with the two in frame, and her sister wore an item like it, confirming his suspicion. Poor thing, he said solemnly, as he held the bloodied headdress. He noticed the presence of Ryder behind him, curious of his find. Is that the Selian's... Sister, he interjected. Yeah, her name was Talani. Apparently she went missing a while back, around the time we entered the village on the outskirts. That's... She didn't know what to say. To find that a loved one was defiled before death and desecrated after. It was a harrowing thought, causing her to shudder. Come on, he said, bringing the rest of the team on track. Let's nail these bastards. He placed the head ornament into a free pouch upon his thigh as he ordered them to advance down the corridor, now much more cautious due to their earlier encounter. Eyes up! We don't know how many are left, so be careful! Move it! He ordered. They maintained their same formation as when they entered, moving in silence through the rooms. They had made an excess of noise, so he expected the enemy to also be on guard. It was natural when they decided to engage with a trusty eight-gauge and an unsuppressed light machine gun, but he felt comfort in knowing that they had yet to feel the might of the former. Methodically, they entered and cleared each room as they came across it. First it was by their mini-map, seeing if their motion sensors detected any movement, and if they did, then they simply offered a high-explosive grenade into the room until the little red dots on their map disappeared. It was an effective method, especially in an enclosed space. When they would reopen the doors, they would be met with smoke and the occasional mess. Any that moved or groaned were then finished off by Fox or Ryder. X-rays down, sir, spoke Ryder as they cleared the last room before being met with a set of double doors. Good work, replied O'Brien as he approached the door, with Fox and Ryder beside him ready to enter. He already noted several markers on his mini-map that indicated enemy presence spread around the room, with a small cluster centered near the edge of his sensors. He assumed them to be his targets. Check your HUDs, and pick your targets. I don't want a stray bullet to knock the VIPs. Stand by for infill. He then turned his attention to his holographic companion, as she stood no taller than six inches from her device. The door before him was locked, and he turned to her for assistance. Athena, he said. Just unlock it. Don't open it. I understand, replied the AI. I suspect you have a grand entrance in store for them, to which he nodded. Going to give them the old breacher classic, he said, prepping a cylindrical tube on the side of the door that offered cover. The rest of the team used this space to minimize being caught by gunfire as soon as the doors open. When these doors open, let them shoot. On my mark, we throw. Three. Two, one. With a whir of the door's mechanical servos, they opened and a barrage of sharp cracks filtered through from the room, 
with sparks generated from contact with the metallic walls. They had largely missed their mark, and their paws gave O'Brien ample time for a counter. He spoke into his proximity voice input, and began with a toss of his primed grenade. Mark, flash out! Others followed in his example, oversaturating the room with numerous flash and concussion grenades, each activating in such a way that it effectively created a chain reaction of deafening booms. After the last explosion was sounded, O'Brien and his team entered through the doors in a tactical fashion, keeping mind of their weapon pointed at their disoriented opposition. Fox, Ryder, and O'Brien took to the left of the room, with Rice and Gray taking to the right, leaving Timbers to watch their rear. Before them, the Cellian soldiers were wild in their actions, waving around their weapons in blatant disregard at their visual and audio discomfort. They were useless now, but O'Brien quickly weighed their fate in his hands. To him, it was simple. They still had their weapons in their hands, so they were still fair game. Instead of issuing verbal commands to fire, he simply did so by firing select rounds into the nearest target. Those around him followed suit, landing most of their shots center mass before following up with either a pelvic or headshot. It was a textbook breach, and if any of the enemy soldiers recovered, it was likely they would have either permanent eye or hearing damage, perhaps both. The room had quieted after the last body fell, and his eyes were now set to a table at the end of the room where he noticed a collection of robes huddled together and called to them, his voice reverberating throughout the medium-sized room. Come out! We have you surrounded and your guards are dead. Hands above your heads where I can see them, he ordered as he turned on his weapon's mounted light, illuminating their figures that he could indeed see them. They were slow to act, but did as he ordered. However, they failed to comply with his order to see their hands as several of the councilmen had hidden theirs behind their clothing. It was suspicious to say the least, and he ordered them once more. I said let me see your hands. I know you can understand me. Show me your hands. Three of the five did as they were told, tossing what looked to be a service pistol to the side. Okay, don't shoot. Quickly, Gallum, with us, said a Celian, donning blue robes alongside a silent red-robed Celian. The two received scorns from the other two who sported white and purple-colored robes. You cowards! Scorned one in purple as he brandished his weapon to the three, to which O'Brien moved to intercept before having the weapon turned to him. He paused, his weapon now trained on the two who failed to comply. What, Terran? Never had a gun waved in your face before? Mocked the Celian, his nose raised as if trying to look down on him. They stood on a raised platform so it was natural for him to feel the need to be condescending. So you must be Councilman Polas, he replied in a cold tone, free from excess emotion. His words caught the Celian off guard, as he likely didn't expect him to know his name. With a metallic clunk of a weapon hitting the floor, the hands of the white-robed Celian were raised, leaving only Polas. You! began Polas in a fury. You said we should fight to the last! Or did you plan this too? Call him! The Celian in question only nodded in response, denying the claim. Look before you, Polis. They know your name, our names. Whatever else I had left to resist had long since passed. Our men were killed instantly before our eyes, and they had nothing to defend against it. Polus looked to the floor below him, which were only a couple of steps away, and saw the silhouettes of his fallen soldiers as they lay dying. The realization began to set in, but he held his ground as faltering as it was. Reka, Breka, even you, Gollum, you are all at fault as much as I am. Look, Terrans, this is the man you want. Polus waved his weapon to the still Callum, his expression and bearing still reflective as that of a leader. He orchestrated the siege of your worlds. I played along because he's my superior. You want him, not me. His pacing grew erratic and dangerous, with his expression filled with guilt. He could see it, as did the others in the room. You can plead your case at the Senate Tribunal, where you will all be tried for your crimes against humanity, said O'Brien. But first, he focused on Polus, who still waved the gun about, still having not fired a shot. What do you all know about the Room of the Runians, Polus? His posture began to crumble at the mention, and glances from the other council members looked upon him with confusion. What is he talking about, Polus? spoke the blue-robed Breca. Galem. A Celian donned in green chimed in next to the inquiry. What do you mean, Terran? 
Were they not put in place to keep the enemy at bay, Polis? The Celian in question failed to answer, as visible trails of sweat began to form on his head, as reflected in the light from O'Brien's weapon. A sigh was heard, and when they looked to the originator, it was Callum shaking his head. What did you find, Terran? He asked humbly. Solemnity was the only expression he had mustered to ask his question and face the Celian in question. Polis had told us to not go beyond their space, that he had everything under control. I had placed my trust in him because I know what they are, and I fear the worst has come. Councilman Polas, he said, gaining the attention of the dumbstruck alien, what do you know of a Celian by the name of Tolani? It was a question that seemed irrelevant to the larger question at hand, but O'Brien felt it necessary to find an answer. The one in question stammered to speak, before Reka, a councilman in red, spoke on his colleague's behalf. A receptionist clerk. She worked front desk, he said. Nods of affirmation were shared between Breka and Gallum. We saw her plenty with Polis before we entered the sanctum, but we thought he had sent her home or to a bunker. Did you do that, Polis? The call from Breka brought him back to reality, and O'Brien knew that he could have taken him out and subdued him. But he wanted answers now. He wasn't sure if he would be able to see any of them after they are brought in. Now was the only time he could question them himself. I... began Polas. I sent her away. We had a room within the sanctum halls that we shared. She should have left. His words were listless and shallow in execution, like he was now a broken shell that had become a husk in the middle of their interrogation. O'Brien then reached into his pouch, and with the clang of metal, he revealed it, as the sound was familiar to them for it filled the halls daily when she was attached to Polas. This was all that was left in a room of lizards, reduced to blood and bone. Let me show you, he said before firing a single shot at the weapon Polas wielded. He had aimed for the gun itself, but adjusted for a personal touch, the hand itself. It was gone in its entirety as he didn't switch to a more precise weapon and Polas screamed in pain. Meanwhile, the other raiders had circled to the group and began detaining them. Hey, watch it! We'll go, we'll go! Sounded Brecca, as Fox fastened a set of zip ties over their wrists. They were the thicker kind, and they were bound efficiently enough that they struggled to move their hands with how tight they were, causing acute pain with some. Okay, okay, can't you loosen it just a bit? Cried Gallum. His request fell on deaf ears as Fox quickly bound them. With the council bound, and Polus mildly treated, O'Brien began their escort. Fox, Ryder, up front. Lead the way and make for the landing pad, he ordered. They stepped off in silence as the two led the detail. O'Brien led in front of the councilman, with Gray in the rear and Rice and Timbers on the sides, forming a wedge. They continued through the now emptied halls as they passed through open doors. With the light from their weapons briefly illuminating the entrance that revealed familiar corpses to the councilman before pausing. When he stopped, the councilman gagged, noting a foul odor that assaulted them. Gay! What is that? said Breka, followed by the once silent Reka. That is. There was an underlying odor to it that, even in its soiled nature, was something all too familiar to him a smell that he grew accustomed to on the field of battle when a friendly trooper took a lethal hit. Blood. Soiled. Terran, can you show me? asked Rekka. O'Brien did as he requested and shined his light into the room, revealing the previous horrors his team had encountered. Bones piled wastefully to the sides, with the floor and walls thickly stained in green. Littered about the room were the small detachment of Runians previously tasked to defend them, but from the looks of it so far, they did none of that. They neither roamed nor fought, and instead were made short work of. Polas, what did you do? He asked his colleague, to which he muttered. They required a blood payment. I didn't know what to do. Fine soldiers and innocent civilians murdered. Reka had turned, and with his hands still bound, delivered a strike to the crestfallen Polas. That should be you in there. And you. He turned to the eldest among them. You should share their fate. Why? Reka's shoulders shrank, as did his tone. 
Why did you make that deal with her? Callum instead remained silent, and even though Rekha wanted to strike him as well, he was stopped by the flanking raiders. When he spoke, it was devoid of empathy, cold, and calculating. I did what I did for the betterment of our people, new lands to call home and to expand our empire should the Union come at us again. How was I to know that Neela would appear? I could not simply deny her when in her presence were her personal guard. They would have torn us to shreds if we angered her. You live today because of my choices that day, he replied. A shame they were felled so easily, Terran. But lucky for you, they were a small clan, weak and inexperienced, he added, before being forcibly ushered by Grayson to move forward. When they began up the steps from the main chambers, O'Brien began receiving calls as they continued up the steps until they made to the central chambers. To think we were jammed that far down, voiced Ryder, to which O'Brien agreed. It hadn't come to him that they were jammed, or just deep enough to not receive calls, as he and his team were focused on the council. With their mission a success, he had finally realized how much he had missed. This time, he was met with Major Raikou, who was flanked by a small detail of raiders as they looked around cautiously, even though he suspected that they had already cleared the room. Fable, congratulations on the capture. Setting the example for the other battalions, I'm sure. I pray there was no issue down below, he inquired, his demeanor jolly in delivery. Some, but we dealt with it. How did it go up here? Seems like we had no comms after we went in. What about the incoming enemy force? He replied, We had some difficulty, but your sniper proved invaluable in our defense, said Raikou. Dare? replied O'Brien. That's the one. Fine shot he is. Covered us from sniper fire by the enemy. Luckily we held off long enough for marine reinforcements to arrive, and they made short work of the enemy. Fine job they did. So, are these the assets? added Raikou. They are, sir, replied O'Brien. These are the guys who started this whole war. Fine ending, if you ask me. We'll see about that, replied Raikou as he approached the captives, specifically to Callum, getting within arm's distance. How's it feel to lose your home world to the raiders? He could only scowl at the man before him, using silence as his best defense. When he saw that he wouldn't budge, the Major dropped his act, turning to O'Brien. Transport's already covered, and it'll take you to the Queen. I appreciate it, sir. Where's the rest of my platoon? He asked. Already on the assault carrier. Don't worry, Cobra and Raven have it from here. Oh, but Dare insisted he come with you, so he's waiting by the ship. Thanks. See you at the debrief, then. Oh, and mind where you step down there, he said, before escorting the councilmen to their in-house landing pad. Like the one similar to what took Strega and Eau Claire in, it was another Hawk dropship with its side door ramps open to embark. He noticed a small group of raiders whose armor was near pristine, save for some scuffs and dirt, but lacked markings of any kind. They were fresh from the depot. They were talking beside the right ramp, engaging in conversation of their supposed heroism. You should have seen it. Fired damn near a whole mag at a patrol. Got like ten of them before I had to reload. Fields, that's some bullshit and you know it. Ain't that right, Jay? The one referred to Jay looked in his direction, like he had seen a ghost, but O'Brien chalked it up to shock. He approached the ramp, nonetheless, finally gaining the attention of the fledgling raiders. Rah, sir, said one raider whose name was lasered on his chest, spelling spears. He was about to offer a salute, as did the others, but was quickly stopped from doing so. We don't salute in the field, raider. Attention is fine, he said, eyeing each one as they formed up before him. They were young and had survived their first combat encounter with relatively high spirits. It was refreshing. New to the fleet, huh? How was your first real drop? Exciting, sir. Nothing quite like it, exclaimed one whose name was Fields. Beside him their names were in full view and he scanned from left to right, noting Spears, Cameron, and Kurt. They seemed like friends, so it was likely they graduated together. That was his initial thought. How is the Major treating you guys? I know he can be hard at times, but he's fair, he said. Cameron was the next to answer. He treats us well, sir. Nice, too. Yes, sir. The Major knows how to fight. Never saw a man tear the arm off a Cellian and then beat him with it, replied Fields, 
clearly excited. O'Brien nodded at the response, seeing how their feelings were reflective of how he felt of the man who taught him everything he knew. He was also known as a great fighter, but he hadn't seen it firsthand. But a man of his caliber, it seemed plausible. However, he cut the conversation short, as he had to deliver his captives. You guys can get going. My team has it from here. And remember, take time to decompress, he said as he boarded the Hawk. They came to attention and stepped from the danger zones of the aircraft, clearing from its exhaust zone as it began to start up, and the doors closed, encasing his small team. The councilmen were seated in the center of the compartment, with some of the raiders taking this time for leisure, with Fox and O'Brien on guard duty. Their ride was turbulent at first, but quickly subsided after they broke through the first layer of the atmosphere. From there, he only had to wait until they reached their destination. The TRSC Phantom Queen. Their transit was short as their ship began landing procedures. It jolted to the sides as the automated landing system engaged, tossing their occupants around if they weren't seated. He knew from experience aboard dropships and shuttles that a smooth landing was possible when free from confined spaces, but it was required for hangar landings to assist with pinpoint accuracy. It helped to maintain space in the hangar, and it was a quick process. When he felt the landing gears touch the deck, the ship lowered once more with a thud as the magnetic locks activated, effectively sealing it to the deck. The doors of the central compartment then opened, revealing a bright white light that filled the hangar, nearly blinding the Cellian War Council, evidenced by their grimmest faces as their eyes slowly began to adjust. With himself in the lead, he disembarked from the ship and was met by a large crowd that gathered on the edge of the landing pad's boundary, with ship security placed along the perimeter. Much of the crowd were donned in colored mechanic suits that indicated their roles and with their entry had gathered them. They looked upon them with wide eyes, with others discreetly trying to get photos, with several being hounded by security on operational security. From the crowd, they were parted, and he was shown a familiar set of faces. The first that stood out to him was Wolf, with a pair of Cellians behind him and a small detachment of his own men, most notably from Foxtrot Platoon. Sir, O'Brien said as he came to attention, mission accomplished. We have men on the ground securing the site, but I would like them to return to our carrier once they get replaced. Granted, once the Marines touch down, which they should have, your battalion will be free to return to your ship. Now, said Wolf, to whom do I owe the pleasure? He spoke to the first in line, Reka, followed by Breka and Gollum. I am Reka, military advisor to the head chief, he replied, offering a slight bow. These two are Breka and Gollum our Empire's lead logistical officer and diplomat, respectively. But while I may, can you usher Councilman Polis to a medical site? Wolf turned to a pale Cellian, with its right hand covered in stained bandages. He eyed O'Brien before calling for medical, to which the individual in question was taken and led by his own detail of ship security. When the individual was out of earshot, Wolf spoke. What happened? Did he piss you off enough to blow his hand off? O'Brien relaxed his posture as he replied, Sort of. If you saw and heard what I did, well, you probably would have put an entire eight-gauge into his torso. He's lucky it was only his hand. That, and he was waving a gun around. I couldn't have him misfire and put one in the head of a VIP now, could I? Wolf smirked to his reply, and then focused on the last Cellian in the group. He looked to be at least twice the age, if not greater, than the surrounding councilmen. Before he could speak, the female Cellian that previously took cover behind Wolf showed herself. The previous three were surprised at her sudden appearance, but she promptly ignored them, instead focusing on the quiet column. Father, she said in soft disdain, quite the nerve you're still alive. Colum sighed, his eyes resting to meet her gaze. Yorla, for what reason are you aboard a Terran vessel, along with that failure of a commander? He said directing a sharp stare at the other Cellian who had yet to present himself and chose to remain quiet. We have seen what you ordered Torlak to do. Enslavement. We fought the Union to free ourselves from them only for us to commit the same atrocity. 
We still have many of our own people still enslaved by them, and you... You went and did this? Tears began forming in her eyes as she spoke. Kalim remained silent, as he didn't have a rebuttal or excuse. He was at fault, and it had inevitably caused war which quickly turned to their disadvantage. To save him from any further dishonor, he decided silence. When she found that he wasn't going to respond, she turned to step away, finding her spot beside a man separate from the aged commander who greeted them first. He was younger, but still wore what he suspected to be naval uniform. Then he noticed it, an ornate headdress mixed with gold and silver, fashioned with expertly crafted flowers that sat upon a white cloth. Since when? he uttered, curious of her adornment. When did you receive such a gift? A year ago, she responded. We are betrothed, and with this war over, we will marry. Callum turned his gaze to the man who stood beside her, eyeing him in detail. What is your name? Vale, but I'm afraid we won't be acquainted long. He gave a nod to the Eiffel Wolf, to which he ordered their confinement. We'll have security escort them, said Wolf, and a set of guards surrounded the remaining four Cellians as they led them to the brig. The crowd had then slowly begun to disperse, eventually leaving the small group after Wolf dismissed the rest of security. O'Brien, we need to talk privately, he said, turning to his entourage of the Cellian pair and lone commander, not minding his team as they had already set themselves to relax. O'Brien followed him to the ship his team disembarked from and closed the doors. The ship's engines were still off, so there was no hum to add to the ambience. What now, sir? I'd like to think my team is going to enjoy some much-needed leave, replied O'Brien. You will, but we've received some troubling news. Sergeant Trisco from Viper's Kilo Platoon was ambushed. They were operating a skeleton detail for transport when they stopped in a system to rendezvous with Senate forces for a send-off. He only had half a squad with him, but they were wiped out, save for him and the crew. The worst part... Torlak escaped. I'm sorry. It was an unwelcome surprise to O'Brien, and he was furious at the loss of his raiders. But he had new questions for him at the report. How? Sensors would have picked up an enemy ship transiting through their newly controlled space, right? He rebuked, to which Wolf shook his head. We don't have a lot of the details, but the captain of the ship reported that they had to do emergency repairs. That's when they were attacked. However, in the midst of that... The sergeant was kind enough to provide video of the enemy. Take a look. He retrieved a rectangular device and handed it to O'Brien when it started playing. It was a video played in the point of view of Sergeant Trisco himself when he was interrogating a Cellian that he didn't recognize. It was only the two of them present, so he turned up the audio. Come on! You rancid piece of shit! Tell me what I need to know before I glass your sorry fucking world! He held the scruff of his clothing effortlessly lifting the Cellian. You don't have that authority. You're just as low on the cast as that fledgling behind you, retorted the Cellian. Oh yeah? You want to know who can? He's the biggest and baddest raider this side of the galaxy, and I'm willing to bet he'd nuke whatever hole your family came crawling out of. Best get used to glass, because when I find your family, I'll give him your regards. The Cellian tried to fight back, but Trisco proved too strong for him. Tears of anger fell from his contorted face as he denied the raiders' claims. You! You filthy Terrans! I hope the Union puts you down like the Elders prior, Vecta. You will be nothing more than slaves like the others. Trisco was about to deliver a violent and powerful punch to the Cellian, with O'Brien unsure if he was going to hold back. But he stopped after a shake of the helmet feed gave him pause. He tossed the Cellian back into his confinement, and sealed the door before issuing orders to the raider behind him. The following series of events occurred how he expected, at least initially. It was quickly turned against them when the door to the room opened, and bolts of light dashed through the corridor. Trisco, along with the subordinate, then looked to where the shots were coming from, which was from the door that led into the small hangar. There were already two dead raiders laid on the floor, motionless, as the volume of fire from the enemy increased. Trisco had assessed the corridor for any friendly forces, with only a couple further down and in the prone position as they fired through the doorway and into the hangar. They were, however, unarmored, 
donning only their undersuit and fatigues with fresh bed hair. They had just woken up, but their first instinct was to fight, regardless whether they had their armor on or not. And yet, they fought. However, it took a turn when the shooting stopped and a large mass lunged through the door and swung at the sergeant with its large tail. It knocked him against the bulkhead, causing him to cry out in pain before going unconscious. From there, the only imagery was of the floor and numerous bodies, both human and alien. There was a stark difference with those in the video, however. They weren't Selian. The video then cut to after he woke up, with an angered Selian kicking at his body and cursing him. There was no presence of the alien threat, so it continued on with Trisco rising from the retreating enemy and recaptured the Selian prior. He ended up catching the enemy with their backs turned and lifting the large reptile's body and the new corpses into the artificial tunnel cut into the hangar's door. The feed finally cut out after the raider placed the Selian back into custody and locked the doors to the hangar, leaving in the corridor fallen comrades whose blood pooled beneath them. It was a lot to unpack, but O'Brien understood the implications. What are we dealing with now, besides the Runyon? He said, his tone near unfazed. Well, beyond the Runyon, we don't know. This happened six to eight hours ago, but the bodies were spaced when the boarding party left. They recovered them quickly, so we only have one other body. They're working the autopsy now, but we won't get results until they make it back to Saul, replied Wolf. Very well, resigned O'Brien. I take it Fourth Fleet is going to return home? They will. They weren't our original replacement, so we'll head home once another carrier group arrives. The rest of the Seventh will remain here until then. Wolf opened the door to the ship's compartment, removing their privacy, and continued. In the meantime, set up a patrol roster. We're still going to need some guys planet-side for cleanup duty. But as the door met the floor, a person whom O'Brien was unfamiliar with stood by with her own entourage of naval officers. Compared to Wolf, who donned a standard field uniform, she wore similar colored fittings, but her over her thighs was a sturdy fabric skirt, or belt spat. Some even called it a command skirt, or comma. It was a new look, and he wondered if the uniform had changed sometime in the last three years. Ah, Dad, she spoke, meeting the vice admiral in a bear hug once he stepped off the ship's ramp. Zuna, my dear, brilliant display. Never have I seen a ship get torn from a slipspace rupture like that. I think you were lucky to be granted such a magnificent ship, added Wolf, his tone now reflective of a doting father. The woman before him was young and had wavy platinum brown hair tied into a braided ponytail, its length reaching just below her nape. To him, it looked like a fluffed foxtail with the amount of volume it had, bounding with each head movement and step. O'Brien couldn't help but stare. May I help you, Raider? She said in a soft tone. She seemed to be no older than his sergeants, specifically Strega, as they shared similar complexions, just without the scars. Ma'am, he said, offering a slight nod. His helmet was still on, but as he looked her over, he noticed that she bore three bars and a star on her shoulder. She was a commander, and at a relatively young age than he had ever seen. Didn't think I'd meet a commander as young as you. He reached his hand out, to which she replied in kind. I thank my father for his teachings, said Zuna. Well, I must be off. Fourth Fleet has almost wrapped up its support, so we'll make our way to Saul, and we can begin preparation for the tribunal. Maybe I'll see you there, O'Brien. She turned, leaving the two beside the aircraft. After she was out of earshot, he removed his helmet. Is she... Seeing anyone? He asked of his superior beside him. He continued to stare at her as she left, but he received a slight nudge from the elbow of his officer. No. She only wants the best and none have come close to her expectations. But you, well, you practically assaulted an enemy's capital city by yourself and captured their leaders. I'd say you have a pretty decent chance. That, and she even suggested you meet again. I hope you're free that day commented Wolf in an endearing manner. It was a tone O'Brien was unfamiliar with, but found it to be a welcome one. Then, once he had concluded their meeting, had the rest of his team depart for their home, the Arm of Saul. Celia System, City of Artre, mid-2670, Castra. Missiles, tracers, and explosions littered the sky. 
It was unlike previously where it seemed like a storm of fire rained down from above, shooting projectiles of fire in all directions in addition to smoke and whatever else. They had fallen from what looked like coffins of steel, and they littered the place. Apparently, there were some anti-air batteries in place, but they decided to follow the bright light that the pods expensed, missing most, if not all, the enemy who decided to fall from the sky all those hours ago. Castra sat against a wall with his rifle slung across his chest. It was squared, and the magazine was fed in from behind the grip with a red wrap and a black central-colored shroud with a single white line down its center. His armor was tinted a dark gray, atop a black ancestral military garb worn by many veteran warriors of the Selian ground troops, and he was part of the best. The sun had yet to rise when he was ordered to move for a surprise attack against an enemy convoy. The group before him were of a similar group, sporting similar colors of their armor, but they differed by the color of their issued rifles. Ever since Higher Up began the process to move to a different medium for firepower, the company that manufactured their weapons had started going out of business, so much of their current weapons were worn and falling apart, all while they had yet to receive the new series of weapons. I'm telling you, this thing is going to blow in my face before we even see the new tech, argued a young, fresh warrior. I mean, look at this. Can't even get replacement parts. The soldier in question flashed his rifle. It was the commonly issued Type 22 repeater, their main attack rifle for close to medium range. Yeah, I heard early on that the choke worlds got first pick, since they're dealing with the Union after all, replied another young Selian on the matter. Still, replied the other. We've got Terran rats walking about in our capital. How could the defenses of Celia not get first pick? We barely even have our tanks roaming the streets, since most of them were bombarded by enemy craft. I'm telling you, we make this kill, then we should go. He made a valid point, and Castra agreed to his logic. But he deemed it to be a logistic issue, rather than who got first pick. That, and it was possible that the Terrans had seized many of their cargo ships en route to them, but he didn't know for sure. All he had was a set of kill orders for an individual, and they were on lookout. From their scout reports, there was a mechanized detachment inbound that would run them straight into their kill zone. Unfortunately, he had yet to hear from his scouts, so he expected them to have met their end. He found it inevitable since they lacked his unique asset, so they were probably found and executed. The small group staged themselves within a small room in a building that overlooked an incoming road, with it splitting to their left and right. It was a building with seven stories, and they placed themselves on the fifth. A series of fortifications were made to reinforce it from small arms fire and the occasional explosive. In a corner, a veiled blur lied motionless on the floor, peering out through an artificially made hole big enough for his rifle to fire from. After a moment, the veiled blur dissipated, revealing his true form in armor similar to Castra. A weapon was donned with a red grip and a blackened shroud with a single white stripe. They were the only two from a separate troop inserted to fight with the troop of another war chief. Castra had moved beside him and knelt, peering out through the window that met his eye level. What do you think of this group, Tarek? asked Castra. The gander's fist, replied Tarek as he eyed the soldiers in question. They could be better, but not exactly who I want to die with. Castra nodded with a chuckle, followed by a sigh. Commander Mariv had better make it worth our while. The pair had been attached to a portion of Chief Commander Orland's troop shortly after receiving their kill order of a specific individual from none other than Chief General Torlak himself. For a war chief as fabled as Torlak, this is a surprise to be sure, but a welcome one, said Castra. So I've heard voiced Tarek. Apparently, he turned down promotion so often that the council themselves had to intervene. Yeah, but I also heard that the very enemy we're fighting had routed him numerous times, so I still wonder if he's all they made him out to be, added Castra. He was the man who fended off the last of the Union, after all. Then why be here? If they're that powerful, then we don't stand a chance. We're just waiting to die otherwise, said Tarek. Another valid point. If the man who apparently fought off the last of the Union forces from Selian space was sent packing by an unknown force, then why would they even try to fight? 
The Union was known as the epitome of a multifaceted amalgamation of alien hierarchy thwarted by a single race. There were holes in that theory, however, and browsing of the forums would only send one into a hole so deep no mining equipment could get them out. Who knows? But what I do know is that we have a home to defend. We can figure what to do after we recover, stated Castra, to which Tarek scoffed. Ha! Maybe if we had an edge. I don't know if you saw, but those surface-to-orbit cannons that covered this section of space were taken by two teams of Terran warriors. It was only a matter of time before the orbital station fell. Castra couldn't agree more. They had been briefed shortly after entering the city that the Council's special weapons were under attack, but they only had time to assist in the defense of the closest cannon to the north. But even there, his troop suffered severe losses from an unknown shooter, beyond his standard range of engagement. It was a jarring engagement, at first having the upper hand, but he grew concerned over the armored vehicles that assisted them. They did a number against their own, but his people practically encircle the cannon. It was too much for the enemy to handle, but the cannon was destroyed anyway, as if his involvement didn't even matter, which added to his displeasure. In the end, with the destruction of the cannon, the Terrans were able to evacuate with all of their people towards the south, where he saw the smoke of the second cannon that met the same fate. If we had the numbers, then we can certainly take them. I heard a report that the vengeful rain troop is wrapping up a Terran group somewhere to the north. Sendry Park, I think, although they've been at it for several hours, so who knows, replied Castra. Tarek grew quiet as he searched his brain for a similar topic on the Terrans, eventually coming to a question that had formed in his mind. Have you seen a Terran up close? Or at all? he asked. Castra shook his head in the negative. Can't say that I have. I've seen the pictures, but it's always from afar. I'm thinking, if I land this kill, think we should sneak a peek, added Tarek. Castra made an audible laugh, clearly berating the suggestion. Sure, if you can manage to get rid of the armored vehicles and get past everyone trying to protect them, you'd be lucky. Very lucky, said Castra. No need to be sarcastic, started Tarek. It's just that they look similar, almost uncanny-like. Sure, they're taller, but not by much. If anything, their size reminds me of Bralo. Fathers guide him. Two arms, legs, eyes, even hair. If it wasn't for the skin, eyes, and ears, then we'd practically be the same. Now you're talking nonsense. Maybe all that time under your cloak had fried your brain, rebuked Castra. Uh-huh. Why don't you take a call? Maybe check with Mariv when we can get out of here, added Tarek, clearly eager to leave. Besides, I think I see something down the road. It looks like the target. Castra's focus had now sharpened, and the tension of the room rose with everyone's attention toward the street described by Tarek as he continued to peer through his scoped rifle. Castra felt the tinge of a buzz that ran through his body for a moment before settling. It was quick and subsided just as fast, which easily made him disregard it as a battlefield sensation. When you have the target, you're free to fire, ordered Castra. I see him. Bastard's just looking at his wrist. I'm taking the shot, replied Tarek. Castra looked with a set of binoculars at the target, and as he said, there was the target fixation on his wrist. Just as quickly as Tarek notified him of the target, he hastily fired around, and the haze of the bullet trailed to the unsuspecting individual, landing square on the left side of their chest. The force was enough to knock them backwards and onto their back, motionless. Got him. That was easy pay. Quick, let's get out of here, Tarek began. But before he could finish, a wave of gunfire assaulted their position, sending debris from the walls into them. Castra and the rest of the group went prone, as most of the shots hit high. But the whir of the bullets flying inches above their heads did well to keep them suppressed. Castra crawled to the entrance in a rush, still minding his height so as not to catch a bullet to his head and called out to Tarek from behind what he deemed to be a better modicum of cover, since most of the rounds that entered through the walls of the building slowed enough to not penetrate further. I'm going to call Commander Marie for some fighter support, Castra tried to call out, but the sounds of gunfire drowned out his words. But it wasn't just gunfire that stopped his words short of finishing, but a loud, thunderous boom 
that seemingly caused the rest of the gunfire to cease. Since the firing began, time had felt like it had sped up, but when he looked at the time fashioned on his wrist, he noticed several minutes had passed than what he had experienced. It was only after the latest explosion that normal time had returned, and with it, a deafening ringing sound deep within his ears. When he looked into the room, there was smoke that perforated the space and green liquid that layered the floor. The bodies of his soldiers were now nothing more than chunks of meat attached to thin pieces of clothing and armor. He searched the room for Tarek, before falling his eyes to the location he last saw him, and saw the blurred veil that rested in the same position as before. When he moved to the body, he saw it begin to move, before ultimately forcing themselves up. He was relatively unscathed, but his rifle was in shambles, and he was covered in his own men's blood. Tarek! You live! How? said Castra as his hearing slowly began recovering. You'll hate me for this, he began, but I ended up using one of Orland's men to take the blast instead of myself. Selfish, I know, but I didn't feel like dying just yet. Castra shook his head to his comrade's assessment, denying how he would have felt. Much rather them than you. Since you live, we'd best be going. I doubt those whose commander you killed will stop before they find you. Tarek shook his head at the notion, urging Castra to turn his vision outside where the armored vehicles drove towards them. I saw it just before we got it by that explosion, but I saw it. I didn't kill him. Their commander lives. Tarek's tone was serious, unlike previously. It was evident that he had a score to settle and wanted the bounty, regardless if he would live to see it fulfilled. And what? You wish to assassinate him here? They were just attacked, so I don't expect them to be caught off guard again. Face it, we failed. Let's leave, and perhaps you can get another chance, pleaded Castra, to which Tarek denied the retreat. It's possible they think that this ended our attack, which it did, but we also have a second chance. You go, report to Chief Commander Mareev, so that they can bolster defenses of the council chambers, said Tarek. Castra wanted to argue, but as they did, the enemy advanced closer, causing him to concede to his comrades' demands. Fine, may the fathers guide you. I shall see to the council's defense, he conceded. Be well, Tarek. He gave a farewell to his friend and departed, knowing well that his friend was concealing a hidden pain. He couldn't tell at first, since the floor was layered with blood, and Tarek still utilized his cloak which concealed much of the damage he actually took but his stance spoke levels on his well-being. He had a slight hunch, and even though he tried to hide it, his breathing was labored. He was hit, and he was trying to hide it, which he did well, considering what happened to the rest of their group. Castra left for an exit opposite of where they were situated, and descended by way of ladder until it reached the ground. The ladder exit opened into an alleyway, and from there, Castra would regroup with the rest of the Mareev troop, he made sure to activate his own cloaking when before exiting the building and down the ladder wells. When he reached the end of the alleyway, it opened up to another major roadway and further into the city. He had previously noted predetermined patrol paths of soldiers that he could blend with, but before exiting onto the road, he turned back to the building he had just left, hoping that Tarek would follow, but he never did. Instead, several shots took his place. They were heavier with a dull pop that followed. Its sound was unlike their service pistol he was fairly acquainted with. There wasn't even an exchange of fire. It was purely one-sided. Tarek had perished. He sighed heavily with sorrow evident in his breath. Fathers, guide him. As he met the soldiers of the compound, they saw to it that he be granted entry. The area was a far cry from its previous state before the invasion and lost much of its appeal. It was once a symbol of might for the warriors of Celia, being an untouched bastion of authority while they order a conquest to worlds both known and unknown. But now it was reinforced, fearing their enemy and the attack soon to come. A sad truth for Castra. The rest of the soldiers were donned in standard armor, sporting a black undersuit with matted gray service armor. Some wore decorated sashes, which in the field told him that they were part of the general ground troop the largest conglomerate of soldiers available for use by the War Council. There was no uniformity between them in that sense, 
so it was widely accepted for them. However, it was different for a troop such as his own, the Malariv troop. They donned the same undersuit and armor as their brothers and sisters, but his command donned a red sash with glacial marking on the front of his helmet, accented with teal on the top frame. There were many soldiers who tried to emulate it, but never got it quite right. Walking through the compound courtyard, he picked up on several ongoing conversations concerning troops on separate fronts. Looks like the reports finally came in from the east, spoke a soldier who leaned against a wall while the person they spoke to sat against it, cleaning his weapon. Oh yeah? How's it looking? They replied, not taking their eyes off from their weapon. Not good. They've had to fall back again, but they ran into friendly armor. So they're holding them at bay. Once the group supporting the attack on the Terrans at the Sendry Park, then I'd say we might even retake the east, replied the leaning soldier. Akhtari, Terrans be damned. What of the west? I was sure there was gunfire not too far from here, replied the sitting soldier, their attention now on the one beside him. I think that was the ambush team. Probably made short work of the enemy, seeing how short it lasted, but we should probably send a team to investigate. Castra now interjected to the proposition of the soldier. Don't waste your time. The ambush team is dead. The two shot up to attention at his presence, attempting to render a salute, but he put them at ease faster than they could do so. The first to reply was an older male, the one previously leaning against the sandbagged compound walls. How do you mean? he asked. The name's Adelac, by the way, he added, reaching his hand out to meet their superior. War Chief Castra. Well met, trooper, he replied. But I mean that the ambush team was obliterated. Nothing really left, so get to your posts. We may have incoming and keep your eyes open, he ordered. They left promptly, alerting the rest of the idle hands around the compound to an alert status. He had already let the gate guard know before entering, but it seemed like they weren't quick enough to disseminate the warning. He didn't see them in action, but with how quickly it ended, he feared their skill in combat. As a result, he decided against trying to assist others in combat, as he previously promised to do with Tarek. Right now, he just wanted to leave, but couldn't do so without the authorization from his commander. He then entered the main doors to the council, meeting first with an abandoned receptionist's desk and the lack of occupants, assuming all to be out in the yards of the compound manning its defense. Instead of entering from the left, where the council hid, he went right into a series of rooms until he entered a small closet which housed janitorial equipment. With the door closed behind him, he retrieved a small device which was circular in design with a smaller circular depress with glass installed. He pressed a button on its side, and the smaller depression lit up with an amber-colored form. It was an older Cellian that donned a set of expensive earrings and a headdress. Their hair was parted to the sides, leading most of it to the rear, while leaving his face free of his bangs. It was his commander. War Chief Commander Mariv, what are your orders? Asked Castra, as the glow of the hologram lightly illuminated the small room. That depends, Castra, spoke the commander. How are things on the ground? Castra paused for a moment before returning a reply. Bad. From what I can gather, the enemy employs some intricate and deadly ordnance. Tarek had also fallen to their assault and failed in the kill order, reported Castra. Failed? Explain, ordered Marive. As you requested, we set up an ambush on their predicted route. Tarek was the first to identify the target and made the shot, but... Castra trailed off, urging Marive to inquire and forced him to continue. The target lives, and the rest of our team was turned into liquid. I was the only survivor, he reported. His commander shared a solemn expression, exuding sympathy and sorrow alike at the loss of his subordinate. Then, Marive paused. I find it best you soon retreat. I'll prep for you a shuttle, but it will be away from the combat zone. The enemy is keen on maintaining command of the skies. What of the war council? Should they not be protected? Inquired Castra. But Marive showed visible disdain for the name. They are fools who have set our homes on fire by inciting this war in the first place. I have tried to assist in the liberation and safety of our world. But the enemy is powerful, albeit few in numbers, he replied. Castra was conflicted in his commander's reasoning, and it showed on his face. 
prompting Marive to add to his earlier statement. I love our home, and I would fight for it, but the enemy is too powerful for us. They would leave us as food for the worms of the earth. I will not sacrifice my soldiers in a losing battle. Return, and do so in silence. There should be a maintenance tunnel that leads towards the inner sanctum of the council chambers. Use that to gain as much information from the traders and leave. It will take you far towards the north, to the city's northern grid farm. That is where I will send for you. Understood, Chief Commander, replied Castra. Then I best be on my way. He began to speak before the walls and ground around him shook violently, with loose items placed upon shelves falling onto him. What the? he said aloud, prompting concern from his superior. What is the matter, Castra? Are you under attack? I do not know, he replied. Something must have collided with the shield. The enemy may be upon us. If that is true, voiced Marive, all the more reason to leave. Let the warriors of the standard troop face their master's enemy. Go, be gone. We've already lost Tarek. I can't afford to lose you too. The concern shown to him by Marive was seemingly out of character, which threw him off guard, but he welcomed it. He had no real feelings for his fellow warriors, not of his own troop, as they came and went, but those in a committed command he could bond with. Like with Tarek, he was younger than himself, but he was selected by Marive himself as a crack shot, albeit impatient in the field. But he stuck around when things got bad, and together, they bonded. He was a warrior to be proud of, which led Castra to think little of a troop less soldier's life. They had plenty of opportunities to join an organized group like Malariv's troop or even the Gander's fist, but instead, they went standard. I understand, Commander. I will make haste, replied Castra. He turned his holographic communicator off, revealing only the simplest of floor lighting to keep himself not entirely in the dark. When he opened the door, he found the hall to be filled with a cloud of dust, most likely from the impact from earlier. He tried to listen for the soldiers and heard them shouting orders at one another, but the howl of death itself filled the air followed by a series of explosions, cutting off their words before they could finish their sentence. A multitude of smaller thumps sounded around him in a faster repetition, and he did well to dive onto the ground to save him from a potential stray round. After witnessing what happened to his earlier team, he was again fearful of the new and sudden tactic employed by the enemy. He wasn't far from the entrance, and he activated his suit's cloaking before attempting to peek from its frame. He stayed lowed and hovered before the door until the impacts and explosions stopped. When it sounded like it was clear, he leaned over and looked into the courtyard. What was once plentiful with able-bodied soldiers were now reduced to craters and smoke. Green liquid was seen plastered upon the walls across from him, with what looked to be an arm still gripping half a rifle, like it was embedded into the sandbags itself. It made him nauseous. The poor fools, he said aloud, but there was no one to hear him. He spied the culprit circling above in the air in a new location, with bright orange tracers leading from it and into more Selian infantry. As it continued to rain down death upon his own, he turned away back to the room he had left prior. He remained low, this time only to a crouch, as he made his way back into the darkened room. He looked around for an access button described to him previously by Marive before landing into the city. The room was dark, with gray panels making up the color of the room, enclosing him. Of course, somewhere hidden behind the stands and shelves that were placed to his left and right, but the one he was interested in was directly in front of him parallel to the door. It was an off-white compared to the duller light blue that emanated near it. If one looked at it, they would have found it to be simply a faulty bulb or ignore it completely. Instead of reaching down, he quickly tapped it with his foot, and with a low and taxed hum, a panel in front of him opened, revealing a ladder within a shaft that led downwards with similarly colored light blue trail lights leading to the bottom. He mounted the ladder, and by pressing a button in between the first two steps, the hidden doors closed, encasing him into a shroud of a dimly lit shaft. It was large enough for his frame and allowed for some wiggle room for his armor and weapon. After reaching the bottom, he found the shaft had a gentle slope downward and enough room for him to crouch through it. 
Luckily, the flooring for the tunnel was sturdy enough to not warp to his every step, allowing him to relax his stride just slightly. However, as he traveled through it, he began to smell a foul odor that couldn't be completely filtered by his helmet. He gagged when he unconsciously took a large breath and began searching for the cause. There were numerous side panels beside him that looked alien, until he came across a set of thin, plain, horizontal panels that could be maneuvered either electronically to manually for airflow. He opened several until he came across the origin of the odor and peered through them. It wasn't dark, but it was lit just slightly brighter than his tunnel, adding to his eyes straining to focus on anything further than twenty or so feet from where he crouched. Within it, he saw several large bodies huddled together over something he couldn't make out. He knew their frame from miles away, as they were known as the mightiest and most ruthless killers to the Union, the Runian Attack Force. He didn't fear them as most did, but he was simply disgusted by them, wishing upon them nothing but death. For now, however, he disregarded his feelings in the search of information. As he oriented himself to optimize his helmet's environmental headset, their voices came clear as they did little to speak hushed tones. In fact, they were loud and obnoxious, prompting him to relax from the vent opening and just listen. Ah, so graceful, Sir Pola, it is said one as he took a bite out of the barely recognizable corpse, sporting a simple red tunic that covered only half of its chest and wrapped around the torso. Indeed, Bokta, this one was easy to lay, and delicious too, replied another, this time sporting no clothing, only straps of leather tied and decorated with scraps of metal. Many of our brothers would want to know the feel of a selen. Not often we are given grace such as this, said Bokta. Perhaps Sir Pola will reward us with more selen females. I wish to experience that joy again. He must. We protect him and his flock by order of Nila. Surely they will reward us, said another as they ran a femur through its teeth, stripping it of excess meat. Their acts disgusted him, and as his eyes adjusted to the room, he saw the carnage that filled the room. The floor was stained dark green, and bones of familiar structure began to pile up into a corner. He was angry at their very presence, and the naming of Nila added fuel to his hate. Still, he continued to listen in. Unpleasant they wear unsavory scrap upon their heads, added Bokta, tossing aside a headdress that shone silver with a star-shaped central ornament with an emerald gem. Castra had seen something similar in a store that sold plenty with this one leaning on the more expensive end. Their conversation began to swirl into unimportant items such as their first kills or their favorite rock. Disappointed and saddened, Castra departed further into the tunnel searching for the war council. Damned things, I hope the wrath of the fathers befall you surely, he muttered. If the Terrans enter here, then perhaps those forsaken souls may find rest at your deaths. Through opening countless vents, searching for the council, he finally came upon a brightly lit room where the five sat. This time, their backs were turned to him as they sat around a table in heated discussion. What are we to do, Reka? Our forces are being decimated. These are your soldiers who've you taught to be effective in combat. Look at them now. The enemy is on our doorstep, and I'm pretty sure they just bombed the council chambers, shouted Polis a man donning pristine purple robes with added gold lining, with near the quantity of fabric usually reserved for the head war chief, Kalim. I, I don't know, muttered Reka. The enemy has shown utmost skill that our troops could only hope to imitate. They have no drive, and most who join don't last long for it to matter, he replied, saddened by his military incompetence. Seriously, why do we not pull from the choke worlds? Surely if we take a few from each, we can supplement our forces before the enemy gets reinforcements, added Polus. With each word, Castra saw how it ate at Reka, who was known to be adequate as a military advisor. As he knew it, Reka was only decent in space combat and had little experience in ground combat. Even changes in the infantry training regimen did little to actually improve or innovate the standard troops. Even I can make you aware how terrible an idea that is. Those worlds are the only thing from letting the Union run amuck in our space. If we pull even the smaller ships, it would still diminish their combat force, he said, before he was cut off by Polis. 
We are losing our cradle world, Reka, he shouted in anger. We have to do something or it will mean our heads. Fathers know how this will end, for all of us. Reka couldn't deny his logic, seeing how the enemy effectively occupied their skies and decimate their ground troops with fewer soldiers than their own. It was a subject even Castra would like to study should he get the chance, but he listened further to their discourse. Two months, began Reka. Two months. It would have taken for the Choke World ships to make it to Celia, and Torlak was routed for the last time barely a month ago. In less than two days, our fleet in orbit were subdued, and our cannons destroyed in the vicinity where it mattered. Whoever commands the Terran infantry is a force to be reckoned with, and we may have no choice but to surrender, he finished, before a hand met the side of his cheek, and the sound of the slap reverberated through the room, leaving him in shock. Head Chief Callum was the one to deliver the blow. Callum sat back down in his seat, leaving the other four in silence. It was the first that he had taken action like that before, that it left them stunned. We will not surrender our home to the Terrans. True, we have been foolish in our quest to be rid of the Union, only for us to be in conflict with another, started Callum. But I felt it necessary to expand further from our ancient enemy. I was confident we had the ships and troops to engage in such a campaign, but we were wrong. That, since we had beaten back the Union, that we could easily rid ourselves of an unknown race before they got too big to handle. But look how wrong we were. No, we shall fight to the last on Celia. Callum relaxed in his seat, leaving behind a bout of silence after his speech. After a moment, Brecca raised his hand to speak, which was granted by the head chief. Speak, Brecca. What do you have for us? said Callum. Before, when Mistress Neela left, she offered her support should we need it. Is now not the most opportune time? If by her grace she helps us, then we can utilize the choke world fleets to take back the lost systems from the Terrans. That was news to Castra. He was unaware that Neela had presented herself to the council, offering future aid. From that alone, it would act as a pretense for Union occupation again. All they knew was to conquer, and if they were given free access into the heart of their empire, then it would be theirs. It was only by earlier fleets twenty years ago that they fought them back before they took any majorly populated systems. They were lucky then, but he couldn't say the same if they fought with them now. Weighing the two entities, Castra would rather have Celia be under Terran occupation than that of the Galactic Union. From the videos he's seen and the evidence presented, they offered occupied settlements relative peace, albeit still under martial law. But eventually he had no real say and would follow the orders of his commander despite his opinion. No, I fear that is what she wants. For far too long they have coveted our space and not once have they set foot here with their armies, save for those beasts above, replied Callum. I will not surrender, and I will not do so quietly. The head chief brandished a weapon from beneath his clothing. It was a service pistol, still clean and unused. Chief Kalim, you don't mean, started Reka, to which Kalim nodded in affirmation. Let me reiterate, I will not surrender quietly. I suggest you all do the same. He pointed to a wall where a set of handguns were stored, enough for a small detail of guards. By the door, he did notice several standard troop soldiers that sat idly as they waited for their orders. He almost felt sorry for them for who they were going to go against, that he wanted to see how they operate at least once. However, he was running out of time. Soon the council would be captured, or killed, and the planet would be taken over. He had to leave before that happens. He continued on through the tunnel, when he heard faint gunfire that began to echo through the tunnel the sound reverberating throughout his body with each shot. He assumed it to be the enemy encountering the Runians. The fire sustained for nearly two minutes before slowly subsiding, then nothing. When he thought it was over, he heard a distinct shot from a weapon he had yet to experience. It was loud and pierced the air as there was a pause in between each shot. It was thicker in sound that enveloped him, unlike the soft, dull pops that took Tarek's life. Whatever it was, it made a killing blow to its victim. Seeing how much the Runians lacked firearms, it couldn't have been them. 
he bid them a cold farewell, in the hopes that they burned in their afterlife. Castra followed the tunnel even further, and the sounds of the inner sanctum were now absent. Only the dry hum of air and electronics that lined the walls provided any ambience that he was anywhere at all. The small lights from electronics blinked at intervals, which helped light his way as he continued forth, his eyes now fully adjusted to the lack of light. However, he noticed a speck of bright light that had placed itself at the end of the tunnel after he rounded a corner, filling his sunken heart with a modicum of joy, thankful to soon be free of the seemingly miles of duct he had traversed. Thank the fathers, the son, he said aloud, and his quickened his pace. As he neared the exit, he slowed his jog to a walk and observed the entrance with his rifle until his eyes began to adjust to the sudden brightness. The area before him led into a concrete walkway, with a large circular platform in the center that had more pathways perpendicular to it. And in the empty space adjacent to the walkways were transformers of the local electronic grid. In the center of the platform was a small shuttle, one designed solely for transport and for little else. It was small and sleek, with the sides of the main compartment opening to allow entry. It was quick and ultimately quiet. Due to its low electromagnetic output, it was quite often used for tactical insertions in areas too heavy with anti-air capabilities. However, for his situation, it was the perfect exit. As he approached the shuttle, the left-hand door opened, revealing a four-man squad of similarly dressed Cellians, all of whom he was close with. Castra, you fool, where have you been, and where is Tarek? spoke the center man. He was slightly taller than himself, but boasted a decent, muscular build compared to the rest of the squad. Like him, he too was a war chief, as indicated by a single chevron on his upper arm. Morive, my apologies, but I was part of a kill order for a certain Terran when we were counterattacked. The group of standards with me were turned to liquid and Tarek survived, but decided to try to face the Terran in single combat. It was his wish, explained Castra. Fathers guide him. Marive hung his head low and offered a solemn salute in the Fallen's name. I have heard of the order for the Terran, but to think he survived a shot from Tarek. What do you know of him? Very little, Castra responded. Only that Tarek said he still lives. And if the stories are anything to go by, the very Terran he failed to kill was the one who did him in. No one takes a shot like that and lets the shooter live. I know I wouldn't. Castra then boarded the shuttle with the others and lifted off when all five were aboard. As they flew, he would peer out the side of the door where there was a pane of reinforced glass and saw the battle unfold from a distance. Large ships, shaped like predatory birds, danced in the skies as they chased their Cellian counterparts. The Terran design captured his eye as they were sleek and aggressively angular. Some had swept long, swept wings. Others were broad, but they were nimble. Many of the Cellian fighters ditched the winged model some several hundred years ago in favor of a 360 degree of maneuverability. They kept it ever since. Most of their designs were broad in their cross-section, but they opted for curves tailored to the aircraft. He had even spotted several designs contrary to the previous, with variable thrusters on the edge of the wings and a side-loading door that dispensed troops. They weren't uniform in production by any means, so he would find more unique designs during the battle until finally they were in orbit, intrigued by their expanded utility. The traveled until they were on the other side of the planet, and the battle overhead could no longer be witnessed. In fact, the scene was only a quiet sphere of a planet they called home, with no hint of war ever occurring. In the distance, and as they drew close, the likeness of a familiar ship enlarged in their view, with the hangar open ready for them to board. The ship in question was smaller compared to other ships of its class, but made up for it with new technology. It was sleek, opting for smooth angles instead of their rotund cousins utilized by the current fleets. With its construction redesigned to provide protection and shielding to the lower compartments previously exposed in current and earlier models. To say it is a redesign is an understatement as it reflected an entirely new style. Surprisingly, it more resembled a Terran corvette 
just massively upscaled. She's a beauty, isn't she? muttered Morive. Castra and the others within the cabin agreed to its beauty, noting the blackened underframe contrasting with its matted silver hull plating. On the larger portion of its bow, its name was painted this time in ancient Selian. When translated, it read, Malariv's Foresight. I never get tired of seeing it, replied Castra. With a subtle rock of the shuttle, they saw themselves enter the barrier to the hangar, and what was once nothing but void was now lively with people and working hands as they moved to and fro about the deck. Busy, are we? said Castra, regarding the amount of movement below. I would like to think so, replied Morive. We're going to be jumping out of system, and you were the last to be picked up. Consider yourself lucky. The ship thudded softly against the deck, and with a hiss, the side doors opened vertically, with the bottom half equipped with a step. He holstered his rifle across his back and stepped off, with the sounds of orders and conversation filling his ears with normalcy. But before he could wallow in it, he was approached by the man who commanded him, Mariv. Good to see you are well, brother, said Morive. It was well known with the crew that Morive and Marive were brothers, as it was the former who declared it, although some were skeptical because of their age difference, with Morive being much younger than his supposed brother. I do remember telling you to address me as chief or commander, Marive replied as he pointed to the three chevrons upon his arms. So, how is it on the ground? Our comms went dark for a moment, so we haven't received an update. Castra was the first to reply. Worse, Chief Commander, last I spoke, the men of the compound were alive and well. Were? interjected Marive, confusion littered about his face. Yes, when the chambers were struck, a rain of fire continued from the air by way of a ship, much smaller than one of a corvette size, but boasted the weapon's equivalent. All it did was circle above us, but when I walked out into the yard, well, they were unrecognizable. Castra detailed the after-effects of the bombardment, and those around him grew grim at the display of firepower at the Terran's disposal. It was precise enough that use of it within a city is viable for ground support, and it can keep surrounding infrastructure intact, focusing solely on infantry and armored vehicles, I presume. Some of the ordnance used seemed like it would do best against vehicles, he explained. It was a sharp analysis from his brief interaction with it, but it was something he was always good at discerning. Impressive. All that from seeing what it did after? I knew I was right to have you in my troop. Now come, I'll need a full detailed account on your exit, said Marive, beckoning him to follow. After entering a room designated for conferences, Marive, Marive, and Castra were the only ones present as they awaited for others in charge of crucial divisions. It was after the last to seat that they were able to begin their debrief, beginning with Marive. As you all know, Celia has fallen, he began, deterring the hopefuls that it had a chance at resisting post-invasion. But all is not lost. We still have a chance at normalcy, as currently, we are traveling to a system of outer colonies. We will be far from Union space, and currently controlled Terran space. It allows us some time to rebuild a fleet for our protection, but we shall not make the same mistake as the Council did. His words left many confused, their eyes urging him to explain before a sudden bout of mutiny suddenly occurs. He thus played a video that had already been widely circulated through the Selian net as one of Councilman Polis's many speeches denouncing the new race and their act of territorial expansion. Much of what Polis has said was nothing but a front to delude our fellow Selians into fighting a war doomed from the start. Like us, the Terrans expanded towards a territory coveted by our empire, without knowing who we are. They have made that clear. We are their first encounter to the stars, and we have failed them. Even at the order of our chief general, we even tried to carry out a kill order against a prominent field warrior at his behest. No, the time now is to be frugal with our resources and to do so wisely, he said, pausing for inquiry from the group. One male chief presented his hand and spoke, Then what do you have us do? We are forsaking our cradle to a race of warriors mightier than the Vixians, perhaps more so than the Runians. The individual in question garnered like-minded acknowledgement from his peers as they turned to Marie for an explanation. It pains me to say it. But the Celia Empire is no more. 
The choke worlds will undoubtedly unite under the doctrine set 20 years ago and defend those worlds from all trespassers. That means we are alone, replied Marive, and the outer colonies will be left unprotected. They shall be our new home, and it will be under oath to Malariv, our empire's founder. His explanation seemed to soothe dissent, as another asked a more favorable question, this time from a female chief captain that oversaw the ship's fighter accompaniment. Then, how do you propose we approach this new race, these Terrans? asked the chief captain. With cautionary arms, he stated, I have reason to believe the Union may be involved with our downfall. His statement rose in them, fear and anxiety. The Council? spoke one Selian, in charge of ship's weapons. For what reason? Marive did what he could to calm them, ultimately turning his attention to Castra, who stood silently at the far end of the room. Lucky for us, I had someone find that out. Castra, if you will, he replied, as the chief in question began playing a video of his time in the tunnels. Marive then began narrating context to the video before him taking it. Earlier, here in the video, I had tasked Castra and the late Tarek with a kill order of a Terran soldier marked with gold and a face etched like a demon, said to have been the one to fell the mighty Brallo. Murmurs began to rise from the group, but Marive continued, We failed in that effort and saw firsthand what they can do in combat. They are truly a force to be reckoned with, but they can also be a valuable ally. But I digress. He then skipped to the point of an earlier topic, skipping past the bombarded courtyard of the council chambers and into the tunnels below the city, where he stopped with their scaled adversaries in view. Gasps were made, and anger grew present upon their countenance. What are Runians doing in the inner sanctum? shouted an earlier chief, followed by another. Are they eating a citizen? The audio had been playing overlaid with simple subtitles to follow in the absence of sound. However, instead of fear, they were furious, a ruthless enemy laid within their soil, an act unheard of since their secession from the Union. They were prideful in that fact, that not a single Union warrior had set foot on their cradle until now. That's right, added Marive. The Council betrayed our trust and let the enemies within our gates, where they have allowed the defilement of our citizens as their payment. But that is not all. He fast-forwarded the video to just before Castra opened the vent to where the councilman hid. Several shots were replayed, not sharing the same effect as in person, but delivered the same conclusion Castra made upon hearing it. It appears that the Terrans had entered the sanctum and put an end to those lizards. A shame you didn't see it happen, said Marive, clearly disappointed. He then focused it on the councilman stating that they could call upon the assistance of Neela if they wanted. Another act of treason so high that the room had essentially turned into a sauna from their heated fury. It was a wonder they didn't make a call to return to the city and bombard the chambers until a mild, deep crater replaced it. That's right. Another tally for the traitors, I suppose, he added, this time his expression reflecting solemnity and wisdom. We cannot give up on our people who still live, and I do not want to forsake those under control of the Terrans. But we need to be realistic. You've all seen what they can do with a fleet much smaller than our own. They were outnumbered and outgunned, yet they persevered. We must do the same. We will claim a section of colony space as our own and secede formally from the Selian Empire. It is our only choice that can provide us with an out. He paused urging those in the room to dissent or provide an alternative, but none came. Instead, they agreed. Castro was still unsure of what would befall them, but he prayed that it would end opposite of what became of their cradle world. He wished that in the near future they would be able to return to it. Until next time, I suppose, he muttered as he reconvened with the other troopers. It was a sour experience overall, and he wished it wasn't so. He had lost his friend to an enemy they are now removing themselves from to secure their future. But orders were orders. He held no ill will towards the Terrans, and he certainly doesn't condone the loss of their home. But he understood, should the roles have been reversed. In the end, he cursed the general that led him and his people to war. As short his visit was in the capital, it came at a price. 
He only hoped the Terrans would be fair to his people, unlike what they have done to theirs. The ship had now entered an intersystem gate, unknown to him at that moment. The war was won. Sol System, Orbit of Jupiter, The Senate, Late 2670, Octavia, Juna, R. As Octavia walked the granite halls, sounds of shouting were nearly heard beyond the many doors that led into the Senate chambers, and placed throughout the large corridor at fixed intervals were the Senate guards, donning a modded variant of the illustrious Raider standard gear. They stood watch as she continued her way through the halls until finally reaching a door that led into a small office. It was humble, and the appearance was not overtly furnished with expensive furniture. In the back, where a desk was placed, sat a man in the middle of his age as he scoured through countless papers and tablets with a female assistant by his side, providing him with freshly made coffee. He didn't look up to her presence, but his assistant made him aware, Sir, she's here. Huh? Oh, thank you, Autumn. Why don't you get some lunch? He replied. She departed silently and with a wave of his hand, also dismissed the two guards placed by the door, both of whom she didn't see or hear when she first entered. So, what news do you bring? I hope it's something to settle down those senators, replied the man. Octavia approached a seat that was placed across from the man before speaking. Too much, I'm afraid, she said. First off, do we have a date for the Tribunal of the War Council? Beginning of next year. That's locked in, so no need to mention that. What else? He replied without the need to lift his face from his desk. Well, as you know, the invasion of the Selian home planet was a success, she replied. Many from the higher-ups were sceptical over having a single platoon initiate the attack with so few forces, but their spearhead approach worked. The enemy wasn't expecting such a small force to infiltrate, so they didn't prepare proper counters. Hmm. And what of the Seventh Fleet? How did their campaign match up against these Selians? he asked. Fairly well, if not better, seeing how outdated our ships were. They were still utilizing last generation Max and Shield generators but it seems like the Aphant Round proved to be advantageous against unshielded enemy ships. It also seemed like the enemy wasn't anticipating the power of the Mac either. It seemed to be the only thing that gave us the edge against them, she explained. The Aphant Round, huh? Tell me again why it was banned in the first place, he asked, as he continued sifting through documents and signing what needed to be signed. The Senate wasn't keen on its uses against human ships when they saw the result. But against an alien enemy who attacked us first, well, they saw it fit to see its use in live combat. From what I've heard, they were pleased with its efficiency, replied Octavia. That's good, then. No telling what else we may be faced with in the near future, said the man. Unless there is something you're not telling me. Octavia sighed at his keen ability to read into people and their intentions hidden or not. It was that skill of his that led him to being the Secretary General in the first place. One of the VIPs, a General Torlak, was en route to the Sol system when their ship was ambushed. It left most of the Raider escort dead and took Torlak with them. Luckily, a Raider survived and took control of the situation prior to the enemy's departure. So aside from the Council, we have another that was high in their chain of command, explained Octavia. She provided him with her tablet, and on it was a profile of the lone Selian in question. Chief Commander Orlin. He was initially in charge of the defences around their planet, but gave that authority to Torlak. With the assistance of the Fourth Fleet, control of orbital space over their capital went smoothly. But there's one more thing. She trailed off as she searched her tablet for the appropriate documents. When she found what she was looking for, she handed back the tablet to the man before her. Are these dossiers of a new race? he questioned. Two new races. We're working on the third, but we have yet to receive credible intel on their appearances. The first two you see are what we recovered from the ambush, she said, detailing their features. The larger one is called Arunian, a race of large reptilians used as an advanced force. The other is called Avixian, she said. Looks like my dog, albeit weird-looking. Uncanny, if anything, he shuddered. 
I don't know how I feel seeing a dog walk on its hind legs on the regular, and that lizard how plentiful are they when deployed on the field. He noted their relatively large stature, with a fixed measurement tool placed beside it revealing the particular subject to be around five foot eight, with the reptile measured up to nearly seven and a half feet. It was also noted that both subjects were male, but that detail mattered little to him, as the lizard posed the larger threat simply for its size. They are apparently what comprises the largest portion of their ground forces. Beyond that, we know very little. As for the Runians, we have plenty of subjects for now. Although I wish we didn't, she said with a disgusted scowl at their mention. For what reason? You mentioned we have more. Where? inquired the Secretary General. The conditions we found them in were depraved, to say the least. She revealed a data sheet and report on her tablet, revealing it to the man before her. As he read silently, he grew uncomfortable and disgusted. Beyond killing and eating, it appears they have a pastime of forced intercourse with female captives before killing them for food. We found several DNA samples in one of their latest victims, but we only found it because they had yet to eat her womb. It was the only thing not eaten before the raider teams put them down, she explained. Savages, was the only word he could mutter, and his decision was clear, at least for them. I will propose a doctrine for our troops to engage these Runians with prejudice. From the looks of it, they are nothing but lizards who can barely think and are prone to their instincts, regardless of who handles them. Seems we're in agreement on that front, but I doubt that's all you want to know, she said. Why, of course. What else do you have? he questioned. Well, what do you want to hear? she began. We have orbital guard garrisons over several Cellian systems and the Seventh Fleet should be replaced by now. Won't be long before they return to their home port in Alpha Centauri. I'm well aware, but what of our brethren's status? Those captured during the initial invasion? Do we have a lead on them, Director? He said with a glare. Octavia shuffled in her seat at her new position, still trying to warm up to it. We still need more time before we can deploy our first team. They have promise, but screenings are filtering out more than we can fill, she replied. Who do you have so far? he asked. We have a prominent pilot turned raider. He just so happened to be the one to alert us of the threat in the first place. Screening decided to maintain some sort of squad cohesion, so he's joined by a couple from his unit. We're still looking to see who can fill spots aboard the common functions of their new ship, so I need your approval for a funds transfer to allocate for ship upgrades, explained Director Octavia. Oh, what upgrades are those? asked the Secretary General with a raised eyebrow. We're trying to implement the latest in stealth tech, and with the emphasis on not being seen, I think it's more than necessary for our operations. He sighed at her reasoning, but gave in to her request. Very well. I'll issue a funds and asset requisition request to the senators, he said, with the room's main door opening to his familiar secretary, Autumn, with food and drink in hand. Then, Director, I think it's best you set off. You don't have long before your deadline, so I expect to see some results next quarter. Octavia gave a shallow bow, which was returned by the man and assistant before her, before dismissing herself. But before she exited the room, the man called out to her, not of a simple request, but an order. Oh, Director. She stood silent at his order, urging him to continue. Find me General Brooke. We believe he may have gone AWOL when presented with the evidence you gave us. Find him and do it quietly. Also, it may be in your best interest to have a detail from here on out. The door behind her shut, leaving her disconnected from the man and his assistant. This left Octavia in the halls of the orbital Senate chambers as she left for her ship, issued to her by the Senate since the approval of her program. After embarking on her ship, she contacted the only one whom she could rely on. As the display in her office lit up, an aged man with greying sideburns was present. He too was in his own office, so she was free to speak with the man before her. Admiral Wolf, she began, do you have time? I do, ma'am. How may I be of service? He replied. Is the 4th Raider Battalion still attached to your fleet? She asked. Wolf nodded in response silently, to which she continued. I need volunteers for a task force. I need covert, 
and experience for this one. May I ask what for? he said with heavy scepticism. General Brooke has gone off grid, and he's wanted by the Senate for his experiment on the Cellians, she explained. It appeared he continued to experiment on them after we won the war, so it became illegal to do so. Instead, he continued the work, but now he's gone. Wolf furrowed his brows at the reveal as he took her request and began to silently dissect it. That explains it, then. We had a Raider-owned ship reportedly take our first wave of prisoners during the middle of our campaign. To think he was experimenting on them. Who else knows of this? he questioned. Ourselves and the Secretary General. He wants it done quietly so no pods and no fleets, Octavia added. They want him alive along with Dr. Hale, Brooke's chief scientist on the matter. I'll see who's available. How soon do they want them? he asked. As soon as possible. I have too much on my plate and my programme isn't ready for tasking just yet, said Octavia. It will be done, replied the Admiral. The feed was cut, leaving Octavia in her room alone, and she peered out her window. It was a live feed from the view of the exterior, with layers of hull separating her from the void. Her destination was Terra, where she was headquartered. Life was going to get busy, and she knew it. Charities and numerous integration programmes were presented to the Senate following the end of the war. She found the process too quick for her liking, but some programmes were green-lit, and the private sector had already begun rolling out their social programmes out to the Cellians. She had seen it firsthand, and many were shot down before even being given a chance to elaborate. She read many of them as they were introduced, with many blatantly centred around depriving the Cellians of their freedoms in the name of charity. As a result, the Senate had locked down Cellian space until proper regulations were in place. One such programme passed, however, was pilot integration. Giving the Cellians the chance to fly with Terran pilots and to bridge their relationship with the rest of the occupied Cellian worlds. So far, they had only given that responsibility to one squadron, whose designation she couldn't remember. Thus, the world she knew had begun to change, and she didn't know whether it was for better or for worse. All she knew was that she had a job to do, and it was her mission to execute it when the time came. Several weeks would pass with her time on Earth as she concluded a meeting of their latest progress. Specialist Kurt is exemplary in his flying performance with the Mark IV Spectre. We'll be conducting high-speed pickups and drops with the new ship tomorrow and I can offer a report then, replied the voice who was feminine in nature. And what of the infiltration element, replied Octavia, as she scanned her datapad of the report in parallel with the disembodied voice. They're all still relatively fresh from the Raider Depot, but so far they have the best scores compared to the volunteers and those from the other branches, they replied. How so? replied Octavia. Specialist Spears has proven to be quite the capable leader, along with Specialists Cameron and Fields acting as his subordinates, reported the female. They have shown exemplary marksman skills and infiltration capabilities. Where did you pick them, Director? I didn't. They were recommended directly from Gunnery Sergeant Slaughter, simply for their small unit cohesion during their time in the depot. As far as I'm aware, they were part of the first wave of raiders to drop into our tray as part of the 4th's Cobra Company. I was told they earned their stripes that day, explained Octavia. Their stripes? inquired the voice. It's said that a raider earns their blood stripes when they drop into a heavily contested combat zone. You have to get so many kills and survive to be called a true raider, she replied, emphasising her last two words. Then that may explain why they work so well together, they said. I have no doubt in my mind they have their fair share of trauma, commented Octavia. Will they be enough for a covert operation? That's likely, the female began, her tone largely unsure. I don't think it would be wise to issue them on a mission without proper leadership. Do you have anyone in mind that can be substituted while we continue screening, Director? In that case, she said, as she began searching her mind for a suitable stand-in, I'll forward a cross-branch request and see who catches. 
In the meantime, continue with the screenings and the training regimen. Understood, acknowledged the female as she ended the call. Octavia rubbed her forehead in a tired motion. Since her arrival back on Earth, she had been constant in progressing her program, readying it for its first task. She had already received a report that their designated ship was nearly complete, as was the allocation of weapons, armor, technology, and ammunition. Even before official acknowledgement from the Senate, she had already ordered research and development of a new set of armor and technology for her task force, but it fell through. Ultimately, she ended with surplus radar armor, which was colored black, with few adjustments. She was only allowed enough for one squad's worth, and currently, the four raiders were the only ones who could don them. They were already familiar with it, so they had already broken into their new sets. She still had more slots to fill, but it was a start. The crew for their ship was at least manned with a skeleton crew, with barely enough personnel to operate it, and at most, a fire team that had already tasted combat. She felt it necessary that they may have to open screenings to the other branches, but to her the most vital role to fill at the moment was her infiltration team. The galaxy was now open to them, and with it, the countless dangers that threaten humanity. She knew it, and so did her superiors. It was all they could talk about, so her urge to enact her programme was a must. She looked through her files once more, re-reading them until the information became memory. She had then decided to land on a single file, detailing structure, asset allocation and protocols. It was a document that would set the doctrine for a new covert programme, tasked with a mission no other branch had the resources to commit to. She read the top line, again, searing it into her mind, with many more like it to come, but they were to be the first. Terran Reclamation Unit, Black Mamba. This is the end of the second volume. Author's note. This chapter marks the end of the volume, clearly hinting at much to come and many opportunities to derive smaller stories, which is my intention to flesh out the world separate from characters overtly involved with the war. As such, this series is going to slow down, mainly due to my work schedule, but I do intend to continue writing and offering differing perspectives throughout this universe. Therefore, my side stories and extra content will be posted on the wiki. And perhaps to consolidate all information and content, I am thinking of creating a subreddit where I can post extra content I have commissioned for this project. For now, when browsing RHFY, look out for TC underscore title, which will be the format of all R Terran contact short stories and extra content. Until next time, and thank you for reading.